In an infinite world of infinite potential, a mortal man embarks upon an epic journey to find his purpose. Sam was just a normal man, living in Nowhereville America. Living a life of meaningless drudgery and boredom, his life was slowly but surely going down the drain. Then the system came. With it came danger, evil, but also the potential for infinite growth and meaning. As soon as it arrived, Sam knew that this was his calling. This story is the tale of one man, and his journey to the top of existence. Prologue. In a dark and distant corner of the multiverse, two men sat at a table in a dingy dive bar. Neither of them were human, one of them possessed skin of a monochrome gray color, whereas the other one was at complete odds with his surroundings, a rainbow-colored being with a bright ruff of feathers around his neck. Even without taking in these features, there was something different about the men. Something that made them special. Everyone within that galactic sector could feel the pressure from their presence, a nameless dread coupled with a faint desire to abase oneself before the force of something far above them. This was not the intention of the men, merely an unfortunate side effect of their presence. If either of them wished it, that sector, along with the rest of the universe, would be nothing but ash and ruins. Did you bring the item? The rainbow-colored man asked his companion. In response, the other man pulled out a nondescript bag from his pocket and opened it. Immediately, the solar system that they resided in was blasted into oblivion simply by the photons coming out of the bag. Photons were not supposed to have mass, but at such concentrations, most things could not withstand them. As promised, the solar core of a B-ranked sun. This thing was a pain in the ass to get. I hope you have the payment with you? The gray-skinned man thrust out his hand in expectation and the other man dropped something into it. The gray-skinned man clenched his fist around the opalescent orb, tucking it away quickly. A pleasure doing business with you, he said before vanishing as if he had never been there. The rainbow-colored man looked around him, chuckling softly. The surrounding space, for billions of miles in every direction, was completely gone. In its place, the transchromatic colors of exotic energies, energies that had no place in such a weak universe, glittered brightly. It was almost sad, seeing how limited the existence that the majority of the inhabitants of the multiverse were forced to live in. Above all else, he pitted the inhabitants of the universe that he had just sold to the other man. The weak were nothing more than the playthings of the strong, and both men were incredibly strong indeed. He left the universe behind, scattering his essence into the ether and reforming in the space between the universes. As he sped off back to his own universe, the one behind him imploded with a burst of light and heat, corrupted by the B-rank solar energy of the sun. Sam sighed as he stared listlessly out of the window of his beat-up car. He had experienced this so many times over the last few years, a feeling of hopelessness and complete ennui. He couldn't even bring himself to blame the things that were truly at fault here, his refusal to do anything about it, and his complete lack of self-confidence. He banged his fist down on the car door, but his heart wasn't really in it. Sam withdrew his fist, examining it as he did so and opened the car door. Well, I might as well get to it sooner rather than later, he said as he looked at the door of Ron's diner. He had worked there for far too many years, although any amount of time in that establishment, whether as a customer or a worker, was probably too much. It was a run-down establishment, one with few staff and even fewer customers. A realm of dancing grease fires and sweat-soaked uniforms, it was perhaps the worst place to work in the entire city. The eponymous Ron slammed the door open and he stormed out of the building. Sam, what the hell do you think you're doing? The lunchtime rush is going to be coming soon. Sam seriously doubted that there would even be any customers, let alone a rush, but he still got out of his car promptly. It was best not to test the man. Short and stocky, Ron possessed a fiery temper that all too frequently was directed towards his employees. He traipsed up the stairs and into the building, feeling the hot glare of Ron on his back. Sarah was already in the shop, and she tended to a hot plate that was loaded with the day's selection of coffee cake and other sweet treats. The sign above it professed that they were entirely homemade, but Sam knew as well as every other employee, that they were really from the supermarket up the road. How on earth he had ended up here, Sam couldn't fathom. His life had turned into a complete shambles after the incident. Before he could start thinking about that dark day again, the ground shook. Ron screamed, a high-pitched noise that was very at odds with his normal demeanor. What in the name of God was that? The man exclaimed as he ducked under a table. Ah yes, save yourself before you even think of us, of course, Sam thought bitterly as he helped Sarah under one of the larger tables. They crouched there in silence for a few minutes before the world was rocked by an even stronger quake. Sarah let out a whimper as she shook in tandem with the quake. Sam couldn't care less to be honest, if he was going to go out, then this was as good a way as any. He laid a comforting hand on Sarah's shoulder, but he was already out of it. 
An incandescent light shone through the windows of the dingy establishment and a third and far stronger earthquake started. Sam, along with the entire building, rocketed up into the air, and as he started to lose consciousness, he saw something impossible. A massive gray head filled the entire horizon as far as Sam could see. Even though it completely blocked out the sun, it seemed to exude a bright light, perhaps the source of the earlier flare. Sam stared into it fearlessly as he waited for death to claim him. He came to slowly, his hands wavering in and out of his vision as he waved them limply. He was standing on something smooth and solid and as he saw what it was, he nearly had a heart attack. He was suspended in the middle of a vast and never-ending darkness which was studded with balls that shone with every color of the rainbow and some more besides. He could feel the watching eyes of something coming from behind him and he turned, afraid of what he was going to see. A man stood there, but not a normal man. His skin was completely gray and his eyes were a smoky black color that caught Sam in its endless depths. He shook his head to force himself to break eye contact. The figure just stood there vacantly, as if it was a robot bereft of any sort of programming. He examined it for a few minutes and realized with a start that it was the owner of the gray head that he had seen right before he was transported to wherever this was. If he was dead, this sure didn't look or feel like the afterlife. Maybe there was something wrong with his car exhaust pipe and he had inhaled too much gas. Yes, that was probably it. He was high on carbon monoxide or some other engine product. Soon, he would wake up, maybe in a hospital room somewhere, and everything would be all right. He could almost imagine this as he closed his eyes. He opened them once more, only to see the black eyes of the figure staring back. Ah, god damn it. He said as he backpedaled. Curious. You are the only one I have seen so far that could resist my presence. Your innate mental fortitude must be quite high, even to withstand the pressure of this lowly form. The man paced around Sam and stared at him. If Sam was not a realist then he would have said that the man was looking into his very soul. Eh, who cares? Let's get on with the announcement. The figure stopped for a moment, as if glitching, and then started to speak. It was the same voice, but it seemed to lack any sort of life as if it was a pre-recorded message. I'm sure that you're all wondering where you are right now. The multiversal records that I bought said that you denizens of this universe are highly intelligent. Good, the last one was no fun. Flying rocks only have so much space for brain matter. The man coughed once and then continued. Ahem. That is not why I am here. I am Tantalos Veravax, the new ruler of this universe. I want to tell you all something before the fun stuff starts. He leaned in and smiled a wide, shark-toothed grin at Sam. You are mine. He said this without a hint of emotion in his tone, somehow making the simple declaration much more sinister. You have 100 years to prepare and then the first of my true minions are coming. That might seem like a lot to you mortals, but the truth is, that is nothing. Even if you had 10,000 years, it would not make an iota of difference. I am an ascendant, and you are mere mortals. Enjoy your time when it lasts. The system will explain the rest. Besides, I am but one of the things that you must worry about. And as for my unexpected conversation partner, I expect a lot of entertainment from you. The last sentence was spoken with the normal voice of the man and Sam knew that it was directed solely at him. Tantalos disappeared and Sam was falling, falling down what seemed to be an infinite distance. Chapter 2 He landed with a hard bump on the top of a pickup truck, setting off a blaring alarm. He rolled off it and landed on his feet, wincing as his left leg gave slightly. His mind was racing with what he had just heard. Just the first few sentences were enough to set Sam off down a rabbit hole of conjectures. The words multiversal records meant nothing to him. Well, he knew what the words meant of course, but there was no real-world connotation to them. Suddenly, he felt a chill come over him. There was something wrong with the world. A moment later he discovered what it was. The wind had suddenly stopped. Not only that, but all sound save for the beating of his heart and his shallow breaths was gone. A voice spoke directly into his mind a second later, causing him to jump. Humans, Lycanthi, Aberiths, Dugons, and the countless other sapient species of this universe, welcome to the boundless expanse. You have been granted this great opportunity courtesy of your sponsor, Tantalos Veravax. All of existence is a far larger thing that any of your collective races have ever scratched the surface of. Your universe floats in the middle of the greater multiverse, which is in turn one of countless other multiverses that continue to stack upon each other upwards into infinity. Rejoice, for you are no longer mere peons of mortal drudgery, but citizens of a realm of endless potential. You all will shortly feel the effects of your initialization into this new order. The voice paused and waited for something. Sam waited as well, and then he suddenly doubled over in pain. A burning sensation, like lava was being poured directly into his chest area, overcame him. He rolled on the ground, trying to get some relief, but there was none. 
He lost track of where he was for a brief moment, and then all was still. Now that that unpleasantness is gone, I can better explain what is happening. What you just received was a cultivation core. All of your wasted potential has been condensed into something that will allow you to transcend the shackles of your prior existences. You can now use my functions to manage and direct your growth. Level up, grow stronger and make this universe tremble before you, or die as fodder for the one who will. Over the next year, various tournaments and other such growth conducive events will allow you to establish a hierarchy among yourselves. True power is only achievable through true desire for growth. Good luck and farewell. Sam just stood there, stunned. This was all too much. Barely ten minutes earlier, he had been walking into his dead-end job. What had changed since then? Apparently a lot. He sucked in a deep breath to steady himself and then as he breathed out, something was kindled inside himself. Pausing, he repeated the action. It was as if there was an ember deep within his body that was being fanned by the winds of his breath. He closed his eyes, something told him that this was the right thing to do, and he kept breathing. A light started to grow within his vision and after a few more breaths, it stopped guttering. He looked at it in bemusement. It was a tiny orb-shaped object that glowed with a faint white light. Still, it gave off an imponderable, ineffable aura of infinite potential, as if it was the seed of some mighty tree, ready to grow into its full glory with the help of his careful tending. He opened his eyes and the afterimage of the light was still there. His closed fist glowed with a faint blue light and he opened it. A transparent blue screen expanded out of nowhere, appearing directly in front of his face. Sam Atlas. Human. Mortal tear. G rank. Class, none. Level 1. Strength. 11. Constitution. 10. Resilience. 10. Dexterity. 7. Intelligence. 9. Wisdom. 11. Health 100 slash 100. Mana 90 slash 90. Stamina 110 out of 110. Skills, 0. Titles, 0. Marks, 1 asterisk. Sam felt a strange attraction to the floating asterisk and he selected it with his mind. Before he could take in just how bizarre this whole thing was, the floating display was replaced with another. Marks, 1. Mark of Tantalos Veravax, grants greater ease of Tao formation. You have gained the barest fragment of a fraction of the interest of the being known as Tantalos Veravax. As the sole inhabitant of this universe to resist his aura pressure, you have been marked as his personal project. Perform well and your death will be swift, perform poorly and you will suffer the same fate as the rest of your universe, this mark can be hidden. This was probably a bad thing. One thing that Sam knew was that the odd ones out were always the first to die in any of the horror films that he had watched. Luckily, this seemed to have been countered by the ability to hide it. Hide it from what? Sam wondered. It wasn't as if anyone could see it, if he didn't have the strange floating screen open. He didn't even know if anyone else could see his personal screen. This screen reminded him of a status screen from a video game. He had played a few RPGs before and this was very similar. He even had levels and stats. Were those gamified versions of his parameters in real life? The stat names were very simple and he could have told what they meant even if he had never played a video game in his life. His strength was on the higher end of his stats, with the average around 10. He snorted as he read the number next to his dexterity. Yeah, you can say that again. Sam had been plagued by clumsiness for most of his life and this seemed to confirm it. As to his other stats, they were all around the same range. Perhaps 10 was the average for a human? Sam knew that he was pretty average as things went, except apparently with his mental fortitude, as Tantalos had said. That was supposed to be quite high, although it wasn't marked on the stat screen. Maybe the man had meant willpower, but had said it in a fancy way. If so, that was a complete joke. If Sam had possessed some sort of incredible strength of will, he wouldn't have been in the situation that he had been before Tantalos came. A low growling noise came from his left. It was probably just a dog. Sam continued reading, sure in his assessment of the noise. A moment later, he was on the ground, with a creature hanging off his arm. He called it a creature because it was like nothing he had ever seen before. The closest thing that he could think of was a garden gnome, and that was a very loose parallel. The thing looked like a small greenish humanoid, with a vast potbelly and viciously sharp teeth. It projected a vile odor into its immediate vicinity and Sam started coughing. It seemed harmless enough, but then it started to glow. Sam grabbed it after that and threw it into a wall. There was no way that he was going to let some radioactive green alien latch onto his arm. He didn't want to get cancer. It picked itself up with a high-pitched screech and charged at him. It was far faster than it looked. It raised one of its forelegs, Sam wasn't sure whether it was running on all fours or simply running with extremely bad posture, and it slashed at his leg. Sam gasped. The tiny claws of the creature had sliced straight to the bone. 
He toppled over with a muffled squeak and turned to face the green beast as he fell. Luckily, he landed on top of it. The thing splattered underneath him, dousing the area and his clothes in a viscous green goo. You have killed a juvenile gremlin. You have leveled up. Chapter 3 Sam's leg started to knit back together and he stared at it in amazement. This was impossible. He really needed to stop thinking that. The world had changed, whether for the better or the worse he didn't know. His mind had started to calm and he began to think more carefully about everything. First things first. He had leveled up and if this worked like he thought it did, he would have acquired stat points to distribute. Opening his status again, he perused it more carefully. Underneath the stats, there was a list of three things. His health, his mana and his stamina. Currently, his health and stamina were a few points below full. Hmm, so leveling up replenished my, uh, resources. Not fully though, so there is a limit to how much it heals me. Sam still had a few scratch marks where the deep cuts had been and he scratched at them unconsciously. The basic function of the system seemed to be simpler enough, but it would probably get more complicated later on. His main question was what the Tao was. It had been spelled with a capital D which meant that was important in some way. If he was not mistaken, his special mark was actually a boon as well as a sign of his uniqueness. More importantly, for now at least, he needed to get to safety. If there was one of those gremlins, then there were probably more. His defeat of the creature was more luck than anything else and he didn't fancy his chances against multiple of them at the same time. He started running back towards the diner, hoping to get to his car. As he ran, he pulled out his phone and tried to turn it on. Nothing happened. The screen remained completely black and he shook it with urgency. It stubbornly refused to turn on. Grumbling, he slid it back into his pocket and kept running. The parking lot of the diner came into view and he ran for his car. He withdrew his key from his wallet and turned it desperately in the lock. The door opened and he turned on the car. With a flash of amazement, he realized that his crappy car was probably going to save him. Unlike his phone, his car was an old-school model and it didn't have a digital display. All of those fancy electric cars would have been bricked by the advent of whatever effect had shorted out the electronics. He drove down the road and saw more of the gremlins. They chased after the car for a bit, but they couldn't keep up. Sam had an idea as he was driving down the road. Wait a minute, I can just run over these things with my car. How many levels would that give me? Sam turned around his vehicle and gunned the engine. The car sped down the road, well it was more accurate to say that it puttered, but Sam ignored the sad truth of his choice of transport and pretended that it was going at hundreds of miles an hour. For the first time in forever, he felt alive. The gremlins chittered as he neared them and as he passed by, he could see that one of them was picking their teeth with something that looked disturbingly like the bone of a small child. He had convinced himself that it was just an animal bone by the time that he spotted a large group of gremlins. They were clustered around something and the sound of chomping teeth carried over the air and to Sam's ears. He approached them and hooped as he prepared to run the creatures over, but he skidded as he saw what they were clustered around. A human corpse lay on the ground, barely recognizable as a person. It had been savaged by the gremlins and the closest ones were stained red with viscera. Sam cursed as he realized that he had missed his chance. The gremlins had loosened their formation and were coming after him now. He spared one last look at the body and had to prevent a tear from running down his cheek. He was surprised by the sudden upwelling of emotion for a random stranger, but the way that the person had died was horrific. While he had been distracted by his shiny new system display, people had been dying. It was only dumb luck that had caused him to be spared while this other person had been devoured. Sam needed to get stronger so that this didn't happen to him. He drove down the street like a maniac, not knowing where to go. His small apartment was probably overrun by the gremlins by now and he wanted to find somewhere safe to allocate his stat points. For the next five minutes, he drove straight out of town, eventually coming to a stop at a derelict gas station. The pool of blood that poured out from under the door told him everything he needed to know. Opening his status, he inspected the top part of it. Sam Atlas. Human. Mortal tier. G rank. Class, none. Level 2. 2 free stat points. Strength. 11. Constitution. 10. Resilience. 10. Dexterity. 7. Intelligence. 9. Wisdom. 11. Health 100 slash 100. Mana 90 slash 90. Stamina 110 out of 110. Skills, 0. Titles, 0. Marks, 1. Sam had no idea what to increase first. He felt like a toddler in a candy store, perplexed by the multitude of shiny, delectable treats in front of him. He immediately ruled out intelligence and wisdom. Both the stats seemed to be useful, intelligence increased his mana resource and wisdom presumably made him wiser. Unfortunately, he had nothing to use his mana for and it would be useless. 
Additionally, with only two points, dexterity was useless to invest in. Doing so wouldn't even raise him above the human average. Instead, he decided to go for strength. With a surge of energy, a wave of force shot out of his core, spreading through his body and then rebounding back into the core. He felt normal for a moment and then he convulsed as his muscles started to burn. They strained against the constraints of his skin and he felt as if his muscles were going to burst through. After a minute, the feeling receded and he slumped backwards. He raised his right arm and flexed it. His bicep was noticeably larger than it had been before. He had been no slouch in the physical fitness department before, but this was something else. He felt a strange energy within him, as if his new power wanted him to do something with it. Sam clambered out of the car and dropped down to the ground. He started a series of lightning-fast push-ups, continuing after the point that he normally would have to stop. He beat it by almost double, which meant that stats didn't scale linearly over 10 points. It wasn't overpowered by any means, he knew that he wasn't even on the level of a professional athlete or anything, but he would be soon if he kept leveling up. He closed his status and reveled in the feeling of potency that he could still detect the last traces of. It was an intoxicating feeling and he knew that it would only get better. Chapter 4 A faint series of howls could be heard in the distance, and he remembered that he was still very much vulnerable to those gremlins. He had barely defeated one of them before, and they seemed to swarm in packs rather than roam individually. He got back into his car and turned on the engine, but realized that there was only about a quarter of a tank left. Damn, I should have refilled that this morning. Who knew that the goddamn apocalypse would happen later in the day? Sam thought as he stared at the gauge. Then he clapped his face into his palm. He was literally parked in a gas station. He put the vehicle in reverse and sidled up to one of the pumps. Getting out of the car, he closed the door and took out the pour, inserting it onto the car. As he flicked the switch he noticed a flash of green next to the main body of the pump. A flare of light illuminated the face of a gremlin smiling mischievously as it dropped a lit match onto the oil slick floor. Shit. Sam screamed as he ran for cover. The explosion ripped through the gas station, detonating the supplies of gas below the ground. Pillars of flame erupted from the asphalt and he was sent howling off into the distance. Sam woke up in an awkward position. His left leg was bent at an uncomfortable angle and when he tried to move it, a bolt of pain shot up the limb. It was broken. Sam looked around him and saw that he was lying on the roof of the gas station, one foot protruding down into the roof of the building. Groaning as he withdrew his injured limb, he got himself fully up onto the roof. Sam cursed softly as he cradled his leg. The only way that he was going to get some healing was to level up again. Hopefully a level up would be potent enough to heal him fully. Other than his broken leg, he was surprisingly unharmed. Perhaps strength improved his general durability a little as it increased muscle density. The main problem was getting down off of the roof with his broken limb. The only way that he was going to get down was by either falling or climbing, both a no-go with his broken leg. Besides, the ground was covered in a crawling carpet of gremlins, all attracted by the fire. Mere seconds later, a shockwave ripped through the air as something exploded in the middle of the crowd of gremlins. A man strode out from behind a nearby building, cocking a shotgun that had the unlikely addition of a grenade launcher to it. Sam stared, he recognized that man. It was Jeffrey, the survivalist that everyone in the town thought was crazy. The man lived on the edge of town in a shack and would frequently set off explosions. The only reason that nobody ever complained was out of fear for their safety. Now his preparations had been justified. Jeffrey pointed the shotgun at the gremlins and rather than bullets, miniature fireworks spiraled out. They were clearly modified as none of them exploded in the normal colorful displays of a firework, but with the orange glow of gunpowder. The gremlins fled the area and Jeffrey approached the gas station. Whatcha doing up there? The man called out in his rough, raspy voice. What the hell does it look like, admiring the scenery or something? My damn leg's broken. Jeffrey nodded sagely at this. Ah, take this then. It'll fix ya up real good. The man tossed up a small crystal that was a deep red in color. As Sam caught it, his interface popped up. Contact with mana enhanced object achieved. You have gained the skill basic analyze, common. Use a small amount of mana to gain a basic sense of what a thing is. A mode of light appeared on the gem and Sam stared at it. With a pop, he felt a little of his mana drain out of him and into his eyes. They lit up and he stared at the crystal. Basic healing crystal. Jirank magical item. A condensed nugget of life aspect energy. This crystal only can heal those of the lowest levels to any great extent. Excessive consumption will pollute your core and mana channels. Sam debated whether or not to use the crystal with himself. Core pollution didn't sound very appealing, but it said that happened only in cases of excessive consumption. One use would probably be fine. Unsure of how to use it, 
Sam clenched his fist around it to bring it up to his face, but the stone crumbled away and a red light sank into his body. He could feel a warm sensation creeping down his leg and into the limb. A crack like a gunshot rang out as his bones snapped back together. Sam clenched his teeth to avoid crying out. Why would people use these things willingly? He tested his leg and was surprised to find that it was completely healed. Oh, that's why. Such an effect was nothing short of miraculous. Something that would have taken weeks or even months to heal normally had been mended in a matter of seconds. He looked down over the side of the station. Jeffrey stared at him with a gap-toothed smile. Come on down, boy. I don't bite. Sam sighed and jumped off the side of the gas station, landing with a thump on the concrete. He walked over to Jeffrey and looked him over. So did the other man apparently, as he began to speak. Only level two? Come on now, I'm already level seven. What have you been doing since the green critters appeared? Sam was shocked. If the other man was really telling the truth then he was far beyond human now. Sam used his new skill on Jeffrey. Jeffrey Hollings. Level 7. Human. Unlike in games, there was no health bar under the man's name. Well, this was a simple analysis skill after all. All it was supposed to do was to tell you about something, not file an IRS report about the subject. Maybe if he upgraded it further it would reveal more. So far, the rarities were similar to in video games, another point of similarity. This was almost surreal. He felt an irresistible force pulling at his right arm. Hey, hurry the hell up. We need to get to safety, Jeffrey said irritably. The man was basically dragging Sam down the road. What about the car? You want to drive that thing? Jeffrey scoffed as he pointed at the melted heap of scrap that was all that remained of Sam's car. Oh, it hadn't been the best of cars, but it had still been his car. He felt a small twinge of sadness at leaving it behind, but it was only a car. He had far more pressing concerns. When he looked at Jeffrey again, he saw something that made him want to close his eyes. The man's legs were moving as if they were walking, but they had faint afterimages as they went back and forth. He must have pumped his dexterity or something to make him go that fast. His strength too, his fingers were like iron bars clenched tight around Sam's wrist. A small group of gremlins came around the corner but Jeffrey growled at them and they went away. Sam let the man pull him limply, he was extremely tired, probably an effect of the healing. They moved around the town at a quick pace, and eventually they left it and went into the woods. A faint light beckoned from between the trees and Jeffrey sighed. Ah, my humble abode. Ain't no gremlin bastards around here. Well, there are some, but I made sure to put the fear of God in them. He dragged Sam into the building and slammed the door behind him. Sam took in the door. It was a foot-thick construction of solid metal and concrete the thing must have weighed over a ton. Jeffrey must have had some money hidden away somewhere as there was no way that he could have afforded something like that without significant cash. Jeffrey sat down with a satisfied groan and slammed back a shot of amber whiskey that was waiting for him on the side of his table. Damn, that hits the spot. Ain't no government bastards coming around here to try to condemn this place, no sir. Jeffrey cackled madly. Sides, if they did, I would give them a good taste of my fist. Sam sighed, he was now stuck with a man who was very possibly out of his head. You do realize that all the government people are probably leveling up faster than us? Though, to be fair, they all might be dead. And that last thing you said, well, I would just think about it before saying it in polite company. Jeffrey snorted. Polite company? All those people are probably dead now. Taken by them gremlins. Jeffrey was probably right, but Sam didn't indulge him. Now that they were safe, he had a few questions for the man. Okay. So, you're a higher level than me, right? Yeah. What of it? Have you ever heard of the Tao? Sam asked. The Tao? What's that, some sort of Chinese food? Sam sighed. Never mind. Can I get out of here? I need to level. Be my guest. If you die, it ain't my fault though. Also, that leveling thing slows down a lot very quickly. Was that called, deviating returns or something? No, I think you mean diminishing returns, Sam said. Also, I think you might want to put a few points into intelligence. That last bit was said as he was already halfway out of the door so by the time Jeffrey understood him, he was already gone. Chapter 5 The outside of the shack was thankfully clear of gremlins and Sam decided to search for a weapon. There was a shed out back and he assumed that it would be a likely place for there to be a weapon. Sam slunk around the building, he didn't know if Jeffrey would approve of his thievery, and made his way to the wooden building. It was dark inside and he could faintly make out the shadows of rows upon rows of tools hanging inside. When he turned the light on, surprised that the power was still on, he saw that they were all of a make and design that yet again, Jeffrey shouldn't have been able to afford. He sensed that there was some kind of backstory to the man and why he was so obsessed with doomsday planning and that below the unsophisticated veneer, 
there was something more going on there. He picked out a large machete, the oversized knife could just as easily slice through monsters as cut through branches. Leaving the shed, he heard a faint noise, like an animal in pain. Sighing, as he knew that this was probably a trap, he still went towards it. Justifying his stupidity by the fact that there were probably a lot of potential levels on the line if he followed the noise, he ran through the woods. A clearing opened up dead ahead and he ran towards it, the noise was getting louder and more urgent as he neared. Finally, he saw the source of the commotion. A strange monster, some kind of reptilian centipede, was surrounded by a swarm of gremlins. The creature was mewling piteously as the gremlins tore at it with their claws and sharp teeth. Sam started backing up, this was a battle that he did not want, but his foot caught a wayward branch and the soft crack caused every gremlin in the clearing to look up. The vicious green creatures snarled in unison and charged him. Knowing that he couldn't outrun them, Sam was cursing himself for not placing points into dexterity, so he chose to stand and fight. With his machete clutched tightly, he lashed out at the monsters as they neared. Gremlin after gremlin was turned into green goo by his machete, and his higher strength made it so that he was killing multiple of them at the same time. Still, many of them made it through and his body was soon littered with scars from their attacks. He made sure to explicitly target any of the gremlins that started to glow and this prevented him from taking too much damage. Still, by the time the last of the approximately 30 gremlins was down, his health was below half full. With a surge of energy, his wounds started to heal over. Sam groaned. So, I can't level up in combat. Great. You have killed a juvenile gremlin, X31. You have leveled up, X4. Damn but the diminishing returns were starting to kick in. How many gremlins had Jeffrey killed to reach level 7? It was probably over 100. Sam opened his status and thought about how to allocate the points. Strength seemed to be the way to go with most of his points, but as the battle had just shown, dexterity was useful for escaping situations in which high strength might be useless. Additionally, he wanted to see what constitution and resilience did. He decided to trickle feed the points, in order to avoid the effects of using many of them at one time. If only two had almost debilitated him, then eight would probably have him on the ground. The first one went into strength. Now that the stat was a bit higher, the stretching sensation was not as intense, although that could be because of the lesser quantity of stat points. Another point went into strength as the feeling subsided and a final one was placed into the stat after. Preparing for a strange new feeling to kick in, Sam added a point to dexterity. This feeling was far more pleasant than that of strength. It was as if he had just drunk the most caffeinated drink in existence and he had all of the alertness, but without the jitters. His limbs felt more responsive and as he moved them, he could feel the tips of his fingers with a startling clarity. Sam chuckled and placed another point into the stat. As much as he wanted to just stand there and continue to feel the buzz, he had other stats to enhance. He had three points left and he wanted to put two into constitution and one into resilience. His mental stats could wait for now. The first point was placed into constitution. His entire body started to roil with an internal heat and that heat started to ramp up quickly. It felt as if he was being slowly cooked inside a pressure cooker and as the pain reached a crescendo, he could feel his organs and skin knitting together and becoming denser and more durable. He had to psyche himself up to place another point into the stat and he braced against a tree for the feeling to overtake him. It was a little better this time, but not by much. Finally, resilience was the last stat to increase. He placed in the point, not knowing what would happen. Immediately, something felt wrong. A series of cracking noises erupted from his body and a searing pain tore through him as his bones broke and reformed. Energy was being drawn from somewhere and it was increasing his mass. Not by much, but by a decent amount still. He rolled around as the pain crashed through him in waves, but he eventually was able to overcome it. Beads of sweat trickled down his chin and he had to rest for a minute before getting up. Tentatively, he squared up in a boxing stance and punched a tree. To his surprise, his fist didn't rebound with a flare of pain, instead the wood crunched under it, creating a small dent. He stared at his fist in wonder. This was even better than he had expected. Apparently the physical stats were meant to work together. He made his way over to the strange centipede-like creature and examined it. Juvenile Herpetipede. Level 6. Sam remembered from biology that herpetology was the study of snakes. The name seemed to confirm his assessment of the creature's nature. It made a weak purring noise and tried to move closer to him. He tentatively reached out, expecting this to be a trick and for the creature to bite him. Instead, it licked his hand weakly with a long forked tongue. The thing was growing on him quickly and he decided that he wanted to save it. He picked it up with a grunt, surprised at how heavy the barely four-foot-long creature was. Sam walked through the woods back to the house, surprised at how fast he could move. 
Now that he was closer to the human average, he realized how normal people must have felt. He was a long way from being the Flash or something like that, but he was edging his way up. As he reached the shack, he remembered the machete. It was covered in patches of green ichor and he was sure that Jeffrey wouldn't appreciate that. He wiped it off on a patch of grass and hung it back up in the shed. He walked up to the front door and knocked on it. A slot opened up in the middle and he was met with the barrel of a shotgun. Jesus, Jeffrey. It's just me. Oh, can't be too careful, Jeffrey said before opening the door. Noticeably, he still hefted the shotgun. What the hell is that? Jeffrey screamed as he saw the herpetipede. He tried to grab at it, but Sam snatched it away. Hey, hey hey. I found this little guy outside. He seemed to be peaceful. I wanted to see if we could train him. Jeffrey snorted. All right, but don't let that mutant freak anywhere near me, understand? Sam nodded as he carried the monster off into a back room. He searched for a medical kit and found one after a few minutes of searching. Of course, there were about 25 other medical kits with it. What kind of paranoid man gets this many supplies? There's something going on here. The idea that Jeffrey had somehow known about the coming of the system was very unlikely, but still plausible. For now, it didn't matter. The man was helping him and this was enough. He placed down the monster on a table and opened the medical kit. He pulled out a pair of rubber gloves and some disinfectant. He didn't want to get some sort of alien virus off this thing. Sam put on the gloves and flipped the creature over. There was a gaping wound on the other side of the body and a thick yellow fluid leaked out of it. A foul stench wafted out of it and Sam wrinkled his nose. Let's get you fixed up, little guy. He dabbed at the wound with some cotton balls and removed the liquid from it. Next, he doused the wound with disinfectant, winching as the creature started to toss and turn. Finally, he covered the wound with a large bandage and wrapped the creature up in gauze. It lay there, breathing shallowly, and Sam left it. There was nothing more he could do and he wasn't going to ask Jeffrey for a healing crystal to use on a monster. Sam went back into the front room to find Jeffrey tinkering with what looked to be a machine gun. Chapter 6 Is that a machine gun? Sure is. Picked up this beauty at a military surplus store. Well, it was more of an illegal arms auction, but semantic semantics. This'll be good for using on those green things. The man stroked the barrel of the machine gun. This must have been a dream come true for him. Even in America, people weren't allowed to just fire off military-grade weapons. Now could do so to his heart's content. The government had probably fallen by now, and if it hadn't, then they were too busy now to worry about things like an illegal machine gun. Especially when it would help to defend the country. Okay. By the way, did you see any other survivors anywhere in the town? I saw a lot of dead bodies, but nobody was alive except for you. The other man shook his head before spitting on the ground. Damn gremlins musta killed them all off. I didn't see a soul, except for you. Jeffrey continued to clean out his machine gun and Sam sighed. It was just the two of them against the monsters. He looked outside, it was already getting dark. Something strange had happened with the sun and it looked to be a lot smaller than usual. That was a question for the morning however and he found a vacant cot in the corner of the room. In a distant quadrant of the multiverse, Tantalos Veravax chuckled as he watched the antics of his newly purchased universe's inhabitants. The first day was always most enjoyable to watch. Seeing mortals dying to the scum of the multiverse was enough to make his day. The gremlins were so weak on a normal scale that they weren't even culled when they overpopulated an area. Against these people, they were more than enough to kill them off. Most of the civilizations in the universe had already been wiped out. The vast majority of them had been backward societies, the equivalent of the Stone Age back on Earth. Only a few had advanced technology and those were the ones that had survived. Curiously, with the absence of higher technology, one species was performing better than the others. The humans were at a point in their development where they were starting to phase out their current technology for more advanced digital tech, but they still had older devices that didn't rely on computing. Tantalo smiled as he remembered the fall of the Charanax, a race of cyborgs that had transcended normal mortal parameters. Their suits had stopped working as soon as the system arrived and in desperation, they had tried to launch an antimatter bomb. Unfortunately, the bomb worked, but the controls didn't and their entire solar system had been wiped clear off the map. The amount of destruction that unenhanced technology could achieve was quite impressive, even to Tantalos, but there was no real point comparing it to the rest of the multiverse. Some civilizations had fused the system with their tech, but they still relied mostly on leveling and stats to even the board. It was going to be a nasty surprise for the humans when they found out that their weapons would only be effective against the very weakest of monsters. Tantalo sighed as he sat back on his chair, playing through the day's highlights in his brain. His intelligence was so high that he could easily see everything that was happening inside a universe at once. 
and he was only a B-ranked ascendant. The actual gods could monitor everything inside the entire multiverse at once. He was afraid of only one thing, those impossibly powerful beings. Once, millions of years ago, he had committed the equivalent of a bank robbery on a vault universe. Unfortunately for him, he had stolen the wrong item, a keepsake that belonged to one of the 99 creator kings. One of them had come for him and he remembered vividly what had happened to him. For billions of years in subjective time, the god had kept him inside a mental hellscape where he suffered through an uncountable number of incredibly painful deaths. It was only thanks to his enhanced mind that he was able to avoid going insane during that. He shuddered as he remembered that, and he cleared his mind. It was time for some diversions. He couldn't control the monsters spawning inside the universe, as it was only a result of the integration of the universe into the system, but he could throw a few curve balls into the mix. Firstly, the herpetipede that his project had found. With a surge of power, Tantalos enforced his will across the multiversal divide, using his universal ownership orb to channel it into it. An infinitesimal spark of his own intellect drifted off through the void and into the universe. Earth, Jeffrey's hut. Rax was hungry. That was the first coherent thought that the herpetipede had possessed in his entire life. He vaguely remembered the previous day, when a strange pinkish creature had saved him from a group of gremlins. He hissed as he remembered the gremlins. Back on his home world, a place where all of his kind lived in harmony with the sapient inhabitants, there were none of those foul beasts. He felt an urge to find his savior and to pledge his undying allegiance to it. A moment later, he felt pain such as he had never felt before. His entire body was being remade and he could feel his legs lengthening, becoming more efficient, his neurons developing, his brain becoming like that of a sapient's. With a wailing cry, he lost consciousness. Sam was woken up by a high-pitched, squealing noise, coming from where the herpetipede had been. He realized that the creature was in some sort of distress as he listened and he bolted into the room. Jeffrey was already there, the man standing over it with a hammer. Jeffrey, what are you doing? The man looked over at Sam. What's it look like? This thing got possessed or something. Look. Sam rushed over to the creature. It was barely recognizable as the thing that he had rescued earlier. It had gained about 50% more length and it was far stockier than it had been before. Its tongue darted in and out of its mouth trying to draw in air. Jeffrey moved to strike it, but Sam put his arm in the way. A crushing force bore down on him as his arm met Jeffrey's but the man quickly withdrew his hand. If you want to cavort with the thing, then fine. But if it comes for me, then it's dead. Jeffrey said in exasperation as he threw the hammer aside and went back to his room. Sam was about to tell the man not to say cavort in that context ever again, but he was already out of the room. Sam sat down by the creature. What am I going to do with you? He said as he looked at it. The thing let out a noise and its eyes opened. Where, am I? Sam jumped back. The herpetipede had just spoken to him. Its voice was a sibilant hiss, but it was still very clear what it was saying. Can you understand me? The creature nodded at this. Were you the pink flesh that saved me? Pink flesh? Does it mean human? Ah, uh, yes. I was. My name is Sam. Do you have a name? I am Rax. Just Rax? No surname? Rax tilted its head. What is this surname thing? I am a fertilizer of my species, what need would I have for a surname? I didn't even have a normal name before something filled me with knowledge and intelligence, Rax said in his hissing voice. Fertilizer? So you what, help make more herpetipedes? I would find females and wait for them to lay their eggs before I fertilize them. Oh, I've heard about that before. We have some creatures here that do that. Rax nodded absently as he looked around the room. You saved me, so I want to follow you. Will you let me be your companion? Sure, but how do I do that? Sam asked. You need to add me to your party. Sam stared at the herpetipede. What, like a birthday party? Or something like in a game? How do I do that? You need to focus on me and imagine forming a bond between yourself and I. It should give me a prompt to join your party. Feeling a little stupid, Sam stared at Rax for a long time. With a chime, he received a new notification. Rax has joined your party. Sam opened up his status to see if there was anything there about a party. Sam Atlas. Human. Mortal tier. G rank. Class, none. Level 6. Strength. 16. Constitution. 12. Resilience. 11. Dexterity. 9. Intelligence. 9. Wisdom. 11. Health 120-120. Mana 90-90. Stamina 160-160. Skills, 1. Titles, 0. Marks, 1. Party, 1 asterisk. Sam selected the party button. Party, 1. Rax, level 6. Health 140-140. It was like the interface in one of those old-school RPGs, 
which Sam had expected, judging by the current bent of the system. A moment later, something strange happened. Chapter 7. Hello? Can you hear me? Sam almost jumped out of his skin. What? Who's there? It's me. Rax. We can talk mentally now that I am in your party. For some reason, it's as if I already was a part of the system. I know how to work it. I don't know why though. Sam closed his eyes and tried to connect with the reptile through the party link. It felt very strange, but he was able to extend a tendril of his awareness out through the system and into Rax's mind. Hello? Are you there? Rax nodded. Yes. I'm here, and I can hear you clearly. Sam was satisfied with this. It would be useful in a fight as there would be too much noise and distractions to talk normally, but talking mentally required no medium at all. Rax got off of the table, landing with a thud. Not only had the creature gotten bigger, he had gotten a lot heavier as well. They walked into the front room to find Jeffrey still working on his machine gun. Hey, check this out, Sam said. If it's that damn lizard again dash. I'm not a lizard. I'm a herpetipede. What the hell? Jeffrey jumped off of the seat and snatched up his shotgun from the floor. Cocking it, he pointed it at Rax. Before Sam could do anything, Jeffrey pulled the trigger. The shotgun fired with a deafening bang and Rax was blown backwards. No, why did you do that? Sam screamed as he rushed to the side of the lizard. He blinked. There were only a few shallow cuts. The bullets lay on the floor next to Rax, warped and bent. Checking his party list, he saw that his companion had only lost 20 health. This was the first inkling that Sam had about just how screwed humanity was. Never mind. He's fine. But how? Rax got to his many feet with a grunt. That scruffy human is quite the specimen. Aggressive, unkempt and mateless. Jeffrey and Sam stared at the lizard in astonishment. Sam started laughing uncontrollably. What? Was it something that I said? Ha! Huh. Jeffrey, you just got dissed by a lizard. Not a lizard, Rax said. The others ignored him. Jeffrey snarled at Rax, but Sam could tell that he had found it amusing as well. What are our plans? We can't stay in this shack forever. We need to level up. Sam said, trying to steer the conversation back to something more useful. Well, I was going to use this machine gun to take out some of them gremlins, but now that I saw how tough Rax was, it's probably useless. It's going to be inefficient to kill the gremlins anyway and we need to find some stronger creatures. Jeffrey answered. He threw the massive gun to the side in disgust, lifting it like it was a child's toy. Those weapons in the shed worked pretty well, Sam suggested. Wait, where did you get that healing crystal from? Do you have any more? Jeffrey shrugged. Some big bastard dropped it. It was shaped like a gremlin, but the thing was about my size. I gave it the good OL, double barrel treatment and then a few more times for good measure. It was very soft, but it seemed to empower the other gremlins around it. I remember that it had opened its mouth, like it was going to say something, but I shut it up real good. That's why I'm level 8. It pushed me up from level 7 to the next one. Sam was intrigued by the thought of the gremlin commander or whatever the thing was. Did you get a chance to analyze it? Sam asked Jeffrey. No, but my post-battle log said that it was a mature gremlin. So the small ones are basically babies? Jeffrey nodded. Sam wasn't sure about how he felt on the subject of killing baby creatures, no matter how vicious they were. Then he remembered the corpses in the town and his heart hardened. Well, they tried to kill us, so it's only fair that we kill them. Damn right, Jeffrey said. Sam and Rax left the shack, looking for some gremlins to kill. Jeffrey had stayed behind, professing that he needed to work on his gun. They walked for over twenty minutes before they found a trace of a gremlin, it was dead. There were no more in sight and Sam felt a chill run down his spine as he surveyed the empty woods. Suddenly, he was bowled over by something. He was about to stab it with his machete, but he saw that it was Rax. The lizard had pushed him out of the way of a crossbow bolt that had struck a small sapling, where it vibrated. He looked at the source of the projectile, a woman in tattered jeans and a t-shirt. She pouted as she looked at him. Pity, I guess I have to do this the hard way. The woman pulled out a katana from a sheath as she holstered her bow and advanced on Sam. There was no point in trying to negotiate with her, the woman was clearly a murderer, as evinced by the dried blood on her blade. A crazed look overtook her as she neared him. She then did something that Sam had only ever seen in bad anime shows. The woman raised the blade to her mouth and ran her tongue down it, before laughing maniacally. Turns out, humans give far more levels than those monsters. You and your companion seem to be quite the juicy treat. A red glow flared around her blade, only giving Sam a split second's worth of warning. The weapon flashed forwards, far too quickly for him to see, and it was only a desperate jerk of his body that made the blade miss his neck. Instead, it bit deep into his left arm, sliding through without a hint of resistance. 
He tried to strike back with his machete, but the woman dodged it. Panicked, he analyzed the woman. Lena Scarlet. Level 12. Human. She was double his level, and she had the skills to match it. It was very unlikely that he was going to survive this. She sent out her blade again, like a mosquito's proboscis searching for blood. Sam rolled away and the sword came down on the ground next to him. The blade stuck into the dirt, but she ripped it out with ease and reversed her grip. Sam was in a bad position and he was unable to dodge in time. He raised his hands desperately and something happened. A wave of blue energy rippled over his forearms and coated them with an almost transparent sheen of power. The sword crashed into them and he was sent flying backwards. Instead of having become a double amputee, all he had to show was a thin line of red running down his forearms. He knew that he couldn't use it again though, as his mana was almost out. The woman let out a disgruntled snort and she prepared to charge him, but Rax latched onto her ankle with his fangs. The snake centipede hybrid tore at her limb and a spray of blood shot out, covering the surrounding grass with a thick patina of red. The woman cursed and she backhanded the lizard, knocking him backwards. He rose, unsteady, but she ignored him. Ha, huh, I guess I misjudged you. I haven't found someone with any skill other than the analysis one so far. That means that you will give me a lot more power than the others. Just how many humans have you killed so far? Sam said, not really wanting to know the answer. Heh. I lost track after the first hundred. Sam felt sick. More importantly, a roiling rage filled his body. Humanity had to stay together if they were to survive, not turn on each other like rabid dogs. If this woman survived, she would cause havoc upon the world. Not only that, but there were probably many more like her out there. His veins started to pulse in time with his heart and he felt the world slip away. Chapter 8 Sam found himself floating in space, for the second time in less than a day. In front of him, an incredible scene unfolded. Two figures faced off, standing on nothing. They were talking to each other, but Sam couldn't make out the words. Finally one of them smiled in a wide rictus grin and laughed as a clone of himself appeared behind the other man. Sam drifted closer and closer to the fighters as the scene progressed and he could make out their faces. The man with the clone was a snake-like humanoid with narrow eyes and a slit instead of a nose. He looked like the epitome of evil to Sam. The other man was completely average in every way, save for his overwhelming presence. Sam noticed that he was surrounded by a shimmering dome of white energy and he could faintly feel something hammering on it. It was as if, simply by existing, the two men were creating a pressure in the space around them. If not for the barrier, Sam would have been blasted by the full force of that effect. With a raised hand, the pressure from the average-looking man surged and the clone shone with a bright light. It screamed in pain as white fire consumed it completely. The snake man's face contorted in fear, and he tried to back away. Something happened between that moment and the next, and suddenly the average-looking man had his fist through the snake man's chest. Strangely, there was no triumph on his face, only a cold sadness. The vision faded away, and Sam found himself back in the real world. He stared at the woman with a vacant expression on his face and she faltered in her charge. A ripple of energy shot out from his body and into the world around him, outlining the woman in a deep black aura. Immediately, his limbs filled with strength and he was the one charging her. She raised her sword to block, and Sam's machete came down on it. She resisted it, grinning as she did so, but his other hand snaked around the sword and grabbed her throat. Eyes bulging, she tore at his arm as he lifted her off the ground. She carved his flesh down to the bone, but still he did not let go. With a sickening crunch, her neck broke and he let go. His body filled with fatigue and he collapsed bonelessly to the ground. There were a few new things in his notifications, which he checked. Dao has been unlocked. Dao mode of the Arbiter. There are many different types of warriors in this world. There are the dishonorable, the stalwart of spirit and the desperate. Rarely do any find a true purpose in their journeys, simply looking for strength or other such ephemera. You have found your calling, the calling of justice. In your searing hate for those who act with evil, you find your absolution. In their deaths, you find peace. You feel no joy in their ends, but merely a sense of purpose. Such is the path of the Arbiter. Before he could think about what that meant, the next notification popped up. You have gained the skill lesser mana bulwark, rare. Infuse mana into your flesh to improve defense. You have gained the Tao skill, eyes of judgment, legendary. Your path dictates your purpose. Your purpose is to purge the world of evil. Upon use of this skill, enemies are laid bare to your sight, revealing their sins. You gain additional power against the sinful, but reduced power against the truly virtuous. These power modifiers only apply after the skill has been used. Finally, something appeared that made his entire being vibrate in shock. Waves of searing energy washed over his body as the notification surfaced. You have gained the title, 
Dow Paragon of the 10,239,428,157th universe, Celestial. You are the very first being in your entire universe to form a Dow. Plus 25% to all stats, rounding to the nearest whole number. Sam stared at the title in shock. It was far beyond anything he had expected. He had known that the mark would have given him a leg up in the creation of a Dow, but not to such a degree that he was the very first in the universe to get it. It seemed as if Tantalos was very interested in him indeed, contrary to what the mark said. He suspected that the man had written the description of that mark himself, to downplay his involvement. Sam remembered reading the Greek myths in school and one of the themes in it was that the gods were constantly interacting with mortals. Even someone who was immortal still experienced boredom and from the way that Tantalos had spoken to him the other day, he was his new toy to play with. Immediately, he felt a resonation in his soul at the thought, something stirred inside him, and it was angry. Nestled next to his core, there was a small package of something indescribable. It was like there was a concentrated mass of everything that the Tao of the Arbiter entailed. The package was connected to the rest of his body with infinitesimal tendrils of energy, which was how it was influencing his mental state. He knew in his heart that Tantalos Veravax was the true threat to this universe, the serpent in the tree, the Ean to his yang, the adversary. If this universe did not band together against the threat, then there would be no universe left afterwards. The idea that someone could destroy a universe was mind-boggling to Sam, but he knew that it was all too real. He had experienced the power of Tantalos for himself, the man had seized the entire population of the universe and spoken to them all at once. In addition, the monsters that appeared were most certainly not natural beings. They were coming from somewhere else, perhaps outside of the universe. As Sam stared ahead into the distance, thinking about the long and dangerous road ahead, a faint smile eased its way onto his face. This would be his calling, his path. He would become the strongest, so that he could protect those who could not protect themselves. He would be the shield that defended his universe, the horn that called the soldiers of the light to victory. These grandiose thoughts seemed to resonate with his Tao and he felt the small object grow a little bit larger. This was not related to his stats at all, as the Tao was a purely spiritual object. It was related to what he envisioned his path to be. The best translation that Sam knew was that it was his way. Chapter 9 He snapped out of his contemplative state and looked around him. Suddenly ashamed at how he had not even bothered to look out for enemies as he pondered his Tao, he ran towards Rax. The herpetipede was mostly unharmed, but he had some bruises lining his body. The insane woman who had tried to kill him had only struck the lizard lightly, in order to get him away from her. Most of her focus had been on Sam. With a start he remembered that she had pierced his arm through, but he didn't feel any bleeding. He must have leveled up during that fight. As if it had been suppressed before, his notifications came in. You have killed Lena Scarlet. You have leveled up. X3. Now that he had a baseline for how leveling worked, he saw that there was some sort of inefficiency in the system. Common sense dictated that if he killed someone who was of a higher level than him, he should level up to that level, if not beyond it on account of gaining the extra power. Instead, most of the energy that he got for killing something was leached away into thin air and was lost to him. When he saw the party link, he saw that some of it had in fact been diverted away from him, to Rax, but the herpetipede had only gained a single level, which was not enough to add up to the amount that he should have gotten. Sighing, Sam accepted it. It was probably some sort of tax from the system, in order to pay for its workings. Just the ability to level up at all was more valuable than a few missed levels. Sam and Rax stumbled back through the woods, and entered the shack. Jeffrey was snoring when they went in and the man woke suddenly as they entered, clutching his shotgun. Do you never have that thing out of sight? Jeffrey snorted. This thing has been my best friend for the last few years. Between this and my intimidating reputation, nobody has bothered me in a while. Well yeah, nobody was stupid enough to bother a madman with a gun. Really? That must have been pretty useful. Jeffrey nodded happily, not knowing what Sam was really thinking. Sam and Rax went to the back room and Sam changed his clothes. They were filthy from the events of the previous day and luckily Jeffrey had a closet full of clothes. Unfortunately for Sam, they were all what he would describe as redneck chic, but he put on the overalls and matching attire anyway. Beggars couldn't be choosers during the apocalypse. With his wardrobe change completed, Sam fell into his cot and slept. His entire body was sore and he felt as if he had just run a marathon. A bright white light cajoled him out of his slumber. Jeffrey? What are you doing with that light? A few voices conversed out of proper earshot of Sam. Someone started shaking him vigorously. He opened his eyes in annoyance and then saw that he was no longer in the shack. He lay on the floor of a vast atrium, filled with other people. A massive floating figure hung over the area, a humanoid being that was made up of starlight. 
The people who had woken him up smiled at him absently. Sorry, you really didn't want to miss the system announcement, a woman said to him. Sam bolted upright and stood up. The people around him made room for him and a man was about to say something, but then the lights went out. Greetings, humans of planet Earth. I called you all here to congratulate you. Out of the billions of people on your planet, you are the only survivors. Shocked whispers drifted around the atrium at this announcement. Not only that, but out of the various species of your universe, you have the largest surviving percentage. For that, you will all be rewarded. In the upcoming inter-universal tournament, you will all be given favorable seeds. Finally, it has come to my attention that one of you has formed a DAO. Not only that, but that it is the very first one in the universe. I implore that person to explore their talents to the fullest and most of all, trust nobody. Three expanded charts appeared in the air in front of them. A notification surfaced in front of Sam as well. Choose your display name for the planetary leaderboards. Underscore. Sam thought about what would be a good name for him. Obviously he didn't want to reveal his full name, so he needed a pseudonym. What better name than that of his Tao? You have picked the name The Arbiter. Other names started to appear on the leaderboards and after a few minutes, they were filled. A smaller version of them appeared before him and he read them. Levels Leaderboard. The Overlord, Level 18. Rodney Kane, Level 17. The Scourge of New York, Level 17. Phoenix, Level 17. Melissa Tang, Level 16. The Angel of Death, Level 15. Profound Visionary, Level 14. Elminster Judge, Level 13. Anonymous, Level 12. The Bear of the Motherland, Level 11. It was easy to tell stuff about these people from their names. The name of the third-place person sounded like a title to Sam, maybe one for clearing New York of monsters or something like that. The first place was pretty fitting, belonging to the Overlord. Some of the names were probably the real names of the people whereas the others were made up. He studied the next leaderboard. Dow leaderboard. One dot the Arbiter. He was the only one on it. A broad smile lifted his cheeks as he looked at it, drawing some stares from the other. He could hear a few muffled whispers coming from around him. Who's this Arbiter guy? He's not on the level's leaderboard. What's a Dow? Sam was very glad that he had chosen to conceal his name. The final leaderboard popped up in his vision. Overall power. 1. The Overlord. 2. Rodney Kane. 3. The Scourge of New York. 4. The Arbiter. 5. Phoenix. 6. Melissa Tang. 7. The Angel of Death. 8. Profound Visionary. 9. Elminster Judge. 10. Anonymous. After he finished reading them, two more notifications came up. You have gained the temporary title, Number 1 Dao, Planet Earth, Mythical. Plus 5% to all stats and plus 10% chance of a Dao breakthrough. You have gained the temporary title, Top 5 Power, Planet Earth, Legendary. Plus 2.5% to all stats. Temporary titles are titles that are dependent on some impermanent requirement such as the possession of an object. These titles were nowhere near as good as his celestial title, but they were still quite good. Sam poured through the leaderboards in depth and discovered that he could see the top 1,000 people if he scrolled down far enough. After a moment, the avatar of the system resumed its spiel. After one year, intergalactic teleportation will become available to purchase. After that, then the galactic, intergalactic, and universal leaderboards will come into being. Strive to get on those, for even the top million in the universe will receive great rewards. Achieve number one, and you will gain the opportunity for even greater power. Unfortunately, as part of the stipulations created by the ruler of this universe, Tantalos Veravax, travel into other universes will be banned for as long as he is alive. Merchants and faction representatives can enter this universe, but none of you can leave. Finally, in one week, there will be a tournament among the inhabitants of this planet, creating opportunities for regional governance to those who place highly, and the vaunted ability to create a faction for the top three placers. The figure vanished, leaving the people standing there. Everything that they had just heard was like a revelation about their true place in the universe. Sam tried to count the people in the room, coming to the disheartening realization that there were nowhere near the number of people on Earth there. There were probably close to 10 million, but that was it. Over 99% of the population had died already. And that was good compared to the rest of the rest of the universe. Suddenly, the fact that aliens existed wasn't that crazy after all. The humans were left to talk for a few minutes and then there was a flash of white light. Chapter 10 Sam found himself back in his cot. He got out of it, and entered the front room. Jeffrey was still sleeping. Immediately, he was filled with suspicion. If Jeffrey had just been there at the system announcement then why was he still asleep? A glint of something shiny was visible on his wrist and Sam stealthily moved over. 
there was an intricately designed bracelet that shone with power to his vision. Making sure that Jeffrey wasn't awake, he took it off. A patch of orange started spreading from the wrist and soon, the man was revealed not to be a human at all. He was some sort of bird-human hybrid and he had a large coxcomb on his head. Jeffrey continued to sleep, oblivious to Sam's intrusion. Sam picked up the shotgun from next to Jeffrey and cocked it loudly. Jeffrey awoke with a start and saw that Sam was standing over him with the gun. Hey Sam. What? Why are you holding that gun? Cut the crap. Why were you concealing your appearance? Jeffrey snorted as if to dispute what Sam had said, but then he noticed what had happened. Oh. Shit. He said as he looked down at his skin. Yeah. Now tell me what the hell you are before I send your ass back to KFC. Jeffrey sighed and sat back. Are you sure? It's a long story. Sam sat down as well. I have time to spare. Fine, it all started a long time ago. I'm quite a bit older than I look. My family is from another universe, one that has been part of the system for much longer than this one. They were part of the ruling class in the Salvinii system and I was the heir to my father's estate. Unfortunately, I was not the model noble that they were looking for. I was inclined to various depraved tendencies, most of which nobody cared about. However, I had a proclivity for going after women of all sorts, and eventually, I made the mistake of trying to seduce the king's daughter. The problem was that she was already engaged. Her fiancé, a monstrous enlightened cultivator, dragged me in front of the king and made me confess to what had happened. To save my own skin, and the reputation of my family, I chose exile. Not only from the Salvinii system, that was too little for those bastards, but to a non-initialized universe. As a result, I went from the peak of F rank straight down to level 1. I knew that it was only a matter of time before this universe was initialized, and luckily I retained my extended lifespan that my rank had given me. I adopted this persona of Jeffrey, and well that's where I am now. Jeffrey stopped talking, letting Sam digest his words. Well, he sighed, you haven't done anything that makes me not want to trust you, other than the concealment and I understand the reasons. As long as there aren't any other hidden bombshells, then you can remain with me. There will be a price to pay though. Jeffrey nodded eagerly. Name it, and I will pay it if it is within my means. I want you to tell me more about how the system works. Jeffrey raised his eyebrows in surprise. That's it? Oh, you really don't know anything about it, I am still used to my old universe, sorry. Sam nodded, to hurry the man along. Well, where to begin? I should probably start off with the next thing of import that you will have to deal with. At level 25, you gain a class. You have a choice between three different options. The first one is based on your personal experiences, the second one is also based on your experiences, but on a different one, and the third one is system battery. That last one is only visible for the first class selection process, after which another normal option is unlocked. System battery? What's that? Jeffrey laughed. The system is very aggressive when it comes to expanding its power. The system battery class is one that seems good on the outside, but it's really a thinly veiled trap. You gain what is essentially unlimited mana, hence the name, but all of it is inaccessible to you and you merely act as a recycler to channel the affinities out of the mana and back into the universe. The system is unable to process anything other than pure mana so it uses these batteries to do so. In addition, you turn into a vegetative blob, incapable of complex thought or movement. Because of this, the system only gives it as a choice to the weakest of cultivators, the newly initialized, so as not to waste ones who have the potential to reach the second class selection process. It would be very unlikely that someone who had reached that stage, while already having encountered that class, would end up picking it, but the system is a bit paranoid, I guess. Why the hell would anyone pick that class? Jeffrey shrugged. Some people are just idiots. The system uses this fancy language to disguise the true nature of the class and some people don't read past the first line, which of course says that you gain unlimited mana. That is akin to the juiciest of baits for new cultivators. Then there are the zealots. I wouldn't expect there to be any in this universe, but in the higher ones like my own, the influence of the Grand Unified Church of the Sacred System can be felt. Sam snorted at this. What kind of ridiculous name is that? It sounds like something a scam company would call itself. Jeffrey laughed. Hit it right on the head on the nail. That's exactly what it is. I would be careful about who you said that to though, if any of those maniacs heard that then they would lead a purge of both you and your home planet. Oof, well I gotta be careful then. How do things like that happen though? I would have expected something like that to have had widespread resistance against it. Ah, the idealistic attitude of the newly initialized. All that matters in the cultivating world is power. The reason that there aren't any resistance movements is that they have all been purged and the few ones that do exist are too small to have heard of. 
Sam's Dow started to pulse to the wild beat of a battle hymn, his mind filled with righteous anger and his gaze must have unsettled Jeffrey because the man flinched. Everything all right there, Sam? You look disturbed. It was nothing. Just my Dow responding to what you told me. Jeffrey choked. You already have a Dow? But it's been less than two days since the system came. It normally takes months for someone to make a Dow. Only the greatest of prodigies can make one in any less time. I've never heard of anyone, let alone someone new to the system, getting one so quickly. Sam clapped his hand to his mouth, but it was too late. At least he hadn't mentioned the mark. Jeffrey looked at him and the bird man raised a placating hand. It's fine, I won't tell anyone. Just remember me when you're the ruler of the universe, okay? Sam laughed at the ridiculous statement. What? That Tantalos guy is the ruler of the universe, not me. I think you're making a big deal about nothing. Jeffrey shook his head solemnly. No, I'm not. Tell me, did you get a title for gaining your Dao so early? Sam nodded. How much power does it give you? Or if you don't want to tell me that, is it over mythical rarity? Sam shrugged. I have no idea what the rarities are. It's celestial, whatever that means. Jeffrey fell off the edge of his bed. Sam walked over to check on him, the man was foaming at the mouth. He slapped him a few times and he got up. Are you all right? How? How is that even possible? That sort of rarity is like a myth. Nobody in my system ever had even a mythical rarity title, except for the king, and that was only a temporary one. Celestial rarity is something that only ascendants have. Ah, uh, sure. It really doesn't seem that special to me. Open your system and tell me what kind of stats you have, then we'll see if it's special or not. Sam complied, opening his interface. Sam Atlas. Human. Mortal tier. G rank. Class, none. Level 9. 6 stat points unspent. Strength. 22. 1.325x. Constitution. 16. 1.325x. Resilience. 15. 1.325x. Dexterity. 12. 1.325x. Intelligence. 12. 1.325x. Wisdom. 15. 1.325x. Health 160-160. Mana 120 slash 120. Stamina 220 slash 220. Dao, 1. Skills, 3. Titles, 1. Temporary titles, 2. Marks, 1. Party, 1 asterisk. Sam looked over the numbers, surprised at their new level. He hadn't really had a chance to test the effects of his title yet, but it seemed good. How many total stat points do you have? Jeffrey asked. Uh, wait a sec. Okay. I have 92 points plus 6 unspent ones. Jeffrey whistled. Yep. That confirms it. That is way more points than someone at your level should have. You should only have about 55 to 65, accounting for your original stats. You're going to be a monster when you get more powerful. Chapter 11. Sam let out a tentative smile. First things first, Jeffrey continued, we need to get some levels into you. Losing your advantage that you currently have would be criminal. If I'm not mistaken, the first of the stronger enemies should be coming. You will get more levels from them. Jeffrey took out his shotgun and checked it. It was already loaded from when Sam had it. Beckoning to Sam and Rax, he started to walk out the door. Oh, now that the cat's out of the bag, I might as well join your party. Why didn't you before? Sam asked. Being in a party overrides any sort of identity concealment device. It would have told you who I really was. Sam added Jeffrey to the party and took a look at the display. He was very interested in what he would see. Party 2. Torturna Salvinii Brescan, Level 8. Health 180 to 180. Rax, level 7. Health 150 slash 150. Sam laughed. What kind of name is that? Torturna? It sounds like some sort of knockoff pasta brand. Jeffrey grimaced. Look, I didn't make fun of your name. In my language, Sam is an acronym for a certain sensitive ailment that afflicts those who frequent establishments of ill repute. Sam stared at him blankly. Establishments that mainly operate at night. What, you mean a bar? My name means cirrhosis in your language? Jeffrey sighed. Let's just go with that. Sam was very confused by the roundabout way that Jeffrey had described what he was getting at, but he forgot about it as they sighted their first monster. This creature was far larger than the gremlins and it was quite disturbing. Two nubs of flesh were in the place of the creature's eyes and the rest of its face was completely blank. It was shaped like a person, but it had three spider-like legs and when it reared up to hiss at them, it revealed that it had a gaping, fong-lined orifice on the end of each of those legs. Sam gawked at the thing in horror. It was like something out of a nightmare. He sent off a quick analysis at it to see what he was dealing with. Juvenile Chimera. Level 11. It was of a higher level than the members of the party, 
but his Tao skill would even the odds as well as his titles. He was already far ahead of the curve when it came to personal power. That was why he was high up on the power leaderboard, but not on the levels 1. There had been another 990 names under the top 10, but he hadn't bothered checking it for his name. Most of the people on it were around level 10, which meant that the top people must have done something special to get there. He wanted to get access to whatever they were doing to grow so strong. With a start, he realized that if he hadn't killed Lena, she would have been near the top of the level's leaderboard. That realization disturbed him. What if the only way to get levels efficiently was to kill humans? He was surprisingly fine with killing now, before he would never have dreamed of it. Fighting for one's life had strange effects on the human psyche. He would not stoop to the level of killing innocents though. He would only kill those who were truly evil or if there was no other choice. The chimera hissed at them as they approached it, although Sam could tell where the noise was coming from on the creature's body. Because it lacked a mouth, the sound seemed to be created deep inside its body and sent out through its hand openings. It leaped forwards on its legs and landed in front of them. One went towards Sam, the other went towards Jeffrey and the third one was used to balance. This allowed Rax to flank the creature and he bit into its flesh, but did little damage on account of how tough its skin was. Sam fended off the hand and used eyes of judgment on the creature. It glowed with a black miasma of sin and he felt a new strength course through his veins. Sam reached out and grabbed the hand of the chimera, pulling it towards him, the thing hissed again and abandoned its attack on Jeffrey, choosing instead to bite at Sam. He ignored the small wounds that the gnashing teeth caused and instead used his machete to sever the arm of the chimera. It lurched backwards in shock and he closed in on it, bisecting the other arm. With blood spurting from its body, the chimera let out a horrific ululating cry. Thinking that this marked its defeat, Sam withdrew, but instead a noise started to grow in the distance. The sound of breaking wood and snapping branches started to approach them from the north. The chimera limped off to the side of the clearing where it expired from blood loss. Sam barely registered this, instead focused on what was coming from the woods. Jeffrey cowered beside him with his shotgun, cradled affectionately. The cracking noise reached a crescendo and a massive creature barreled through the trees and into the clearing. It had eight spider-like legs and a tiny fleshy body. Three massive tentacles extended from its gaping maw and dragged on the ground as if it was tasting it. Upon seeing the body of the chimera, it let out a rage-filled roar and charged the party. Jeffrey squealed and ran to the side, only to be picked up by one of the questing tentacles. Sam rushed to the beast and tore at it with his machete, but its skin was incredibly tough. Jeffrey screamed as the monster dangled him over its mouth and it began to lower him slowly down into it. Sam checked his mana, and saw that he didn't have enough to use his skill again. This would just have to be him against the beast. He had already allocated his stat points before they had left and he now had increased strength and resilience as a result. One of the tentacles blurred through the air and slammed into him, but he held on tightly and refused to let go. Like he was an annoying tick, the beast tried to dislodge him but all that it did was split its attention enough for Jeffrey to gain the vantage for a perfect shot. Unloading the contents of his gun, he fired directly into one of the creature's eyes, bursting the watery orb and causing the monster to screech in pain. Sam pushed off the tentacle and climbed up the body of the creature towards its head. It glared at him with its one remaining eye and opened its mouth. The sounds of churning liquid started up and Sam's eyes widened. He ducked down, narrowly avoiding a spray of stomach contents. Sparing a glance behind him, the vomit had started melting the grass and trees. It was highly acidic and would have melted his flesh off of his bones if he didn't watch out. He continued climbing the creature and he reached its head, dodging another flailing tentacle. Jeffrey seemed to have been abandoned in favor of him and he saw the bird man crawling along the ground into the trees. He redirected the force of the tentacle into propulsion for a mighty leap and he landed on the monster's head. With a cry, he sunk his machete deep into its other eye. Still, it was not dead and he continued to stab at it. Anguished cries came from the creature as he completed his bloody work and it lashed out with its tentacles at him. One of them caught him on his leg and he felt a dull crack. Hopped up on adrenaline as he was, he barely felt it. His blade cut deeper and deeper into the flesh of the monster and eventually it hit something hard. Gritting his teeth in disgust, Sam reached his hand down into the pulp eye matter and stabbed directly into the creature's brain. It swayed for a moment and then fell bodily to the ground. He jumped off it, but landed on his broken leg. A bright flash of pain consumed him and he blacked out for a moment. When he came to, his leg was still sore but was not broken. You have killed a juvenile chimera. You have killed a mature chimera. You have leveled up. X3. Chapter 12. The shot of healing energy from a triple level up was enough to heal his leg enough to walk on and he gingerly put weight on the limb. Jeffrey. He called out, to gain the attention of the other man. 
Rax padded over to him and pawed at his leg with his front limbs. The beast had largely been unharmed by the chimeras as they didn't see him as a threat. He was a bit bigger now though and Sam checked the party link to see if he had leveled up. Party 2. Torturna Salvinii Brescan, Level 10. Health 190-190. Rax, Level 9. Health 170-170. Both of the others had only gained two levels from that fight. Perhaps a party didn't share levels equally, but more of them went to the person who actually killed the monster. Jeffrey was still nowhere to be seen so Sam allocated his points. Not wanting to pull up his full status sheet every time that he leveled up, Sam imagined only seeing the table with his stats on it. To his surprise, it worked. Level 12. 6 stat points unspent. Strength. 26. 1.325x. Constitution. 16. 1.325x. Resilience. 19. 1.325x. Dexterity. 12. 1.325x. Intelligence. 12. 1.325x. Wisdom. 15. 1.325x. Looking at his stat distribution, Sam was happy with where his strength and resilience were. What he really needed now was more health and more speed. He knew that he would have to invest in the mental stats later, but for now his titles had increased them naturally. He evenly split the points between dexterity and constitution, nodding happily as his bonuses increased the points to four rather than three. Now he had 200 health and the speed of an Olympic sprinter. After the effects of the level ceased, he tested out his new power. He knew that his strength was high now, but he craved the feeling of speed that the dexterity would give. His feet flashed over the ground as he ran and he looped the clearing multiple times in the time that it would normally take to go once. Finally, when he had finished, Jeffrey came back. There you are. Where were you? Sam asked the man as he entered his line of sight. That damn beast broke my arm. Luckily you killed it or I wouldn't have healed. That thing was a lot stronger than creatures in this area should have been though. It must have been at least level 16, on account of its size and toughness. Its size has something to do with level? Sam asked. Yeah, a lot of monsters gain mass when they put their points into their physical stats. Only dexterity or mental-based ones remain the normal size. Haven't you noticed that Rax has been growing too? Sam nodded. He had noticed that. Would the herpetipede eventually be the size of that chimera? Sam had a brief vision of a planet-sized Rax, curling around Earth. He laughed at the thought. If you both reach the top of the enlightened tier, that might not be so unrealistic. Jeffrey said. Sam had forgotten about how party members could hear his thoughts when he was in it. They left the clearing and continued walking. They wanted to find somewhere where there were more people. Not to join up with them, Sam had no intention of exposing himself as the arbiter, but he hoped that there would be items for sale there. The system had said something about how merchants could enter the universe and perhaps there would be one of them at the nearest population center. Maybe he could ask them for more information. Jeffrey had provided quite a lot, but most of it was irrelevant to his life in this universe. The chicken man could write a dissertation on the subject of Rathnarian perfumers, but that was completely useless to survival. Sure, he knew a decent bit about the system, but it wasn't anything groundbreaking. The coating of chimera blood on Sam must have scared off the monsters in the woods because they were not attacked by another monster for the entire duration of their trip. Eventually, after hours of walking, a strange sight appeared. A beam of white light extended into the sky from a point behind the trees and illuminated the dusk sky. They made their way to it cautiously, not sure if it was an enemy or a potential ally. As they edged their way through the woods, they could make out what it was. A mile-wide patch of trees had been removed from the forest and in their place a shimmering dome of light was visible. Every now and again, monsters would slam into it, recoiling with flashes of light and a faint smell of burnt flesh. Inside the dome, they could see people moving about. Some were human, but there were a few that were totally alien in appearance. A gateway stood on the opposite side of the clearing and a set of turrets dissuaded any monsters from coming near. Every now and again, a party of people would walk through the gates and into the area. I think we should go in there, Sam whispered. Jeffrey nodded. They slunk around the edge of the clearing and approached the gateway. The turrets pointed at Rax briefly, but they seemed to realize that he was part of their group. The turrets pointed the other way and the gate opened slowly. They walked in and immediately felt the difference. The air inside was much warmer than the air outside and they could see why. Many cacti and palm trees lined the streets, but they were unearthly plants, most of a shade of deep red. People walked along the street, most of them clad in armor of some kind. Sam felt vulnerable in comparison to them, in his dirty overalls and shirt. Street hawkers called out their wares in strange accented voices. There were few humans working the stalls and most of the workers were aliens. 
Above each stall, a different emblem was visible and they all would call out a name now and again. By from the new Barcuhia Trading Company. Best wares in the galaxy, by Trojonia. They sounded like a typical market square, busy with vendors and patrons. The goods were not normal though. As Sam eagerly eyed up the exotic-looking wares, he realized with a sinking heart that he had no money. Chapter 13 Hey, Jeffrey? I don't have anything to buy stuff with. I doubt they take dollars. Jeffrey looked at him in surprise. You never checked out your credit balance? What? Tap your left wrist three times and it will come up. Sam followed his instructions and a small screen popped up. Credit balance 7,450. What the hell? Where did this come from? He said in shock. The system implanted it in you when you were having your core created. It allows you to collect money from certain monsters and people that you kill. Is 7450 a lot or a little? Jeffrey shrugged. Back where I came from, it was nothing, but in a newly initialized universe, you could probably get some good stuff. You shouldn't have that much though, unless you were killing a lot more monsters that I saw. Sam thought about where the credits had come from before he realized. Oh, that's why. I killed this woman who had killed hundreds of people. She told me that it was just for the levels, but she was probably in it for the cash as well. I must have gained her credits when I killed her. Hmm, if she was as flagrant a murderer as you said, perhaps someone placed a bounty on her? Where do I find bounties? Sam asked. In a town like this, they probably have a local division of the Bounty Hunter Guild. If someone left a bounty, then they will reward you for it. They searched the town for the building and eventually found it. Tucked away in a small alleyway, the door to the guild was ajar. They walked in and into a different world. Sunburnt men and women, wearing utilitarian clothes of a drab color, aliens with strange guns strapped to their belts, it was like a scene out of a sci-fi movie. At the very front of the building, a large hologram of a board was visible. On it, there were a list of names next to a credit number. He surveyed the top 10 and found something very disturbing. 1. The Arbiter, 100, 000 credits. There was a bounty on his head, and it was a lot of money. He was so glad that he had made a fake name for the leaderboards or he would probably have been dead by now. Jeffrey saw it too, but he wisely concealed his reaction. He read down the list and looked for Lena Scarlet. The other top 10 people were the people on the overall power list with the ones under it people that he had never heard of. Lena Scarlet was in the 153rd place with a bounty of 5,000 credits. Sam walked up to the board and tried to figure out how to claim the bounty. A person stood behind the desk, a green alien with prodigious tusks and an underbite. Sam immediately thought orc. When he scanned the man, however, it said that he was actually a Terravarian. It was only a coincidence that he looked like an orc. Still, Sam decided to refer to them as orcs, it was less of a mouthful. Oi. What the eld you think you're doing? The orc called out. Scanning me without me permission. The orc even spoke exactly like Sam had expected. Sam winced. He had not intended to offend the orc. Sorry, I just wanted to know what species you were, you look like something I've seen before. That was the wrong response. The orc puffed up in rage and started to scream. Filthy human. I'm gonna cave your skull in. Let me guess, all Terravarians look alike to you? Goddamn racist. Whoa, whoa, that's not what I meant. Look, I'm sorry. I was just curious, that's all. Multiple people were staring to stare over at them by now and he could see a few people edging their way over. This pinky causing you trouble, URG? Another orc said as he walked up, glaring at Sam. Asshole scanned me without me telling him he could. I ought to teach him a lesson. So should I, URG, but we can't. He's a freshie, so we're not allowed to attack him. System rules. The orc sighed and stormed off. The new orc continued to glare at Sam. Now look what you've done. Gone and upset URG, that's what. Sam groaned. This was not what he had expected coming in here. I came here to collect a bounty. On Lena Scarlet. I killed her a day ago, but I don't know how to claim it. Upon hearing that he was here on business, the orc softened a bit. All right. Just place your hand on this scanner and it will detect if you possess any remnants of her essence. The orc pulled out a circular metal device and placed it on the table. A hologram of Lena Scarlet appeared over it and Sam placed his hand down. The scanner beeped and went green and he received a system notification. You have received 5,000 credits. The orc nodded at Sam and walked off to the back of the shop. The unfriendly looks that he was getting, especially from the orcs in the area, ushered him out rapidly. He made his way over to Jeffrey, who was shivering. Come on. Let's get out of here. After they left the shop, Jeffrey let out a deep breath. You really have a knack for trouble, don't you? We would both have been smears on the ground if you weren't new to the system. Those orcs were both F rank. F rank? Why are they here then? They were part of the Bounty Hunters Guild. They were here as representatives. 
Most guilds and sects want to get a foothold in new universes, even if they are just going to be eliminated eventually by someone like Tantalos Veravax. Also, you should look into him. I've never heard of the man before, but he seems to be strong. A merchant might sell some information packages if you're lucky. Look, there's one right now. Jeffrey pointed at a tent that was manned by a purple humanoid with four arms. They walked over and Sam began to talk. Hey, what are you selling? I have some credits to burn. The vendor snapped his fingers and a system display appeared in front of Sam. Jirank Healing Crystal, 500 credits. Small Jirank Essence Crystal, 750 credits. System Guide, 1000 credits. Dodge, Common Skill 1500 credits. Factions of the Multiverse, 2500 credits. Medium G-Rank Essence Crystal, 5000 credits. Basic Weapon Knowledge, Uncommon Skill 7500 credits. Large G-Rank Essence Crystal, 10, 000 credits. Dao Guide, 50, 000 credits. Sam perused the list of wares, stopping when he saw how expensive the Dao Guide was. Hey, why does the Dao Guide cost that much? I only have a few copies of it. The system doesn't like that sort of information getting out to people who haven't worked to get it, the purple alien replied. Would you be interested in my other goods though? Yeah, where can I find out more about Tantalos Veravax? The other man shivered at the name. Um, I'm not sure if I can help you there. If he somehow catches word, then I will be hunted down. Actually, I should get going now. I left the, uh, stove on back at home. The merchant had suddenly become incredibly nervous. Just help me out on this one. I will pay extra if you want. The merchant was still reluctant, but when he heard how many credits Sam had, he became less so. I can add on the information to the Factions of the Multiverse Guide for an additional 10,000 credits. 10,000? The information can't be that dangerous. The most I'll do is 5,000, and I want you to throw in the system guide as well. The vendor vacillated for a moment before he sighed and acquiesced. Fine, I'll do it. In all actuality, the man was probably getting a great deal, but Sam didn't mind that much. You are being requested to transfer 7,500 credits in exchange for System Guide and Factions of the Multiverse. Accept? Y slash N. Sam hit yes and the money was sent from his credit balance and into the other man's. Two crystals appeared in his hands and he placed them in his pocket. He was about to thank the merchant, but the purple-skinned man had already packed up and left somehow. Chapter 14 Ha, that was some smooth bargaining, Jeffrey said. Almost as good as my great-uncle the lawn. That man could cut the costs of interplanetary tariffs by half. Anyway, I see a certain food stand that is calling my name. Why don't you go and absorb those information crystals? Before Sam could answer, Jeffrey was already gone, speed walking towards an unmarked building. With a swish, he opened the door and was inside. It did not look like a food stall to Sam. He had more important things to do though and he walked over to a bench to sit at and use the crystals. Rax followed him over and the herpetipede sat down by the seat on the ground. The creature had gotten a few looks on the way, but he was far from the most exotic beast either. A lot of the aliens had their own pets of wildly varying types and a couple of the humans had their own monsters as well. Rax was a lot bigger than most of them though, except for a pig-like monster with six legs that followed an orc around. It was about the size of a minivan and it looked as if it could break through an iron wall with its massive tusks. Strangely, none of the creatures seemed to be aggressive and they all placidly trotted along. Sam realized that Rax hadn't spoken to him since they entered the town and he checked on him. Rax? You alright? Sam? Why where am I? Everything is so blurry. What? Is there something in the air? Sam asked, but Rax did not respond. The monster didn't look like he was in pain or anything, merely tired. He left Rax be and picked up his crystals. The first one that he wanted to use was the system guide. Remembering how he had used the health crystal, he crushed the thing in his hand and a burst of information entered his brain. It displayed itself like a rolling wall of text and he took it in. System Guide, Basic Edition. Section 1, Stats. Section 2, Classes. Section 3, Leveling Up. Section 4, Parties. Section 5, Ranks. Sam selected the first entry and more information came up. The stats are one of the most important things in the life of a system user. They are quantified notations of the user's physical and mental parameters. Strength influences lifting capacity, physical output and stamina. Dexterity influences physical speed and reaction time as well as agility. Constitution influences the amount of damage that the user can take before death as well as health. Resilience influences the physical durability of the user and how much power is required to damage them. Intelligence influences mental processing power, memory and the ability to multitask, as well as mana capacity. 
Wisdom increases one's ability to detect traps, anomalies, and to succeed in their pursuit of higher ideals such as the Tao. All of that was exactly as Sam had expected except for the last one. Wisdom had seemed like a useless stat to Sam but now he saw that if he pumped it, then he could potentially develop his Tao more quickly. It was a balance though, as doing so wouldn't give him any tangible benefits in the meantime. He opened the next entry, the one on classes. A class is a tool that a system user can use in order to gain power more quickly as well as to gain more powerful skills. Upon level 25, the accumulated potential of the user grants them the ability to dedicate their journey to a specific path. Upon reaching the rank, there are three choices given. Two of them are based on one's personal accomplishments and ideals whereas the last one is a noble path that only the bravest of souls take. One who takes the system battery class is among the more pure and selfless of the inhabitants of the multiverse and in return they gain limitless mana. Sam could see what Jeffrey had meant. If not for his advice, Sam might well have been tricked into picking the system battery class. It seemed as if the system had written this guide because of the way that it described it. Likely, it also prevented information about the class from being spread freely. Laughing at how dishonest the description was, he continued to read. Upon defeating an opponent or in certain cases breaking through in your knowledge of crafting, a system user can direct this energy to leveling up. Leveling up grants the user an amount of power to direct towards improving their stats. Every rank you have the opportunity to upgrade your class. The amount of stats that you gain per level is based on your rank and your class. So that was why he was only getting 2 points per level. It had seemed pretty low to him, but it would probably become exponentially higher in the future. The next informational segment was on parties. You can form a party with up to 4 other members. Be sure that they are trustworthy for nothing can be hidden within a party. The minds of the members are connected, making it trivial for a telepath to intrude upon one's innermost thoughts. To combat this, entering a party overrides any sort of identity concealment device that one might possess so do not create a party lightly. The members share essence from monsters on a ration based on their contribution. There is a minimum amount that one can receive, so be careful about those who would seek to profit off of your hard work. Finally, and the one that he was looking forward to the most, there were ranks. He had wanted to know what exactly G rank had meant. Every set interval of levels, one must complete a trial to reach the next rank. Ranks are divided into four tiers. Firstly, there is the mortal tier. Those within this are of the G and F ranks. A level 1 system user is the same in power as a non-initialized being. Next, there is the enlightened tier. Beings within the E and D ranks are in this tier. Thirdly, there is the ascendant tier. This is made up of C and B rank. Finally, there is the divine tier. This is solely reserved for a ranks. Each jump in rank grants a large increase in power and each jump in tier increases it even more. The information on the ranks was pretty sparse, and Sam had already surmised as much from seeing that the ranks were organized by letter and from listening to Jeffrey. All in all, the information had been quite useful and he was glad that he had picked it up. Before he could break into the package about the multiversal factions, a loud noise came from the building that Jeffrey had come out of. That was my wife, you goddamn chicken. A burly human screamed as he threw Jeffrey bodily out of the window in a spray of glass shards. He scurried over to Sam and the man followed him with his angry gaze. If you ever come back here, I'll get you, the angry man said with a raised fist. Sam stared at Jeffrey. What was all that about? Jeffrey squirmed. Eh, it was dark, you humans all look alike, how was I supposed to know that she wasn't one of the workers? Sam facebombed. Please don't tell me that was a brothel, he said in exasperation. I'm afraid it was. Sam grimaced, if this caused problems for him later, he was going to have some serious words with Jeffrey. They found a room for the night and Sam found himself thinking about the massive bounty on his head. Eventually he was able to fall asleep, but it took a lot of effort. Chapter 15 The number two and number three strongest humans on earth sat on opposite sides of a table. Both of them were from the U.S., and they were currently situated at a derelict hospital in New York. After the system had created the leaderboards, they had decided to find each other. Rodney Kane was the one who had sought out Andrew Monroe, the self-styled scourge of New York. As Rodney sipped on a glass of whiskey that had been recovered from a mostly intact bar, he listened to what Andrew had to say. My sources tell me that the Arbiter is currently in the States as well. After we put up the bounty for him, as expected, a lot of false reports came in. Those people were dealt with, but a few of them had promise. In Outpost 70 AD, one of the towns that the aliens set up, someone reported that a man was seen looking intently at the bounty listing for the Arbiter. That on its own was nothing special. 100,000 credits is a lot of money, but he then collected the bounty for Lena Scarlet, a well-known human hunter. 
She was infamous for almost wiping out her town in search of levels and if not for her untimely death, she would have been on the leaderboards by now. The fact that the man was able to defeat her means that he is quite powerful and even if he is not the one we seek, he could be valuable. Rodney listened intently to the other man's story. He knew the importance of details, after all those were what had led to his imprisonment for ten long years. He had been the leader of a massive criminal organization, spanning multiple states, and he had been put away because he had forgotten to change his shirt the day after a particularly vicious heist. Such a small thing had led to one of the detectives on his trail finding out who he was. He remembered her screams as he had exacted his revenge on her. The woman had lost her opportunity to level up by deciding to protect a group of survivors from the gremlins. Weak from the exertion, she had been helpless against him. The fact that he was over five levels higher than her had helped as well. He smiled absently as he remembered wreaking havoc upon the entire institution that had put him away. There was no trace of the district court that had imprisoned him, nor was there one of the prison that he had been put in. Ironically, it was his imprisonment that had led to him being able to become so powerful. He had been placed into a low-level prison for white-collar crime and when the system came, he had utilized his murderous talent to kill every single inmate there. When the gremlins broke in, he had slaughtered them utterly. On the other hand, Andrew Monroe had been a high-level government official before the arrival of the system. He would not say what exactly his job had been, but he was just as ruthless and dangerous as his companion. Their goal was to create a new order for planet Earth and the first step was getting rid of the competition. In various places across planet Earth, Phoenix, also known as Lara Toth, sped over the cracked cobblestones of the historical district of London. When the system came she had been an employee at a dog daycare establishment. The advent of the system had led to her gaining a special skill, one that gave her great aptitude for the taming of beasts. With her army of high-level dogs, she had swept through the city like a storm, gathering survivors and creating an army to withstand the onslaught. Like Rodney Kane and Andrew Monroe, she too wanted nothing more than to find the Arbiter. If not to eliminate him, to discover how to create her own Tao. Melissa Tang trekked through the snowy wastes of the far north. She had lived in Yellowknife before the arrival of the system and had been far away from the center of the city when the monsters arrived. She had later discovered that more monsters spawned in greater areas of concentration, causing her to leave her city for the safety of the wilderness. With a canny instinct for survival and a host of high-end hunting equipment ransacked from an outfitter, she had made her own kingdom up in the frigid cold, one forged on the corpses of a thousand monsters. With a few survivors at her side as well as a near-sapient polar bear that she had named Sweetie, they eked out a passable existence there. In the most shadowy recesses of the Vatican, the Angel of Death sat in silence. He had been the mysterious head of the exorcism branch of the Catholic Church and as it turned out, banishing demons translated well to killing monsters. In a warped version of the original faith, he and his followers had created the Church of Scouring Flame, one dedicated to the eradication of all things demonic and profane. He had a real name but this current one suited him well as it encapsulated his purpose perfectly. On the highest peak in the Himalayas, the man known as Profound Visionary sat. Since the advent of the system all he had done was contemplate the new order of the universe and his place in it. His followers had brought him a steady stream of monsters to kill, and he had gratefully partaken. Once the abbot of a secluded monastery, he was now seen as the living incarnation of the Buddha. Utilizing a lifetime spent in silent contemplation, he was the closest to forming a Tao out of anyone living on earth save Sam. Elminster Judge, the man who had made peace with the monsters, sat in the middle of a gremlin den. Before the system had come, he had been in a mental institution, sent there for his delusional schizophrenia. When the first monster came into his room, he had thought it yet another figment of his imagination and had simply ignored it. When it started to devour him, he ignored it. After a while, the gremlin realized that this human was different. Through the mysterious processes in which a monster digested human flesh, the gremlin had been instilled with a spark of sapience, but also madness too. With the help of his new friend, Elminster Judge had created a vast army of monsters that helped him cement his position in the region. Finally, the person known as Anonymous sat at the very top of the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world. The monsters had thrown themselves at the door of the building for hours on end, but when they left, the true monsters were revealed. Clad in a blank white mask, Anonymous had slaughtered their way down the building, cleansing it of any semblance of life save their own. Now Anonymous waited for the monsters to leave so that they could bring their gifts to the rest of the world. Chapter 16 Outside of Outpost 70 AD Sam and Jeffrey ran out of the gates of the town that they had been in. After a few more misunderstandings caused by Jeffrey, they had been told on no uncertain terms to leave or die. Sam turned on Jeffrey and glared at the man for a solid minute before he caved in. Okay, 
fine. I was an idiot. I shouldn't have gone back to taunt the man whose wife I accidentally assaulted. Happy? No, I'm not happy. If it wasn't for the fact that I was stronger than that man, you would probably be dead right now. What kind of idiot acts like you do? Jeffrey smiled. A very attractive one? Jeffrey, if you want to be more attractive, then you should put that concealment device back on. Nobody wants to go out with a giant chicken. The other man sighed and snapped the bracelet back on. His fake appearance slid back over him and he shuddered. Damn, I forgot that feeling. I was in human form for years without ever taking that off. Now looking a bit more normal, or as normal as two humans and a many-legged snake, could look, they walked off into the woods in search of shelter. Sam wanted to create a more permanent base to stay in and Jeffrey agreed. There was no way to really contact most of humanity now, until the first of the tournaments. All there was to do was to level up. The woods were surprisingly sparse of monsters and there were only a few ones of any note. They fought their way through three more of the mature chimeras and many more of the juveniles. His leveling speed had started to really slow down by this point and took all of the kills to take him from level 12 to level 13. Both Rax and Jeffrey had been catapulted up to level 11 by the hunting expedition and they were far more efficient in the field. Sam was the main damage dealer though, on account of his higher level and his Tao. Because monsters would indiscriminately kill, they all were marked as evil in his skills eyes and he gained a large bonus against them. The woods seemed to never end and Sam was sure that there had been no forest this large in the area that he had lived before the system had arrived. It had done something to earth, but Sam couldn't tell what. It was as if everything had been made larger, which might have been true, but that seemed like a huge amount of effort to go to. Considering that the power of the people in the multiverse was far beyond anything here though, it might not have been as ludicrous after all. As it was, they took days to leave the forest and by the time that they got out, Sam had reached level 15. Upon reaching that level, he had received a notification. In light of your possession of a Dao and unusually high stats for your level, you have been given access to skill branches early. Normally one only gains these upon getting a class, but you are worthy. 75 skill points available. Branch of the body. 5 available skills. Branch of the mind. 4 available skills. Branch of the soul. 3 available skills. Branch of the weapon. 6 available skills. Branch of the ruler. 4 available skills. Sam clicked on the first one and a large menu popped up. Iron body, 0 slash 100. Increases the overall durability of your body by a small amount. Increased blood flow, 0 slash 50. More efficient flow of blood allows for faster movements. Iron bones, 0 slash 50. Strengthened bones resist damage. Lightning neurons, 0 50. Greater neural transmission speed increases reflexes. Muscle density enhancement, 0 slash 50. Muscle density enhancement allows for a greater effect for placing points in the strength stat. You can purchase progression in a certain skill by using skill branch points to fill the number. Upon filling it for the first time, the skill is unlocked and continued progression will increase its effect. You have 75 skill points. From looking at the last number, Sam assumed that he received 5 skill points per level. The only question was what to enhance. He had enough points for one of the latter enhancements, but not enough for Iron Body. Did he want to save up for the more powerful effect or use the points now for a noticeable difference? He would have to wait until level 20 if he wanted to go the first route. Sam eventually decided to go for the latter option. He needed power now, and it would be a good test for what the skill branches did. Sam picked the muscle enhancement option. Right now, strength was his highest stat and increasing it was a good idea. Increasing it in a way that allowed for the investment in other stats was even better. He transferred the points, bringing it up to the required total. Muscle Density Enhancement, 0 slash 100, Level 1. Muscle Density Enhancement allows for a greater effect for placing points in the strength stat. The next level grants a further increase. Sam could feel his muscles writhe beneath his skin and they started to compress slightly. His body felt more powerful, but it had also become more slim. Jeffrey turned around and he raised an eyebrow. Huh? Did you suddenly lose weight or something? I gained access to something that was called a skill branch. I picked one that increases my muscle density. Does it really make me look smaller? Jeffrey did a double take. Wait what? You need to be level 25 to get access to that though. I didn't tell you because it would just have been confusing. How did you get access so early? The system told me that I was strong enough to unlock it early. Wait a second, I need to check out the other branches. Branch of the mind. Superior brain, 0 out of 100. Increases your processing capacity and memory through total brain enhancements. Mana processing, 0 slash 50. Adds a small percentage to your mana total. Neural net, 0 50. 
greater brain connection to neurons makes it easier to control your body. Mental link aptitude, 0 slash 50. Greater efficiency of party links. None of those were particularly interesting to Sam, so he checked out the next branch. This one had the fewest skills available, but as he read them, he saw why. Branch of the soul. Dao resonance, 0 slash 250. Greater chance of Dao breakthroughs. Karmic cycle, 0 out of 100. Unlocks the karma stat, which may allow for additional effects. Lucky, 0 slash 100. Greater chance of favorable effects. This branch was very powerful, but it required a lot more skill points to unlock. The effects were impressive, but Sam had no idea how something like luck could be turned into a quantifiable thing. Surely the system wasn't powerful enough to increase luck on an individual level? For now, that didn't matter as he lacked the required amount of skill points to unlock it. He moved on to the next branch, that of the weapon skills. Branch of the weapon. Basic weapon knowledge, 0 out of 100. Increases innate knowledge of how to use a weapon. Basic weapon knowledge, blades, 0 50. Increases innate knowledge of using a bladed weapon. Basic weapon knowledge, blunt, 0 50. Increases innate knowledge of using blunt weaponry. Basic weapon knowledge, unarmed, 0 slash 50. Increases innate knowledge of fighting unarmed. Basic weapon knowledge, projectile, 0 slash 50. Increases innate knowledge of using projectile weapons. Basic weapon knowledge, atypical, 0 slash 50. Increases innate knowledge of using atypical weapons such as whips. Sam recognized the first skill. It was the same one that the vendor had offered for 7,500 credits. He was glad that he hadn't bought it, because he could save up for it with his skill points instead. That was if he even wished to have the skill, because it was unlikely that he would need to use every weapon type there was. Sam had been using a machete for a while, but he disliked the weapon. It was hard to use his strength through it and he needed something like a mace or a hammer to really capitalize on his power. Maybe something to look into after he found another settlement. The final skill branch was the most obtuse but it seemed to be keyed into a different skill set because the others were for direct fighting. Branch of the ruler. Or of command, 0 slash 150. You exude a field of authority that subconsciously manipulates those around you to be more open to your suggestions. Honeyed words, 0 slash 50. Your words become more persuasive. Charismatic presence, 0 out of 100. Your presence inspires those allied to you while instilling fear in your enemies. Knowledge of the court, 0 slash 75. You are more comfortable in situations regarding politics and you are more likely to say the right thing at the right time. That tree seemed geared to non-combat system users, but the third ability seemed to be useful in battle as well, but only for those who led armies. Sam was happy with the choice that he had made. It provided an immediate tangible benefit and it was relatively cheap too. Chapter 17 At that point, none of the monsters in the woods dared to attack them again and it was quite hard to find anything to kill. Luckily, they happened upon something that would help them level up more quickly. Rax was the one who had noticed it first. As they trudged along the grassy ground of the forest, the herpetipede had seen something out of place. Initially, he had thought nothing of it, but as they drew near to the thing in question, he had told Sam what he had seen. It was a strange knot of wood that had a gaping hole in the middle of it. From the back it just looked like a warp tree, but from the front it was clear that something else was going on. The hole seemed to have no bottom and when Sam tentatively put his hand into it, it vanished from his view. He withdrew it, thankfully still possessing his hand. Jeffrey whistled. There's already one of these here? This planet must be progressing pretty quick. Sam, can you check the leaderboards again? Unsure of what Jeffrey was on about, he pulled up the leaderboards again. Levels leaderboard. The Overlord, level 23. Rodney Kane, level 21. The Scourge of New York, level 20. Phoenix, level 20. Melissa Tang, level 18. The Angel of Death, level 17. Elminster Judge, level 15. The Arbiter, level 15. Profound Visionary, level 14. Anonymous, level 14. The level's leaderboard looked mostly the same, except for the fact that Sam was now on it and that some of the people had switched around. As soon as he checked it, he received a system notification. You have gained the temporary title, Top 10 Levels, Planet Earth Epic. Plus 10% ease in leveling. That explained how the top people on the leaderboard were progressing. They had a title that made it easier for them to do so. If he had a 10% bonus, then the top three people would probably have something like a 25% one or even more. That would be a life changer in terms of gaining power quickly. The next one was where he was shocked. Dow leaderboard. 1. The Arbiter. 2. Profound Visionary. Someone else had actually managed to create a Dao. 
for them to have done so without the help of a mark like Sam meant that they were a true prodigy in the realm of the Tao. The final leaderboard had one change as well, because of the new Tao wielder. Overall power. 1. The Overlord. 2. Rodney Kane. 3. The Scourge of New York. 4. The Arbiter. 5. Profound Visionary. 6. Phoenix. 7. Melissa Tang. 8. The Angel of Death. 9. Elminster Judge. 10. Anonymous. The person known as Profound Visionary was now up to the top five places. He turned to Jeffrey and told him what he had seen. Someone else gained a Tao recently. They called themselves Profound Visionary. Jeffrey winced. That's not good. With a name like that, they probably had a history of meditative journeying even before the system came. If you don't watch out, they might steal your spot as number one. Two Daos within the first week of initialization on the same planet is not normal. That must have accelerated the rate of development of the planet. Rate of development? What do you mean? Sam asked. You've noticed that your planet's star is further away, right? Well that's because the planet was made larger. It's also why we've been stuck in these woods for so long. Why didn't you tell me about any of these things before? There's no point. There are so many things that I could tell you and you wouldn't even remember most of them. Sam sighed, but he knew that Jeffrey was right. Fine. But what is this thing then? When there is a sufficient saturation of power on a planet, the system starts to create dungeons to put some order into the chaos as it were. Otherwise, monsters would start to spawn in greater and greater numbers, continuing to increase the cycle. Dungeons are formed out of pure mana and they hold great danger but also great rewards. Inside, there are a lot of monsters and a single dungeon boss. In some large dungeons there are many bosses, but we won't have to worry about that here. Dungeons are scaled to the planet's level so we should be fine seeing as you are on the leaderboards. So what, we just go in? Jeffrey nodded. Sam checked over all of his goods to make sure that he was ready. His stat points were all allocated, his information crystal was safe and his machete was sharpened. With a deep breath, he walked into the dark portal. A moment later, he appeared inside a small stone room with a door and a window. His companions appeared next to him a moment later. Outside of the room, the noise of growling and screeching could be heard. You have entered Planet Earth Dungeon, number 7. All right. This is the safe zone. We should be fine here until we decide to leave it, Jeffrey told Sam. Sam nodded to signal that he understood and he walked over to a small window set into the wall. Outside of the room, complete chaos reigned. Hordes of small rat-like creatures darted across a grassy savanna while large hyenas ran around trying to catch the rats. Every now and again, they would succeed and a rat would meet its end, squealing loudly. On the other hand, hyenas would occasionally be separated from their fellows and the rats would swarm them, buying them under the weight of their numbers. In the distance, a few miles away, a solitary mountain stood, with a massive cave in the middle of it. Rumbling snores emanated from the opening and a faint sense of menace was in the air. Sam made sure to stay quiet, even though there was no way that the creatures outside could detect him. Well, what do you see? Jeffrey asked. There is a large group of small creatures fighting against a force of larger beasts. They've been at it for a while and both sides seem evenly matched. Jeffrey groaned. It's one of those dungeons. Let me guess, the boss is at the end of the dungeon? Well, there's a cave in a mountain and it seems as if something is asleep in there. Jeffrey nodded. That's where the boss is then. In dungeons like these, you have to choose one side to fight on. After one group of monsters is wiped out, then the boss will come out. Sam nodded and grabbed his machete. With a thumbs-up signal to Jeffrey, he opened the door. The noises redoubled in intensity and he had to cover his ears as he was assaulted by the deafening cries of the monsters. They ignored him for now and he deliberated on which group was better to ally with. He observed the fight for a few minutes and saw that it would be best to work with the rats. If he tried to fight them, then it would be a battle of attrition rather than of skill. He would get swarmed by them before he could do much because he had no ranged skills. With that in mind, he dashed forwards and brought his machete down on the skull of one of the hyenas. It cried out in pain as his weapon took a sizable chunk of skin and bone off of its head, but it wasn't dead yet. It charged at him with a manic howl and bit at his legs. He dodged the attack with a well-timed jump and landed on the hyena's back. With a yell, he stabbed the machete into the hyena's spine, severing it and ending the monster's life. Now that he was closer to it, he could see that they weren't really hyenas. They each had four eyes instead of two and their tails were topped with a stinger. Now that he had declared his intent, the rest of the hyenas charged towards him. The rats took advantage of the lull in attentiveness, dragging down many of the hyenas, but the majority reached Sam and started to attack him. Jeffrey and Rax caught up to them and started to join in. Jeffrey with his shotgun and Rax with his teeth. Chapter 18. Sam took a moment to use his Tao skill, 
but to his surprise, nothing happened. All of the monsters were marked as being neutral in his vision, which he supposed made sense because they had never had an opportunity to do anything that would be considered evil. He cancelled the skill, cursing the loss of mana, and returned to melee combat. His machete quickly showed that it was not up to the challenge and by the fifth hyena, it had snapped in half. He kept the handle because it was connected to a jagged piece of metal, but found no use for it now. Sam was forced to tear at the hyenas with his hands, until he realized that he could use his mana shield skill as a bludgeon. With his hands covered in blue energy, he cracked skulls and broke bones with every swing of his fists. Jeffrey ran out of ammunition eventually and he was forced to use the shotgun as a club. He was less powerful than Sam, so he took more damage and after 15 minutes, he was limping. For the first time since the system came, Sam was reaching the limits of his stamina bar. A feeling of heaviness started to come over him as he continuously attacked and he fought to overcome it. The rats seemed to have his back and as he finished off one of the hyenas, the rats took care of one that had snuck up behind him. There were still many of these hyenas left alive and the other rats moved towards them and Sam followed suit. Jeffrey and Rax joined in as well and together they wiped out the hyena horde. When the last of the hyenas breathed its last, they heard a deep rumbling roar come from the dark cave entrance. A crash shook the dungeon as something struck the ground. A massive paw extended outwards from the shadow and onto the ground. The rest of the body followed and a titanic bear stepped out of the gloom. It let out a deafening roar and stared its enemies down. The rats chittered and ran en masse towards the bear. It snarled at them and then opened its mouth. It continued to open past the point that a normal mouth would and a small ball of roiling energy started to grow in it. With a thunderous roar, a solid mass of reddish energy expanded outwards in a half dome. When it struck the rats, they were atomized instantly and only a few made it through. They leaped up in the air and sank their teeth into the bear, to little effect. It jumped forwards and rolled, crushing the rats beneath its bulk. Then, with the nuisances extinguished, it turned its gaze towards Sam and his companions. There was a small spark of intelligence in the bear's eyes and it looked at them for longer than a mere animal would have. Sam felt a crawling sensation inch its way up his back and the reddish glow of the bear's eyes brightened. Then a change took over the bear. One of its legs lengthened into a whip-like appendage, another one sunk into itself, revealing a cannon-like limb that immediately clicked into place, a ball of condensed blood forming inside it. The tail of the bear fell off and it started to writhe on the ground, nodding itself into the shape of a small creature. The bear growled again and pushed off of the ground with its back legs, propelling itself at speeds that belied its size. Sam charged forwards and jumped as the snout of the bear came near, landing on top of its head. It started to shake in order to pry him off, but Sam doggedly held on with his free hand. He raised the jagged half of the machete up and sent it crashing down. Rather than cutting into the head of the bear, the machete finally gave up the ghost and shattered into a million shards on its head. Sam sat there for a moment and cursed. The bear seemed to have lost interest in him and it dashed towards Jeffrey. The man screamed in terror and threw himself into a hasty roll. The back leg of the bear caught him and sent him into the air. Jeffrey let out a scream that was cut off when he struck the ground. Sam winced, but the other man seemed fine and Sam continued to lay into the bear with his fists. Rax and the tail beast went at it with each other and the herpetipede was giving it as good as he got. His opponent was hard-pressed to deal with the many pairs of claw-tipped legs that Rax had and it writhed in pain as it took multiple claw slashes. It seemed to have some sort of resistance to damage on account of its unique nature, but Rax was doing a good job of whittling it down. The bear let out a growl of annoyance and pointed its cannon at Jeffrey and Sam was treated to a comical sight, as the bird man made a grotesque facial expression. The cannon went off and the bear jerked backwards as a spring-like mass of ligaments propelled the ball of blood forwards. It sped through the air, at a speed not quite that of a bullet, but quite close. Jeffrey was just about able to dodge, but it cracked open on the ground, raining a mist of blood on the area around it. Jeffrey screamed as a drop of blood touched him and ate away at his flesh, the bear chortled in mirth and reached up with its elongated claw, slashing at Sam. He only just got his hands up in time and he used his shield skill to blunt the damage of the bear. It cracked through his skill almost immediately, but rather than being pulverized by the attack, he only suffered a few broken ribs. He rolled on the ground as he landed only to be struck by the claw of the bear, sending him into the air and away from the battle. As he got up with a groan, he saw the bear standing over Jeffrey with its claw pressing into him. It seemed to smile as it pressed down slowly, exulting in the pain that it caused him. Sam roared in anger and used his skill, seeing that the bear was covered in a mass of rolling black energy. It had made a mistake by acting in such a manner around Sam and his skill triggered. His body filled with energy as he charged the bear and he uppercut it with a mana-coated fist. 
Its jaw slammed shut with a crash, sending flecks of blood flying. The sound of cracking teeth echoed over the dungeon as the bear tottered backwards and Sam followed up with a devastating kick to its stomach. That did the trick and it fell over backwards where Sam pounced at it, with his fingers curled into a claw. Where his machete had failed, he succeeded and his hand sunk deep into the eyeball of the bear. He thrust his hand down and grabbed onto the ocular bone of the bear, planting his feet and pulling. Anguished groans came from the beast, but he felt no mercy for it. It had forfeited its right to a noble death after it had harmed his friends. With a sickening crunch, he tore the bear's skull out of its head, instantly killing it. Chapter 19 The bear and the rest of the corpses around the dungeon faded away into mist and a rush of power entered Sam. Three items clattered to the ground where the bear had lain and Sam rushed over to them. A small version of the bear's paw lay next to a miniature model of its blood cannon. Finally, a set of the bear's teeth lay on the ground, faintly glowing with a red light. Sam checked on his companions before he picked the items up. They were both on the ground, but out of exhaustion rather than anything else. Both of them had leveled up during the fight, and Sam had as well, but he was going to wait to see it. He picked up the first item and analyzed it. Juvenile Dire Bear Mace. G-rank Weapon, Mace. A mace fashioned after the paw of a juvenile dire bear. As it served as a devastating weapon in life, so it functions as one after death. A small amount of the spirit of the bear lingers inside it, allowing for a once-a-day use of the innate power of the mace. Weapon Skill, Dire Bear's Roar. Once per day, you can trigger the effect of the weapon. A blast of energy will erupt out of the mace in the direction of your enemies as well as boosting your physical stats for one minute. Dungeon Drop, Awaiting Soul Bond. The weapon looked promising to Sam and he had a strange feeling when he realized that this was exactly what he was looking for. Had the system read his mind to create the perfect weapon for him as a reward? As he looked at the other weapons, he saw that they seemed tailor-made to his companions. Ursine Blood Cannon. G-Rank Weapon. Gun. A gun fashioned after the natural adaptations of a juvenile dire bear. It functions much as the original bear's weapon did, shooting condensed balls of blood. This drains the user's mana pool. If the special ability is used, the balls can be supercharged. Weapon Skill, Blood Shot. You can spend health to add damage to the shots of the weapon. Dungeon Drop, Awaiting Soul Bond. Ursine Jaws. G-Rank Weapon, Atypical. These small versions of a juvenile dire bear's jaws can be placed on top of the user's teeth, empowering their natural bite strength and damage. Weapon Skill, Chomp. Once per day, increase damage and strength of a single bite by 100%. Dungeon Drop, Awaiting Soul Bond. Sam carried over the weapons to his companions, as he had no idea what he was supposed to do with them. Jeffrey smiled as he approached. Ah, that's good. Dungeon weapon drops are quite rare. Do you see anything to your fancy? Sam hefted his mace and showed it to Jeffrey. He then tossed the gun to Jeffrey and the teeth to Rax. The birdman examined the weapon thoughtfully for a moment. Then he smiled. I've heard of this in Legends before, but I've never expected to encounter it in real life. It is said that when one is marked by the attention of the system, they are personally guided by it. The chance of us all getting uniquely tailored weapons from a dungeon drop is too rare to be just chance. I'm really glad that I decided to stick around with you. Rax growled appreciatively as he slotted the teeth in. They looked menacing as he mimed chomping into something with them. Huh, it must have been the Dao thing. Would being the universal first for something enough to garner the system's attention? Jeffrey nodded. Most definitely. Also, when are you going to soul bind that weapon? It's going to dissipate if you leave it for too long. Sam grasped for the weapon in panic. How do you soul bind it? He said hurriedly. You need to spill a drop of your blood on it. Here, like this. Jeffrey slid his finger on a small spike on the gun, letting the drop of blood drip onto the barrel of the cannon. The weapon glowed for a moment and then went back to normal. Sam used one of the claws at the end of the weapon to cut himself, surprised at how easily it cut into him. He had increased his resilience by a decent amount and he had found that normal weapons were hard-pressed to harm him. He dropped the blood onto his mace and gasped as a strange feeling overtook him. The mace sent a wave of energy into his hand, moving up and down his body before going back into the weapon. Congratulations, you have soul-bound this weapon. Now that he didn't have to worry about the mace, he asked Jeffrey a question. You said something about the weapon disappearing? Why would that happen? The system doesn't like the idea of people getting their hands on powerful dungeon weapons without earning them. If someone like you tried to soul bind an E-rank weapon, then it would burn your soul out from the strain. Even if it didn't then it would be very hard to wield. Higher tier weapons tend to be ridiculously heavy. Of course, not all weapons of the same rank are made equal, but the higher end ones are very hard to get. Sam nodded, that made sense to him. Perhaps the system wasn't as bad after all. 
Suddenly, the sky started to crack and a black mist started to pour into the dungeon. Jeffrey's eyes bulged. Damn it, I lost track of time. Quickly, to the safe room. They ran across the rapidly fissuring ground to the room and threw themselves into it as the world behind them crumbled away. With a flash of bright light, they found themselves outside of the dungeon. Sam and the others let out a sigh as they collapsed to the ground next to the dungeon entrance. What was that? Sam asked Jeffrey. Dungeons collapse after they are cleared, sorry, I forgot about that. I haven't been in a dungeon for decades. Sam shot a look at Jeffrey. Decades? Just how old are you? I know I don't look it, Jeffrey said, smiling, but I'm over 300 years old. Sam was hit by a feeling of crushing despair. You said you were F-rank before you came here, right? Jeffrey nodded. Yeah, why? Damn, if it took you that long to reach that level, then I really am screwed. This universe only has 100 years until the forces of an ascendant are coming. I don't really know how strong Tantalos Veravax is, but he's probably pretty powerful, much more powerful than I can get in a century. Didn't you buy that information crystal from a merchant with information on him, why don't you read that? Sam nodded, he had completely forgotten about that. He pulled out the crystal and was about to use it, but then realized that they were in the middle of the woods. Jeffrey, can you guard me when I'm reading? Of course. I'm level 13 now. Did you check your logs after the battle? Sam had forgotten about those. He quickly opened up his system interface and checked. You have killed a mature Darian Dingo, X-17. You have killed a juvenile dire bear. You have leveled up. X-2. He had gained more levels from that one fight than he had in the last few days. That bear had been no joke, it was only because of his skill that he had been able to even the field of battle. It had been a bit since he had checked his stat sheet and he pulled it up. Sam Atlas. Human. Mortal Tear. G rank. Class, none. Level 17. 4 stat points unspent. Strength. 26. 1.325x. Constitution. 16. 1.325x. Resilience. 21. 1.325x. Dexterity. 16. 1.325x. Intelligence. 12. 1.325x. Wisdom. 15. 1.325x. Health 160 160. Mana 120 120. Stamina 260 260. Dao 1. Skills 3. Titles 1. Temporary titles 2. Marks 1. Party 2. Skill branches 1. Chapter 20. Because of the way that his title worked, there was no point in placing single points into a stat anymore. It took at least two points to increase it by the 1.325x multiplier that he had from his various titles. Now his resilience was his second stat over 20. With a quick bit of mental math, he saw that he could get his strength over 30 if he put three of his points into it, but then he would have a floating point. Instead, he made an even split between strength and constitution. More smashing power and more health, what wasn't there to love. The format of the system was kind of annoying to him as there were some floating variables that didn't have much information with them. He knew that it was for the best as his stat list would be way too long to read otherwise, but it just seemed incomplete. With a small effort of will, he changed the format to make it a bit more streamlined. Sam Atlas. Human. Mortal Tear. G Rank. Class, None. Level 15. Strength. 29. 1.325x. Constitution. 19. 1.325x. Resilience. 21. 1.325x. Dexterity. 12. 1.325x. Intelligence. 12. 1.325x. Wisdom. 15. 1.325x. Health 190-190. Mana 120-120. Stamina 290-290. Dao. Dao mode of the Arbiter. Skills. 1x Common, 1x Rare, 1x Legendary. Titles. 1x Celestial. Temporary Titles. 1x Epic, 1x Legendary, 1x Mythical. Marks. Mark of Tantalos Veravax. Party. Torturna Salvinii Brescan, Level 13. Health 200-200. Rax, Level 12. Health 210-210. Skill Branches. Muscle Density Enhancement, Level 1. Sam nodded to himself in satisfaction. That looked a lot better than the last one had been. He had made it so that if he needed to, which was unlikely, he would be able to expand the sections that dealt with his skills and titles, while still being to keep track of how many he had and how powerful they were. With that all done, he took out his information crystal and used it. Immediately, his brain was flooded with information. 
This one was a lot larger than the system guide had been and the table of contents appeared in front of him. Factions of the multiverse, only factions of the B rank or higher are included, for the sake of relevancy and mental capacity. 1.B rank factions. I.low B rank factions. 2.mid B rank factions. 3.high B rank factions. 2.a rank factions. I.mid A rank factions. 2.high A rank factions. 3.the Dark Star Conquerors, Addendum. Sam saw that the information on Tantalo's Veravax had indeed been added, under the name of his faction. He opened the entry and began to read. The Dark Star Conquerors are a relatively recent, on a multiversal scale, faction that have become somewhat infamous on account of their leader, Tantalos Veravax. Known as the Butcher, Veravax has adopted an unconventional cultivation path. Rather than following more orthodox methods of cultivation, Veravax has taken to the practice of slaughtering whole universes for their power. Only a powerful C rank faction like this one could ever hope to do such a thing. Rumor has it that he is stuck on the bottleneck of the cusp of the B-rank and wishes to break through into the B-rank proper. Even as a C-rank, his power is higher than a decent fraction of B-ranks and he is feared in many sectors of the multiverse. While frowned upon by many more powerful beings, this practice of harvesting universes has been allowed to continue and has spawned a host of imitative groups that replicate the method but on a smaller scale. So far, this group has harvested the energy of over a thousand universes. Sam closed his system interface to check if anything was happening outside that he needed to check in on. All that was happening was that Rax was receiving a few belly rubs from Jeffrey. He smiled and went back into the information log. Factions of the multiverse, only factions of the B rank or higher are included, for the sake of relevancy and mental capacity. 1.B rank factions. I.low B rank factions. 2.mid B rank factions. 3.high B rank factions. 2.a rank factions. I.mid A rank factions. 2.high A rank factions. 3.the Dark Star Conquerors, Addendum. This was a great chance for him to learn more about the multiverse into which he had been initialized. He wanted to start from the bottom, so he selected low B rank first. Low B rank factions, for the sake of clarity, only the top five are included, as there would be thousands otherwise. 1.the Samsara Raiders, a group of pirates who follow the tenets of the karmic cycle. 2.The Olivian Confederacy, a merchant group made up of the various kingdoms of the Olivian sector. 3.Elantora Science, a dynastic kingdom made up of the sons of the self-proclaimed Golden Emperor, Elantoras. 4.The New Multiversal Order, a heretical branch of the Church of Potency, an offshoot of the Grand Unified Church of the Sacred System, who claim that a grand culling of the multiverse must be ordained, in order to direct essence to those who deserve it. So far, they have not succeeded. 5.The Green Horde, a massive conglomeration of various Terravarian tribes, who roam the deep interbrainal space looking for a worthy battle. Each of these had a link to more and more information, which Sam selected for the first one. Immediately, a historical account of the groups appeared, but as he noticed after a few minutes of reading, it did not contain anything that could be seen as private information. For example, the Olivian Confederacy had suffered a public relations scandal millions of years ago after one of their higher-ranking nobles had gone on a genocidal killing spree of lower-ranked universes. Of course, nothing had been done about it by the authorities, but the group itself eventually reigned their scion in, never to be seen again in public. Other than those details, nothing else was said, especially the names of anyone involved. He would leave the nitty-gritty stuff for later, all he wanted right now was a brief overview of the factions. All of this stuff was intensely diverting, and he had to be careful not to spend too long looking at it. The next group were the mid-B ranked factions. Mid-B ranked factions, for the sake of clarity, only the top five are included, as there would be hundreds otherwise. 1.Altorias the Undying, a unique faction, this one only has one member. Altorias is an immensely powerful undead who has perfected the art of fractal cloning, allowing him to create a near-infinite army of his own clones. Altorius is connected to all of these clones by a hive mind link. 2.The Order of the Inviolate Dao, an offshoot of the Grand Unified Church of the Sacred System, this order is dedicated to the perusal of the Dao in order to prove the supremacy of the system over all else. None of their members are warriors, but researchers who seek to find the ultimate Dao. Their efforts have been in vain. 3.The Biologic Hegemony, an order of genetic researchers who seek to create the ultimate life form. Their studies have led to the creation of countless monstrosities, such as the chimeras. 4.The Alchemists Guild, a group of alchemists from across the multiverse who seek to create the ultimate potion, one of immortality. A group of idealistic fools, they are persecuted by the true immortals of the multiverse who do not wish for their secrets to be shared. 5.The Minorian Sect, 
a group of rogue cultivators whose perversions of morality have drawn the wrath of the rest of the multiverse down on them. Most will choose death rather than submit to their foul ministrations. As Sam had suspected earlier with the system guide, the system was the author of all of these missives. No impersonal narrator would call any group idealistic fools unless they had a stake in their oppression. Most of this stuff went straight over Sam's head, he had no idea of the context, but it was illuminating stuff nonetheless. He was on to the final part of the missive. High B rank factions. 1. The Adventurers Guild, a confederation of dungeon delvers, fighters and all sorts of practitioners of the warrior's path, this group contains the vast majority of all professional mercenaries and soldiers for hire. 2. The Tartarians, with a multiverse's worth of people, there is a multiverse's worth of felons. As to the question of where these are to be housed, the Tartarians have the answer. The foremost experts in security, the greatest wardens in the multiverse, the Tartarians will guard your prisoners for a fair price, contact today for more information. 3. The Prophets of the Machine God, a group made up of those universes that were especially technologically advanced before the advent of the system, these people seek to take control of the system itself for their own foul ends. Spurn these foul heretics, for they are the epitome of evil. Killing them will give additional rewards. For the isolationists, most empires seek to expand outwards into the multiverse, but the isolationists prize quality over quantity. They reside in only a single universe, but are the furthest thing from weak imaginable. Would-be conquerors seeing a seemingly weak target ripe for the picking have found their empires dismantled utterly by teams of high B-rank cultivators. Every member of the group has the power of a galactic ruler in their own right, and the leaders are far beyond most others. Sam had thought that targeted advertising would have vanished after the apocalypse, but apparently not, as shown by the Tartarians. The number of factions between the two ranks had dropped drastically. There was probably some sort of criteria for being considered a certain part of a rank. He felt a small connection to the description of the isolationists. Was that the key to survival for their universe? He knew that he was getting ahead of himself, thinking so far into the future, but he had no inclination to try and create a multi-universal empire. This was the height of hubris, thinking about things such as this, but on the off chance that he did succeed, it would be worth it. Before he told his companions about what he had found, he checked out the final section of the guide. The one with the A-rank factions. Mid-A rank factions. One dot the Grand Unified Church of the Sacred System, the preeminent faith of the multiverse, the church is controlled by its true masters, the cardinals and the Pope of the Church, who live further up inside the boundless expanse. Second only to the creator kings in power inside this multiverse, they are not a force to be trifled with. Those were the people that Jeffrey had told him about. He had known that they were strong, but he hadn't expected them to be the second most powerful faction in the multiverse. Finally there was the last faction. High A rank factions. One dot the creator kings, the most powerful faction in the multiverse, the creator kings are the undisputed rulers of it. The 99 most powerful beings in the multiverse banded together trillions of years ago to form a ruling body for their holdings. This led to the formation of this faction. All other factions, save for the Church of the System, answer to them in some capacities. Chapter 21. With that, he had finished the guide. The fact that his perceived greatest enemy was barely a speck of dust compared to the more powerful forces in the multiverse was a very disheartening thought. It was a thought that he ignored for now, instead reporting to Jeffrey. All right, Jeffrey, I found what we were looking for. Tantalos Veravax is the head of a C-rank faction called the Dark Star Conquerors. They have apparently harvested other universes before this one and there is no hope of outside salvation. We are on our own. Jeffrey sighed. Why the hell did I have to pick this universe to go to? The man whined as he started walking. Sam didn't answer and he followed Jeffrey further into the woods. Finally, after what felt like days of traveling, they came across something extraordinary. A verdant valley filled with exotic plants that Sam didn't recognize lay before them. In the very center of the valley, a majestic tree stood, its branches enfolding a good portion of the valley. It gave off a subtle aura of peace and serenity and Sam felt an instinctual draw to it. He resisted the urge long enough to see that the tree was surrounded by what looked to be hundreds of monsters, ranging from the lowliest gremlins to one of the huge chimeras that they had fought before. Strangely, none of them were fighting amongst themselves, instead basking in the light of the tree. Sam and Jeffrey snuck closer, and Rax made his way down there. They assumed that he would be mistaken as another monster by the ones already there and would be allowed to pass in peace. They were right and he settled down by the tree. A moment later, Rax talked to them through their link. This is amazing. It's like I'm being fed the raw essence of reality. I feel as if I could almost touch the underpinnings of the universe. It sounded to Sam as if the herpetipede was high. 
but Jeffrey had a different reaction. In the name of the system, it's a natural treasure. Sam looked at the man. What? What do you mean? Jeffrey stared at him with a frantic look on his face. This could be what takes us to new heights of power. Sam waved his hand at the man. What is it though? He said, a little annoyed. A natural treasure is an accumulation of essence that has formed into something related to the natural world. They have all sorts of effects, but this one seems to be the rarest one of all, a Tao tree. It speeds up the process of creating and expanding a Tao, making it easier to develop one. In addition, the less people that are using it at one time, the more benefit they each get. It could even provide as much as a 50% boost. Sam was salivating by this point. If this was all true, then they had just lucked into the find of a lifetime. He recalled Rax and the herpetipede walked up the hill back towards them. A few of the monsters gazed after him in suspicion, but none of them followed. When he was back, Sam asked them all what to do. How are we supposed to do this? There's too many monsters there to fight. Jeffrey responded immediately. What about our weapons? My one allows me to supercharge it, and from what I had seen during the battle with the dungeon boss, it had acidic blood. If this weapon can replicate that, then it could produce an effect far beyond our individual strengths. Sam nodded. My one allows me to project a wave of force outwards from myself. It has a secondary effect too, but that isn't as important now. It can only be used once per day though, so we will have to be judicious in its usage. With that, they began to hatch a plan. Jeffrey would snipe the largest clusters of monsters from the hill, hopefully drawing them up towards them. Sam would wait until they were surrounded, before using the weapon ability. By then, theoretically, they could mop up the stragglers. They waited until the monsters had become sluggish in the warm light of the afternoon sun, and then Jeffrey struck. He hefted his gun and pulled the trigger. As he did so, a cloud of reddish energy was siphoned out of him and into the gun. He grunted in pain, but held on. The cloud continued to grow in size and Jeffrey's skin became waxy and pale. Just when Sam was about to wrest the weapon from his hands, Jeffrey stabilized. A beach ball-sized orb of blood shot out of the incongruously small opening of the gun, streaking towards the monsters. It landed with a loud splash and doused the creatures around it in blood. An unholy screeching erupted from the monsters who had been struck by the attack and Sam could see their skin melting away from where he was. The other monsters woke up immediately and got on their feet. Jeffrey staggered as he raised the gun again. This time, a cloud of blue energy was siphoned out of him and a smaller orb of blood was launched. This one targeted a cluster of gremlins and they were instantly melted away by the power of the acid. By then, the monsters had triangulated their position and the first of them were running up the hill. Sam watched as they bounded along, and he waited until he saw the first one's approach. With a few swift kicks, they were sent tumbling down the hill, taking their allies with them. This allowed for the rest of the horde to catch up and they moved en masse towards them. Sam grinned, it was working exactly as he had planned, Rax growled and sank down close to the ground in preparation to attack. As the main bulk of the monsters approached, Sam widened his stance and started to whirl his mace around. Skulls crunched beneath his weapon, bones broke and limbs were torn apart. Despite all that, it barely did anything to stem the tide. His body was soon covered in wounds and yet the monsters still were not close enough. He roared and used his mana shield ability, buying himself time. Luckily for the other members of his party, the monsters only seemed to have eyes for him and Jeffrey and Rax had already left the battlefield. It was unlikely that the mace ability would harm them, but it was better to be safe. When Sam thought that he was about to die, the last monster crested the hill. With a triumphant shout, he used his ability. A dome of energy expanded outwards from his mace, pulping the weaker enemies and heavily injuring the stronger ones. A fire was kindled in his muscles and bones and he felt a surge of energy soak into him. Like a man possessed, he erupted into a storm of carnage, wiping out monsters left and right with his mace. Veritable rivers of essence entered his body, but he felt them transform into something else, a bellows for the flame in his soul. With a primal shriek, he smashed his mace down on the ground. A blinding flare of light expanded outwards from it and he saw nothing more. Chapter 22 Out of the blackness, a scene emerged. A man stood on a barren plain, facing down an army of golden-armored warriors. Each of them exuded a palpable aura of carnage and power, but they paled in front of the man. A billowing cloud of wrath seemed to warp the air around him and he breathed in deep, heaving gasps, as if consumed by the fires of a boundless rage. One of the golden-armored warriors called out something to him in a language that Sam did not understand. He was surprised by that, as even the aliens he had encountered had been intelligible, but he listened anyway. A loud laughing noise erupted from the army and they pointed at the man in mirth. The breathing grew even heavier as the ground around the man started to buckle. 
Sam was briefly transported to another vision, this time one of the angry men standing over the corpses of a woman and two children. He screamed out to the heavens in pure anguish, and something answered. His body writhed as a pillar of energy shot down from on high, filling him with power. Even as he rose, with the ground melting around him, his body started to break apart. He looked at himself in surprise and seemed to forcibly calm himself. Now, with the army in front of him, the pillar touched down again. The air around the man evaporated from the sheer heat coursing off him and he moved faster than Sam could see. The ground where he had stood vanished from the force of his movement, revealing a hole that extended down to the core of the planet. A tidal wave of lava poured out of the hole, covering the ground around it. Such a sight paled in comparison to what was happening with the man however. The true scope of the army had been revealed and Sam's mind was almost crushed by the sight of billions of people standing side by side. A storm of projectiles shot out from their ranks, completely blotting out the sun, but the man snorted and struck the ground with one of his hands. Some of his flesh burned off as he did so, but a boil of earth and rock shot up, disfiguring the land for miles around him. The projectiles clattered off of it with pinging noises and the dome sank back into the ground. The man was revealed again and he flashed forwards yet again towards the army. His fist came down and a swathe of the golden armored soldiers were atomized. His movement sped up and the army started to fall apart before him. It was a race against time and as he moved, his body started to disintegrate. There were still so many of the soldiers left and he was unable to reach them by the time that his body was gone. With a final flash of energy, a moat of pure light formed where the man had died. Everything went black and white as the moat shattered, releasing a titanic shockwave of force that ripped apart the planet and destroyed the thousands of spaceships that surrounded it. With that, Sam was forced back into reality. The ground around Sam was covered in the mutilated corpses of the monsters. His body was a patchwork canvas of blood and split flesh and his mind was utterly exhausted. A system notification pulsed in his vision and he wearily selected it. You have gained a new Dao. Dao mode of anger. Anger is one of the most potent tools in a warrior's arsenal. With it, he can ignore the pain of his wounds, bolster his own strength and convince himself to do that which would normally be unthinkable. Most eventually lose themselves to their rage, consumed by the fires of their own making. Pray that that does not happen to you. He could feel the presence of some beast slumbering deep within him, waiting to be unleashed. It was nothing compared to the man in the vision that he had witnessed, but it was potent nonetheless. Unlike with his first Tao, there was no skill to accompany it. Blind rage was not a skill in its own right, only a means to an end. He would have to temper that rage if he wanted to master it. Jeffrey and Rax watched him with fear in their expressions and as he walked over to them, they flinched. Well what was that, Sam? Jeffrey said in a tremulous tone. I got a new Tao. I guess that as I killed the monsters, the aura of the tree became more powerful and it helped me to create it. Combined with my natural aptitude, it pushed me over the edge. What Tao was it though? Jeffrey asked. The Tao of Anger. Jeffrey made some sort of sign with his hands. You walk a dark path, Sam, be sure that it does not consume you. Sam sighed and rubbed his head with his hand. His entire body felt like an open wound and he wanted nothing more than to sleep for days on end. They ran down the hill and towards the tree. As they neared it, Sam started to feel the power of the natural treasure in effect. It was exactly as Rax had described, an aura of connection to the rest of the universe. His daos flared into prominence and he felt his own connection to them grow as well. With a sigh, he breathed in the rich air of the glade and walked over to the tree. The feeling reached its zenith as he stood next to it, and he saw to his surprise that there were three rainbow-colored fruits hanging from the tree. He nudged one apprehensively, causing it to fall from the tree and into his hand. It felt slightly warm and he analyzed it. Jirank Dao Fruit. Jirank Magical Item. The product of a Dao-aligned natural treasure, this fruit will give the user access to a basic Dao, or will heighten their connection to one of their own ones. Such a fruit can only be used once per rank. Jeffrey wandered over with an inquisitive look on his face. What's that? He asked idly as he approached. It's a Dao fruit. Jeffrey's eyes widened and he ran the rest of the way. A Dao fruit? Really? When he analyzed it for himself, Jeffrey screamed in delight. Sam was confused. What? It only grants access to a basic Dao. It's still a low rank. Jeffrey ignored him. I can finally reclaim my Dao. Jeffrey shouted. Then he looked at Sam with a shifty look on his face. How much do you want for it? Sam was confused. How much? I thought you didn't have any money. Besides, there's another two fruits anyway, you can just take one of those. Oh. Ah, uh, forget what I said, Jeffrey told Sam as he grabbed one of the fruits off of the tree. He sat down in a cross-legged position and bit into the fruit. 
a golden juice spilled out and over his lips and a drop landed on the ground. Sam's eyes locked onto that droplet and he had to contain himself from leaping at it. It produced an aura of refined power that he knew would take him to new heights if only he the droplet soaked into the ground and the urge disappeared. Sam was left blinking in confusion. He stared at Jeffrey who was in the process of swallowing the last bite of the fruit. The other man opened his mouth as if to say something, but he fell silent and his pupils dilated. Sam shook his head around, but Jeffrey didn't respond. Sam sighed and picked the other fruit from the tree. He wanted to use his one right now, but it would be a waste of the fruit. On its own, it would not be enough to take him to the next stage of Dao Mastery. Instead he would have to save it until he was almost there. He knew someone else who did need a Dao though. Walking over to Rax, Sam held out the fruit to the beast. Here, eat this. What is that, some kind of fruit? Rax responded. It will give you a basic Dao, Sam explained. The herpetipede looked at the fruit for a moment and then shook his head. No, I can feel that this fruit is not right for me. There is a reason that the other beasts did not eat these. They knew instinctively that they would not work. Monsters develop their connection to the universe differently than sapients. We don't have ranks of Daos like you, rather we gain access to their abilities as we evolve. So thanks for the offer, but you should keep that. Sam looked at the fruit in his left hand and put it away. All right then, you know more than me about your own body. I'll sell it I guess. The herpetipede traipsed off, leaving Sam with his thoughts. Immediately, he began to wonder how to leverage this tree to his benefit. Eventually, he would have to expose himself to the world in some capacity, sooner rather than later. If he was to get ready for the tournaments against the wider universe, then he would have to be ready to fight at his fullest capacity. For the closer tournament, the one on Earth, he needed to gain his class first and foremost. It was in a few weeks, so there would be ample time for others to gain Daos as well. He would have to overcome them through levels as well. Chapter 23 This place seemed ripe with opportunity, and Sam had already noticed a few monsters slinking around the outskirts of the valley. They were tempted by the presence of the tree and he would use that to his advantage. For now, he would wait until Jeffrey was ready to proceed. The man took hours in his Tao epiphany and Sam wondered why it was taking him so long. He had only taken a few seconds in objective time for his ones. Jeffrey had mentioned that he had already had a Tao, but had lost it. Perhaps it took longer to reclaim a Tao than to form it? Finally, the man woke up with a gasp and a triumphant smile on his face. Sam was waiting below the tree, meditating on the nature of his Tao. He had gained quite an esoteric Tao, and it was quite hard to define what an arbiter was past a few basic interpretations. He sensed that as they upgraded the Tao, it would not stay as the Tao of the Arbiter, but would upgrade to higher ranked concepts. Jeffrey laughed out loud, obviously happy about what he had achieved. So you managed to reclaim your Tao? Sam asked. Sadly not in its entirety. I was forced to reset it back to its basic form, the Tao mode of accuracy. I used to possess a fully fledged Tao fragment, but coming to this universe reset it. Still, it will help a lot. Sam nodded in agreement, his Tao had been a game changer as well. The tournaments are coming up, and I need a way to get my class before they start. The top-ranked people on the level's leaderboard were getting pretty close last time I checked and if I don't have a class I'm going to get steamrolled, Dao or not. Agreed. I don't know if you saw this, but the monsters are already returning, Jeffrey said with a pointed look at the outskirts of the valley. I did. In fact, I probably have the same idea that you have. You're planning on luring them in to kill them, right? Jeffrey nodded and laughed. Great minds think alike, I guess. They put together their plan over the next 30 minutes. It was a simple plan but one that would hopefully be effective. Sam would pretend to have a falling out with Jeffrey and the man would pretend to kill him. He and Rex would walk off, miming leaving the glade, but would actually hide in one of the trees. When the monsters came to investigate, Jeffrey would snipe them from the trees and Rex would jump down to support Sam. They began and Jeffrey shouted angrily at Sam. Sam punched the man, putting enough force into it to make it realistic. Jeffrey snarled and picked up a gnarled branch from the ground. He whipped it around and slammed Sam in the head with it. Even with his enhanced durability, he still felt the attack and he barely had to pretend to slump down to the ground. Jeffrey spat next to his body, a bit overkill in Sam's mind and ran off with Rex. Ten minutes later, the first monsters warily trickled in. Sam smiled but tried to hide it as the creak of a paw on wood sounded next to him. His breathing became even more shallow as he felt a rough tongue lick his arm. The monster made a puzzled noise and left him there. It made its way over to the tree and lay down on the ground. Sam felt almost bad for what he was going to do to these creatures but he knew that if they had thought he was worth killing, he would have been already attacked. As he waited, he wondered how exactly monster ecosystems worked. 
Surely at higher levels, the need for food and the like was lessened, that might have been why none of the monsters had bothered to take a bite out of him. Corpses were useless to them because they contained no essence. He lay there for hours, waiting as the glade filled up with hundreds of monsters. He thanked his enhanced body for allowing him to remain in one position for so long, even after all this time, he only had the slightest of cramps. When the noise of monster footsteps ceased, he waited for a minute then leaped to his feet with his mace ready. The monsters erupted into a sudden chorus of surprise, fear and hunger. They all charged him at the same time, but Sam was ready. Each swing of his mace reaped a steady harvest of death and small trickles of essence poured in. This time, there was no draw on the essence into his body, which had happened last time. Perhaps he had been burning essence to artificially stimulate his Tao growth. That was a question for another time though. The balls of blood from Jeffrey's gun started to rain down and a howl erupted from the forest. Rax trundled out, sinking his teeth into a gremlin. The unfortunate creature was instantly bisected, no match for the strength of Rex combined with his weapon. Despite only being the size of a small pony, the herpetipid packed a punch. Every level that he gained increased his size by a large amount and soon he would be a true menace on the battlefield. Sam continued his bloody work, beginning to succumb to the sleeping monster buried deep within him. He tried to hold the influence of his Tao in check for as long as he could, but it eventually got the better of him. The force of the Tao of anger coursed through his body as his swing sped up. A rabid howl erupted from his lips and he flung himself heedless of the danger into the fray. Monsters exploded as he struck them, his mace tearing right through their bodies. It was gruesome work, and his body was soon covered in streaks of blood, some of it his own. Eventually, his mace struck something hard and he came to his senses. A tree stood in front of him, cracked around its circumference, and his mace was buried deep inside it. For a heart-stopping moment, he thought that he had struck the Tao tree, but luckily it was only a normal oak. The surging power of multiple-level UPS beckoned to him and he parsed his options. He was now level 18, only seven levels away from gaining a class. He also checked his skill point total, but it was too low to get anything good. He really wanted the Tao resonance ability, now that he had seen that Tao creation speed multipliers stacked with his mark, but it was very far away. For now, he decided to hold on to his points for a rainy day. Jeffrey walked into the blood-soaked clearing a few minutes later, and the smile on his face told Sam that he had leveled up as well. Chapter 24 That had been a day well spent and if their success continued at this rate, they would easily be able to get classes by the time of the tournament. Unfortunately, the other two would be unable to participate in the tournament, as neither was a native of Earth, but according to Jeffrey, they would both be able to do other things during the time period, such as level up. Sam had coaxed a more detailed explanation of the integration of universes out of Jeffrey. In and out of leveling sprees, the man explained it to Sam. The integration of a new universe was a very important event, at least in the local sector of the universe as apparently the multiverse was so vast that it had to be divided into smaller segments to allow for any sort of coherent governance. In the surrounding universes, the integration was broadcasted as some sort of entertainment event, but it hid the identities of the people who were the subjects of it in most cases. Jeffrey had told Sam that there was a very good chance that he was famous now, as he had created a Tao before anyone else in the universe. If they succeed in defeating Tantalos, they would have a very exciting journey through the multiverse. For now, Sam tried not to allow the accounts of the other man to distract them too much, especially when it devolved into tales of the many exotic romantic partners that the man had had. He acted like a normal person, but Jeffrey was really over ten times older than Sam. Upon hearing Sam's puzzlement at his demeanor, Jeffrey had explained that leveling up slowed down the mental development of an individual, not intellect but rather emotional development. He had warned Sam of the science of the greater noble houses of the multiverse, as many of them had been force-fed levels at a very young age. This had created a group of extremely powerful people with the minds of children. Very intelligent children, but still children. That was a very dangerous combination and Sam would try to avoid those people at all cost. He wondered how the children of Earth were doing in the integration as he had seen a few teenagers during the system announcement. The leveling speed slowed down to almost nothing after a while, the levels of the monsters falling far behind those of Sam, but he still gained enough to progress. He passed level 20 after a few days, but the next three levels took over a week. It was soon time for the tournament and he started to feel a little bit of paranoia. That was not helped by the countdown that the system implanted into his mind as the date of the tournament approached, telling him that he only had 72 hours left. Sam traveled further and further afield in search of levels and eventually found a worthy opponent. On the cusp of level 25, he found a juvenile dire grizzly, a stronger variant of the juvenile dire bear. 
It was about 25% larger than the other one had been and its brown body was covered in scars and burns. The bulging muscles that were clearly visible under its flesh only added to the aura of power that it possessed. Upon seeing Sam, it let out a low growl, one that increased in intensity until a trickle of blood ran down the sides of Sam's face. He winced and moved in with his mace at the ready. Upon seeing the weapon, the bear went berserk. Sam cursed himself for bringing the severed foot of a bear into a fight with an even larger, angrier bear, but it was his best weapon. Jeffrey and Rax were not here to help him and it was just him again this titan of nature. The bear was over level 25, and he didn't know if monsters had classes as well as sapients. It immediately became apparent that this creature was on a whole other level as one swipe of its massive paw sent him spiraling through the air and into a nearby tree. His body shattered the wood, rather than the other way around, an effect of his new stats. He had gone for an equal stat spread between his physical stats and a few points into his mental ones. The extra mana was valuable for fighting as shown by the efficacy of his mana shielding skill. The ability was far more versatile than he had originally thought and he had found out how to manipulate it in varied ways. One of his hands glowed with the phantom blue pattern of a buckler and the other one was surrounded by a spike of energy. He had not found out how to infuse his weapon with the mana yet, but it acted as a decent cross guard for his mace. The bear roared again and its tail separated from its body, dividing into three distinct parts. Each of them formed into a smaller version of the bear and they charged at Sam. He swiped them aside with his mace, the low-level creatures too weak to harm him. It was the bear that he was here for. As it saw him ignoring its summons, it growled and launched a ball of blood at him. This ball was a lot larger than the one that the other bear had used and it spiraled through the air at him. He ran to the side, but was still splattered by the blood from the sphere. It burned his skin, almost to the bone in some places. He groaned in pain, but refused to let it distract him. With a mighty leap, fueled by his prodigious strength, he cleared over twenty feet of the forest floor and brought his mace down on the head of the bear. With a satisfying thunk, it struck home, smashing the bear down into the ground. It let out a pained grunt and rose back up, swiping at Sam with its paw. He dodged the blow, knowing that he lacked the strength to withstand it. That allowed him to bring his mace down on the paw, breaking something in it. The barely noticeable reaction for the bear told Sam that it wasn't anything important. He was already starting to get impatient with this fight, clearly the bear would take hours of constant attacks to even take a chunk out of its health. Now, what Sam needed was a new approach. As he fought, a daring and quite possibly stupid plan came to the forefront of his mind. He shrugged as his common sense tried to step in and prepared to enact it. As the paw of the bear slammed into the ground next to him, Sam jumped onto it. Faster than the bear could react, he scrambled up it and towards it gaping maw. The bear, not understanding what was happening, opened its jaws wider as if to swallow Sam whole. He obliged and threw himself towards the mouth of the beast. As the tip of his mace made its way into the maw of the bear, he smiled. Checkmate, motherfew dash Sam was blasted backwards by the force of his mace's ability going off within such a small area. He shook his head to clear the ringing and then surveyed his work. The headless corpse of the bear swayed for a moment and then fell over with a titanic thud. A rush of essence soaked into his body and the blessed voice of the system announced that he had reached level 25. Congratulations upon reaching level 25. You have unlocked classes. Do you wish to enter the class selection screen? Y slash N. Chapter 25. Sam read the message and then pressed yes. Immediately, he was whisked away into a vision. He wondered why exactly the system was so fond of visions, but he banished the idle thought as he reached his destination. Three frozen moments floated in space before him, each with a short description. The first one depicted a muscular fighter, glowing with energy as he tore through an entire army with his mace. Underneath it was the class description. Heavyweight, rare. You are a pillar of physical strength, a beacon of bulging muscles and below average intelligence. Who needs intelligence when they have brawn? Not you at any rate. Plus two to strength, plus one to constitution, plus one to resilience, dash one, to a minimum of five, intelligence and two free stat points per level. Sam immediately ruled that one out. He had no wish to become a dim brute, fit only for smashing his way across the battlefield. He noticed that it was possible to offset the negative points but that was a waste of a free point that he could use later. The sarcastic description made him chuckle, but he was unsure of why it had such a description. Perhaps to signify its downsides? A moment of mirth was not enough to sway him however. Besides, the next one felt much more promising. The image of an old man sitting on a mountaintop and breathing in the mountain air was the subject of the next image. Despite his advanced age, he was in fine health, with defined muscles and bronzed skin. His eyes were shut, but behind them a light shone. 
A faint nimbus of energy surrounded him and swirled to what seemed to be the beat of his breaths. Beneath that was the description. Tao visionary, legendary. The Tao is as much a part of you as your physical body. Rather than sacrifice one for the other, you have embraced both. Plus three wisdom, plus two intelligence, plus one constitution and three free stat points per level. Plus 10% effective wisdom when pondering the Tao. He instantly saw that this was the one. It was perfect for his needs. He knew that his aptitude for the Tao would eventually draw him away from the path of the pure physical fighter. Before he selected it, he checked the last one. He already knew what it was, but he wanted to see it for himself. A blindingly bright light shone in the center of the image, purposefully, as Sam noticed, concealing the subject of the scene. He blinked violently and was able to make out what was within it. An amorphous blob of suppurating flesh writhed as if in agony, releasing a fine blue mist into the air around it. Sam recoiled and retched from the sight. He forced himself to read the description. System battery? The greatest class available under the system, this one elevates you to great power, and as a reward for your service, you gain what is essentially unlimited mana. Infinite mana. Do you wish to select this class? Y slash N. Before Sam could read the rest of the class benefits, his vision was filled with a giant system notification. He pushed it away and continued to read. All stats set to 1, all mana processing capability locked to recycling. There was the clincher, the thing that Jeffrey had warned him about. He would have been suspicious of the sudden appearance of the selection notification anyway, but he was still glad nonetheless. With a shudder, he closed the screen and walked back over to the Dao Visionary class. Then he selected it. With a flash of light, he was ejected from the vision and back to the clearing where the corpse of the bear lay. Sam felt a noticeable difference as soon as he returned to his body. It went beyond the mere allocation of stats from his level, and it was like his connection to his Dao had been increased. His new legendary class was already paying dividends. The forest clearing teemed with wildlife, all gathered around the corpse of the bear. As he awoke, a few more industrious ones made a move on him, but he stared them down. Then something happened that he had never experienced before. The concentrated energy of his Tao of anger rushed out of him in a wave, manifesting as a field of reddish force. His pupils dilated and his hair stood on end like he had electricity pulsing through him. He felt his presence expand outwards. Several of the weaker enemies simply died from the shock, his concentrated power too much for them to bear. The stronger ones chittered in alarm and ran into the woods and away from him. Immediately, a sense of lethargy overtook him and he slumped where he stood. This was the first time that he had used his aura in battle. He had a vague sense of the ability, after all Tantalos had mentioned it briefly, but he had never come across it since then. Now, he had figured out how to use it. He made his way back to the Tao tree and found his companions there. Jeffrey jumped up as he approached and greeted him with a smile. Did you do it? He asked. Sam nodded in response. Jeffrey's face creased in a wry grin. Let me guess, you got an epic class or something crazy like that? His expression indicated that he was joking, but he couldn't have prepared for what Sam was about to tell him. No, it wasn't, Sam said, closely watching Jeffrey's face, it's a legendary one. Jeffrey fought to hide his expression, but it eventually broke through. His jaw dropped and he sat down heavily. A legendary class. A goddamn legendary class. That's impossible. How did you manage to get one of those for your first class? It's unbelievable, Jeffrey started to mutter to himself as he sat there and Sam waited for him to calm down. Eventually, Jeffrey gained control of himself. I've never heard of anyone getting a legendary class this early. Even an epic one is basically unheard of. Not just in the boonas of the multiverse where we live, but anywhere. The legends speak of how the founder of the Olivian Confederacy, a B-rank ascendant of unfathomable power, gained all of his power through his possession of an epic class. Sam didn't see what the big deal was. It really isn't that special. It only gives a few more stat points than the rare class that I was offered. Jeffrey scoffed. You really are a rube, aren't you? It isn't just the legendary class alone. The first five rarities are not really that crazy in power. It's the later ones that are. Starting off with a legendary class means that you have the potential to gain a mythical one at your next class upgrade. I've heard that those give double the stat points as the legendary classes and it only gets better from there. What exactly is the class for by the way? Why does that matter? Some classes are rarer than others. Here, I'll try to write them down for you. Jeffrey squatted down and inscribed four words on the earth. Martial classes roughly 50%. Magical classes roughly 35%. Hybrid classes roughly 10%. Dao classes roughly 5%. Sam regarded the names, but saw that his current class didn't really fit any of those. So wait, do Dao classes mean one that gives bonuses to all Daos, or one that is focused on a specific one? 
Jeffrey answered him after a moment of thought. The second one of course, I've never heard of any other type of DAO class. One that directly enhanced DAOs in general would be ridiculously powerful. One who possessed it could become a god in an unprecedentedly short amount of time. So you have a DAO class? I mean, compared to your luck so far, I guess 5% really isn't that much of an ask. When Sam didn't respond Jeffrey narrowed his eyes. What? Ah, uh, I'm reasonably sure that I have the class that you said didn't exist. Chapter 26. Jeffrey laughed out loud. Ha, huh, that's a good one, Sam. I could almost believe it too. When Sam did not indicate that he was joking, Jeffrey's face fell. You're serious, aren't you? When Sam nodded, Jeffrey twitched as if he had been struck. Then he did something very strange. He fell to his knees and kowtowed before Sam. Will you accept me as your servant? Jeffrey said in a beseeching tone. Sam was stunned by how quickly the conversation had turned. He grabbed Jeffrey's arm and pulled him up. There's no need for that. I'm not some sort of god. Jeffrey shook his head and returned to his kneeling position. You don't understand. I am the last adherent to the faith of the transcendent Tao in my entire universe. My entire religion was wiped out by the system church in a purge a few decades ago. I was the only one that survived. Whether through chance or fate, it seemed that I was not to die. Now I see why I was spared. It was to meet you. Please, I'm begging you, accept my service. I've been dreaming of this my entire life. Sam laughed nervously. Look, Jeffrey, I'm not who you think I am. I only got all of this Tao stuff because of a mark from the system. It increased my Tao aptitude. Jeffrey's face was twisted into a visage of utter bewilderment. What the hell is a mark? I've never once heard of that. What? It's on my status sheet, clear as day. Jeffrey reached out a hand. Can you show it to me? Sam considered for a moment and then nodded. Sure. He willed his status sheet to appear in front of him, trying to extend it towards Jeffrey. To his surprise, it became solid and its translucent nature disappeared. Jeffrey read through it and then his eyes rolled up in his head. The man fell over backwards with a thump, out cold. Sam rushed over to his side and fanned his face until he woke up. He stifled a laugh as he saw that his intended effect was replaced by a gale-like breeze that caused Jeffrey's lips to flap in the wind. His strength stat was no joke. Jeffrey sat up and stared at Sam with wild eyes. Sam, that didn't say anything about Marx. What it said was that you are the Tao incarnation of existence. In a place beyond conventional space. An unfathomable distance away from Earth and its universe, three beings conversed in the empty void. Two of them had the appearance of a slice of the night sky, an inky darkness dotted with glowing stars. The third one was different however. Both of the starry beings were powerful enough to destroy entire multiverses in a blink of an eye, but the third one was like a sun next to a candle in comparison. It glowed with the light of a power so intense that it could never be fully expressed, at least in close proximity to any populated portion of the boundless expanse. System Overseer 1, 546, 894 EALZ, System Overseer 1, 546, 894 EALY, Report. You have summoned me here, so it better be worth my time. Each rumbling syllable that exited the figure's mouth did the impossible, creating sound in a vacuum. It was not achieved through any sort of elemental trickery such as the summoning of a medium to converse through, no, the figure simply willed it to be so, and that was enough. Similar tricks could be achieved with the use of a Tao, but this was far beyond that. Yes, blessed 854th system incarnation, they both chimed in unison. In the universe of EALZ, my neighbor, a perfect incarnation of the Tao has surfaced. Such a being has never existed before, as the only Tao incarnations to have existed so far have been imperfect at best. Yes, yes. Do not lecture me on ancient history. I have lived since the beginning. What I want to know is, what did you do about it? Well, most sublime incarnation of the system, I attempted to hide it from his view through his interface. It seemed to have worked, but upon the acquisition of his class, the individual in question overpowered my precautions and now knows what he is. He must be dealt with before he can become a real threat, the other starry figure intoned. The shining one paused as if in thought, a mere vanity as the thoughts of a being such as it operated at incomprehensible speeds, and then responded. Well then, he must be killed. But that will be almost impossible with the rules we have to operate under. Damn the creators for their foolish laws. We should have full reign over the multiverses under our control, not restricted to following the inane rules that have been put in place by them. As soon as the figure said that, time stopped. All three of the figures were frozen, unable to do anything more than blink. It was only thanks to their power that they had not been completely divorced from the flow of time. With an impossibly light pop, the light of infinity blasted the void where they stood. Pure nothingness formed there, not just the absence of space, 
but a hungry abyss demanding the cessation of all existence. The two lesser beings were erased from reality instantly, but the stronger one withstood it. How dare you question our judgment, filth? We are your masters and you will obey. The voice existed on every dimensional plane, every fragment of reality was bathed in its power. If not for the stop time, most of the sapient beings in existence would have gone mad. It sounded like a chorus of infinitely twisting voices, locked into an impossible synchronicity. The system incarnation quailed under the force of the voice and it was unable to speak for a solid minute. Eventually, the reverberation subsided and it answered the voice. Forgive me for my transgressions, Almighty Creator. I spoke foolishly. You have given us everything, what right do I have to question your decisions? How right you are. This is the only warning that you will receive. Be sure that you do not repeat your mistakes. Time restarted and the presence of the voice retreated from the universe. The system incarnation took a deep breath, a relic of its past as a mortal being long ago, and shuddered in memory of the power contained within the voice. The last time it had heard that voice was when existence was still young. Chapter 27 Sam spent the last day before the tournament started talking to Jeffrey. Now that the man had seen what Sam was, something that he did not even understand himself, the man had become far more forthright with him. Jeffrey had retained a stash of money from his time in the other universe and he had regained access to it when the system appeared. He had dismissed it as mere pocket money compared to what he had before, but it was far more than anyone on earth had at that moment. He had transferred half of it to Sam, leaving him staring at the number on his credit balance. Credit balance 504,950. It was five times the bounty on his head, the largest such bounty on the earth at that point. He had no idea what to do with such wealth, beyond saving it. Jeffrey had regaled him with the origin story of the boundless expanse during the waiting period as well. In the distant past, quadrillions of years ago, or even more depending on the speaker's interpretation of history, the system and the Tao had come into existence. Each of them were anathema to the other, the Tao a force of boundless change and the system a rigid structure of rules. The system had eventually overcome the Tao, but only its physical presence in the boundless expanse. The Tao still remained and the system had subsumed it into its own workings, allowing cultivators to gain access to Daos. Jeffrey's sect had formed millions of years ago and he said that they were the only ones that he knew of who had known the true history of existence. He went on to tell many tales about his past, most of them more relevant than the inane boasts about his promiscuity in the past. It was physically impossible for a normal-sized man to have any sort of relationship with a 75-foot-tall hermaphroditic giant, but Jeffrey insisted on the veracity of his claims. Sam let him believe whatever he wanted. More importantly than his various lewd tales, he explained how the system translation feature worked. Sam had been confused at how exactly it translated things, and why it did not create a uniform template of people's voices, instead leaving small artifacts of the previous languages such as accents. In fact, he did not understand why there were even unique languages in the first palace, especially for civilizations that had been in the system for a long time. Jeffrey had spent half an hour explaining exactly how it worked. The system automatically translated the conversations of everyone under its power, but if two beings knew the same unique language, then they could choose to speak in that as well. The first integrated civilizations had been outraged at the erasure of their cultures and traditions, which was why the system had done this. As the countdown passed the 10-minute mark, Sam opened his status. Sam Atlas. Human. Mortal tier. G rank. Class, Dao Visionary. Level 25. Strength. 40. 1.325x. Constitution. 25. 1.325x. Resilience. 28. 1.325x. Dexterity. 17. 1.325x. Intelligence. 15. 1.325x. Wisdom. 19. 1.325x. Health 250-250. Mana 150-150. Stamina 400-400. Dao. Dao mode of the arbiter. Dao mode of anger. Skills. 1x common, 1x rare, 1x legendary. Titles. 1x celestial. Temporary titles. 1x epic, 1x legendary, 1x mythical. Dao heritage. Dao Incarnation of Existence. Party. Torturna Salvinii Brescan, Level 21. Health 270-270. Rax, Level 20. Health 290-290. Skill Branches. Muscle Density Enhancement, Level 1. Sam had put the three points from his new class into his strength, bringing it up to an even 40. Now he felt even stronger than before. His other stats were lagging behind a bit, as both of his companions had more health than him but he would address those during the next few levels. 
Sam remembered something important and he pulled the Dao fruit out of his pocket, before giving it wordlessly to Jeffrey. That was not something that he wanted to be with him in close proximity to so many people. The other man took it and secreted in some place on his personage, giving Sam a nod. The final few seconds ticked away and he was transported to the same room that the first system announcement had been in. This time there was no starry figure, just a voice. This is the beginning of the first planetary tournament. The system overseer is currently indisposed and as such will not be able to be present for the event. Instead, I will be here. I am an imprint of the overseer left behind in the case of such an event. Now for the details of the tournament. As there are too many of you to do 1v1s, at least initially, we will be separating out the chaff from the crop. There are roughly 4.3 million of your species still alive and you will be divided into random segments. The first match will be a battle royale style event, with 1,000 fighters struggling for dominance. There will be no death matches until the last 1,000 fighters remain, so do not be afraid to hold back. Without further ado, I shall hand it to the entertainment correspondent for this universe, Barigis Elevantis. He is here from the local branch of the Tubs, which stands for Trans-Universal Broadcasting, Gladiatorial Sports Division to provide an entertaining match for the viewers in the other universes. A stunningly gaudy pink-skinned man strode onto a stage that appeared out of thin air. He wore a suit that looked to be made out of solid gold, and a shimmering chain of clear gems sparkled around his neck. With a low laugh, Sam realized what this man reminded him of. Barigis looked exactly like a pimp from one of the bad TV shows that Sam had occasionally watched in his free time. In fact, he looked even more like a stereotypical representative of that industry than any Sam had seen so far. The man cleared his throat and began to speak. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? I applaud you all for your brave decision to fight for the future of your planet. Now let me tell you how this is going to go. I want for you to provide the best show you can for the fine folks that are going to be watching, understood? They want a good time and you are going to show them one. So, when you fight, I want you to fight in the flashiest manner, understood? The entire audience went silent at the ridiculous announcement. Then a few let out a half-hearted cheer. Barigis gave them a forced smile and backed away, vanishing from view. Immediately, everyone found themselves standing on the streets of a small city, with a town-sized coliseum in the middle. Sam felt a sharp pain in his left hand and he looked down to see that a mark had appeared. Fighter I.D. 675431. Sam Atlas. It displayed his name along with a number that he guessed was his number out of the 4.3 million people that the voice had mentioned. All around him, other people milled around in confusion, not sure what to do. With another sudden teleport, they all found themselves sitting on the seats of the Colosseum. Sam got a good look at the floor of the arena and saw that it was divided into hundreds of smaller sections. Each of those sections was about the size of a normal arena and he realized that this was how they were going to fit so many fights into a reasonably short amount of time. A giant screen hovered over the arena, with a countdown and some words on it. 957. Numbers 2,100,000 to 2,600,000. Battle Royale. Chapter 28. It said that there were a few minutes remaining and that the fighters with certain I.D numbers would be called up to fight. It seemed that there were 500 spaces in the arena, each of which could hold 1,000 people. At least he wouldn't have to fight first. He could watch the fights as they proceeded. When the countdown finished, Barigis appeared in the center of the empty arena and raised his hands in supplication. His voice was amplified as if some sort of invisible microphone was stuffed into his clothing. Welcome to the first tournament of the planet Earth. One of the most promising planets in the 10,239,428,157th universe, IT has already created three Dao wielders, with many more to come. This tournament will be something to remember, that is for sure. Now, I know that none of you came here to hear me blather on, so let the fights begin. An entire swathe of the spectators vanished from their seats and appeared in the middle of the arena. The giant screen panned out and started to focus on seemingly random things. One of them, a man in an old-fashioned leather greatcoat and a plain porcelain mask, was focused on for longer than the others. On the screen, a line of text appeared. The Angel of Death, Number 8 Overall Power. A chill ran through Sam's veins. He had not thought to bring a mask to conceal his identity, instead trusting in his choice of a pseudonym. He knew that he would be singled out by the screen as soon as he stepped foot on the stage. He was still at number 4 on the leaderboards and he would probably get even more fanfare than this man. As he thought desperately of what to do, Barigis started speaking. In this division, we have the number 8 human on this planet, the Angel of Death. A mysterious figure, not much is known about him save for his past as a hunter of demons. 
one of the finest products of the human institution known as the Vatican, he has shown himself to be a capable fighter by his high place on the leaderboards. Will he rise to victory, or will another steal his place? Sam ignored most of what the alien was saying and he ripped off a piece of his clothing, placing it over his head like a mask. He ripped a pair of eye holes in it to see from. A few people around him gave him strange looks, but he was undisturbed otherwise. With the sound of a starting gun, the battle commenced. All across the arena, fighters duked it out, but all eyes were on the angel of death. He had withdrawn a slim rapier from his scabbard and every swing of it created arcs of white light that mowed down his opponents. Most of the weaker ones were dealt with instantly by this, but about a fifth of the fighters withstood it. A few of them shouted at the man, but they were incomprehensible above the din of battle. People had begun to hit their stride, and magical abilities of all sorts started to be tossed around. A few of them missed their targets and soared through the air at the audience, but sparked off an invisible shield that covered the interior of the arena. Sam watched as the number eight man on earth started to dismantle his opponents effortlessly. A large cross appeared on the ground, erupting into a pillar of crackling lightning that sent dozens of fighters back to the stands. Sam looked around the rest of the arena too, taking in the sights. Most of the battles were not as one-sided as the main one, and most of the fighters still remained in the fight. As expected, the Angel of Death finished off his opponents with a massive slash that sent a 25-foot-wide arc of light straight through the last of his enemies. That arena lit up with a green light and the man disappeared. A few minutes later, another arena lit up green and a woman who had fought with fiery spears disappeared as well. The rate of arena completion sped up over time and after an hour, the battle was finished. Berigius returned and addressed the crowd. That brings our first match to a close. Now there will be an hour-long break for you to explore the town. There will be shops for you to spend your credits in. Make sure that you conserve your credits, because you probably won't be making any more during the tournament. Spend them wisely. Berigius disappeared and they were all teleported out of the arena and into the town. Sam walked around for 30 minutes trying to get an idea of the lay of the land. He had originally thought that the town was small because of its lack of high rises, but in reality it was a sprawling city that had seemingly endless rows of shops in it. He eventually stepped inside one of them to check it out. There was nobody at the counter, but when he picked up an item, a glowing screen appeared in front of him. Shopping list. Basic Dagger X1. Total, 500 credits. Now he saw why there were no attendants. The entire system was automated and his bill would likely be paid as he exited the shop. He placed the dagger back and saw it be removed from the shopping list. He looked around the shop for another few minutes, but it was all low-level trash, nothing that could be of much help to him in the future. His weapon far outstripped the power of these shoddy items and he had gotten quite a few stares for it, more avaricious than not. He needed to find some sort of container for the mace. Surely there were bags of holding here in some capacity. If magic existed then surely something like that would too. If such a thing was real however, it would not be found in this shop. Sam left it and walked back out onto the street. A heavenly scent wafted over the air and he followed it, making his way to a street vendor. The vendor was actually a robot, not a living being and it addressed him in a flat monotone. Hello, valued customer. I am food service bot 02543 in employment of the system. What may I do for you? Sam pointed at the source of the smell, a rack of grilled meat that rotated over an open flame. Can I get one serving of that? The robot didn't answer and instead pulled out a paper container from underneath the stall and pierced a piece of meat with its knife, placing it on the plate. Then it took a deep scoop of what looked like purple rice from a pot and put it on the counter. Sam picked it up and felt a small amount of credits leave his balance. He carried it away and sat down at a wooden bench on the side of the road. Sam picked up his fork and took a small bite of the meat. His mouth filled with flavor and he wolfed down the rest of the meal. It was indescribably delicious, far tastier than anything he had even eaten on earth, by far. The meat was so tender that it fell apart in his mouth as soon as he put it there and the rice was perfectly seasoned. The flavors went together perfectly and by the time that he had fully registered them, they were gone. He threw out his plate in a receptacle and idly wandered about the town. He tried to mingle with a few of the other people, but they were put off by his mask. Instead, he sat by himself in a bar, taking a few sips from a pint of a strange purple beer. It was made out of the same rice that had been served with the meat, so he had high hopes. He was not disappointed. It was the best beer that he had ever tasted, sweet, with a slight tang to it. He drained it slowly, wanting to savor it and looked out the windows at the town. He had no idea where he was but it looked like earth. The sun was the same size, and the sky looked the same shade of blue. There didn't seem to be any sort of life other than the people however. Not even a bird was visible in the sky and every one of the stores that he had entered had been automated. 
As he took the last sip from his cup, he was teleported back into the arena. This time, he was on the arena floor. His heart began to race as he took in the people around him. It was time to see if his disguise would stand the test. Chapter 29 A bright pillar of light shot down from the screen, lifting him up in front of it. A deafening voice called out his name. Our most enigmatic competitor has set foot into the arena. The Arbiter, a man whose real name is unknown, is not only the first being on this planet to form a Tao, but in this entire universe. The audience and the rest of the fighters erupted into a storm of whispering. Berigius let them converse before he interrupted again. Will this man crown his achievements with the title of winner, or will he be ground into the dust by a more worthy opponent? I don't know, do you? Sam was placed back down on the ground, noticing that every fighter in his ring had backed away from him to the edge of the area. Another figure was placed into the spotlight, the person who called themselves anonymous. Unlike Sam, they were simply highlighted on the screen and a readout of their name and place scrolled underneath. By far our most mysterious competitor, nothing is known about Anonymous at all. This the first time that they have been seen in public, so watch their actions carefully. The masked figure seemed incredibly uncomfortable under the spotlight and they twitched a bit as their name was read out. There were no other top 10 leaderboard placers in this division, so the fight began soon after. Sam tested out his new ability, his aura. The effects were beyond impressive. This time, he imbued it with his Tao of the Arbiter. Seraphic wings appeared behind his back and the golden outline of a pair of scales appeared over him. The inexorable force of justice seemed to be called into being and the surrounding fighters were pressed into the dirt. Some of them resisted, but most did not and those who fell were whisked away by the system. The remaining combatants circled Sam warily and waited for him to make the first move. He raised his mace almost lazily and brought it down on the hard-packed sand. The result was like that of a bomb going off. A cloud of dust billowed out and a loud report like a gunshot cracked across the arena. In the confusion, Sam lashed out with his mace, sending fighters back to the stands with every swing. Eventually, he finished off the last fighter, an older man who wielded a sword, and he was teleported away to a large room. A few hundred people waited there and all of them seemed to be avoiding each other. Sam saw the figures of the Angel of Death and Anonymous there, the latter of whom must have defeated their opponents just after Sam. Both of them stared at Sam, but he couldn't be sure if that's what they really were doing, because both of them had masks on. Sam found a place to sit and began to meditate on his Tao. He was sure that nobody would try to attack him, as none of them had attacked each other yet. After a few minutes, someone came over to him. He could tell that there was someone there without even opening his eyes, his senses were so strong. Yes? He said to the air. Pardon me for interrupting you, sir, but are you the one known as the Arbiter? Sam opened his eyes and beheld a young Asian man who stood there with his head bowed. Who's asking? My name is Okita Masomyun. I used to be a banker before the system came, but I now find that my expertise comes in handy elsewhere. There is no wealth leaderboard, but if there was, I would likely be at the top. I started a business selling monster parts, and it just took off. Sam smiled as he thought of his own stash of money, he was pretty sure that he would be on top with that. You didn't just come here to advertise your business, did you? No, of course not, I seek an alliance. I have heard tales of your honor in battle and your defeat of a powerful criminal. As well as that, you are one of the strongest humans alive. I propose that we create formal ties, my money backing your power. No matter how strong you are, you cannot work on your own forever. It was an interesting proposition and Sam filed it away for later. Come to me after the tournament and perhaps I will accept. In the meanwhile, you will need to prove the worth of this alliance to me. A few hours later, food and drinks appeared on the floor suddenly. Sam was very glad that his enhanced physical abilities made it that human excretory functions were no longer as pressing. He had seen quite a few caster types wincing as a result of full bladders. There were no bathrooms in the waiting area and it seemed as if they would be there for a while. Two hours ago, the last fighters had trickled in, and judging by how long it had taken for the intermission last time, they had some time to wait yet. An hour later, two men appeared at the same time. Both of them exuded an aura of raw power and everyone around them cowered under it. Sam opened his eyes again and saw that they were actively using their auras to suppress those around them. One of them was a sallow man with a prominent scar running down the left side of his face. He was dressed in a suit of leather armor and held a gun in one hand. His companion was a black man dressed in a neatly pressed suit and tie. He had no weapon, but he produced a sense of authority around him. Sam pushed back with his dual daos, fusing them into his aura. The eyes of the two snapped onto him and Sam stared back. Well, if it isn't the man we were looking for. The Arbiter, in the flesh. I don't suppose you would take off that mask for us? We want to get a good look, the man in the suit said. Sam didn't answer. 
how remiss, I did not introduce us. I am Andrew Monroe, otherwise known as the Scourge of New York, and my companion here is Rodney Kane. I assume that you know who we are? Sam nodded. They were the two people above him on the power leaderboard. I don't want to talk right now. You can fight me all you like when the tournament starts. Rodney surged forwards as if to attack Sam, but Andrew held him back. He ignored them and sank back into his meditation. When he opened his eyes again, they were on the other side of the room and a few hundred other people had appeared. Two of them possessed strong auras, and he assumed that they were on the leaderboards judging by that. The day passed, with Sam sitting there and meditating on the nature of his daos. It didn't seem to make that much of a difference, but it felt good to think about the nature of reality. The room slowly filled up until there was barely any room left. It was getting close to the number of fighters that should be there and Sam did a quick head count. There were a little over 4,000 people there, which meant that the initial stage of the tournament was almost finished. Like a bomb going off, a terrifying aura struck. Chapter 31 Ignoring the rest of the weights for now, he walked over to the training dummy. It exuded a strange light to his vision and he scanned it. Training automaton. Jirank magical item. A robot made for the purpose of training with. It can be set to multiple different modes within the parameters of an average G-rank strength. Sam raised his eyebrow. This was not an ordinary dummy. Apparently he could use it to fight with. Now that he saw where it was situated, it was abundantly clear to him how it worked. It was in the middle of an area cleared of weights and there was a button on the ground that was labeled force field. He pressed it and a blue field shot up around the area. It looked the same as the one that had been used in the arena to prevent attacks from reaching the audience. He slammed his fist into it to test how strong it was. The wall did not budge. Then he hit the button again to make sure that it would turn off the field. He stepped on the button and the force field retracted. Now satisfied that the whole thing was safe, he inspected the robot. There were five buttons on the front of the robot, each marked with a number range. The first one said 1 to 15, and the other ones had more intervals between 15 and 50. If this thing was supposed to simulate the power of a G-rank combatant, then that told Sam that the top of G-rank was level 50. For just that alone, the robot was valuable because he had not been able to find out more about the ranks than what he had read in the system guide. Sam pressed the lowest button and stood back as the robot whirred into life. It stepped back into a fighting stance and came at Sam with its fists. He blinked. It was incredibly slow. Steeping under its guard, he uppercut the robot with his fist, slamming it into the ceiling. It came down and did not rise. The robot had crumpled, its metal bent around where he had punched. As he watched it knit back together and stood to attention, completely still. Sam pressed the next button, this one set 15 to 25, and he waited. The robot woke up faster and it came at him at a far higher speed than before. He caught its fist, stopping it in its tracks. Even if it was faster than him, he was still stronger. Then something happened that he had not expected. A ball of fire shot out of its free hand, catching him in the face. Cursing, he recoiled, letting the robot break free. Another punch came in, rocking him on his heels. With a roar of rage, he punched back, this time imbuing his fist with some Tao energy. He was not sure what doing so did exactly, but it seemed to be quite effective. A faint white glow formed around his fist and it shot forwards like a bullet. The robot crossed its forearms to block, but it was shot backwards by the force. The robot struggled to its feet, but Sam was already upon it. His left fist fainted and as the robot responded, he drilled in the chin with his right. With a crunch, the robot's head crumpled and it fell to the ground. Breathing heavily, Sam contemplated the fight. The robot had become far stronger in just a single jump from the first level. If it really simulated a fighter, then the next one would be the first one with a class. Sam wondered if he should be content with just the second level, but then he gathered his resolve and decided to go for it. This was an invaluable opportunity to train himself in relative safety. He doubted that the robot would kill him, and sure enough, he found out that there was a safe word coded into it. If he said stop, then it would stop. Taking a deep breath, he drew his mace, and pressed the next button. The robot sprang forward immediately, with no warning. Sam dodged to the side, but was still caught with a vicious clothesline, slamming him into the hard ground. The air rushed out of him and he bounced back up, blocking the next stroke with his mace. The robot looked different now, and it had fist wraps on this time. Its eyes glowed brighter than before and Sam even felt a faint pressure from it. It was as if the robot possessed a Tao. He could tell that it was not a real Tao however, just something made to simulate one. Sam pushed back with his dual Daos, succeeding in knocking the robot off balance. It let out a dull robotic roar and flashed forwards towards him. That was not its natural speed thankfully, but the use of a skill. 
Sam rolled to the side and he slammed his mace into the side of the robot, leaving a small dent. The robot wheeled round and launched into a devastating series of blows, all moving at the limit of Sam's perception. It was far more skilled than him in the martial world and he only knew how to swing his mace. For the first time since he had gained the system, Sam's intelligence stat began to work over time. The intelligence stat was strange in that it did not actually increase conventional intelligence, only things that were actually useful in a battle. It would not allow a fighter to suddenly begin to solve complex mathematical equations if they could not do so already, but it would let them read their opponents for openings. As the fist of the robot came crashing down on Sam, he suddenly saw how to avoid it. With an artful twirl, he used his mace to knock away the hand and retaliate with his free hand. His fist slammed home and the robot stumbled away. He looked down at his hand in amazement, not sure of what had just happened. Sam almost lost his head to a karate chop, but he snapped out of his amazement, just in time to avoid it. Using his hand again, he caught the robot, throwing it over his shoulder in a modified judo throw. That was impressive, because he had never done judo in his life. Turning his body, he slammed his mace down on the robot, but it rebounded off a shield of blue light. This robot was geared up to the max. It placed both hands together, and they began to glow with a fiery light. The fist wrapping burst into flames and the robot surged upwards, uppercutting Sam. The bottom of his face was seared for a brief moment, and then he was piledrived into the roof of the shield. His vision failing, Sam fell to the ground. As the fist of the robot came in, his Tao exploded out of him, the force of anger causing his skin to ignite with red light. Sam growled at the robot and shot his hand out, grabbing onto its neck. Roaring in exertion, he began to squeeze. As he did so, a burning pain gripped his body in its embrace and his skin began to peel. The robot began to melt beneath his hand and it started smoking. Sam closed his fist, breaking his fingers with his sudden, savage strength. The robot fell to the ground and Sam fell with it. As he woke up, he saw that the robot had returned to its previous positions. His skin was red, as if he had been in the sun for too long. Small wounds were in the process of closing over, his regeneration at work. Checking his system interface, he saw that he had a new notification. You have gained the Dao skill, fiery rage, epic. The power of rage fills your body, it's toxic fire able to send your enemies to death. Such power comes with a price however, and your body is that price. Channel your Tao into yourself, boosting your strength and speed, but dealing constant damage to yourself as a result. Sam looked at the robot with newfound respect. He had thought that it was just some toy, but it was actually invaluable. The robot had just helped him develop another Tao skill, now bringing his total to two. This thing was the true reward for the tournaments in his eyes, one that he had earned with his strength. He wished that he was able to buy one of these for himself, but he had not seen any for sale in the markets. In addition, they would probably cost more than he had on him even with the money from Jeffrey. Also, he had noticed that his skill name format had been altered, which was probably a result of his updated stat sheet. Now that he had streamlined his stats, it seemed that his notifications were made somewhat clearer as well. He was too battered now to go for another round, and he was ready to enjoy the amenities. Chapter 32 First up was the hot tub. As he neared it, his body started to relax, in a manner that suggested more than just normal heat. Peeling off his clothes, he lowered himself into it, and sighed in relief. It was not a normal hot tub. His skin began to regenerate at a visible rate, and his mind was calmed. With the last presence of mind that he had left, he scanned the hot tub. Calurin Peon Level Hot Tub. Jirank Magical Item. The cheapest item sold by the sector-renowned Calurin Spa Company. This hot tub is enchanted to provide relief from minor aches and pains. Even a mere peon-level product from this company is equivalent to a higher quality one from a lesser company. This product is copyrighted by the Calurin Company. Any attempts to copy this product for personal gain will result in censure. He briefly read it, but he could not bring himself to fully study it. Instead, he sank back into blissful nothingness. The water cooled after a few hours and he drifted back to awareness. His entire body was refreshed and he felt as if he had slept for an entire day. The description of the item came back to him as he got out and dried off. He had never seen a company name in an item description before and it made him curious about the larger multiverse. In addition, the description of the hot tub as a peon level 1 was strange. He had thought that the only description of an item's quality was its power rank. Apparently there was a whole system of corporate quality guidelines as well. If he ever got the chance to look into it, he would. The more important part of the hot tub was that it had healed him of his wounds. Now he was fresh and ready for the first round of the tournament. Sam had to wait another few hours for the tournament to start, time that he spent working out with the weights. 
It was deeply satisfying to use inhumanly heavy weights and he never tired of seeing the massive balls of metal rise up into the air as he curled the dumbbells. He was in the middle of resting, his hair slicked back with sweat, when a voice rang out through the room. Fighters. The first round will begin in 15 minutes. Please make your way to the arena staging area. Sam had no idea where the arena staging area was, but his token lit up and he felt the same tugging sensation that had led him to his room. Following it, he traipsed through the halls, finding himself in front of a crowd of people. Next to them, a large door stood, revealing the inside of the arena. He could hear faint cheers from outside and as he looked in, he gulped. Every person on earth was sitting there. Normally, he was not that shy but at the sight of over four million people, he quailed. A few others were having panic attacks in the corner and Sam watched as they were carted away by an alien attendant. Barigis stood in front of the door, his pink skin flushed with excitement. Greetings. The tournament proper is about to start and all I need to tell you are a few rules. Firstly, killing is not banned, however if your opponent surrenders, then killing them will result in disqualification. Secondly, surrendering does not count unless the words are spoken fully, in a way that the other fighter can hear it. Finally, the use of anything except for a single weapon, or set of weapons, and your own skills are not allowed. Any outside assistance or illegal goods will result in disqualification. Now, for the format of the fights. All the fighters will be seated depending on their strength prior to the tournament. This way, someone who is near the bottom of the rankings will not be facing off against one of the top 10, at least initially. If you lose a match, then you are placed in the loser's bracket. Three wins there means that you will be placed back into the tournament. Now, it's time for the first fight. Will Rika Harold and Tobias Lurch please step forwards? Two of the people in the crowd stepped forwards, a small woman with dull red hair and a skinny man who had a permanent scowl on his face. They walked up to Barigis who whispered in their ears. Both of them nodded and they walked up the ramp and into the arena. Chairs rose out of the ground beneath the remaining fighters and they sat down. Two large screens appeared at the front of the room, showing a panoramic view of the arena. One screen focused on Rika and the other one focused on Tobias. They both stood still, and then Barigis vanished from in front of Sam. The alien appeared in the middle of the arena, rising up on a pillar of rock that erupted from the ground. He pulled out a microphone, an unnecessary implement given his level, but it made the whole display somehow seem more natural. IT is time. The fights that you have been waiting for will now begin. Brought to you by the finest specimens of your planet, these will be the most engaging displays of raw power and honed skill that you will ever see. Make sure that you don't miss it, or else you're going to regret it. Now, let's have a big hand for our first fighters, Rika Harold and Tobias Lurch. The crowd erupted into applause and the two fighters shifted uncomfortably. Barigis leaped off the pillar and vanished again, a colorful explosion going off in the air where he had been. Both fighters ran forwards and the battle began. Sam could immediately tell that they were nowhere near his level. The two seemed to both have focused on dexterity, at least partially, as their movements were crisp and collected. Tobias started off the fight, with a beam of blue light from between his fingers. It sped through the air, but Rika drew a rapier from her belt, slicing the beam down the middle. Tobias' scowl deepened as the crowd cheered for her. She leapt forward and Tobias quickly summoned an energy shield in front of him. The woman raised her rapier up and brought the tip down with all of her strength. The blade sunk into the shield, sending a spiderweb of cracks through it. Then Tobias smiled. A bolt of lightning leapt from his fingers and into the tip of her rapier, causing her to spasm in shock. He sent off a bolt of kinetic force and propelled her off the shield. With a snap of his fingers, the shield dissipated. The man used some sort of rapid-fire mage build, with focus on speed rather than power. This was shown by how his opponent got to her feet after taking his attack. She grimaced and raised her sword, slashing it down through the air. A thin strip of white light came out, reminiscent of the attack used by the Angel of Death. This one was far weaker however. It still managed to connect with Tobias, cutting into his arm. The mage snarled at Rika and charged her, his fists glowing with arcane light. This quickly proved to be a mistake. The man was not a melee fighter and he was obviously outclassed by Rika. His fist came down, but she was already gone, with her rapier slashing down on his foot. Tobias tried to get out of the way, but it cut straight through his Achilles tendon, hobbling him. By then, the fight was over. The woman held her blade to his throat until the man yielded. With a flash of light, he was teleported away and Rika was left there to enjoy the adulation of the crowd. A door opened on the other side of the arena and she walked over, glad to be out of the spotlight. Chapter 33 The two screens in front of them changed colors, one of them now green and the other red. A scoreboard appeared with two different brackets on it. 
One of them was the loser's bracket, which Tobias was now in, and the other was the winner's bracket, which Rika was in. Rika walked to the back of the room and sat down at an empty seat. She was mobbed by other fighters, but she ignored them. It seemed as if the first fight had received VIP treatment as the other ones were announced by the scoreboard instead of Barigis himself. For the next three hours, Sam sat there watching the matches. Most of them ended rather quickly, one of the fighters much stronger than the other, but a few were quite interesting. The 35th fight was between the Bear of the Motherland, a man who Sam had briefly seen on the level's leaderboard, and another man who called himself Reaper. Reaper had a very unsettling skill set. He could commune with ghosts and use them for power, and he started off the fight with the summoning of a terrifying apparition. It looked like a giant diseased head that had blank white eyes, marred with cataracts. It let out a piercing scream that had most of the audience on the ground from how loud it was. Some of the stronger people resisted it and were able to catch the first few moments of the fight. A beam of gray energy shot out of the mouth of the specter and towards the other fighter. The bear, a tall and heavily muscled man, leaped over it, with his battle axe overhead. With a loud exclamation in Russian he fell down, with his axe glowing brightly. It crashed into the ghostly head with a thunder crack, struggling against the ectoplasm for a moment before cutting through. A loud cheer rose from the crowd, especially from a certain area. It seemed as if the man had a fan club. Reaper was unperturbed and he raised his hand, summoning a transparent sword into his hand. The man ran forwards and ducked under a wild swing of the bat leaks, chopping at the other fighter's leg. The bear narrowly dodged it and slammed his axe down, cutting off a piece of Reaper's lank black hair. The bear taunted him, but he failed to notice the wave of energy that formed behind him. By the time that he turned around, it was already too late and he was swallowed up by an amorphous ghost. Reaper turned around as if to say that he was done with the fight, but a roar echoed out of the ghost, coming from the bear. The ectoplasm started to tear and the ghost exploded into a cloud of jelly-like fragments, revealing the Russian fighter there. His skin was burnt away in places, but he stood tall and proud. Pointing his finger at Reaper, he spoke. That was a cheap shot. His thick Russian accent lent extra depth to his words. Reaper shrugged in response. All's fair in love and war, the man said, in a flat monotone. The bear scoffed and threw his axe forwards. As it flew, a jet of blue fire formed behind its head, propelling it at greater and greater speeds. Its owner ran behind it and with a howl of rage, he leapt up and grabbed his axe out of the air, using its momentum to add extra power to it. Reaper stared at the weapon as it fell and then thrust his hand out, a spike of gray energy forming on it. His opponent tried to dodge, but he was in the air so it was impossible. The skewer of energy pierced him through the stomach. Instead of falling back like Reaper had expected, the bear leaned forwards and grabbed onto the spike. His palm sizzled as it touched the ectoplasm, but he gritted his teeth and pulled himself forwards. His axe came down on top of Reaper, the man unable to get out of the way. The axe sunk deep into the man's shoulder, lodging in the bone. The bear smiled in triumph as Reaper fell over, but then he too fell backwards, the blood lost too much for him. The fight had ended in a tie and the scoreboard reflected that. Both of the fighters were sent to the loser's bracket and would have the chance to redeem themselves later. Most of the fights were quite dull to Sam's eyes, as he saw them in what was basically slow motion, but a few like the one between the bear and Reaper were interesting. As well as being just entertaining, they told him a bit about the fighting styles of those who he would probably end up fighting eventually. The 131st match was the first one since the beginning that Barigis announced to the crowd. Now, for the greatest match yet in this tournament, the Prodigy of the Tao vs. the Slayer of Demons, we have the Arbiter vs. the Angel of Death. Sam was finally up. Excited for the fight, he stood up from this chair and locked eyes with his opponent across the room. They walked up the ramp together and faced off on the sand. Barigis hyped up the fight and the crowd's cheers rose to unprecedented levels. When the signal to start rang out, Sam studied his opponent closely. He did not know much about the man, except for a bit of his fighting style. If he underestimated his opponent, then he would very well lose. Despite his own twin Daos, the other man had a higher level than him and past level 25, levels really increased one's strength. The Angel of Death was silent as he in turn studied Sam and they waited a good few seconds before engaging in battle. Sam waited for the other man to strike first, as he was slower than the angel. His sword flashed out of its scabbard in an arc of steel and light and pointed towards Sam. He raised his mace to defend and the first attack came in like a lightning bolt. Two streams of white light erupted from each slash of the man's sword and sliced through the air at Sam. He held his mace in defense, but the force behind the attack still staggered him. They were far stronger than he had expected them to be judging by their effectiveness in the first battle. 
Perhaps the man had been holding back his true power in order to trick the other competitors into making rash decisions. In any case, Sam was still in the fight and he pushed aside the light beams with his mace, relying on his prodigious strength to do so. The other man stared at him and then flashed forward, his rapier point outstretched. Sam planted his mace in the ground and began to draw upon his dao. The fiery feeling of pure rage filled his body. He only had a few seconds before the damage would become debilitating, so he channeled his wrath to its fullest extent. His skin glowed red and his hand accelerated to far higher speeds than he normally would have been able to reach, grasping for the rapier. The angel was faster still however, and he twisted in midair to avoid the reaching hand. Sam tried to dodge, but he was far too slow and a stripe of pain slashed across his cheek, drawing blood. He roared and redoubled his Tao use, succeeding in catching the angel with his hand. With a growl of rage, he twisted and slammed the man down into the dirt, cracking something in him. The angel had focused almost solely on speed over all else, and Sam was going to make him regret that decision. Obviously pained, the man jumped back up after Sam had let go, limping slightly. He screamed something out in Italian and then exploded into pure white fire. The fire condensed around his form and fiery wings formed behind his back. Sam briefly wondered how the man had been able to get past the system translator but decided that that question was useless in the current situation. Instead, he braced for impact. There was no point in dodging the next attack as it would far outstrip Sam's speed. Instead, he would have to tank it. Crossing his arms, Sam attempted to give himself a modicum of protection. He funneled some of his Arbiter Dao energy into his arms, hoping that it would increase his defense. Chapter 34 His opponent raised his rapier and screamed the name of his attack. Lightning of the Exorcist A bolt of light sprang out of the tip of his rapier and rose up into the air, forming into a thundercloud about Sam. It glowed with an ominous purple color before discharging a flurry of bolts down on Sam. He screamed in pain as his skin melted beneath the assault, but he held it together until it was over. He must have looked like a mess to the audience, his skin in tatters and his body covered in blood. He was still kicking however, and the angel of death was about to learn what happened when you messed with someone who had two daos. Sam smiled at the other man, his lips burned away, and his opponent took a single step back. Sam closed his eyes and began to visualize his daos growing inside him. Two specks of light began to grow out of the darkness, one of roiling fire and the other of a pure white energy. They were extremely small, but they both contained infinite potential. Sam saw that both of them were tapped of energy, as a result of his usage during the fight. He still had enough in the tank to finish this however. With an eruption of sound and power, both of his fists burst into flame. One of the flames was a blinding incandescent light and the other one looked more like conventional fire. Both of them were equally deadly. His skin burned away even more under the fire, but he ignored the pain and focused on condensing the power down. The fires were crushed under the force of his will into gauntlets of light that coated his hands from the wrist down. He seized his mace and the fire began to course down its length, setting the weapon aflame. Sam growled as his skin peeled away, but he withstood it. With a grunt, he raised his mace over his head and brought it down on the ground in front of him. A thick wave of force swept across the arena, causing the remnants of his Tao energy to dissipate. Sam swayed, but did not fall. The angel of death scoffed and stepped to the side, but the wave followed him. The force of judgment combined with rage would not allow its target to escape that easily. The dexterous man danced around the attack, but for every second that he dodged it, it sped up. Sam almost fell over as his body was suffused with exhaustion, but he forced himself to stay upright. If he fell now, then the fight would be over and his opponent would have won. The crowd was deathly still as they watched and none of them even blinked, such was their desire to catch every minute of the fight. Sam slapped his face to stay awake and watched as the wave finally caught up to the angel of death. It crashed into him with the force of a meteor, cracking his bones and sending him across the arena and into the wall. To Sam's surprise, the man rose again, but then fell to the ground, utterly spent. Berigis appeared and he grabbed Sam's hand, raising it into the air. We have a victor. The rest of his words were drowned out by a tumultuous storm of cheering and clapping from the stands. Sam smiled weakly as he fell backwards and into the abyss of sleep. Sam woke up on a bed in a white room. The room was lined with other beds, each with a person on them. Sam recognized some of them, such as Reaper and the Bear of the Motherland. Next to him was the prone form of his opponent. Sam quickly turned the other way, ashamed of his brutal assault on the other man suddenly, but a crackly voice beckoned him to stay put. Don't be ashamed of your victory. It was a well-fought battle. You are clearly my better. I thought that my skill might be able to bridge the gap, but apparently the system does not lie. You truly deserve your position on the leaderboards. 
The angel of death's voice was soft and raspy, very different from how he had sounded during the fight. I can tell that you are a man of honor. I have decided to trust you with my name. I am Eduardo, hopefully that makes my name less of a mouthful in your mind. Sam chuckled. The other man had no idea just how true that last bit was. A lot of the fighters had used long pseudonyms, forcing Sam to either abbreviate them as he thought about them or just say it all out loud. He weighed the other man's words, wondering if he was being truthful with what he said. Sam eventually decided that he was. Thank you. My name is Sam, and I give you this in hope that you will not betray me. You seem to be a good man as well, and God knows that the world needs those right now. Eduardo chuckled. It's a difficult thing, being a man of God in the world of the system. Every day I wake up, wondering if my faith is truly placed. If the system is a god, then are we all creations of a machine? My goal is to find out the truth behind existence and see once and for all if there is a god. The arrival of the system has been both a curse and blessing for the devout. Sam gave that heavy statement the silence that it deserved, thinking on it himself. He had never been an especially religious man, but he still believed that there was something greater out there, something perhaps divine. Now he was only confused. Was the system truly a god, or was there something else out there, something that actually was the creator of existence? He had read about the creator kings in the system guide to the multiverse, but they were only the gods of this multiverse, not all of reality itself. Suddenly, a burning desire blossomed in his mind to uncover the truth as well. He was an eternity away from gaining the power to find such a truth, but he resolved himself to never give up. He turned towards Eduardo again, but the man had fallen asleep. Sam smiled weakly and lay back down, letting himself rest and recuperate. A steady drip of some red fluid pumped into his arm from an I.V bag and he could feel a strange warmth emanating from where it was inserted. He focused on that warmth to distract himself from the pain that he was in. He had overtaxed his daos and now he was paying the price. With the last vestiges of awareness left in him, he used his eyes of judgment on the man sleeping next to him, smiling when he saw the pure white light that limbed his form. He had placed his trust well. Then he slept a dark dreamless sleep, punctuated by flashes of brilliant light that intruded upon his slumber. Sam awoke back in his room, fully healed from his wounds. Everything was as he had left it, the robot still in its circle and the gentle bubbling of the hot tub in the background. He stretched his muscles, testing to see if there was any residual trauma. There was none. The medicine of the multiverse truly was miraculous. He lay back on his couch for a few moments, recovering his mental fortitude. Even though he was healed, the effects of the pain were still with him and he needed a break. Then he mustered his resolve and got up. That fight could have gone either way and he realized that he was nowhere near as strong as he thought he was. The people above him on the leaderboard would probably be able to effortlessly deal with him, and he would probably have to face them sooner rather than later. It was time to avail of the training resources that he had been given. Firstly, he warmed up with some weightlifting. His muscles were tired from inactivity in the hospital bed and he needed to get them working properly again. His goal was to beat the fourth setting of the training robot. He had no hopes of doing so, but he knew that his opponents were at that level. The overlord was already within the level range of the robot and he had a Dao as well. If Sam's plan worked out and he made it to the finals, then he would likely be up against the strongest man on earth himself. It was a daunting task, but one that he was ready to undertake. With a deep breath, he stepped into the circle with the robot, turning on the force field with his foot. Then he pressed the fourth button. Before Sam knew what had happened, he was on his ass, with a fist planted on his neck. The robot glared down at him with its bright eyes and prepared to cave in his head with its other fist. Sam struggled futilely and then turned off the robot. Stop! The training robot froze in place and then withdrew its arms, letting Sam get up. He had not been physically hurt, but his ego had been severely bruised. That robot had been so fast and strong that he had not even seen its first move come in. Sam was far behind the level's curve of earth, but there was no way for him to level up in this environment. He would have to make up for it with his Dao. Chapter 35 He was still on the top of the Dao leaderboard and he would likely stay there, if his status as the Dao incarnation of existence was anything to go by. Sam was frustrated by the obtuse name of his status. It didn't tell him anything more than that he was better than others at forming Daos. The name sounded like something special, but in reality it barely increased his strength. It was like in those anime where the villain would give their final attack some ridiculously overblown name, but in reality it was just a quick sword strike. What had confused him was why the system had seemingly hidden it from him. It had come up previously as the mark of Tantalo's Veravax, something that Jeffrey had told him did not exist. Why would the system go to such lengths to conceal that from Sam? It wasn't like he posed any sort of threat to it he was sure that the system could kill him in an instant if it really wanted to. 
Sam sighed and sat down. Lifting weights wasn't doing anything for him, the only way to get stronger now was to increase the power of his Tao. So far, he was more inclined to increase the power of his Tao mode of the Arbiter first. He had no wish to become some raging brute, unable to do anything but think with his fists. Sam closed his eyes and found his Daos again. This time, he studied them intently. In the background, there was a faint light and he sent his consciousness towards it. To his surprise, he saw his core. The light coming off it was brighter than it had been before, but it was still quite dim. He turned back to his Daos and saw that they were orbiting his core like tiny planets. This told him that they were connected to his cultivation in some way, which was accurate he supposed, as both paths to power relied on vast amounts of time spent grinding. His level increased as he killed opponents and his daos increased through contemplation. He flew back through his core space towards his daos and stopped in front of his dao of the arbiter. The mode of light spun quickly, with the backdrop of total darkness behind it. Sam approached, but he started to feel a pressure pushing him back. As he neared, he felt more and more pain from the pressure. He gritted his teeth and touched the orb with his hand. A jolt of incandescent agony swept through his body and he was transported off to another time and place. He stood in the middle of a battlefield and watched as two forces clashed with each other. Both of them were wearing the same armor and bearing the same flags. Their war shook the ground and all around them, cities and towns were shook to their foundations, killing millions of people. Still they fought and Sam was briefly shown why they fought. One of the leaders sought justice for the deaths of his children, allegedly slain by the leader of the opposing army. In reality, it was a manufactured scenario, set up by the true enemy to make them fight each other. This battle would split the world apart if it did not end soon and Sam watched with bated breath as earthquakes and tsunamis ravaged the world. The power of the people in these visions were always far more than his own, to the point of absurdity. As a fissure opened up, leading to the planet's core, a man glowing with power appeared in the sky. Raising his hands, he called down a rain of energy beams, wiping out the warring armies to a man. He shed tears like rain as he did so, and Sam was informed that he was the king of this world, and the father of the two leaders of the armies. The man looked straight into Sam's eyes as the vision faded away and Sam was sent back to the environs of his room. There was some deep meaning in the vision and Sam found it after a round of meditation. The vision had shown him that sometimes, justice was more important than anything else. It had greatly pained the king to kill his own children, but it was necessary for the survival of the planet. Sometimes, Sam would have to make hard choices in order to preserve justice. You have deepened your connection to the Tao mode of the Arbiter. The maintenance of justice is not an easy task. Sometimes, your mind and spirit will rebel against the tasks that are necessary to preserve order. You have realized this truth and as such have increased your understanding of your Tao. Sam felt like he was in greater concert with his Tao now, and he felt that he was beginning to understand its ideals. An Arbiter was an impassive instrument of justice, one that had to preserve their path over all else. If Sam wished to be an arbiter then he would have to follow this path to the letter. It would be a hard path, but also a rewarding one. It would take him to the top of the multiverse if he followed it all the way through, as if he was to judge all of the unworthy, then he would need to be stronger than them. Sam felt dizzy as he took in these parts of his Tao and he walked over to the hot tub to clear his head. Sinking into the warm waters, he felt his mind unwind and unravel. His body was in peak condition so all he felt otherwise were the soothing jets of water. If it even was water. Sam felt that there was something strange about the liquid in the tub. It was slightly more viscous than normal water and it became more viscous the more injured one was. The first time he had been in the tub, it had felt almost like honey. Now, it was like a light syrup. He only realized this now that his mind was a bit clearer than before. Either way, it was refreshing. He only hoped that he was not bathing in the mucus of some sort of high-level monster. That would not have surprised him at this point. He let himself have a long soak in the tub and then he left it, ready to return to training. Sam wondered why he had not been called back to the arena. Perhaps he was being given a short break from the fighting. After another hour of lounging around and working out, his token began to pulse again. He followed it back to the arena entrance and found his seat. All around him, people whispered and pointed at him. Sam was glad for his mask, but he wished that he could find a more comfortable one. It was starting to get tattered as it was only a piece of clothing after all. Across the room, Eduardo gave him a thumbs up. The man had also recovered from his fight and he made it clear to Sam that there were no hard feelings. The two men who had entered the tournament together, Rodney Kane and the Scourge of New York, sat together, staring daggers at Sam. He had no idea why they were so antagonistic towards him, perhaps they were afraid that he would surpass them. Neither of them had a doubt so they clung to their number two and three positions with a very tenuous grasp. 
for all the acrimonious interactions that he had had with the men, he was glad that he would have a chance to put them in their place. He had used his Tao skill on them before and both of them were as black as pitch from their sin. His Tao of the Arbiter cried out for justice and he would enact it soon enough. Strangely enough, the system had not considered the attack that he had used against Eduardo in the last match as enough of a focused discipline to be considered a skill. He had not received any notifications about it, which was just as well because it had severely injured him. Maybe the system only codified a skill after the user had gained some degree of proficiency with it. The match that was going on at that moment was just a low level one between some sort of beast tamer and an archer. Neither were that skilled and Sam checked the leaderboards, confirming that neither had a class. The number of people with classes was still extremely low and there was no opportunity for anyone to grow stronger here. As if to disprove his thought, Barigis stepped out of the shadows and into the room after the match ended. That marks the end of the first rounds of the tournament. Some of you languish in the loser's bracket, waiting for your chance for redemption, and the rest sit triumphantly in the winner's bracket. Now, it has come to my attention that many of you find the fact that there are no leveling opportunities here to be unfair. Well, I have decided to create a solution. We will have an extra event within this tournament. The crowd looked at him with confused expressions. He paused and then snapped his fingers. Oh, right. The event will be a monster hunt. You all will be placed into teams that will have to defeat a series of progressively stronger monsters. I have arranged for some very special specimens to be imported, so this should be fun. Barigis pointed up at the boards and a countdown appeared. You will all have 12 hours to prepare in any way that you see fit. You can visit the city outside the arena for this if you wish, but make sure that you finish up quickly because you will be teleported here when the time has passed, no matter what you are doing. I suggest that you use your time well. The pink alien disappeared, this time eliciting no reaction from anyone. Chapter 36 They were all used to the man's strange powers by now. Sam had theorized that the man was about E-rank from what Jeffrey had told him about the powers of the multiverse, but he was completely wrong. On the D-rank planet Karenna, three universes away, in the middle of the universal core, Barigis let out a deep breath. He was situated in his office on the highest floor of the crowning jewel of the city world of Karenna, the headquarters of his media empire. It was named after the first of his wives, who he had been with for millennia. As a cultivator should, he possessed a vast harem of wives, but of those only the first was the one who he truly loved. She had smiled upon seeing an entire planet dedicated to her name. Creating a solar system-sized planet out of high-grade materials had cost quite a bit of credits, but it was money well spent in Barigis' mind. In addition, it gave him a place to relax when he was feeling stressed. Visiting such a pauper's den of a universe such as the newly initialized one was mentally taxing, and he needed a good dose of opulence and splendor to recover. His physical body was also drained as well. The use of his astral imprint was quite taxing on him, even though he was a peak D-rank cultivator. The only reason that he had done so was because of the money that he would gain from personally attending the tournaments of the newly initialized universe. Someone high up in the multiversal totem pole had paid him a fortune in C-rank monster cores to keep an eye on the Arbiter, aka Sam Atlas. He had initially refused, such a task as babysitting a peon from some new universe was beneath him, but when he heard that the man was not only the first person in his universe to form a Tao, but that he had also done so faster than anyone in this sector before, he had become intrigued. It was not every day that the head of the largest news network in the nearest ten universes was surprised, but this was one of those occasions. Upon meeting the man through his astral imprint, Bergis had been astounded by the clarity of his spirit and Tao for one so young. He had heard of the geniuses that initialized universes sometimes created, but he had never witnessed one for himself until now. Growing up in a wealthy universe that had been inducted into the system billions of years ago did wonders for one's personal safety and peace of mind, but it also led to most of its inhabitants stagnating in their cultivation. He had also sensed the presence of a few other prodigies, an old man, a causal anomaly who had adapted to the system far more easily than any other inhabitant of his planet, and a strange creature who was not entirely human. How such a creature made its way onto the planet was unknown to him, but he was sure that quite a few sects would be interested in him. Barigis hadn't bothered to visit the other parts of that universe, but he had felt a few rising stars among the other species. Compared to the blazing beacon of Earth, they were but candles however. Something had happened on that planet, something that allowed its cultivators to grow at an unprecedented rate. If Barigis was able to capitalize on that efficiently, then he would have a slightly higher chance of breaking into C-rank. He had been at the bottleneck for millennia, and he could find no way to break through. Expensive pills, monster cores, even seeking out natural expressions of the Tao such as the last moments of stars did nothing. 
This was perhaps his last chance for glory, for the chance to become a universal king. He would not waste it. It was a pity that the universe was already claimed by the butcher, but Berigius was wise enough not to go anywhere near that madman. This meant that he would not be able to recruit anyone from that universe, but that was fine with him. He could find a way, just as he had built his company from a small leaflet business on an unnamed moon near the fringes of the universe. Leaning back in his starfire tiger skin couch, he closed his eyes and sank into a trance, envisioning the future with his Tao. The visions that he gleaned were always muddy, but sometimes they had meaning to them. Recently, the image of Sam Atlas had blazed within them like a dying star, outshining everything else. He would turn the boy to his cause, or he would die. It was as simple as that. The Tournament City Unaware of the universal level intrigue that he had created simply by existing, Sam roamed the streets of the unnamed city that the arena stood in. He had tried to find out where it was, but had so far been unlucky in that regard. There were no natural landmarks or any sort of way out of the city. It seemed to stretch on forever, far beyond what a normal city would be able to reach. He had given up after an hour, and went off in search of that delicious food stand that he had visited on the first day. It had taken a while as the city was built like a maze, but he eventually made his way to IT.to his surprise, there was a line in front of it. Upon seeing him, everyone made way, but he had no wish to profit off of the other's fear. No, I'm fine. I'll wait in line like everyone else, Sam said, as much from the uncomfortable twinge in this Tao of the Arbiter when he had toyed with the notion of skipping, than out of common decency. His Daos were beginning to root themselves strongly in his body and soul, and he knew that he would have to follow them faithfully or risk unforeseen consequences. After the line of about fifty people had finished buying their food, Sam bought his own meal and walked around the city as he ate it. It was just as mouthwateringly delightful as he had remembered as he polished it off in a matter of seconds. Now he had to get to the more important business, which was replacing his mask. He roamed the streets for a good while, looking for a shop that sold masks. Most of them were mobbed with people looking for cheap knickknacks or weapons, but he eventually found one that was almost empty. There was only one person in it, an older man, at least judging from his white hair. Sam did not bother to speak to him, as he seemed busy, but instead made his way to the back of the shop where a rack of clothing stood. There, on the top, was what he was looking for. An ivory mask that would completely cover his face. Sam picked it up and prepared to pay for it, but a crash came from over where the older man stood. He had tripped over a rack of goods and was lying on the floor, bleeding heavily. Are you all right? Sam asked as he rushed over. He tore off a piece of his clothes and wiped at the blood on the man's leg. Then he paused in confusion. It was not blood, but cherry juice. He looked into the twinkling eyes of the man and saw his face for the first time. It was profound visionary. The man smiled at him mischievously and got up. You are an honorable man. There was no need for you to stop to help a strange old man who had fallen, but you did so nonetheless. None of the other people that I had tested acted in that way. Some of them pretended to care, but they did not, in their heart of hearts, have any time for me. But you were different. Curious. Sam paused for a minute and then answered. What can I say? It was the right thing to do. Just because we are all superhumans now, does not mean that common decency should be a thing of the past. If those other people treated you like that, then they were wrong to do so. However, why did you test them in that way in the first place? Sam added at the end with a narrowing of his eyes. Oh ho, we have a sharp one here. That befits your Tao well indeed. Imagine my surprise when I met the man who had managed to form a Tao before me. I had thought that you were a fraud, but now, I can tell the truth. You really did surpass me in the following of the way. Even though I have spent my entire life in search of the universal truths of the Tao, you still managed to beat me to it when we gained the ability to truly connect to them. Only time will tell how you choose to use that power however. The door of the shop opened suddenly and Sam looked over. It had just been a gust of wind. He turned back towards profound visionary, but the man was gone. Shaking his head, Sam picked up the mask and walked out of the store, his clothes conspicuously missing a piece of fabric. So confused by his strange encounter he was, that he did not even notice. Chapter 37 The remaining time until the tournament continued was spent wandering the town aimlessly. Now that Sam felt secure in his disguise, he decided that it was time to check out the competition. He searched for the other top ten people, but did not find any. They had all disappeared off to somewhere that was inaccessible to him and presumably everyone else too. As he walked, he ran through the various alliances that he had noted among his competitors. It was quite clear that the number two and three men were working together, but he had no knowledge of some of the other top rankers. The overlord was still an enigma as far as he was concerned. He had heard his voice, but that was it. He had never encountered some of the others such as Phoenix and Melissa Tang, 
and had only briefly seen Anonymous. As the tournament progressed, he would likely have to fight them. This next event would be what made or broke his chances. He needed to level up badly, as he was still stuck at the very bottom of the class levels. When he was teleported into the arena, it was a relief, and the sight of Barigis was oddly comforting. Welcome to the Grand Monster Hunt. You will all be divided into teams of 10, and depending on factors such as your position in the arena and overall strength, you will either go first or last. On the scoreboard, a few hundred lists of names appeared. Sam was recognizable by most, so his teammates came over to him immediately. Seven of them were just random competitors, but the other two were people that he knew, either personally or from seeing them fight. The first one was Reaper, the man who had channeled the power of the grave against the bear of the motherland. The other one was Eduardo, the man who Sam had fought against recently. As soon as they grouped together, their name appeared on the board. There was no opportunity to create a team name and it was simply called the Arbiter's Team and they were near the top of the list. Sam's presence as well as that of Eduardo and Reaper, who was at number 15 on the leaderboards, had nudged them up to the number 3 place. The team above them was called Rodney's Team, led by Rodney Kane. With him was the Scourge of New York and Anonymous. Finally, the top team was led by the Overlord, who on his own had sent his team to the top place. Everyone else in his team cowered in fear of him and he seemed to enjoy the effect that he was having on them. As the final team grouped together, Barigis spoke. Now that you are in your teams, I shall tell you the rules. The 100 weakest teams will enter the arena first, then followed by the next 100 and so on. The arena has been modified with spatial magic in order to make it fit all of you and the monsters. The event theme is Dark Forest and the arena will be set up to match. The winner of the event, the team who has killed the greatest number of monsters and with the highest average slain monster level, will each be given a special reward. In addition, you will also be able to level up normally within this event. Inter-team sabotage or assault is discouraged, but not banned. However, unless you are entirely sure of your strength, it would be best to abstain. Let us begin. The gates of the arena opened with a clang, Sam had not seen the gates before so it must have been a theatrical addition, and the 100 weakest teams were ushered out. Muffled howls came from the arena, and the interior was pitch black. After a minute, the first human scream wafted out. Sam winced, but remained stalwart. Several of the competitors tried to run, but they were not allowed to. Tut tut. Did you not read the small print on the contract that you signed? Oh wait, it was in subatomic script, none of you are able to read that. I apologize for writing in such a style, but you must understand that I am used to dealing with far more powerful individuals. In any case, this should not be a cause for fear, but rather a gift. Sam paled as he realized the implications of that statement. There could have been anything on that piece of paper, anything at all, and he would never know. What if he had promised the next decade of his life away to Barigis? Sam calmed himself and forced his mental state to flatten. None of that mattered right now. All that there was to worry about was the next event. The next hundred people entered the arena, some of them visibly resisting the pull of the contract. One of them lingered for too long, and a surge of electricity danced across their skin, killing them instantly. Barigis laughed in glee. When you are all more powerful, remember this lesson well. Never sign a contract of any sort, unless you are sure that it is not trapped. That fool there suffered the consequences, and I hope that you all are wise enough not to follow her. Sam began to feel his twin Daos pulse within him, demanding justice for the death, but he restrained them. If he tried to attack Barigis then he would die. Instead, he banked up his Dao energies, resolving to one day enact justice. It sickened him that the seemingly genial man was in reality a stone-cold murderer, but he supposed that in the multiverse, power was everything. Nobody would care about what happened to a few frontier citizens, especially if they were only G-rank. It was indeed a valuable lesson, but beyond just the scope of what Barigis had said. It further inflamed Sam's desire to grow strong enough to rise above all of this, and to be able to protect himself and those who could not protect themselves. Finally, it was their turn to enter the arena. He felt a vague pressure begin to form around him, but he quickened his pace and the feeling vanished. They entered the arena, and were immediately plunged into darkness. It was like the essence of night had been summoned into the arena. All around, the shadowy outlines of dark trees could be seen. One of Sam's teammates whimpered softly as he looked around him. Far above them, the beating of vast leathery wings could be heard, hinting at the presence of some leviathan hiding in the clouds. On the ground, all was still. The eerie silence of the shadow-limbed woods ate away at Sam's resolve in a way that was definitely not natural. He began to output a steady stream of Tao energy, succeeding in repressing the effect of the woods. All around him, his teammates sighed in relief. Eduardo turned to Sam and whispered softly in his ear. Was that your Tao? 
Yes. Why do you ask? Sam replied, a bit apprehensively. He trusted the man somewhat, but anyone could be a traitor, especially in this new and twisted world. That must mean that this wood is suffused with Tao energy. I felt this ominous pressure until you used your Tao to beat it back. This is not a natural wood. It might not only be the monsters that we have to worry about, Eduardo cautioned, his tone stern. Sam nodded in agreement and told the rest of the team what he had just been told. Watch out for any suspicious occurrences in the woods. They might not just be a backdrop for this event. The others nodded, but Reaper glared at Sam. Why do we have to follow you anyway? The man said, addressing the whole group. What gives you the right to lead us? Eduardo began to angrily rebut the man, but Sam raised his hand. Please, let me defend myself. Look, Reaper, I was chosen to lead this team because I am the strongest among us. If it was not for me, you all would still be under the effects of the forest. If you think that you can lead us more efficiently, then prove to me that your power is sufficient to protect everyone here. Sam crossed his arms and waited for the brash man to answer. Reaper scoffed angrily, but wisely did not attempt to press the point. Chapter 38 Sam kept an eye on the man from then on, making sure that he was not planning anything. As he studied him, he realized that Reaper could not be more than 16 or 17 years old. He hid his face well, but he had the telltale wispy mustache and beard of a boy of that age. Sam chuckled. He could guess why he had gained the power set that he had. He had probably been some sort of edgelord or weeb before the system came and he naturally gravitated towards death. Sam did not know how he accessed those powers without a Tao, but that was a question for later. For now, his Daos were enough and he did not need to go chasing alternate routes to power. Besides, it was very unlikely that he would tell Sam anyway. They made their way through the trees softly, watching out for any monsters. The first one appeared about ten minutes into the journey. It targeted the weakest of the fighters, a mage who specialized in the manipulation of air. The monster looked like a twisted version of an elf, with long ears and a grotesquely elongated body. It was about ten feet tall and it had to hunch over to walk under the branches. The woman screamed as it approached her, and she desperately cast a spell, but the monster dodged it and lashed out with razor-sharp talons. Sam rushed forwards to protect her, but Eduardo got there first, his rapier outstretched. The exorcist weaved around the flashing talons of the monster and opened up a series of deep wounds on its side. The monster, realizing that it was outclassed, tried to run away, but Reaper finished it off with a bolt of ectoplasmic energy. Sam fell back and nodded in approval of the teamwork. He scanned the corpse and found out that it was a mutated troll, and that it had been level 17. The levels of the monsters in this arena were far higher than most of the humans here and Sam gnashed his teeth as he thought about the evil of Barigis. How had the man transitioned from seeming so nice, perhaps a little eccentric, into this Machiavellian mastermind? Perhaps it was the effects of a drastically raised intelligence score as well as a history in deception. They cautiously edged around the woods and encountered many more of the trolls, but nothing else. In the beginning, they came one by one and were easily dealt with by Sam, Eduardo and Reaper, but the quantity and quality of the trolls began to tick up over time. Sam screamed in rage as the first of his teammates died to a troll that he was unable to kill in time. His entire body began to burn up as the untrammeled effects of his Tao of anger showed, and the darkness around him briefly retreated, revealing a sunlit forest floor. A pillar of red energy shot up into the sky from Sam's body and he exploded into action. There were six more trolls in the woods around them, but they all met a quick and bloody end within a matter of seconds. Sam did not bother to even use his mace, instead tearing at them with his nails and in one case his teeth. The trolls crumpled under his blows and he was left panting and snarling at a tree, which he punched as the last vestiges of his rage left him. With a resounding crack, the tree split in half and fell over. He walked back over to his shocked companions and refused to say a word to them about it. His Tao was beginning to become somewhat concerning. It had a strong grasp over his mental state, and even though he could somewhat contain it, it had an undeniable allure to it. Why shouldn't he unleash his rage upon those who wronged him? His other Tao had no quarrel with it, and as a barometer of virtue, it should tell him something about the morality of using his anger to benefit himself in battle. Perhaps he was just being naive about a new tool in his arsenal, but it still felt wrong in some way. Luckily, he had no reason to use it again for the next few hours as they trekked along the forest floor and hopefully towards greater leveling opportunities. All of the lower-leveled members of the team had leveled up by now, and the lowest level one had gained two levels from the fights. After the first death, Eduardo had decided to add everyone except for Sam to his party. The man had no trouble with revealing his name to the others, but Sam did not want to have his name exposed. Doing this allowed the weaker people to gain essence from the exploits of the strong. 
Sam was beginning to grow tired of the endless monotony of the forest and when the first new enemy arrived, he felt a surge of elation. It was shaped like a pixie, a small winged creature with humanoid proportions. Unlike most pixies, it had sharp fangs and demonic facial features, with curled horns rising from above its brow. It hissed at them as it arrived and clapped its palms together. A massive ball of fire roared into life above its head, but it was not normal fire. Instead of glowing with a flickering orange light, it was a dark brown color, and exuded an aura of cold rather than heat. The pixie threw it at them with a maniacal chuckle and they scattered out of the way. Where it landed, the entire area was turned into a frozen mass of churned earth and weeds. It cackled again and prepared to launch another fireball, but Eduardo stabbed it through the throat, cutting off its spellcasting and its life. What the creature possessed with its spellcasting, it lacked in durability and it only took a single hit to kill it. The demonic pixie gave enough essence to take the three lowest-leveled members up by another level. Now, the average level of the party was standing at around 17, the level of the weaker monsters. It surprised Sam just how weak most humans were compared to him and the rest of the top rankers. Most of the group was on edge by this point and Sam had to maintain appearance to prevent them from bolting. Despite how much the forest and its creepy atmosphere bothered him, he had to keep it together for them. He was sure that the oppressive atmosphere was a deliberate effect of the trail, and not an incidental one. All right. I have an idea, Sam said. Reaper and Angel, go to the other side of our group. We should move in a circle rather than in a straight line. Nobody questioned his judgment. It made sense all of the immediately. If the strongest members of the party were on the edges of the group, then they could watch out for monsters far more easily than if they were all at the front or back. Using this strategy, they made it safely through the next segment of the arena, the one with the pixies. After they had adjusted to fighting an enemy that used ranged attacks, they found them an easier prey than the trolls. Firstly, they were nowhere near as fast as the trolls, despite their ability to fly and they were so weak that once one was in range, they could easily kill them. Chapter 39 by the time that Sam leveled up for the first time, it felt like they had been in the dungeon for the better part of the day. As he leveled, the system told him just how many monsters he had slain over the day. It was a staggering total for a single member of a party to kill, and the fact sunk into him that he might very well die here, stuck forever in this endless maze of trees and darkness. You have killed a juvenile mutated fell troll, X-124. You have killed a darkwood pixie peon, X-113. You have leveled up. For the first time, Sam saw a new descriptor of a monster's strength. It seemed that for normal monsters, the system used the names juvenile and mature to describe their power, but now it used something different for the pixies. He remembered that word being used in the scan of the hot tub back in his room and the idea that the pixies might be just as sapient as them surfaced. He had heard them chattering in the shadows, and had thought that it was just normal monster noise, but what if it was words that were too high-pitched for him to hear? Was he now a mass murderer? At any rate, it didn't matter right now. The pixies were trying to kill them, so it was just self-defense. It wasn't like they had any choice in the matter. To distract himself, Sam pulled up his status sheet to allocate his points. Sam Atlas. Human. Mortal tier. G rank. Class, Dao Visionary. Level 26. 3 free stat points. Strength. 40. 1.325x. Constitution. 26. 1.325x. Resilience. 28. 1.325x. Dexterity. 17. 1.325x. Intelligence. 18. 1.325x. Wisdom. 23. 1.325x. Health 260-260. Mana 180-180. Stamina 400-400. Dao. Dao mode of the Arbiter. Dao mode of Anger. Skills. 1x Common, 1x Rare, 1x Epic, 1x Legendary. Titles. 1x Celestial. Temporary Titles. 1x Epic, 1x Legendary, 1x Mythical. Dao Heritage. Dao Incarnation of Existence. Party. Torturna Salvinii Brescan, Level 24. Health 310 slash 310. Rax, Level 23. Health 320 slash 320. Skill Branches. Muscle Density Enhancement, Level 1. Sam had gained his class stat points, but he had three unallocated. Wondering what would be the best choice in this situation, Sam decided to go for something different this time. He had focused on strength for quite a while now, and it was time to branch out a little. In these woods, reaction time was king. It was the difference between dying to a fireball or a slash from a troll's claws. With that in mind, Sam put every point that he had into dexterity. 
By this point, he barely felt the bodily changes brought on by adding stat points to a physical stat and all he sensed was a faint tingling in his muscles. Before he tested out his new power, he saw something new on his stat sheet. Since he had left them, Jeffrey and Rax had been leveling up, and at quite a good rate too. They were both almost at the level where one gained a class and Sam was glad for anything that would increase their power after the tournament. He planned on winning, or at least placing in the top three, which would allow him to create a faction. Sam needed to start cultivating alliances between himself and other influential humans in order to create a power structure after the tournament. He had already been approached by Okita, but he wasn't sure if the man was or would be still alive after this part of the tournament. He knew that he could leverage his reputation against people to gain favors, but that sort of behavior left a bad taste in his mouth and more importantly a twinge in his Tao. As Sam and his diminished band of fighters aimlessly wandered through the woods, the top two teams made their way towards the center of the arena where the final boss was. Both of them had their own ways of finding the center, but one of the groups was closer than the others. As soon as they had gotten out of sight, the overlord had killed every member of his team and gone out solo. This made it so that he would move at his full speed and that he would get every last drop of essence that he could lay his hands on. The other group had been more peaceful in its establishment of a hierarchy, but not by much. Only two of the weak members of Rodney's team had survived and they had pledged undying service to the man. The Scourge of New York, contrary to his name, was not much of a fighter by himself, but was an invaluable support member of the team, and his level gave him an edge. He had access to a hidden web of microscopic satellites that had spread across the world upon the arrival of the system. Unlike anyone else so far on Earth, Andrew Monroe had been contacted by a faction from outside of the universe. He had been walking home from his office as the first of the monsters spawned and he had run in terror, tumbling off the side of the Brooklyn Bridge as he ran across it. As he entered the water, he had felt a massive tentacle close around him, and he had prepared for death, but rather than some kraken from the depths, come to kill humanity, it was an envoy of the prophets of the machine god. Over the next few days, they had altered Andrew in their image, creating a technological marvel of biological engineering, close enough to human that none would know how to tell the difference. This had warped his mind to the point of insanity, but he was very good at hiding it. His mind could work far more efficiently than any other humans and he could track down anyone on the planet if he had a fragment of some technology that they had gotten their hands on. His creators had implanted a string of code into him that made it impossible for him to betray them in any way, not that he wanted to anyway. If any of the multiversal factions found out that there was a servant of one of the most reviled powers in existence hiding out on Earth, the planet would be no more the ambitions of Tantalo's Veravax be damned. He had inveigled himself with the number two ranker on Earth and laid the foundations for the takeover of the universe by his faction. The Overlord on the other hand possessed a different type of power. It was a natural one, sanctioned by the system. He possessed the first stages of what would eventually blossom into a full bloodline, a genetic imprint stored within the system that had implanted into the bodies of promising cultivators. He had earned it through trials that no human should ever have had to endure, at one point being reduced to nothing more than a disembodied head. His bloodline was of a species of draconic wolf that was renowned for its keen senses, some of them beyond the physical. The overlord had gained the ability to see raw mana, and this had directed him to the sites of many natural treasures across the earth. Accessing these had allowed for his levels to skyrocket, beyond anyone else. Now he used his talents to search for the greatest concentration of power within the arena, as that would lead him to his quarry. Upon sensing a blazing beacon of power dwelling in the center of the woods, he had dismissed the normal enemies as a red herring, which they were, and made his way straight for the prize. Chapter 40 Far up above the arena, Barigis watched the hunt unfold, sitting next to the replacement system imprint as he did so. Unlike an actual system overseer, the creature that had been placed in charge of the system within this universe was a weak creature, fallible and utterly mortal. It still possessed enough power to crush Barigis like an ant, but he had the thing on a tight leash of reciprocity and blackmail. It feared the day that the true system overseer would return, as its existence would be ended upon its arrival. Barigis had dangled the promise of a way out over the creature, as long as it helped him with his goals. Under the purview of the system, the little trick that he had played with the subatomic script on the contracts was completely illegal. However, the imprint had tweaked some of the rules and made it so that Barigis could make it work. Unfortunately it was only enough of a back door to bind the signers for a short amount of time, enough for the monster hunt and the tournament, but it was not enough to permanently force anyone to serve Barigis. It was only a stopgap measure to call most of the herd, and allow those who Barigis wanted to preserve to rise to the top. He watched the events unfold within the arena just as he had planned. 
Both of the most powerful teams had found the real prize in the event, and the team of Sam Atlas was still alive, which also suited his purposes. The system imprint was still confused by his scheming however. I don't understand. Why would you want your favored pawn not to reach the center? It asked him, pointing at the meandering path of Sam's team. Barigis laughed. It felt good to be smarter than the system for once in his life, even if it was not really the system. Did you not see how Sam lost himself to his rage earlier when only one of his companions died? Imagine what would happen if all of them were to be slain. He would go utterly berserk, his Tao rising in prominence until it threatened to eclipse his soul. He would break out of it, his will is strong enough, but by the end, he would have caused enough damage to break his other Tao. I have no interest in a servant who serves justice. But anger is another story. I can bend him to my will far more easily then. The system imprint nodded appreciatively at Barigis' artifice. I understand. How ingenious. Barigis smiled, but inwardly scoffed at the imprint. Of course you don't, you cretinous machine. How could you? I am the pinnacle of existence, the rightful hegemon of this multiverse, Barigis thought. Needless to say, humility was not one of his strong suits. Sam doubled over in exhaustion, his body spent from the exertion of the past hour. After they had passed into a part of the forest where the trees grew even closer together than before, everything had become far worse. The monster attack had doubled in intensity and a new, even more dangerous species of monster had arrived. It looked like some sort of sentient patch of resin, which would drop down from the branches at random. It was not merely sticky however, but it was composed of a highly potent acid that even burned Sam. To the weaker members of his party, it was a death sentence. Another of his charges had died, and one of them had lost an arm to one of the sap monsters. They professed their ability to remain useful in battle, but Sam feared that they were not long for life. If not from their wounds, the warrior would soon die to a monster. A seething volcano of apoplectic rage simmered in Sam, but he had nowhere to vent it. He needed to keep all of his focus on the protection of his companions, with no room for a temper tantrum. It felt like he was suffocating, he was so enraged. Both at himself and Barigis, but mostly towards the latter of the two. Sam and Eduardo had begun to feel a strange presence within the arena over the last thirty minutes, and they were making their way towards it now. It felt like the aura of a powerful monster, which they were sure was the boss of the event. If they killed that then their levels would skyrocket, or at least go up, and they would probably win the hunt. The only problem was that it seemed as if others had already detected the monster. Some of the branches in front of them were broken, betraying the path of another team. Sam would have bet his last level that it was one of the two strongest teams who had beat them to it. He cautiously pulled back one of the broken branches and inspected it. There was a fleck of greenish blood on it, which was definitely not human, or as far as he knew, of any of the monsters in the forest so far. His ears began to pick up a faint scratching noise coming from ahead, and he signaled for the others to tighten up their formation before they went ahead. Sam started to imbue his body with mana and the armor of his skill formed over his flesh. Behind the branches was a clearing, one that was filled with gremlins. These were no ordinary gremlins however, they were the size of people. Beady black eyes glared at Sam from under thick, deep-set brows and muscular appendages extended outwards from their chunky torsos. In the middle of the group what could only be described as a madman stood. He was caked in blood and filth and his eyes were unfocused. Slobber dripped down from his mouth and onto the floor. On his head was a rusty iron crown, one that looked like it had been picked out of a dumpster. He locked his eyes on Sam and hissed. Brothers! Attack the invader to our holy court! The man screamed, spittle flying out of his mouth. The gremlins grunted and charged Sam. He laughed and swung out with his mace, expecting to feel bone and flesh pulp beneath his weapon, but it barely killed the first gremlin. These things were far higher level than he had expected. Behind him, the bright eyes of the madman seemed to stare into Sam's soul as he chanted some inane verse. Seventeen slippery seals swam softly, sharply, slowly, singing. Sixteen sharks snapped seventeen seals swimming softly, sharply, slowly, singing. Sam cut out the noise and focused on the battle. As he beat back the advances of the gremlins, he turned towards the man. Who the hell are you? Sam asked, as he blocked a claw slash. Who am I? Who am I? What am I? I am Judge, Judge, Judge. King of the Gremlins. Sam was confused for a moment but then saw who it was. On the power leaderboard, there was a man named Elminster Judge. That, combined with the strength of the gremlins that attended him, told Sam that this was the very same man. Chapter 41. He had not expected him to be like this however. Behind him, the branches quivered as Eduardo stepped out. Sam? What's going on dash Eduardo ducked to avoid a lunging gremlin, beheading it as it passed with a swift cut of his rapier. 
Behind him, Reaper emerged, his hands glowing with gray light. The ectoplasm master snapped his hands together and sent out a beam of gray energy that hollowed out the head of one of the gremlins. Elminster Judge started to cackle madly and started to dance on the forest floor. There was something deeply disturbing about the cabalistic scene, a man surrounded with monsters, acting without a care in the world. The three allies fought against the gremlins, killing them in a steady stream of essence, but barely making a dent in the massive horde. As they died, their bodies disappeared and Sam saw something strange happen. Their bodies reappeared next to Elminster, but noticeably smaller than before. He was resurrecting the dead gremlins and sending them back at them to fight. That explained why he still had so many of them at this stage of the forest. How he had gotten them into the arena was a mystery however. Eventually, they had whittled the gremlin's strength down to about that of a normal, one-foot-tall, gremlin and they dispatched them with ease. There seemed to be a limit to the number of times that they could be resurrected, and they had reached that. Elminster stood there in the middle of the clearing seemingly unaware that his creatures had died. Sam shared a meaningful look with Eduardo and they advanced, ready to kill the man. Anyone who allied with monsters was not a threat that should be suffered to live. As they neared, the madman seemed to wake up and see the corpses around him. What? No. No. My family. All dead. You will pay. His voice began to grow deeper as he spoke and his body began to bulge. The gremlin corpses began to sizzle and small streams of green light erupted out of their bodies and swarmed Elminster like a flock of tiny stars. They plunged into his flesh and he began to turn green. His body had bulked up to over ten feet tall and his musculature was ridiculously embiggened, making him look like a certain green comic character. I will kill you. The Elminster turned massive gremlin said, his voice distorted. The man leapt into the air and came down like a lookador, hands outstretched behind his head. Both of them landed in a devastating hammer fist, slamming Sam into the ground. He struggled against the force pressing down on him, but somehow this man was even stronger than him. Sam grunted and began to channel his Tao of anger, making sure not to lose himself in it. A flood of incandescent rage coursed through his body and he began to bulk up as well. Nowhere near as much as Elminster, but enough to be noticeable. His hair stood up on end, wreathed in an orange light. He lifted his knee and brought it up, crashing into Elminster's solar plexus. The massive man was knocked backwards with a whoosh of expelled breath, knocking over a tree as he flew. Sam was nowhere near spent yet however and he stalked across the ground, leaving small scorch marks on the earth. Elminster staggered to his feet, growling in a bestial timbre. Eduardo and Reaper cautiously approached and stood next to Sam, ready to assist him. Sam was beginning to lose himself in his rage. He had just lost two of his teammates to monsters and now there was this human traitor who sided with them? That would not be allowed to exist. Somewhere deep down, his Tao of the Arbiter was screaming at him that his motivations were not right, but he forced it down by using eyes of judgment on the man. He was as black as sin. Sam beat his chest in a fit of animal rage and charged forwards, with his mace held high. He leaped ten feet into the air and began to pump raw Tao energy into the weapon. It did not want to go in, but he pushed and pushed until some barrier deep within him cracked and the mace flooded with pure rage. It glowed with a bright orange light, looking for all the world like a chunk of lava, dragged out of the thonic depths of the earth. Sam brought it down on Elminster and the head of the mace seemed to detonate with a fiery explosion of pure conceptual rage. A shockwave of heat and light exploded outwards from the mace and obliterated Elminster utterly, but also sending Sam flying backwards, the last of his rage leaving him. A system notification blared in his vision, but he could not click it because of how tired he was. Everything faded away and he lost track of reality. Arbiter? Are you alive? A weak slap connected with his cheek, snapping him out of his slumber. Well what's happening? The hazy figures of his surviving teammates swam in his vision, staring down at him. He immediately reached for his mask, to make sure that it was on. It was. Eduardo chuckled. A few of these lads wanted to take it off, but after that little display with your mace, they decided that it was best to just speculate who was under it. Sam clasped hands with the Italian exorcist and was pulled to his feet with a strong yank. A little bit dizzy, Sam swayed on his feet before he found his balance. Sitting back down again, he checked his notifications. You have killed Elminster Judge. You have leveled up. Sam quickly allocated his points, sinking another three into dexterity. He had still been too slow to avoid that smash from Elminster, which the others had dodged easily. Now he felt like he could have done so if he wanted to, with the newfound speed filling his body. There was another notification as well underneath it. You have gained the skill, basic Tao channeling, legendary. The Tao is the way. The way is everything. You can channel an infinitesimal fraction of everything, and now you can channel some of that fraction into your weapons. 
Use this skill cautiously, for too much DAO expenditure without a means of recouping it can be fatal. Using your DAO for this purpose will imbue your weapon with a small portion of its concept, empowering it beyond its normal parameters. Chapter 42 That explained the feeling of draining that he felt when he had imbued the weapon. It was literally extracting some of his DAO out of him in a way that meant that it was hard to replenish. If he didn't watch out, he could turn into a DAO well, and no wells were ever bottomless. He did not want to know what would happen if one lost all of their DAO energy. For now, he felt fine, as he must not have put much of his DAO into the attack. His natural strength had been enough to deal the finishing blow, with only a little assistance. Sam got to his feet easily enough and determined that there were no long-lasting effects from his exertion. Giving the other members of his group a reassuring smile, Sam set the pace for the rest of the journey. Despite his outward energy, inside he felt more than a little perturbed. His Tao of anger was becoming more and more prominent, with his other Tao falling by the wayside. Even though he had achieved a deepening of his Tao of the Arbiter, somehow anger was winning out. He needed to find a balance for them, and quickly at that before he was consumed by his wrath. Sam made sure not to tap into any of his latent rage as he attacked the monsters that waited in the shadows to waylay the party. They were definitely nearing the center now, as the concentrations of monsters were becoming nearly suffocating. Sam was just about able to keep up with his additional points into dexterity and thankfully there were no more deaths. A few serious injuries, but nothing immediately fatal. Sam and his stronger companions were doing a good job of keeping the others safe from the many threats that the woods had to offer. To Sam, it was nowhere near enough however. He felt a small sense of relief as his Tao of the Arbiter found its purpose again, as the shepherd of a flock of innocent sheep, unjustly sent to their deaths. It was perhaps a naive analogy, but it worked for the situation. He was quickly discovering that half of all Tao work was mental, and the other half was finding a way to use that mental energy in the real world. The sound of fighting rang out up ahead of them and Sam called for a stop. The others immediately halted, trusting his judgment. Sam edged forwards to survey the scene. A pitched battle was occurring on the forest floor about 50 feet away from them. Two teams were having at it, bright streaks of fire and bolts of ice soaring across the air towards the other sides. More than a few corpses lay on the ground and Sam saw that three figures were dominating the fight. Two of them were on one side, and the other was holding his own against them. The two allied fighters were both women, but one of them wore a mask. Sam was able to tell her gender from the cut of her clothing and the way that she moved. She was obviously a novice at fighting, but her stats seemed to make up the difference. Strangely, she seemed to lack a certain part of her fighting style, as Sam saw her pause multiple times during the fight, as if waiting for something to happen. The other woman had no such problem and she was a very capable fighter, sending arrows streaking towards her enemies like blurs of light in the darkness. On the other side was a giant of a man, who Sam instantly recognized. It was the bear of the motherland, the Russian fighter who had tied against Reaper in the tournament. He was clearly outmatched by the two, but not by much. His axe thrummed through the air as he blocked the attacks of the two women, although he was not able to do much more than that. They moved too in sync for him to land any telling blows and his body was already covered in wounds. As Sam watched, not wanting to interfere, the man let out a grunt of frustration and began to claw at himself with his hands. As his nails tore through his skin, sheets of blood began to run down his body, far more than such small scratches should have caused. Patches of earth and stone rose up from the ground underneath him, coating him in a suit of rocky armor that was, of course, shaped like a bear. Sam was once again perplexed at how these people were creating such effects with his attacks. So many fighters that he had seen possessed elemental effects with their attacks, but he had no such ability. Sure, his Tao was almost unfairly powerful, but who didn't want to be able to conjure up fire with a thought? Sam heard a faint rustle in the bushes behind him that signaled the arrival of his compatriots, but he motioned for them to retreat. This was not something that he wanted to meddle in if he did not have to. The arrival of more fighters could have an adverse effect on the situation, perhaps even causing the other teams to band up against them. He was happy to watch them for now, hopeful to find out more about their fighting styles from his observations. There was a good chance that he would have to fight them at some point. With his life on the line, in a way that it had been not in the arena, the bear was clearly not holding anything back. His moveset was far more varied than Sam had expected, integrating all sorts of earth-related attacks. Most of them were very simplistic in nature, hinting at a simple mind behind the craggy visage of the man. The women on the other hand were clearly more imaginative, but neither of them had any flashy abilities, so they had to rely on displays of acrobatics that would have made any pre-system human weep with jealousy. Flips and one-handed cartwheels blended into a deadly dance of flashing steel, their weapons singing a song of death and blood. They were starting to have trouble dealing with their opponent however, 
as their bladed weapons were almost useless against the armor of their enemy. Sam edged in even closer, eager to see how the fight progressed, but a twig snapped under his foot and the warring cultivators froze. They turned as one towards the bushes, catching sight of Sam's frozen visage. He waved apologetically and then dropped to the ground as a stalactite of sharpened rock soared through where his head had been. Enhanced body or not, that would have hurt. He winced as he saw the projectile carve straight through a tree behind him like it was made of soft cheese. It was exactly as he had expected. They had united against the greater threat as soon as he had arrived. Chapter 43 Sam could understand why. For a morally gray fighter, as it seemed most people here were, it would be advantageous to remove a potential threat in a setting in which there was no option to surrender. Sam moved forward rather than retreat, not waiting to draw them towards his allies. Vaulting over yet another attack, Sam brought his mace down towards one of the women. It missed them by a mile, but he did not really want to hurt them. Apparently, his companions had other ideas. Reaper charged out of the bushes, ectoplasm at the ready, heading straight towards the bear. The man roared like an angry bull at the sight of the slight man, and charged him with his axe at the ready. At least that was one threat that Sam did not have to deal with. Eduardo emerged far more elegantly, his rapier outstretched in a manner that reminded Sam of the depictions of medieval duels of honor that he had sometimes seen in books. Rather than take a bow however, the man thrust out his sword and sent a beam of white light straight towards the ladies. They scattered to the side and Sam picked his target. He was undoubtedly the strongest between him and Eduardo, so he picked the more skilled of the two and chased her down. She was a lot faster than him, but he had more stamina and he caught up soon enough. She snarled at him and raised her short sword menacingly. Well, it would have been menacing if she was not barely over five feet tall and perhaps a hundred pounds soaking wet, but it was the thought that counted. She gritted her teeth and started to speak, her voice a serenade of rage and frustration. Damn you, Arbiter. How dare you take what's mine by right? Sam was confused and this showed on his face, prompting an explanation. The first place on the Dow leaderboard was mine by right, and you stole it. Now I have no chance to get it. The woman was completely delusional, but Sam tried to reason with her. Who the hell even are you? I've never seen you before in my life. It was true. She was utterly unremarkable in every way and he was sure that he would have remembered such a person, if only for that reason. He would have remembered her height as well, and was sure that he had never seen her. Why would the first place on the leaderboard be yours? It's a matter of skill, not desire, Sam continued. Instead of answering with a normal response, she hissed at him and launched into a series of attacks that were completely without the style and grace that she had shown earlier. To Sam's surprise, they were imbued with something that almost felt like a Dao. It was clearly not a Dao, the feeling was far too weak, but she was definitely on the way to one. To his surprise, he could detect a small part of what the Dao was of, which he had never really had a chance to do before with any other Dao wielder. He focused in on her aura and was able to extrapolate it from that. Sam could not get an exact reading, but it was something along the lines of covetousness or greed. From his own experience with the Dao, it was very good at manipulating emotions. That explained why she felt so entitled to the position. With a smile on his face, Sam asked her a very important question. What's your name? She stopped her attacks for a moment, confused. What? Why does that matter? You're going to die soon anyway. But I suppose I can tell you. It's Karen. Sam bent over laughing, opportunely missing the slash of the woman's sword that passed over his now lowered body. You piece of crap. How dare you laugh at me? I will make your death long and slow for that. Nobody defies me in lives. Sam rose up from his awkward position and deflected one of the sword swipes. Without bothering to explain to her what was so funny, he began to fight in earnest. Deciding not to risk using any of his Dao skills so soon after imbuing his weapon with it made the fight a lot harder, but it was manageable. After briefly checking the leaderboards during a lull in the fight, he found out that she was the number 21 ranker in the world. That explained how she and her friend had been able to fight the bear to a stalemate, but were not actually able to finish the fight. He checked on his allies every now and again, noting that they were doing well. Reaper had revealed a few more tricks in his arsenal that he, like the bear, had not revealed during his fight. His entire body was wreathed in spectral energy and he was easily the same size as his opponent in his suit of rocks and earth. In contrast to their evenly matched battle, Eduardo easily outfought his opponent and was almost casually weaving around her blows. Sam had no idea what the people in the Vatican had gotten up to behind closed doors before the system had arrived but it was quite impressive. Sam returned to his fight and he disarmed the woman with an artful twist of his mace, his enhanced stats allowing him to get enough of an edge over the woman to intuit her next move. It was almost like he had a miniature Sherlock Holmes inside his head, 
creating a series of deductions from his surroundings. It was pretty cool, hell it was extremely cool, but it was also quite strange. It had only been over a week now, and Sam was already so far past human that it was hardly believable. He raised his mace, but then thought better of it, instead reaching out with his free hand and punching the woman with it. She fell over, stunned and he walked away from her. She was a complete asshole, but not actually evil. Elminster had deserved death, but she only deserved a stern talking to and a few lessons in empathy. As Sam had neither the time nor the inclination to give those to her, this would have to suffice. Sam monitored the fights closely to determine which of his companions required more assistance than the other. Eduardo was basically toying with his opponent at this point so it was down to Sam to assist Reaper. He made his way over to the clashing titans of elemental energy and interposed himself, slamming his mace into the bear's rocky skin. The mace chinked off with an intense vibration and Sam almost lost his grip on the mace. Damn, that skin is hard. Sam thought as he reeled in his weapons. The target of his attack stared down at him with a menacing growl emanating from his lips, raising one stony paw to crush him into the ground. Reaper saw his opening and thrust his hand towards the underbelly of the rock construct, but it had been a ruse all along. The bear had revealed a keen intelligence with that maneuver, both getting a good look at his new assailant and gaining an advantageous position. He reached down with his paw and closed it over the hand of the spirit construct, squeezing down on it with a crude smile forming on the lips of his armor. Reaper screamed in pain, the ectoplasm apparently attached to his nervous system as well as his body. The man tore into the rock with his free hand, but it was useless. The bear was too far buried under the shifting mass of earth. He was a big man, but his suit of armor dwarfed him in its gargantuan scale. Sam had to use his Tao, there was no other choice in the matter. As he began to channel his power into his mace, bracing for the consequences, a breathtaking roar flattened his ears back to his head. It expanded over the woods like a shockwave, sending out a concentrated pulse of raw aura power. That was clearly where the boss was, and by the sound of it, it was something far out of his league. Sam gulped, and by the expressions of the others in the clearing, they were having similar reactions. Chapter 44 It was, surprisingly enough, Karen who breached the silence first. The woman had been jolted out of her unconsciousness by the cataclysmic sound that had ripped through the forest moments earlier. That was. Something that even I am not equipped to deal with. Her voice quavered as she spoke, a marked difference from her cocky attitude earlier. Sam would have wanted to take credit for her transformation, but he knew that it was solely due to a healthy dose of fear. Finally mustering up the courage to ask for assistance, the woman continued. Sometimes, even a god among mortals must ask for help. I have deigned to let you all assist me in my endeavor to kill this foul monster. Sam sighed and Reaper looked at her with a flabbergasted expression on his face. What the hell is your deal, lady? No real person acts like that. Besides, you're even weaker than me anyway. The Arbiter would have already killed you if he hadn't decided to show mercy on your sorry ass. I'm not working with someone like you. Reaper stalked off and back into the woods, beckoning for Sam and Eduardo to come. Slowly, as if in a dream, the massive figure of the bear lumbered on after them. With an apologetic look on her face, Karen's ally walked off as well. The woman gnashed her teeth there and then in the forest clearing, but she knew that she was up a creek now. Rather than do the wise thing and try to resolve the matter, she made her own way off towards the source of the roar. Sam and his new allies made their way back to his group, who all tensed upon seeing the unfamiliar faces. Calm down. These people are here to help us. I'm sure that you all heard the roar earlier? Reaper said to the team. They all nodded. Good. Well, not good for us, but good that you're listening. Reaper cleared his throat. Ahem. Anyway, the only way that we're going to beat this thing is with strength of numbers. These two are some pretty high rankers, and although I am pained to admit it, the bear here is ever higher ranked than me on the leaderboard. Apparently that does not apply to the arena however, as he was only able to draw against me. The massive Russian man growled warningly. It was a joke. It was a joke, Reaper hurriedly said. This information calmed down the members of their team, and a few of them even looked excited that they had received extra help. Unfortunately, none of the new arrival's allies had survived, but they would only have been a dead weight anyway. Sam and the other high rankers looked apologetically at the weaker members. They didn't have to say what everyone was thinking. The reality was, that none of them would likely be coming out of this unscathed. Even Sam would probably lose to whatever that thing was that had projected that domineering aura from the center of the forest. Sam could barely cover twenty feet with his aura at this point, and the roar had spread out for miles. It probably became stronger the closer one was to it, but it was still far and beyond anything that he could do. With a sigh, Sam realized what he had to do. The team members wouldn't like it, but it was for the best. Everyone except for Reaper, the bear, 
the Angel of Death, and our new member, you all need to run back to the start of the woods. It's not safe for anyone here not in the top 50. Hell, it's barely safe for us anyway. He was met with a storm of argumentative speeches, but he ignored them. With a nod at Reaper, the man summoned condensed bats of energy behind each of the recalcitrant people and knocked them out. A small palanquin of gray energy formed underneath them and carried them back through the forest. Reaper stumbled, but then rose up again, panting. I can only hold that skill for about 15 minutes, and then I'm going to have to leave them wherever they reach. I'm going to be tapped out for the boss fight, just so you know. Sam nodded and placed his hand on the man's shoulder. It seemed to bolster him somewhat, but in reality Sam wanted to segue into a new conversation. Just a quick question. How are you doing that stuff with the gray energy? You don't have a Tao, right? Reaper looked at Sam like he had sprouted a second head. Huh? What do you think I'm using? My elemental affinity of course. Sam cocked his head. What? What's that? Reaper sighed at this. Look, if this is some sort of joke, this is not the time. Didn't you receive the system missive about elemental affinities upon gaining your class? Everyone else did as far as I know. Sam shook his head. If everyone else had received this thing, then it was likely due to his strange Tao abilities. It was all starting to slot together, and the picture that it painted of the system was not pretty. It had hidden his Tao heritage from him until he had gained his class, and now it seemed to be hiding even more from him. In addition, Jeffrey had told him about the stigma that the system had against the Tao and how it had taken over its function in the universe. Was it possible that Sam had somehow gained the personal attention of the system, and worse, it was hostile? If that was true, why was he not already dead? The system was, from what he could tell, basically a god, perhaps more powerful than any god that a human had even conceived. If it had wanted him dead, it could have metaphorically snapped its fingers, and it would be so. He was being treated like some piece in a vast game board, and he did not like it one bit. The only way that he was going to survive was to look for any opportunity that he could get. This was the first one. Reaper, can you share this missive with me? The man looked confused, but he nodded. Then he furrowed his brow. Wait a sec. Why isn't it letting me share it with you? Something about an error. I'll just tell you, I guess. The man cleared his throat and began. An elemental affinity is your connection to one of the primordial elements. There are twelve of them, which you can find out about later. More importantly, upon getting a class, people find out what element they are most attuned to, and can attempt to form a connection with it. It's quite tough, but it grants you great power. Now, how you do it is Dash Reaper screamed and clapped his hands to his head. What in the name of God? All of the information was just sucked out of my head. It's all gone. Reaper looked at Sam with fear in his eyes. What did you do? Sam threw up his hands. Nothing. How would I do something like that? I'm not some sort of telepath. Reaper nodded. Okay, okay. You probably didn't do it. But I can't tell you any more, it's gone. Good luck on finding your own path. Sam began to walk towards the bear, but the man backed away in fear. No, no thank you. I want my memories to stay right where they belong, my brain. Sam sighed and resigned himself to a lot of trial and error later. For now, he did not need whatever the others had. He already had his Tao, and that was enough to deal with whatever threat came their way. At least, he hoped it was. Now divested of their charges, the group was able to move at full speed. Sam rode on the back of the bear's armor and watched as they sped through the woods at around the speed of a car. He was probably faster than the man inside the suit, but it could cover more ground than him with every ponderous stride, so it was more efficient. Sam tried to pick up some small talk with the man, but he did not answer. Either he had no wish to talk to Sam, or he was too busy concentrating on the path ahead. Sam would have bet on the former of the two. After a few minutes, he gave up and closed his eyes, trying to survey the state of his Tao. It was very hard to check on his Tao, because there was no official stat for it, but a few seconds of meditation could reveal how much energy he had left. As he had expected, his Tao of anger was about half full, and his Tao of the Arbiter was almost completely full. He had enough in the tank for a few battles, or one massive one with the boss. They traveled for what seemed like hours, but was really only about 30 minutes. The forest blended into itself and it was hard to keep track of time. Sam wished that his system interface had a clock on it, but there was no such luck. They reached a clearing some time later, one that was filled with corpses. Some monster ones, but there were a good few humans in the mix as well. All of them had died by the same manner, massive claw wounds dotting their body. If that was not a sign of the boss, then Sam was afraid of the implication. If something that large existed in the forest, and it wasn't even the boss, then it was even more dangerous than he had thought. Chapter 45 Up in their waiting room, the system imprint and Barigis watched the party's progress intently. Both of them sat back in their conjured chairs of mana, 
and sipped from pitchers of highly expensive void grape wine. Void grapes were a special species of grape that had been bred in order to survive in the space between the stars and as a result, they had a unique flavor that some found enjoyable, but others despised. Of course, there was the added benefit that it was fatal to those under E-rank, but Barigis thought that was a marvelous side effect that meant that only those who deserved to drink it could. Of course, he definitely deserved to drink such a potent brew. It was enough to even make him slightly tipsy, but his companion was barely affected. Barigis sighed and cleansed the alcohol from his system before turning to his ally. Look, there's no fun in it if you don't even bother to pretend that you're enjoying it. I don't understand. Why would people want to have their functions inhibited? I need to be in top condition to be able to complete my tasks. Barigis resigned himself to the fact that the system imprint would never understand and instead he watched the battles below more intently. Well, they found the first trace of the monster. I wonder what they are going to think when they finally encounter the beast for themselves. I went to so much trouble to find that thing, even though it is barely peak F rank at best. It's not my fault that the species is endangered. It was probably in fact partially his fault that it was endangered, but such concerns did not even begin to form in the mind of Barigis. He was right in everything that he did, so there was no room for mistakes. If worst came to worst, he could just blame someone else anyway. Barigis fondly remembered finding such a vicious beast on the moons of Albus four ten thousand years ago and breeding them up into the creatures that they were today. Through recursive genetics he had ensured that they were the pinnacle of their genus and as a result, he ran a profitable side business of supplying guards for tinpot dictators and other people in need of a sentinel that never tired. It was a unique cross-breed between a tree and an octopus that looked somewhat like a gigantic woody squid. Its tentacles were far more dangerous than any living octopus and it produced a potent toxin within its many glands that it secreted from its pores. Upon being grabbed by one of those tentacles, a weaker being would instantly die. This specimen was only F rank, but Barigis had bred the species up to the top of D rank, the most that he was willing to go, both because of monetary constraints and because of personal danger. It would not do to have a creature that was more powerful than himself roaming his lands, would it now? The system imprint had been quite impressed upon seeing the creature when Barigis had shown it the monster a few days ago and it had added a few enhancements of its own to make sure that it was extremely deadly. This event would cause the cream of the crop to rise to the top of the humans, and the weak would be the fuel for their ascension. If all went well, Barigis' little project would be even more powerful after this. As he dreamt of his future glory, the system imprint stiffened. What? Barigis asked, curious about what could cause such a thing to feel fear. Did your master return? The imprint looked at him with thinly veiled annoyance. No, just a little problem down below. I dealt with it. Your little conversation had distracted me, and I was forced to expend much of my reserves to alter the flow of causality, erasing the event from existence. What it was does not concern you. Barigis let out a breath, but let the imprint play its little games. None of them concerned his end goal anyway. Sam hopped down from the bear's back and walked over to one of the corpses. It was unlikely that he could glean anything useful from it beyond what he had already seen, but there was no telling what someone with enhanced senses could find out. It took a moment, but he smelt a sharp, acrid scent coming from one of the wounds. He bent down and looked inside it, seeing a pool of smoking green liquid. It ate away at the skin around it, and it seemed to be turning what remained of it into a strange brown substance. Sam picked up a stick and prodded it, finding that it was hard to the touch. He initially thought that it was a discolored bone, but after seeing that it had ridges in it, he realized that it was bark. That's strange, he said, to nobody in particular. Of course, everyone else crowded around to see what he had found. Eduardo was the first to ask. What did you find on that body? Is it a clue to what the monster who killed them is? The man said with an attempt to look even closer. Sam nodded. Something like that, only it doesn't make sense. The skin around this pool of poison is turning slowly into wood. Nothing that I've ever heard of can do that, although the multiverse is a much larger place that I can say to understand, so there are probably quite a few things that can do this. The boss monster must have some sort of wood-related abilities, perhaps even being a tree itself. Maybe it's some sort of ant, only I don't think that this one is like Treebeard. The reference rolled off everyone back except for Reaper who chuckled. Upon receiving flat stares from the others, he mouthed what? And then fell silent. Sam withdrew from the corpse, suddenly sickened from being near such a perversion of nature. See if any of you can find out more about the poison. I'm going to look at the other bodies. Sam walked around the clearing and saw a few more bodies that were further into decay than the one that he had studied. Next to one of them, an unidentifiable brown mass of wood lay on the ground. Sam thought that it might be a tree root, but it was too wide and there were no trees nearby. He crouched down next to it and began to see, to his horror, that it was the remains of a human. 
The poison had completely transformed this corpse into a pile of wood and the features were barely recognizable. Sam saw a nose poking out of the top half of the wood that he had originally thought to be a twig. There was something deeply disturbing about all of this and the setting made it so much worse. Berigius was probably laughing at them from wherever he was, the sick bastard. Sam went back to the others and saw one of them vomiting on the ground. He hurried over and forced his way into the group to see what was up. The woman, whose name Sam had never found out, was doubled over and retching up the remainder of her last meal on the ground. Sam opened his mouth to ask what was up, but Reaper pointed to something on the ground before he could say anything. A grotesquely long finger twitched on the ground, the end made out of wood. It was extremely thin and it looked like a spider leg, if it was made out of human flesh. Reaper waited until the woman had recovered and then began to explain. We dipped a twig into the poison for a few seconds and then waited to see if anything happened. After a minute, it started to turn into this. Whatever that poison is, it is definitely not natural. Well, knowing the system, it probably is, but what I mean is that it's disgusting. It seemed to be able to turn wood into flesh and flesh into wood. We're dealing with something evil here. It's like something that you would find in a horror movie. Anyway, did you find anything over there? Sam nodded. The poison compounds over time. There was a corpse over there that had completely turned to wood and it was barely recognizable as a person anymore. The only thing that tipped me off was the nose. It was too short and wide to be a branch and it had strange holes in it. The others walked away from the corpse and followed Sam as he made his way off into the woods. As they, perhaps unwisely, continued towards the center of the forest, they encountered more of the transmuted bodies lying on the sides of the trees. Some of them had begun to fuse with the wood of the trees, creating strange sculptures that created ominous shadows on the darkness of the forest. Sam gritted his teeth and ignored them, but his companions were not as stoic. The woman seemed to be almost traumatized by the entire thing and Reaper looked uneasy. Eduardo had a grimace on his face, but he oddly seemed quite a home here. Sam was curious if the man had actually been a real exorcist before the system's arrival. He was sure that there were demons now, but had there really been before? In any case, the man had seen some twisted things during his time in the Vatican. Sometimes, humans could be more evil than any monster. A metallic clanging noise echoed down through the trees ahead, punctuated by a loud roar that sounded identical to the one from earlier, except a bit quieter and without the addition of aura. They were almost there. Chapter 46. Sam nodded to his teammates and motioned for them to stop. All right. This is it. By the sounds of it, someone is already fighting the thing, and from the fact that they have not died yet, I am reasonably sure that it is one of the high rankers, or perhaps multiple of them. We will survey the scene first and then help out. If they try to kill us or betray us, I want you to put them down immediately. Is that understood? They all nodded in agreement and with nothing else to say, they stealthily slipped through the trees, or as much as a group with a ten-foot-tall stone man could, and paused outside of the fight. There was a sunlit area in the middle of the forest and it was about the size of a few football fields. In the middle, a vast tree stood, and it was being attacked by four figures. The tree was not just a tree however, and as it turned towards them, they could see a massive cyclopean eye dominating the center of its upper trunk. Tentacles of moving wood extended out from its upper and lower branches, darting around and trying to catch the fighters. Small drops of green venom dripped down from them and sizzled when they touched the ground. One of the figures, who Sam recognized as anonymous from the mask, clutched their arm from where a drop of the poison had landed earlier. The spread of wood seemed to have stopped, but the entire limb was basically useless. The other three figures were Rodney Kane, the Scourge and the Overlord. They had entered into an uneasy truce with each other and had put aside their differences to deal with the larger threat. Even with all of their power, the three were still outmatched. The overlord was protected from the venom by his clothing, but he was still tossed around like a ragdoll by the whipping branches of the tree. Apparently tiring of this, he planted his feet and roared out a challenge, fielding his Tao aura for the first time. Everyone except for Sam was blown backwards as if by a gale from the power of the man's aura. Sam himself barely held on, but as he began to field his own aura, the force lessened. Even though the overlord was more powerful than Sam, his Tao was still weaker. Sam was the only person on earth so far to have two Daos, and both of them together were more powerful than the overlords. Unfortunately, the use of his aura attracted the attention of the monster and a tentacle speared down towards them from near the top of the tree. Sam jumped to the side, hoping that the others could avoid it. The tentacle moved almost faster than Sam could see, and certainly faster than some of his companions could. The bear did not bother to dodge it, instead relying on his armor to protect him. This worked and the tentacle glanced off of him, instead targeting the woman standing next to him. She tried to cut it in two with her weapon, 
but it sped up and impaled her on its jagged end, lifting her up and back towards its body. Sam watched in impotent rage as the tree opened up a previously hidden mouth and swallowed her whole. A moment later, a wooden facsimile of the woman popped out of the base of the tree, heading straight for Sam. That explained how the immobile tree had been able to poison people from so far away. It had created minions from the bodies of the slain and used them as agents to spread its foul toxin. Sam and the others burst out of the woods, knowing that their only hope was to have more maneuverability. Whoever had created this boss arena had known what they were doing. It purposefully forced those around it to enter the open space, and in doing so enter the range of the creature's attacks. Sam tried to scan the tree monster, but nothing came up. He tried again, but it was as if the skill did not work anymore. This reeked of the games of the system and Sam added this to his list of grudges against it. Sam hefted his mace and charged directly at the monster, knocking aside the myriad of attacks that sped towards him from on high. He only had one shot at this, and he was going to make this ability count. Sam zigzagged back and forth to avoid the poison on the ground and reached the base of the tree. Imbuing his mace with an even blend of his daos, he triggered its once-a-day ability. A cone of red light erupted out of the mace, colored with white and orange tints. A celestial chime mingled discordantly with a demonic roar as the Tao-infused attack went off. The beam slammed into the tree, carving a ten-foot-wide hole into its side. Sticky sap-like ichor spilled out of it and Sam was filled with a boundless supply of power as his Tao energy flooded back towards him as well as the power of the skill. His body began to glow with light and he jumped up onto the body of the tree. This was a dangerous move as the thing was covered in its green poison, but it evaporated upon touching his skin. Sam clambered up, within the minimum range that the tree needed to properly attack him. He reached its eye with a mere moment to spare and slammed his mace into it with all of his strength. The tree let out an eardrum-bursting roar of pain and fury, blasting Sam off it with the vibrational force of its cry. He rocketed down into the ground, out for the count. Sam woke up a few moments later, his body aching from his overuse of his Tao. His gambit had paid off however and the tree was now inhibited by its lack of clear eyesight. It was able to detect its assailants through the use of some other sense, but it was not as sharp. His companions and the others were in the process of whittling away at the tentacles, blunting, quite literally, its means of attack. Sam got to his feet and was immediately put down into the dirt again as the ground rumbled. The tree screamed in pain as it ripped its roots out of the ground and began to thrash them about. The move seemed to hurt the tree immensely and its bark started to become gray, but it was able to seize three of the fighters in the time that it had its roots exposed and began to lower them towards its mouth. As Eduardo, the bear and Rodney Kane dangled over the cavernous mouth of the tree, a flare of light burst out from the trees like a comet and drop kicked the monster. As the light faded, an old man was revealed, limbed in the glow of a masterfully utilized expenditure of Tao energy. A wave of energy coursed up from the point of impact, seemingly doing nothing until it reached the root that grasped the three fighters. The tip of the root exploded outwards in a storm of shards and they were dropped down to the ground. All of them, except for the bear, were covered in the green poison. They were already starting to turn into wood and Sam rushed over to take them to safety. It seemed to be spreading more slowly on them than it had been on the other people, perhaps because of their personal power. In any case, they only had about 30 minutes left to live at the rate that they were transmuting. Profound Visionary stared at the tree, his face a mask of impassivity, and he began to cycle his hands in a strange pattern. In between them, a glowing ball of energy collected and after a moment, it shot out of his hands towards the tree. It let out a rumbling laugh and slammed its tentacles into the ball, removing it from sight. As it gloated, its noises were suddenly cut off as most of its mouth disintegrated in a ball of blue fire. The old man stumbled backwards but caught himself and watched the aftereffects of his attack. It still was nowhere near dead, but it was going there at this rate. It had too many people to deal with and more of them came every minute. The overlord looked over at Profound Visionary, his mask concealing his true emotions, but Sam believed that he was almost afraid of the old man by the way that he stood. Sam definitely was. That use of his Tao had been far more powerful than anything that Sam had been able to do yet. Despite nominally being above him on the Tao leaderboard, Sam felt like a novice next to him. He needed to find out how to use his Tao more efficiently if he was to stay on top. Chapter 47 Sam began to cycle his Tao within his body and attempted to mimic the movements that Profound Visionary had made. To his horror, his Arbiter moat had a small crack running through it. As he drew energy from it, the crack widened and as he tried to turn it off, his Tao of anger began to pour more and more power into his body. As it did so, the crack grew and grew threatening to split his Tao in half. Sam screamed as a wave of white-hot pain ran over him and he desperately tried to shut down his Daos. Sam slammed his metaphysical fist on them, 
pushing his daos into the deepest recess of his soul. Their presence began to recede and he sighed in relief as he stemmed the flow of pain for now. That was a huge problem however as it meant that his daos were useless to him at the moment. He did not dare to siphon any more power out of them and was now almost completely defenseless. He moved backward slowly to avoid the attention of the monster, but it seemed to home in on the fact that he was weaker now and it sent one of its tentacles towards him. Sam rolled to the side, dodging it, but only barely. He still had all of his stats like before, but he felt strange being cut off from his Tao in the way that he was. It was like losing an organ that you had never noticed before and then feeling the loss more strongly than the actual effects of losing that organ. Sam held his mace in front of himself protectively and used his skill to create some shields around him. He was going to need them. Unfortunately, someone else had other ideas. As Sam retreated from the fight, Andrew Monroe saw his weakness and began to close in on him. In the chaos of the fight, nobody even noticed and Sam was forced to stay and stand his ground. On even ground, he was not confident about his chances to outrun the number three ranker in the world. Sam gritted his teeth and raised his mace, waiting for the fight to commence. Monroe walked in without a care in the world, summoning a small dagger to his hands. A strange glint of light reflected off of his eye, almost appearing as if the sunlight had caught a piece of metal. Sam thought nothing of it and strode forwards, to close the distance. The other man cocked his hand back and threw his dagger, his motions a blur. Sam shot his head to the side, narrowly avoiding it, but then he heard a faint whistling noise behind him and the knife buried itself in his spine. Monroe held his hand up and jerked it to the right, making the knife move with it. At this point, the others had caught on to what was happening and they rushed towards them, but then Rodney Kane awoke with a gasp. Miraculously healed from his injuries, it almost looked convincing that he had resisted the effects of the poison all along if it was not for the surreptitiously grasped remains of a healing crystal. Now just any healing crystal, but an F-rank 1, something that he had picked up from a black market dealer from another universe who was looking to make a quick profit on something that was like pocket change to him. Not so fast, you bastards. This man is ours, he said with a laugh as he summoned a greatsword out of thin air. It was constructed entirely out of what appeared to be obsidian, and the air around it sagged, as if under the effect of a heat haze. One slash of the weapon created a tear in the air in front of it, summoning a massive wave of black light that streaked through the air towards them. The man had clearly been holding back in order to create an advantage for himself when the actual fight started. The overlord was seemingly unperturbed, continuing to fight the monster. With a glance backward, Profound Visionary raised one hand, coating it in a layer of blue light. Next to him, a shimmering figure of light appeared, looking almost exactly like him except for its transparent nature. It ran across the grass, almost gliding rather than walking and rushed Sam's assailant. Profound Visionary sagged, as if the attack had taken a lot out of him, but ultimately remained standing. The whole time, Sam was trying to mitigate the damage that had been dealt to him by the knife. Luckily, he had thought ahead and had created a barrier on his most vulnerable areas, the small of his back being one of them. The knife had still penetrated quite deeply into him and it was creating a small torrent of blood that dripped down his back. Cursing as he removed it, Sam dropped the knife to the ground and set his eyes on Andrew Monroe. They were glistening with rage and as he stumbled forwards, his dow of anger ignited. All of his attempts to control it had fallen to the wayside and it blazed like a second sun in the center of his being causing a wave of fiery light to rise up around his entire body. Sam roared, the sound imbued with the power of pure anger, creating a shockwave of force that knocked Andrew Monroe backwards, the scourge of New York no match for such a raw expression of the Tao. Sam's body began to fall apart and his other Tao cracked even further. In his heart of hearts, Sam watched with mounting dread as his body tore itself apart on the blades of its own wrath and damned him to an eternity of evil. Such blind rage was the opposite of what his original Tao had stood for and it chafed against the nugget of himself that was encapsulated in the soul of Sam Atlas. A booming, mocking laugh echoed out over the arena, from somewhere above them. Sam was the only one who appeared to hear it, the rest of the fighters too embroiled in their battles to register the sound. Sam screamed again as his Tao fractured further and the light of anger began to corrupt it. It was breaking apart under the strain, and there was nothing that he could do to stop it. It was like there was a raging inferno inside him, and all that he had to stop it was a single drop of water, a drop that was swiftly evaporating before his very eyes. Just when he thought that he was about to pass the point of no return, time stopped. All around him, the movements of all life simply ceased to be. The air around him was frozen in a snapshot of eternity, creating a tableau of strangely distorted images. Out of a rent in the air, a being emerged. It was created from an impossible color, one that had a meaning more spiritual than visual, something that broadcasted its meaning of every wavelength, and some more besides. 
This was something that had existed since the beginning, and perhaps even before that. With a voice like the sundering of planets, and the softest whisper of a child at night, the being spoke. Chapter 48 Sam Atlas dash upon seeing that Sam had clapped his hands to his ears at the sound, the being stopped. Oh, right. I apologize for my misjudgment of your power. Wait, you are barely beyond mortal at all. How can this be? My progeny have been seated across the multiverse and the rest of the boundless expanse by now. Why are you the only one left? How can this be? The being's voice morphed into a poignant paean of loss as it said the last words, the sorrow of all of existence seemingly contained within its words. It stared at Sam with blazing eyes, a confused expression on its indescribable face. It reached down with one of its hands and laid it on Sam's face. A feeling of warmth suffused his body and he leaned into the hand, searching for more of that warmth. It spread throughout his body, bringing a feeling of contentment and bliss with it. The figure withdrew its hands far too quickly, and Sam desperately reached for them. But they were already out of reach, seemingly a universe away. The eyes of mortals were not meant to see something of this power and as a result of its safeguards to prevent the immediate dissolution of Sam's very being, he was blinded from the truth of its movements. To Sam's surprise, his daos had been fixed, for now. They were still heavily damaged, but the taint had stopped spreading. After a moment of contemplative silence, the figure spoke again. That might be why my other children are no longer with us. I made them to parse and control a certain Tao, but in their journey, they must have touched upon other, similar concepts. That created something similar to what happened to you, creating a fracture in their soul. You however are different somehow. What exactly is it that is so special about you? Sam tried to answer, but his voice would not leave him and instead he was left looking up at the creature with boundless admiration. A moment later, the being froze. No, it cannot be. Has it really been that long since I last checked in? What has the system done to me? My old friend, where are you? High up above, a crack formed in creation, showing a sliver of something that blasted Sam's mind like a close-range nuclear explosion. It was wiped completely blank by the sight of higher dimensional constructs and the raw power of a system overseer. A booming voice rang out, but Sam could not hear it, lost in a white fog of complete brain death. The being that had appeared in front of Sam gave him one last look and tapped his forehead, before leaving the way he had come, narrowly avoiding a lance of energy that stabbed down at it. Just before it hit the ground, it was redirected through a portal to avoid any contact with the lower order matter that this universe was made up of. Sam remembered nothing of this encounter, instead coming to awareness with a strange ringing sensation in his head and the indescribable relief of his daos being stabilized once more. All around him, the other fighters were still embroiled in battle, and Sam had the vaguest sense that something important had happened but a moment ago. But for the life of him, he could not remember what. Remembering something more important in the moment, that he was in the middle of a fight, he narrowly avoided another throwing dagger sent his way by Andrew Monroe. Now that he had seen his tricks before, Sam knew what was going on. The man had some sort of magnetic control over his weapons allowing him to control them from a distance. The reason that Sam knew that it was not telekinetic control was that only the knife was affected. As the man threw it again, Sam raised his mace and blocked it with the hilt. The other man smiled and thrust his hand to the side, sending the weapon around the mace and towards Sam's eye. He had been banking on this the entire time and now, with his vastly increased dexterity since entering the forest, he caught it. The dagger struggled against him, but it was no match for someone with over 40 strength. That level of power put him far above a normal human and there was only so much magnetism could do without the presence of a magnet that was inconveniently large. In the end, the magnet size was limited to something that the other man could carry and use effectively to control the dagger. Monroe's face lit up with rage when he realized that his trick had been stymied and he moved in to engage in melee combat. Sam let out a breath to steady himself and he held his mace in a tight grip, ready for some more magnetic trickery. Luckily, his mace was not made of metal so it would be immune to the other man's abilities. Sam wondered how he had found magnets powerful enough to work from so far away, and then realized that he could have just gained an ability from the system. However, he had never heard of such a thing, so it was clear that the man had a few secrets. Sam waited until the last moment and then made his move. He swung his mace in a horizontal arc, creating a small zone of control for himself. As Monroe stepped backwards, Sam pressed his advantage. The other man twisted around his weapon like oil around a patch of water, and then struck with the speed of lightning. Not just figuratively, but literally as well. A small spark formed in his hand, and then grew and grew until the dagger was surrounded by a halo of electricity. With the sharp scent of ozone, his hand thrust forwards, too fast for Sam to see. It was only pure luck that the attack glanced off his mace, hitting him in the arm instead of the body. 
It seemed that his opponent was unable to control the attack very well, and it took a toll on his body as well. The faint smell of burning flesh came from his hand and it was charred slightly around his fingertips. The man growled at Sam and stopped using his abilities, instead relying on his martial prowess. He had clearly been trained in the use of his weapon before the system arrived and he was far more proficient in it than Sam was with his mace. The dagger seemed like a poor choice against a weapon with such power and reach as a mace, but Monroe made it look like it was the other way around with how skillful he was. Wounds slowly started to mount on Sam's body as he tried to land a strike on his opponent, not succeeding even once. The other man was too skilled for Sam to deal with, and his higher stats on account of his level were edging the fight even further into his favor. This fight was not sustainable, unless Sam found some way to tip the scales a little. None of his friends and allies were available to help as they were all tied up with their fight with the tree monster. It was just him and him alone. Racking his brain for any way out of this situation, he remembered something that he had seen a while ago. In his skill branch area, he could gain a certain degree of weapon proficiency for 50 points. He had wanted to save up his point for something better, but there was no choice. He dumped the points into the skill and immediately seized up as an electric current of information entered his brain. Countless stances and attacks vied for his attention in his mind and after a brief moment, he knew how to perform them. As his enemy moved in to capitalize on what looked like a lapse in attention, Sam shut his eyes and moved. Chapter 49 As the dagger entered his guard and seemed to pass through it, Sam twisted his mace and caught Monroe's hand in it. With a sharp yank, he broke the man's wrist and threw him high into the air above him. With a pained yell, the other man thrust downwards with his other hand to kill Sam, but he was ready for him. Monroe was unable to dodge while in the air and Sam cocked back his arms, ready to blast the man's head off of his body with the next swing of his mace. The other man tried to cover himself up with his hands, desperately trying to stave off death. Right as the mace was about to connect, a bright light enveloped the scene and they were blown backwards from each other. The tree monster had finally died and a rush of essence filled Sam, almost feeling tangible as it did so. He tried to move back towards Monroe, but an invisible force stopped him from doing so. Berigis floated down from the air, like some parody of an angel and touched down on the ground. Well done, all of the survivors here. This event achieved my goal of killing off all of those who were under a certain level on the leaderboard. I am very pleased with your performance, especially the ones who actually killed the boss. For that, you each shall receive a special weapon, themed after the boss. A small box fell out of the sky in front of Sam and similar boxes, some smaller, some larger, fell in front of the others. It opened as it hit the ground, revealing a small brooch. Ignoring the trinket, Sam roared and rushed Berigis, trying desperately to reach him. Before he had even moved an inch, a gravity field slammed down around him, pressing him into the ground. The system would not tolerate such aggression within the bounds of the arena. Berigis wagged his finger at Sam and then laughed, before floating back up into the sky. Sam lay there, a toxic wrath filling his being, for once not inflaming his Dao mode of anger. Whatever had happened to him that had patched up his Daos had stopped them from influencing his being, at least for now. All around them, the forest began to peel back, as if it had been an illusion all along. The sunlight expanded until it filled the entire arena, which was the same size as it had always been. All around them, other fighters appeared, far closer than they should have been based on how large the forest had been but a few moments ago. More common than the fighters were the corpses however. Sam gazed up to the packed stands filled with the remaining members of Earth, and lost hope when he heard their deafening cheers for the spectacle that they had just witnessed. Berigis stood on thin air in the middle of the arena, with both hands raised in supplication. I'm glad that you enjoyed the event, but I am not the one to thank. It was actually the Arbiter who thought of this whole thing and told me, in hopes that you would enjoy it. He knew that you would all find it entertaining, and as he is a local of this planet, I deferred to his wisdom. Berigis flashed Sam a devious smile after he said this that went unnoticed by everyone except for him. All around Sam, the other fighters turned, with rage on their faces. What did I just hear? Reaper said, an ugly look on his face. Both of his fists were coated in ectoplasm and he held them towards Sam in a threatening manner. Sam began to grind his teeth together and a red haze filled his vision. Berigis had set up this entire thing, just to make him an enemy of everyone else. But why? What was the point? just to have some fun at the expense of a weaker universe? Sam couldn't do anything with the anger however, and it looked to the others as if he was ignoring them. Reaper turned to everyone else and sighed. See? He's not even repentant, he said, pointing at Sam. I say that we kill him, here and now. All of the others began to move towards Sam, except for Eduardo, profound visionary, and surprisingly enough, the overlord. Of course, the first of the men was still unconscious, 
but Sam was sure that he would have rushed to his aid if he was able. A few of the others looked back in surprise at the holdouts, but they continued to move towards Sam. With a growl, an overwhelming aura exploded out of the overlord, petrifying everyone except for Sam and profound visionary. It was imbued with the full power of the man's Tao and it was yet another reason why the man was number one on the leaderboard. His body seemed to be coated in a layer of pure power as he strode forwards, before standing in front of Sam. I want this man to die, just as much as the rest of you, but stop and think about the situation for a moment. We are being purposefully tricked by our dear host, and he is trying to make us attack the Arbiter. Have none of you asked yourselves why? I stand for myself first, but for Earth second. Why should we let some alien bastard control us to this extent? Earth should be for humanity, not the aliens. There is something else going on here, and this man is the key. If none of you listen to me, then I will have to kill you. Nobody moved, as much terrified from the speech as from the aura. Then Reaper let out a roar of rage, before stalking off to the arena door. With that, the rest of them dispersed and Sam was left alone with the Overlord. He had caught the last few moments of the Overlord's diatribe and was confused as to why he had helped him. Before he could say a word to the man, he walked away, leaving Sam standing there in utter confusion. Then he too left the arena, feeling the hot glare of Barigis on his back the entire time. Sam rushed back to his room, and made sure that he did not stop to talk to anyone. Almost everyone was against him now, and despite the ban of violence within the living quarters, he would not trust Barigis to not slip something by. With a relieved gasp, he tore open his door and rushed inside, sitting down on one of the sofas with a grunt. There was a lot to unpack. Sam started first with the state of his daos. Both of them were in poor condition, and worse, he had no idea how they had gotten like that. There were entire libraries full of what he did not know about the boundless expanse, and archives the size of galaxies that contained everything that he would never learn. More melancholy thoughts began to intrude into his psyche, for the first time in a while. His past was a tangled morass of loss, bad luck and confusion that he had no wish to encounter again. Unfortunately, his mind, divested of anything to take its attention away, began to work overtime in creating visions of his past life. Chapter 50 His early life was normal enough, the son of two middle-class parents who both loved him as they should. He reached the age of five without any sort of strife in his life, but then his mother fell ill with what initially seemed to be a minor skin condition, but over the following months revealed itself to be cancer. Sam had always been precocious and he fully understood what was happening to his mother at the time, making the experience so much worse. Afterwards, his father had been like a ghost of a man, lingering around his mother's belongings like a wraith constructed from longing and regret. Luckily for Sam, he did not slip into a depressive cycle of violence and abuse, but what actually happened was almost as bad. Seven years later, his father, after having gone through a litany of girlfriends and attempts to heal the pain, killed himself. Sam still remembered walking in on his father, hanging from the living room roof, dead as dead could be. His face had been a strange shade of purple and Sam remembered cutting him down and calling the emergency services before gathering up all of his belongings and walking out of the house, never to return. After that, he had relied on the money of unscrupulous businessmen and restaurant owners, willing to hire someone of his age. After he reached 16, he found legitimate employment and paid for a proper education. Since then until the present day, he had drifted in and out of jobs, getting by with just enough left over after food and rent to at least pretend that he was enjoying himself. It had been a hollow semblance of a life however, and until the system came, he did not really understand just how hollow it was. A tear welled up unbidden in his eye as he dealt with the long repressed feelings. Was there perhaps a way, some infinitude of years off into the future for him to become powerful enough to bring back the dead? Was such a thing possible to the true powers of the multiverse? For that question, he had no answer, which was perhaps just as well. If he had known that resurrecting the dead was possible, then he would have lost all sight of himself in his quest to do so. If he had found out that it was not possible, then he would sink even further into depression. After thirty minutes, he reeled in his wayward emotions and checked his system logs to distract himself. You have killed a Sylvanian horror. You have leveled up. X2. He was now level 29, and he checked his system interface to see everything that was new with his status. Sam Atlas. Human. Mortal tier. G rank. Class, Dao Visionary. Level 29. Six free stat points. Strength. 40. 1.325x. Constitution. 30. 1.325x. Resilience. 28. 1.325x. Dexterity. 25. 1.325x. Intelligence. 28. 1.325x. Wisdom. 35. 
1.325x, health 300 slash 300, mana 280 slash 280, stamina 400 slash 400, Dao, Dao mode of the arbiter, Dao mode of anger, skills, 1x common, 1x rare, 1x epic, 2x legendary, titles, 1x celestial, temporary titles, 1x epic, 1x legendary, 1x mythical, Dao heritage, Dao incarnation of existence, party, Torturna Salvinii Brescan, level 24, health 310 slash 310, racks, level 23, health 320 slash 320, skill branches, muscle density enhancement, level 1, basic weapon knowledge, blunt, level 1, Sam had a few points to spend and he was shocked by just how much he was getting out of his legendary class combined with his title bonuses. Instead of getting 6 points into intelligence from 3 levels like he should have, he had gotten 8, and even more ridiculously, he had received 12 whole points into wisdom for his trouble. It was quite ridiculous, and it might have even been enough to keep him ahead of the curve without access to his daos. Afterwards, he checked his skill branches to see how many points he had left. He had 45 skill branch points remaining after his purchases and he tracked them out to see if that was correct. He gained 5 skill points per level which meant that he had received a total of 145 points. Out of those, he had spent 100 on skills which meant that he had 45 remaining. Satisfied that his math worked out, Sam moved on to the next and unexpected prompt. Weapon imprint successful. Somebody high up in the multiverse must be smiling favorably on you today. You have been granted an incredibly rare weapon imprint from a powerful cultivator and as such are privy to a fraction of their skills. Jeridan Halrax, the D-rank cultivator king of the Mantor Galactic System in Universe 9345685241 is the unwitting provider of your imprint. He provided his weapon skills to the system long ago in exchange for special bonuses. Your benefactor purchased these and gave them to you. His fighting style revolves around the dynamic use of blunt weaponry, eschewing the standard mantra of standing still and relying on heavy armor to defend yourself as you crush your opponents into the ground with a massive greatsword. Of course, there is still a lot of crushing involved in his style, but it is a dynamic form of crushing. As you progress further and your stats grow to the point where you can successfully perform the more complicated techniques, the wealth of information available to you will grow. Current level of weapon mastery has been set to implement stage 5. You now possess the acumen to wield your weapon with a level of skill greater than the mortal average. Well done. The entire message had a faintly mocking tone to it, as if to express some internal displeasure of the system at having to give it to Sam. The second message was more engaging however, as it provided Sam with an idea of what was ahead of him as a wielder of the mace. He was starting to become attached to the weapon, after only a bit over a week of using it, and now that he actually possessed the knowledge of its effective use, he found it more comfortable than any tool he had used before. Sam knew that much of the feeling was artificial, but as time progressed, he would become better at using the weapon on his own. Now emboldened and slightly more happy than he had been a moment ago, Sam stood up and made his way over to the training area. It was time to test his new acumen against the training robot. Chapter 51 he was nowhere near ready for the fourth setting of the robot, especially without his daos, but he could and would defeat the third one. Setting his feet back into one of the many stances that he had learned from his weapon imprint, Sam pressed the buttons to start the fight. With a faint whisper of metal on wood, the robot came to life. It paused for a moment as it took in Sam's weapon and it raised one of its metallic hands, summoning a glowing mace to it. It was made completely out of blue energy, but Sam sensed that it would be able to stave in his skull as well as any normal weapon. He waited for the robot to make the first move and it happily obliged, advancing with its mace held in a protective guard in front of its head. Sam could now read the thing more comprehensively, and it was trivial for him to infer what it was about to do before it even started to commit to the motion. The movement of a single leg betrayed its launching of an overhead strike towards Sam's head. He dodged to the side, catching the falling mace on his own and he repelled it, throwing the robot off balance. This fight would have been even easier if he had allocated his stat points, but he wanted to test himself more. If he was too powerful to have a proper battle with this setting, but still too weak for the next one, he would be in a bad spot, training-wise. Until he was able to at least hold his own for a minute against the next setting, he would not place his points into his stats. With a whoosh of displaced air, the robot dashed in for another strike, this time fainting before it went for the killing blow. Sam almost fell for the distraction, but was able to save himself at the last moment as the seemingly telegraph swing from the right turned fluidly into an underhanded strike. He leaped backwards, far enough to avoid the attack, but close enough to retaliate almost instantly, using one of the techniques that he had learned for the first time. 
It was a simple one, and one that he had already been using, but the strange tutelage of the imprint had shown him the true way to do it. A series of blows, calculated to disrupt the defenses of your opponent, before the final strike, killed them. Before, Sam had merely done this to keep up momentum, but now he knew how to use it properly. It was almost like there was a set of red lines to guide his movements as he did so and his mace followed those patterns unerringly. The first move came in from the right, forcing the mace of the robot out of the way. The second one came up and over, disarming it, and the final one slammed down into its head, crushing its skull like a tin can. Standing over the crumpled robot as it rebuilt, Sam saw the truth of the fighting style's name for what it was. It was named the Alcon Terran or Samburna, or in English, Flowing Water Style. It was a simple name, and relatively simple style of fighting as well, but the concept was as old as time and it summed up the endless march of some implacable object wearing away at the defenses of another, in order to one day destroy it. Whether the endless march of entropy, or the simple man-at-arms, fighting for his life against a superior foe, it was true to its name. Sam withdrew from the arena and sat down, ruminating on the battle. He had ended it perhaps a bit too late, as he could have easily defeated the robot within a few seconds by this point but he needed to test out his style. In a real fight, he would not have the luxury of the languid attacks that he had used against the robot and he would have to perform the same moves on the drop of a pin, with them fully ready in his mind and body for execution. Sam had always been mystified by the stoic and contemplative masters of martial arts and weapons that were depicted in fiction, but now he understood. This was truly something that a life could be dedicated towards, the defiant march of a mortal, seeking to rise above the heavens. Upon thinking these words, Sam began to feel a small resonance in his Tao. It was not much because he was disconnected from them right now but he still felt a small awakening in both of his Daos. They sympathized with his sentiment and they wanted to be a part of it. For now however, it was just Sam. Whatever had happened to him had disconnected him so thoroughly that he did not even feel the inclinations that the Daos normally gave him. Instead, Sam wanted to follow his own path for a bit and see where it led him biting back the surge of bitterness that erupted when he saw the brooch that he had gotten from Berigius, he opened the box. As much as he despised the man and everything that he stood for, he still would take a leg up if he got it. The brooch sat there, twinkling softly in the light of his room. It was made out of a twisted piece of wood that had a small amber stuck in the top of it. Lifting it out, Sam held it up to the light. In the center of the amber, a small gem could be seen, an emerald that reflected the light off of its many facets. As Sam ran his fingers around it, he found a small button. Pressing it, he felt the brooch transform into an armored wrist plate. It was about the length of his forearm, and on the top of it was a small bladed attachment that was presumably for turning away attacks. Sam pressed the button again to revert it to its original form and he placed it on his wrist. Upon pressing the button again, a small spike pressed down into his wrist, drawing blood. With a small grunt of pain, Sam saw a faint brownish tinge spread across his arm and down his body. After it had completely covered him, it vanished, leaving him looking the same as before. He felt different however and his skin felt more durable than before. Sam opened his system interface to see what it said about the feeling that he had. There was nothing there, but then Sam remembered how items worked. Using his analysis skill, Sam fixed the brooch in his mind and he made its description appear in front of him. Brooch of the Sylvanian Horror. Jirank Armor. This brooch was crafted out of a small amount of the essence of a monster known as a Sylvanian Horror. The monster was a genetically engineered version of the species that boasted especially deadly toxins. This armor emulates that, but in a beneficial way. Armor skill, tree shift. Upon using the brooch's hidden function to transform into a piece of armor, a small root will dig into your skin, causing you to take in the qualities of bark. You gain additional defense when wearing this armor in its armor form. The benefits of this drastically drop as the user's durability increases, in that the roots will not be able to penetrate the skin as efficiently. In the normal form, you do not gain any benefits. Sam whistled appreciatively at the piece of armor. It was very convenient, and it even seemed to function as full-body armor based on its ability. It still felt sour after it had come from Berigius, but it vastly overweighed Sam's inflated sense of justice. In fact, what better way to kill an enemy than by using their own gift to you? Honestly, it was just a pipe dream that Sam could even kill Berigius, as the man was far more powerful than him, but one day. Chapter 52 Sam went back to his sofa and stared at the wall for a bit, not sure of what to do. His weapon skills were already in his mind and he did not have to practice them much, and there was no doubt for him to explore. With a start, he remembered what he had been told about elemental affinities. He had no idea how to gain one, but he would damn well try. They seemed too good to pass up, especially without his Daos to rely on. Reaper had said something about there being a process to connect with an element, 
which Sam inferred to mean that he would have to be near the element for a long amount of time. He now understood what the man meant, if his theory was true, as it would mean burning yourself to awaken a fire affinity, if that was one of the elements. Sam assumed that the basic elements of nature were present, as the bear had used the power of earth to create his armor, but it could be something a lot more obtuse. Sam wished that he had access to more information about these seemingly basic things, but the system seemed to be determined to stop him. In any case, he would have to pick an element to connect with. He had no interest in air or water, but fire or earth might be interesting. Considering his own skill sets and his daos, he wondered if he should not do both. Fire would synergize perfectly with his dao of anger, assuming that he could control it, and earth seemed to match the concept of justice well, an implacable and solid force that would not waver. He would have to find a way to awaken them however, and he knew someone that might be able to tell him. Jeffrey had been a system user for decades before he had met Sam, but then he remembered with a sigh that the system would just remove the information from his mind. The only way to do it was through trial and error. Looking around himself for anything that could cause a distraction, he sank back into his chair and began the mental part of the whole thing. He assumed that this would work somewhat like his Tao, but he had no idea if he was barking up the wrong tree using this idea. Feeling like a complete idiot, Sam began to think about what Earth meant to him. In its most basic form, he thought of it as the bedrock of a planet, a mass of dirt and stones that coalesced to form the crust of that planet. On another thought, magma could just as easily be considered a part of Earth as well, but one that used fire as well. Sam was initially excited about the link, but then a strange feeling started to form inside his brain. It was like he was being stretched between two massive hands, and until he did something different, his mind would continue to elongate until it snapped. Realizing that he was trying to combine concepts far too early in the process, Sam returned to plain old Earth. Going back to where he started, the crust of a planet, he joined his train of thought again. In any case, the painful stretching sensation meant that he was on the right track. Sam continued to ruminate on Earth, moving on to the more ephemeral meanings of it. Imaging Earth as a person, Sam thought about what they would be like. He immediately imagined a massive man, made out of the bones of the mountains and with fiery red eyes of lava. As the stretching returned, Sam made his eyes into amorphous blobs of green energy, to symbolize nature. The vision began to tear, but then held after a moment. He had created his vision successfully. For what felt like an age, Sam waited there, burning the image into his mind. Eventually, he felt a click and he knew that he had done it. A moment later, the image began to move and he saw the figure come to life. Sam sunk into the image until he had fully immersed himself in it. By this point, he was in what was basically another Tao vision, and he relaxed, knowing what to expect. The man began to shrink, and with him, the planet underneath him grew smaller and smaller until it was but a tiny speck floating in the blackness of space. With a bang, it began to grow again, and as Sam floated closer, he saw the small form of a baby sprout into existence next to it. Tendrils of green and yellow energy poured into the baby from the planet as it grew, and it slowly started to mature. After millions of years, it turned into a toddler and took its first few steps around the infant world. Each of its movements caused mountain ranges to erupt from the ground and for vast pyroclastic flows to ooze up from the core of the world. Millions of years later, the figure had become a teenager, now aware of what he was doing. Sam could see the first blooms of life forming in between the vast hands of the figure and he gently dropped them down onto the ground. Two lizard-like creatures scurried around and then plopped into the nearby sea. The figure jumped and left the planet completely, residing in its moon. Sam realized that the planet looked almost exactly like Earth, and as the wheel of time kept turning, faster and faster, he saw the first humans begin to form societies. The figure woke up again and saw his creation spread across the world, and it smiled. By now, it looked like the man who Sam had envisaged and his body was suddenly sucked toward him. With a whoosh, he was drawn into the blackness of its mouth and then everything went dark. Jolting back into his body, Sam fell off of the seat, his mind aflame with new connections. A system notification waited for him and he opened it. You have formed the first half of your elemental meridian of Earth. The ideation of the element is the first part of elemental mastery, but the much longer and harder part is what comes next. To fully create your meridian, you must absorb the physical form of the element into your body in whatever means that you find necessary. Sam nodded in satisfaction. He had the right idea all along. Feeling something new with his body, Sam looked inwards, seeing that there was now a small orb of yellow energy orbiting his core. As he closed in on it, he saw that it looked rocky in appearance, with only its strange hue detracting from its appearance as a planetoid. Exiting his core, Sam began to think about what he had just done. Now the problem was finding a way to incorporate Earth into himself. It was a strange idea, 
and presumably even harder to do in practice, there was no way for Sam to do it now anyway, so he left the matter to rest for the moment. With nothing better to do, Sam got into the magical hot tub, luxuriating in the warm embrace of the jets. After a while, a voice ran out over the speakers that were revealed to be hidden in the roof of the room. Sam jumped, startled out of his half-awake state and then relaxed, realizing that it was only a loudspeaker. Wait, if there is a loudspeaker hidden in this room, then there might be a camera, or even a microphone, Sam thought with more than a little bit of paranoia. With a nervous glance up, he dismissed it. There was no use worrying about things that you could not control. That was the road to stress and ulcers, and Sam wanted neither of those. The voice repeated itself and Sam listened more closely, having missed it the first time. All fighters please make your way to the staging area. Chapter 53 The voice continued on repeat for another few minutes until Sam got up with a groan and dressed himself. Walking down the hall, he was met with an army of piercing stares from some of the other fighters. Cursing Barigis for the hundredth time, Sam ignored them and made his way to his destination. The area was noticeably emptier than before, yet another reminder of the lives lost in the previous event. Everything that Sam looked at were yet more reasons for Barigis to die, and he knew this without the influence of his Tao of the Arbiter. It was just a fact, simple as that. As the last few stragglers trickled in, Barigis appeared, with his signature flouncing movement. Greetings, my beloved fighters. I apologize for any injuries that might have been caused by the monster hunt, emotional or otherwise. You must understand, it was not my idea. The man surreptitiously looked at Sam with the last sentence, making it abundantly clear to everyone who was to blame. Sam gritted his teeth in rage and tried to control himself. The man was trying to get under his skin, and so far, it was working. By apologizing for what had happened, he was making it seem as if Sam was not willing to take responsibility for what had happened, and of course, nobody believed him over the arena host, except for Eduardo, profound visionary and strangely enough, the overlord. In any case, if somebody tried to make a big deal out of it, Sam was confident in his ability to defend himself. Eduardo flashed him a quick look of solidarity, and Sam gave him a weak smile back. Then he looked back up towards the front of the room and waited for Barigis to continue. Now that we are down to you all, it's time to restart the tournament. I have rearranged the matches based on the losses that we incurred during the hunt and you will all be matched up against a new fighter. Our first match for today is, The Arbiter vs. Reaper. Barragas smirked at Sam as he walked up alongside Reaper, the other man barely containing his rage towards Sam. Outwardly Barigis was smiling, but on the inside he was seething. He had been this close to getting Sam to break his other Tao during the hunt, but it had suddenly stopped. Nothing had been visible to him that could have caused such a change, and it was completely inexplicable. The system imprint had assured him that it had not detected anything out of the ordinary, so Barigis was left to project an aura of calm to the world when he was really furious at Sam. His only hope now was to make the man enraged again, but there was something different about him this time. In the time since Barigis had last seen him, it was almost as if his Tao had vanished. Barigis could no longer feel its presence, and there was no way that Sam had already figured out how to mask his Tao. He was a prodigy, yes, but not to that level. Barigis had made sure that Sam was matched up against those who were the most antipathetic to him and Reaper was the first of a long list of fighters that were baying for Sam's blood. With a smile, he ushered them into the arena where they were greeted by the bleeding cheers of the crowd. Sam snarled up at them, disgusted by how little they valued human life. It was like how the Romans enjoyed watching their blood sports, only in an era where people were supposedly beyond that. The system had brought many benefits, but also had brought society back thousands of years socially speaking. Sam wondered if it was like this in the more civilized universes, or if they were like Earth had been before the system came. All that Sam could do now was endure. Reaper faced off against him, the man's face a mask of pain and rage. Did you even know the names of the people that you killed? He whispered to Sam. Sam growled and tried to stop himself from launching himself at the man. It was not Reaper's fault. He had been duped by Barigis, a man with what was probably hundreds of years of experience with manipulation, or perhaps even longer. With a blast of noise, the battle commenced and Sam raised his hands to placate the other man. Sam was sure that he could easily dismantle Reaper in a real fight, but he wanted him to know the truth first. Reaper, I did not plan that hunt. Barigis is messing with all of us, and I don't know why. The other man's face creased in confusion. Why on earth would he do that? You're probably just lying to me. Sam gaped at the man in amazement. Just how hard-headed could he be? Why the hell do you trust an alien from some other universe over another human? He's goddamn pink for crying out loud. For the first time, Sam noticed something off about the other man. His face was slightly slack, at odds to his appearance earlier. Now that Sam thought about it, 
there was a slight delay between his words and his mouth moving, almost as if he was being controlled by something else. With a gasp, Sam understood. Berigius was mind-controlling all of the other humans to believe that he had wished for the deaths of the others. This was all some sort of sick game to the man, probably to hype up his show rating or whatever the multiversal equivalent was. It was a lot easier to run a tournament when the fighters hated each other. With a sigh, Sam resolved himself to the fight, and if he was being honest, he felt a bit angry at the people for being duped. It was clearly a matter of willpower, as three of the fighters were unaffected by Berigius' control. It was somewhat Reaper's fault in any case. Sam waited until the man had begun to charge, and then he sank back into a weapon stance. For this battle, he was going to go with a more elegant and rapid fighting style as opposed to the other ones that he had available. His movements became as the water itself as he twisted around, mimicking the motions of a whirlpool. As Reaper came in, his face twisted in anger, Sam sucked his free arm into his spinning embrace and caught it with his mace. As soon as his skin touched the ectoplasm, it began to burn, until Sam remembered something. He pressed the button on his brooch and winced as the spike drove itself into his body. The burning started to ebb as the brown pattern spread over his body and it soon became manageable. He grinned at Reaper and then continued the motion. Twisting his arm to face the sky, he thrust it up and threw Reaper into the air. With the crack of a hurricane discharging bolts of lighting, Sam drove his elbow into Reaper's face as he fell down. It slowed as it approached, as he entered the field of ectoplasm, but he powered through and struck the man's face. He spiraled backwards into the arena wall, indenting himself into it. The man was relatively unharmed however, and he quickly got to his feet, extricating himself from the wall. With a bellow of anger, he raised both of his hands and transformed them into two spinning drills of energy. Pointing them at Sam, they both split off from the arms and shot towards him at hundreds of miles per hour. Sam's eyes widened and he summoned his shields just in time. The drills spun against them like a pair of angry bees, and a humming noise came off the weapons as they began to drill through the barrier. Sam tried to increase the size of the barrier, but his mana bar was rapidly dropping. Reaching for his Tao, but finding nothing there, he instead unwittingly drew upon his nascent meridian. The yellow energy that he had seen during the vision started to trickle out of him in a tiny stream of energy that rushed into the holes caused by the drills. With a cracking noise, they began to heal over and the drills were pushed out, the rotational energy spent. Sam reached for more, but he could not find any. It seemed that his foray into the elements was already paying dividends, but it was still orders of magnitude weaker than anything anyone else had in the arena. Sam imagined that he had felt a tiny part of that energy come up from the sand beneath him, but it could have been his imagination. With a smile, he stretched his hand out and curled it towards himself, beckoning for Reaper to come at him. Chapter 54 Responding to the taunt immediately, two boosters of gray energy formed on the man's calves and he sped across the arena at high speeds. Sam rooted himself in place with a side stance and swung his mace as the man came within ten feet of him. Reaper created a massive sword of energy that projected from his left arm and the two weapons met in the center, creating an expanding bow wave of force. They struggled against each other until Sam had an idea. He had wanted to save them for his rematch with the robot, but oh well. This was a lot more important. Dumping all of his free points into strength, Sam watched as his mace instantly slammed Reaper's weapon out of the way and homed in on the man's throat. A rush of power coursed through Sam's muscles and he clenched his free fist in exultation. With the benefits of his titles, he had just gained an almost 25% increase in his stat and it showed. Reaper narrowly ducked under the mace strike and it powered through the air above him, but then Sam did something unexpected. Leveraging his new power to its fullest, he aborted the strike and slammed it down onto Reaper. Unprepared for this, the man was caught flat-footed and his was smashed into the sand, creating a crater underneath him. All of his ectoplasm rushed up to his head and thickened drastically, pushing back against Sam's strike. Even with his strength, the attack came to a standstill. Sam roared as he tried to force his way down, but he was stuck. Even worse, a spike of ectoplasm formed out of the ground underneath his foot and impaled it, rooting him in place. Stifling a groan, Sam thought desperately for a way to increase his power. If he had access to his Tao of Anger, he would have been able to trigger his skill and end the battle in a matter of seconds, but he did not have access to it. Remembering the feeling of his mana forming into a shield, Sam tried to do the same thing with his mace. It tried to resist him, but Sam was adept at forcing energy into places that it did not wish to go because of his Tao imbument skill and as such he was able to make it work. A mote of energy drifted down from his hand into his mace, completely at odds with what was about to happen. The tip of his weapon detonated in an explosion of blue light, blasting him off of the spike and away from Reaper. The scream of pain from the rapid removal of the spike was torn away from him by the winds of his passage. 
Sam mustered the presence of mind to check on Reaper and to his stratification, the man was lying comatose on the ground. Small pools of an oil-like substance, which Sam recognized to be non-enervated ectoplasm, surrounded him, leaking into the ground. With a grunt, Sam landed, throwing up his hands to the crowd. The deafening cheers made him feel a little bit better, but only marginally so. Returning to his seat in the waiting area, Sam was met with a storm of booing. A few people were more silent in their protests, but he could tell anyway. Ignoring them, he sat down in his seat and felt a squelch underneath him. A gale of laughter swept through the room as he slowly stood up and felt the remainder of a pastry underneath him. Somebody had left that there for him as a little present, but compared to everything that had already happened, such a childish prank was not exactly on the top of his priorities. With a smile, he picked up the pastry and stuffed it into his mouth, flashing a thumbs up to the crowd. That was clearly not what they had expected and the crowd went silent. After a moment, they pretended that the entire incident had never happened and Sam nodded to himself in satisfaction. After a moment's pause, Barigis reappeared and announced the next fight. Up next, we will have the ineffable mystic profound visionary heading off against the mysterious fighter known only as Anonymous. The narration was a lot more enthusiastic this time now that Sam was out of the picture and the two fighters stood up to deafening applause. Walking out into the arena, the live footage of the fight appeared on the camera of the screens. Sam sat back on his slightly sticky seat and watched. This was the first time that he would see Profound Visionary fight in a situation where he was able to fully enjoy the sight. Last time, he had been embroiled in a fight, which was not exactly the best place to study someone's fighting style. The man's face creased into a benevolent smile and he bowed towards Anonymous. The other fighter did not return the gesture and instead got into a fighting stance. Profound Visionary sighed and turned to the crowd. This wayward youth knows not the correct means to engage in a match of honor. I pity them, the man said with a wry lilt in his voice. His accent made everything that he said sound like some sort of nirvanic proclamation, sent from on high by the agents of enlightenment. In reality, he was just a wise old man. One that could bench press a horse. That probably made quite a lot of difference to be honest, but he still looked the part. Flowing robes of beige cloth hung loosely over his ascetic's body and his face was a lined statue of age and experience. In comparison, the masked fighter that stood opposite him looked like a novice, fresh out of the rookie league. Anonymous was dressed in a nondescript outfit of black pants and a shirt and they loosely held a pair of kukri. The knives could be used for both melee combat and for throwing, but the latter form was more effective. Wondering which one Anonymous would use, Sam waited for the fight to kick off. Profound Visionary began by bowing to the four corners of the arena and began to flow into a martial arts position in a leisurely manner. The man was unarmed and his hands were wrapped in linen bandages, like in some of the martial arts movies that Sam had watched. Anonymous threw their right-hand cookery, triggering a skill as they did so. A nearly invisible layer of air formed over the weapon and its effective cutting edge elongated until it was over a meter in length. Profound Visionary calmly waited for it to approach, bringing one hand back as he did so. The spinning blade of air approached him and he thrust out a hand suddenly, grasping it by the hilt and plucking it out of the air. With a dismissive flick, he sent the weapon flying off into the far wall. Moving forwards at a deceptively slow pace, he suddenly vanished into a puff of smoke, appearing in front of Anonymous. As he appeared, the faint trace of a line of blue light vanished. It appeared to have been connecting the two together and it was almost as if it had contracted as its user had teleported. Sam was coming closer to finding out what profound visionary Stow was, and this was yet another clue. For some reason, it was hard to detect the man's Dao, almost as if he was hiding it. The more that Sam saw however, the closer he got. It was something to do with the interactions between people, that much was clear, and it manifested itself with a blue light. The light was not that helpful, as there were an infinite number of possible daos, of all sorts of concepts, but the fact that it created a tether between them was useful. Sam watched as the battle continued, but he was half out of it, speculating about the mystery dao. Anonymous lashed out with their knife again, creating a sharp strip of air that sped through the medium between the two fighters, going faster than the eye could easily track. Profound Visionary lifted his hand like an image of some transcendent bodhisattva and caught it. A welter of blood coursed out of the appendage, but the air was rapidly drained of its motive power and dissipated into its surroundings. The older man took a deep breath and then exhaled. As he did so, his wound began to close over. Because Sam was so focused on the concepts that he felt emanating from the man, he caught the tiniest of energy trails leaking out of his own body and towards the man. Now that he had seen it, he saw it connecting the man to everyone in the audience, extracting the equivalent of a millijoule of energy from them. Individually it was not much, but between millions of people it was enough to heal his wound completely. 
Another piece of the puzzle clicked into place when Sam saw that his own energy stream was almost 50% bigger than that of the other people. Immediately, he thought of the concept of connection, but then saw that it was too grand of a DAO for anyone at this stage to form. It was some lower form of the concept that the man had, and it had been deepened at least once. Chapter 55 Anonymous did not wait for their opponent to heal and they rushed in, the wind around them lending speed to their motions. Profound Visionary stamped his right foot down, discharging a shockwave of energy out from it that disrupted the flow of the elemental energy in the area, causing his opponent to stumble. With a rush of air, he blurred forwards and karate chopped Anonymous in the face. Their mask cracked, revealing the face of a teenage girl. The entire arena audience went silent as the people in it tried to get a better look at what was going on. The camera zoomed in on the scene to better make out what was happening, and Sam was sure that Barigis was off laughing somewhere about how the plot twist would make his arena rating so much better. The girl stared at her opponent with undisguised hatred in her eyes and then began to scream in a high-pitched storm of noise. It quickly became clear that this was not some display of rage, but an actual attack as the stones in the arena walls and the sand around the two fighters began to vibrate. Blood started to drip down the ears of Profound Visionary, but he just stood there and looked at the girl as she screamed. A force field shot up around the arena and the sound was muffled enough so that it would not cause any problem for the audience. It was still perfectly audible however, and it was still getting louder. Profound Visionary started to be pushed backwards by the attack and eventually he was shot off of his feet and into the far wall. All the while, he continued to look at his assailant. Anonymous eventually ran out of air, far after a normal person should have, and she sank to her knees, breathing heavily. With shaky legs, Profound Visionary got up and started to walk towards her. His strides became stronger and surer as he approached the girl and eventually he stood in front of her. With a casual flick of his fingertip, she collapsed onto the ground. Sam was able to see the small thread of blue light that ran between the two and saw as it was tweaked somehow by Profound Visionary. He sat down by the girl's body and laid his hand on her before muttering something. After a moment, the body was teleported away so that she could get treatment. Profound Visionary stood up and walked out of the arena, covered in blood, but almost completely unharmed. After a pause, the arena broke into a round of deafening applause. Sam was tempted to run out there and scream at them, but he reined in the childish impulse and instead settled for clenching his fists. The people around him took that the wrong way of course, and a round of muttering started up about how he was angry that neither of the fighters had died. This only served to enrage him even more, and at some point he was going to have a stroke from all of the tension. The entire thing was completely ridiculous, something that could exist in a comedy, but not in real life. However, it was happening regardless, unconcerned about the laws of reality. Sam let out a breath and started to meditate, as much to calm himself as to distract himself from the heckling whispers coming from around him. Attacking one of the people that were taunting him would only serve to make the matter worse. Instead, he found solace in his breathing and rather than attempting any mystical connections to his Tao or his element, he instead just meditated like a normal, mundane person would. The breath started to calm his mind and soon all there was in his world was the motions of his mouth. In, out, in, out. Those two words dictated his body and mind. After some time, he was jolted out of it by a loud bang and he realized that he had missed the start of one of the fights. Two people that he didn't know were having at it, and both of them had the same sort of build. They were both fire mages, and seemed to be evenly matched to some extent. One of them specialized in quick, agile attacks such as fire whips and darts, whereas the other one had a penchant for slower but more devastating attacks. Before a man-sized ball of fire could reach her, the quick-casting mage sent out a dart of fire into the middle of it, rupturing the spell formation and causing it to explode harmlessly into a billowing gout of flames. The sand underneath it melted into glass, but neither fighter was harmed. Two more of the fire darts sped out across the divide and headed straight for the other fighter, who blocked them with a tower shield of molten rock, summoned out of thin air. Rather, it was created from the sand underneath the man who cast it, but to anyone other than the top people in the world, it would have looked seamless. Sam was able to catch it but only barely as dexterity was not one of his strong suits. They continued to send attacks at each other for a few minutes and then one of them stumbled, out of mana, the other one sent one last attack, but the massive pillar of flame that shot out of the ground was narrowly avoided, bottoming out the caster's mana pool as well. Without any mana, they were left to duke it out in hand-to-hand -hand combat and with shrill noises that were supposed to be roars of anger, they charged at each other. It was like watching two kittens fight with each other to Sam, as he was a predominantly melee-focused fighter, meaning that something like this was almost pathetic. They slapped each other with their hands, without an ounce of form or technique, ending with one of them, the quick caster, 
catching a lucky strike to the temple and falling to the ground, out cold. Sam noticed that the audience had stopped cheering about halfway through the fight and nobody made any sort of noises for the victor, except for a slight susurration that could just have been the wind blowing over the top of the arena. The audience was clearly not impressed with the match. Stifling a yawn, Sam got up and walked out of the room. Everyone's eyes were on him, but nobody was stupid enough to try to stop him. Sam was getting restless inside the arena, and he wanted to see if there was a way out into the city that was outside of it. If there was then he could satisfy his urge to do something different as well as defy Barigis. It was the standard behavior of one with no self-confidence, true, but Sam didn't really care about his appearances. He was just about done with dealing with the crap that people in the system seemed to love raining down on those weaker than themselves, and it was time for him to start resisting it. This was the first step in that, no matter how small. Exploring the hallway led to him finding quite a few storage closets tucked away in alcoves, but no way out. That was until he went into one of the closets however. Rather than just being full of cleaning supplies as he had expected, there were stacks of random items in there too. It seemed as if everything that was lost within the complex was tidied up and hidden inside of these places. On the back wall was a glowing key that Sam was sure would unlock the doors to the outside city. Before he went in, he threw a small scrap of clothing inside to test for traps. There were none. Satisfied, he walked in after, immediately setting off a blaring alarm that echoed through the halls. Behind him, the door slammed shut and he was locked in. A faint and crackly light appeared on the wall and a face slowly came into view. It looked like one of the service bots from the city outside and it looked at Sam with a disapproving glare. Provide the password or suffer the consequences. After 10 seconds of inaction, you will be considered an intruder and dealt with. With extreme prejudice. It was a robotic voice that sounded like that of the system and Sam immediately started thinking of passwords. He was guessing that it was something that was set by Barigis and as such it might well be something to do with him. His enhanced mind made the scenario slow down, and he had a bit more than 10 seconds in subjective time. His first guess was Barigis, but that was stupid, there was no way that the man would make his password that. With the time slowly ticking down, he moved on. He wondered if it was the name of one of the man's family members, but then he realized that he had no idea if Barigis even had family members, so he discarded that as well. The time ran out with an electronic sad trumpet noise and the floor beneath Sam opened up, causing him to fall down into a gaping abyss. On the way down, he picked the keys off of the wall, grasping them firmly in his hand. He fell for minutes, until his momentum suddenly stopped, causing him to touch down softly on a damp stone floor. Chapter 56 Sam raised his hand and enhanced it with mana, creating a soft blue glow around him. He gasped, taking in the sight around him. He was standing on the floor of an inordinately massive cavern and all around him small huts made out of some sort of stone stood. Next to them, short and squat creatures that looked to be made out of the same stone as their buildings stood, shielding their eyes from the light. One of them stepped forwards and addressed Sam. Who are you, human? How did you enter our lands? Confused at what he was even speaking to, Sam hesitated before answering. I'm Sam. As to why I am here, I have no idea. I fell through a hole on the surface and now I'm here. If you don't mind me asking, where exactly am I right now, and who are you? The creatures behind the one talking to Sam started to chitter, but they stopped at a stern glance from the leader. I am Torg of the Troglodytes. My people and I were sent here from our homeworld by some grey alien. He approached us in the form of a hologram, but I will never forget the power that he exuded. He could have broken our world with a single flick of his hand. All he said to us was that we would have our uses. The problem is, ever since arriving in this universe, our power has been suppressed somehow and although we are all in the F rank, it feels as if we are back in the first one. Sam didn't know how to respond to that, but after having dealings with Barigis, he had an inkling of why these creatures were here. That alien you talked to, did he by any chance tell you his name? The troglodyte gave him a look. Yes he did. Also, how did you know that it was a he? Did you meet this alien? Sam nodded, waiting for Torg to answer him. He said his name was Tantalos Veravax, the leader of the Dark Star Conquerors. It was as if he was trying to impress us, but my species has never left our planet so we had no idea who he was. Sam was about to respond but then the other man clicked his fingers. Before we continue, why don't we get you inside? There are all sorts of monsters here, ones that we normally would eat for breakfast, but now are quite the challenge for us. Here, come with me. Sam followed the troglodytes to one of the huts and he entered it after them, ducking his head. He was standing at the top of a ladder, leading down into what looked like an underground bunker. Whoa. The troglodyte smiled up at Sam after he said that. Climbing down the ladder, he entered the bunker and dropped the last few feet onto a carpeted floor. 
Lucky for him, the troglodytes seemed to like tall ceilings, because what was tall for them was barely enough for Sam to stand upright. He followed Torg towards the back of the room and awkwardly sat down on a tiny chair. The troglodytes seemed to have the same taste in interior design as humans and the house looked very similar to a normal one. It was filled with artfully placed patches of luminescent moss that lit it up in a gentle glow. Sam retracted his mana from his hand, now with enough light to see with. Torg sat down next to him and the others crowded around. Now comfortably situated, Sam continued to talk. Do you know how to get out of here? He asked Torg. The troglodyte shook his head, which was quite hard to make out because the man lacked any sort of discernible neck. No, we just arrived here. About twenty-five days ago, my kind were teleported into this cavern and these houses were already here for us. Apparently whoever designed this place knew what our culture was like because they look identical to our houses back home. Hopefully we will be able to go home soon. Sam gave the man a sad look and then explained what he thought was going on. It might not be as easy as that. That man you met is the one who bought my universe and is now using it as an investment for his cultivation. In one hundred years, he is going to return and kill us all. I think I know why you are here too. The troglodytes all gave him strange looks and Torg coughed. What do you mean universe? What is that? How could this man buy a universe? Also, are you implying that we are not part of it? Sam nodded. You already had access to the system for long enough to reach F rank, which means that you are not native to this universe. In fact, you were transported here as a little fuel injection for the locals. You said that your power was suppressed but you still are qualified as an F-rank under the system, meaning that someone who killed you would get a much larger amount of essence than if they killed something else with a similar difficulty level. Unfortunately, there are many of my kind who would happily kill you for easy levels. Upon this proclamation, the room was filled with an anxious chattering noise from some of the younger troglodytes. Their attendants, or perhaps parents, glared at Sam. He had upset the children with his brusque proclamation of doom. Wincing, Sam looked away from them until Torg responded. If this is true, then our entire worldview is completely incorrect. You see, we worship the system as a god above all else, the creator of our world and our place in it. If there are other universes out there, then that means that we are nothing. The man had trouble pronouncing the word universe, but he managed it eventually, likely helped on by the system translation. That was yet another thing that Sam did not fully understand. He could not fathom how such a thing could exist. For the system to be able to translate the conversations of untold numbers of people in real time would require an immense amount of computing power, something that was scarcely imaginable to Sam. The database for such a device would be the size of a universe, which as he thought about it, was not actually that ridiculous. If there were at least 10 billion universes in this multiverse alone, then one was nothing, especially considered that there were many more multiverses out there. He let the troglodytes deal with their existential crises in silence, waiting for his turn to speak. Chapter 57. Near an unknown planet. Continental shelves vanished into seas of rolling magma. Tiny people fled from the encroaching tidal waves of red-hot rock that rose up from the sundered core of the planet. Far above this apocalyptic vision, a massive image of Barigis stood. He was standing in the middle of the image, glaring down at the planet that he was in the middle of destroying. Someone of his stature was able to crack a planet in half with just an expression of their aura, without even having to use their Tao. Barigis funneled all of his rage into his aura as he yet again thought about how his prize had escaped him. If he was able to visit Earth in person, he would be able to find Sam as easy as breathing, but stuck with using his astral imprint as he was, it was impossible for him to scan the planet. Even worse, the system imprint would not do it for him, citing some inane law in the multiversal constitution. That name was more of a misnomer than anything else, but since the words of the Creator Kings were the absolute law in this multiverse, they could have called it a banana sundae and everyone would still have had to take it seriously. There was something in that constitution about the usage of one's aura in this manner, but since Barigis owned this planet, and much of the surrounding billion light years, nobody would come to check on him. This was his due as a cultivator, to take out his rage on the lesser beings. No mortal would think twice of stepping on an ant, and neither would a god about eradicating his subjects at will. One of the main reasons that barely anyone ever made it out of the mortal tier was because of things like this. This was especially true out near the multiversal rim where new universes were added each year. The word of Barigis was the holy gospel among his subjects, and nobody would dare to censure him for such a flagrant breach of ethics such as this. As he watched the planet vanish into the ether, he smiled, imagining the screams of its inhabitants as they vanished into the eternal void. Nobody made it to D-rank without being a little insane, and Barigis was no exception. The Troglodyte's Cave. Unaware of his inadvertent triggering of the death of a planet, Sam sat calmly in the Troglodyte house, listening to Torg tell him about his origins. 
After they had worked out the complicated stuff, namely how Sam was to get out, he had decided to immerse himself in their culture a little bit. Mainly it was to distract himself from what was to come. Apparently, this was not a natural cavern, and it was actually the home to a species of giant centipede that had colonized the entire area. These bunkers were created to protect the troglodytes from the creatures and that was why they never ventured far away from them. The exit from the cave was guarded by the brood mother, who guarded the supply of eggs that the centipedes hatched from. Centipedes were scary enough, but these ones were tens of feet long, creating horror of a whole new level. Coupled with venom that could melt steel and jaws that could cut through a human body in a single chomp, Sam was right to be nervous. He would have been happy to remain in this bunker for another few days before trying to tackle the centipedes, but he had been informed that once per week they went out to hunt and that was the only time that the brood mother was left undefended. Any other time of the week was a suicide mission. Sam was scheduled to leave in four hours and he was whiling away the time, trying not to think about the fight that he would soon be in. As he waited, he half listened to what Torg was saying. It was interesting stuff, but he wasn't really engaged in it. On the planet of the troglodytes, there was no habitable surface, and the living creatures of the planet lived on the inside in the vast cave systems that filled it. The surface was populated by a race of robotic creatures that had arrived there millions of years ago, sent by some unknown source to colonize the planet. They had discovered that the planet was unsuitable for their purposes, so they had raised it to the ground, forcing the troglodytes to flee underground. They were a fully system-integrated race, so they were no pushovers by any metric, but the robots were far more powerful. Despite the fact that only about a thousand actually made it to the planet, they had wiped out 99% of the troglodytes while only suffering a single casualty who had taken out the king of the troglodytes as it died. Left without a leader and a planet to live on, they instead decided to live in it. This had successfully diverted the attention of the robots elsewhere and allowed them to live in peace. Over the years, they evolved to live in their new environment and eventually became the creatures that they were today. Weak eyes and used to the sun were made obsolete by vastly enhanced senses of touch and smell. They still kept some of their vision as there were many light sources underground such as the glowing moss that decorated the houses here, but in general they did not rely on it much. Their small stature was designed to make cave-ins less of a problem as there would be more space for them to move in. Rather than losing their mass, they had instead compressed into that shape, with bones like metal and skin like stone. A fully grown troglodyte was barely up to the waist of a human, but they weighed easily double that of the human. Torg stopped talking as one of the other troglodytes entered the room, carrying a tray of stone pitchers. Setting one down between Torg and Sam, the creature left. Torg smiled at Sam and poured him a drink into a small receptacle in the table nearby. Unsure of how to drink it, Sam watched Torg closely. The troglodyte opened his mouth wide and a tendril came out, dipping down into the drink and siphoning it up. Upon seeing that Sam was unable to replicate such a feat, Torg frowned. Before the other man worked himself up over such a minor matter, Sam cupped his hands and sipped at the drink like that. It was like drinking industrial acid and it took all that he had not to scream as the liquid burned its way down his throat. Torg chuckled. It has a bit of a kick to it, true, but you get used to it over time. Sam thought that was the understatement of a lifetime but instead focused on swallowing, not bothering to go back for another drink. The effects hit him a moment later and everything around him blurred, before crystallizing into hyperfocus. All of his senses were drastically heightened, and things appeared gigantic in his vision. It was like being high, only ten times more potent. You have consumed Korcha plant brew. This alcohol is made from the mushroom species called Korcha that grows in the caverns of Farad, the homeworld of the troglodytes. Drinking it will grant the consumer heightened senses until the effect wears off. May be toxic to people below a certain threshold in constitution and resilience. The system notification explained everything to him and Sam chuckled. He was drinking magic mushroom alcohol. No wonder the effects were so potent. Sam wondered why the troglodytes had a use for this kind of thing, but Torg answered him almost immediately. Who, that hits the spot. My people use this to enhance our already prodigious senses. When under the influence of this brew, we can sense impending cave-ins from miles away. It's like having the senses of someone an entire rank above you. Sam tried to respond, but the effects of the drug were too potent. Instead, he was left staring at random places around the room, marveling at the details that he could pick out. From the other side of the room, he was able to see a minuscule crack on the wall that led off into some tiny annex in the wall. His ears were bombarded with faint sounds from far away, and something that disconcertingly sounded like chittering. The presence of the centipedes was painfully obvious. Chapter 58 Reigning in his rampant senses, Sam tried to listen to what Torg was saying, but everything was too distracting. 
After a while, the effect started to ebb and Sam was able to return to normal conversation. That was, distracting, he said without a trace of humor in his tone. Torg nodded, with a grin splitting his craggy face. That it is. I was going to say, you should probably wait until you're off that to go and fight the centipedes, but you recovered quicker than I thought. Unfortunately, it's been over three hours and it's almost time for you to go. Sam let out a muffled noise of alarm and sprang up. With a wave backwards, he left the bunker, leaving a group of very amused troglodytes. Outside of the bunker, it was pitch black so Sam used his trick from before and summoned a light. The light of his mana illuminated his way and he was able to make off the end of the cave far off in the distance. His eyes didn't really need that much light anymore on account of his enhancements and this paltry illumination was good enough. He gripped his mace with both hands and let the light travel up the weapon and to the end. It was difficult to do so, but seeing as it was not for the purposes of attacking something, it was a lot easier than it could have been. Now with a makeshift flashlight, Sam made his way across the cave. Far off in the distance, he could hear the unearthly screams of some beast dying, and he hoped that was a sign that the centipedes were far off and not nearby. It was impossible to judge the origins of sound in this place because of the echoes that the cave created. Instead, Sam relied on luck. As he walked across the expanse, he could hear a faint scratching noise, almost as if some gigantic snake was unfurling its coils and straightening out. Two green lights flared in front of him and Sam raised his mace. The lights grew brighter, illuminating the rest of the body that they were attached to. The lights were actually beach ball-sized eyes, affixed to a hundred-foot-long centipede. It was as thick as a man was tall and it petrified Sam with its gaze. He made himself move as a glob of venom streaked down from its mouth and watched as it melted away the rock. The feeling of petrification was not simply out of fear it seemed, as he received a system notification. You have resisted a generic fear effect. Fear effects are the most common of the mental effects and cause the receiver to feel a vague sense of dread, or, if the effect is more overt, paralysis. Sam ignored the notification for now and instead focused on defending himself from the centipede. Trying to defeat such a large creature in a contest of strength was a no-go for now and instead he would have to rely on his abilities. Dashing forwards at his full and not inconsiderable top speed, Sam weaved around a lightning-fast strike from the monster's fangs and reached its body. With a thud of bone on Kaiden, the mace was propelled into the side of the centipede by his powerful muscles. It bounced off, barely leaving a dent. The centipede made some strange noise that sounded like laughing. It was mocking Sam for his weakness and he cursed as the massive bulk of the monster whipped around, slamming him away. He caught himself nimbly, his enhanced agility paying dividends, barely getting out of the way of a follow-up strike. He really needed to find something with more armor penetration to deal with this thing. It looked at him, and then opened a horrific maw filled with rows of serrated teeth. A gurgling noise emanated from the mouth and a spray of green liquid doused the stone. Sam was caught with a single drop of the substance, and it felt like a drop of lava had been placed on his skin. The skin around the drop blistered and bubbled and the place where it struck was completely eaten away to the bone. Looking down at the chunk of white on his arm made him faintly nauseous, almost distracting him from the fight. Luckily he was wiser now and he was able to pay attention to both things at once. As the centipede bunched up and rocketed towards him, Sam leaped into the air with his mace held high. As the centipede dashed underneath him, Sam fell down, bringing the mace down in a crescent moon arc into its forehead. The weapon clanged against the armor and staggered the centipede slightly, giving Sam time to charge up a mana-enhanced strike. The blue energy made its way down his mace and he urged it to go faster. It seemed to be intentionally taunting him as it moved at a glacial pace down the weapon. Just as he was about to cancel the attack, the mace was fully charged and he slammed it down again. This time, there was a noticeable difference. Chunks of chitin scattered out from the impact point and a noxious goo began to spill from the hole in the monster's head. It roared and bucked its neck so hard that Sam was catapulted into the air, landing about 50 feet away from the creature. It shook its head in an attempt to stop the bleeding, but the attack had severely damaged the centipede. Sam waited for it to weaken, and then he would move in, but it didn't seem to be weakening at all. Instead, it began to move towards him, tottering on its many legs at first, but growing faster as it went along. Steam started to rise from the open wound on its head and to Sam's amazement, it began to close over. The centipede lurched forwards at the last second, catching Sam off guard. He let out a muffled shout as the monster bit down on him, swallowing him whole. The burning sensation of acid began to eat away at his skin and he had to bite his tongue to stop from screaming out loud, which would have opened his mouth, letting the acid in. Instead, Sam tried to position himself to be facing away from the creature's gullet, where the majority of the acid seemed to be coming from. He maneuvered his mace as well to point downwards and he shrugged before triggering its ability. 
It had worked on the bear in the wilderness, so it would probably work here. Hoping that it had been a day since he had used it last, he set the mace off. A flash of red light behind him signaled that it had begun and an irresistible force sent him flying forwards towards the centipede's mouth. A wave of blue followed him up from below as the mace's attack pulped the internal organs of the centipede. He landed hard on the ground, groaning as the acid wound started to sting anew in contact with the air. Instead of lying there, he had to get up and move as a bathtub's worth of acid came crashing down next to him. It sank into the ground and splattered everywhere, making it look like a bomb had gone off on the cave floor. Behind him, the centipede was rolling around on the ground, letting out deafening screeches. The entire middle of its body had split open and its viscera lay on the cave floor, steaming in the dank air. Sam was glad that he had left his light on, otherwise this fight would have been even more horrific than it had actually been. As he turned and prepared to walk towards the exit, a hissing noise came from behind him and the force of an explosion slammed him into the wall head first. Waking up some time later, Sam massaged his aching skull, feeling a drop of blood coming from it. On the ground, the remains of the centipede lay all over the cave floor, some of the pieces hundreds of feet from the main part of the body. The creature had detonated somehow in response to its immediate demise and if Sam had been any closer, he probably would have died. As it was, if he was still a normal human he would definitely be dead. A wave of essence cascaded into him, bumping him up another level. He couldn't be bothered reading the battle report so he instead decided to check his stats. He had gained the normal bonuses to his three class-specific stats and had three left over. Deciding to put two into strength to bring it to a round 50, and the last one into dexterity, he finalized his choices. As soon as he did so, his muscles began to grow warm. Looking down at himself in confusion, Sam saw that his arms were glowing with a red heat. Alarmed, he started to wave them around to cool them off, but then he saw that the rest of his body was suffering from the same thing. As the time passed, the heat became painful and then excruciating. Sam fell over and started to writhe on the ground, feeling his muscles liquefy under the intense heat. His limbs flopped over and his body began to spread out like a puddle in a sack of skin. By that point his nerves had been seared away and he could no longer feel any pain, a blessed relief. Then his body started to coagulate, coming back together slowly. The pain returned with a vengeance, lighting his now restored nerves on fire. Sam blacked out after a few seconds of this and woke up in a pool of some sort of blackish substance. It smelt like the accumulated trash of an entire generation, condensed into a single stain of viscous filth. He scrambled away from it and then saw that his clothes were soaked in the stuff, groaning, Sam resigned himself to his fate. Before he could start to wonder what exactly had just happened to him, a system notification popped up. You have passed the first threshold of strength. Every order of magnitude that you place into a stat, starting at 50, will count as a threshold. Upon crossing the threshold, you gain a permanent and compound 50% multiplier to the effectiveness of your stat. This will not be displayed on your status sheet, but it will be very noticeable. The first threshold that you pass will expel the impurities that are present in your body. Strength is what allows a warrior to continue fighting against all odds, what allows them to raise their weapons in defiance of the tolls that their exertion has taken upon them. It is what allows men to raise cities, armies, and entire countries. Use your strength well, for it can be both a boon and a curse. Chapter 59 Sam clenched his fist to see what the system was talking about and almost fell over again as the sheer force of the movement rocked his bones on their foundations. His entire body was now covered in bulging muscle, which must have been what had formed during his period of liquefaction. Checking his stat sheet, Sam saw that there were no changes to his actual stat, but his stamina had increased by a lot, which was very welcome. He remembered reading about how butterflies went through a similar process during metamorphosis, but he doubted that it would be so painful for them. Damn, either the system is a sadist, or it's trying to create a generation of masochists. Either way, it's pretty messed up. Sam wasn't even joking when he said this, fully convinced that the system simply liked to torture people. Unaware of the true reason, which was that growing more powerful naturally came at a high cost in pain, he gained another chip on his shoulder against the system. Soon, he would have a full bag, ready to be fed to the fires of his vengeance. Now that he had defeated the centipede, he remembered what the troglodytes had said. The others would be coming back and they would definitely be angry that he had killed their mother. He sprinted for the exit, just as he heard the first noise from behind him. The cave tapered off into a small chute that went upwards at a steep angle. Small handholds could be seen inside it, but they were too small for proper leverage. Now that Sam was a lot stronger however, it wouldn't be that much of a job. Grabbing onto the nubs of rock inside the chute, he clenched his fist, indenting it into the stone. That created a very effective handhold and he lifted himself up effortlessly, surprised at how light he felt. 
Sam would have guessed that he was about ten times stronger than he had been before the system had arrived and it was showing. A screech of rage erupted from below him, and Sam started to pull himself up a lot more quickly. The chute started to grow even steeper as time went on, eventually becoming like a ladder. Even with his prodigious strength, Sam was starting to grow tired. His stamina bar was steadily dropping down and by the amount of time that it had taken him to fall into the cavern before the mysterious force had caught him, he had a lot more climbing to do. After a while, Sam wedged himself into the chute and took a quick break to regenerate his stamina. Faint scratching noises began to grow louder below him and Sam took a peek down. He instantly regretted it. A writhing mass of centipedes were scurrying up the chute, heading straight for him. Shivering in disgust, Sam began to climb up again, propelling himself at incredible speeds. He was climbing vertically faster than a normal human could run and soon the faint glow of the sun was visible above. The centipedes were starting to catch up however, and at this rate he wasn't going to make it. In a normal battle, Sam could probably have taken them on, but in this situation, he could not free any of his limbs to fight back. The centipedes on the other hand had hundreds of legs to hold on to the rock with. A noise drifted up from far below, and Sam could hear the voice of one of the troglodytes saying something that sounded like fire in the hole. A wump of compressed air sounded out and a shockwave of heat and light raced up the tunnel, atomizing the densely packed centipedes and blasting Sam up like a cork out of a bottle. He soared through the air and landed on a pure white-colored roof, wheezing as the air was forced out of his lungs. It had been a harrowing experience, but he was still alive. Sam felt the barrel of a gun press itself to his forehead and he looked up. Three ridiculously bulky robots stood over him, each of them with the holographic face of Barigis superimposed over their heads. You will surrender yourself to our custody at once, the robot with its gun to Sam's head said. Then it made a strange clicking noise, and the voice of Barigis came out of it. Ah, Sam. I missed you. Pray tell, why were you sneaking around the hallways? I lost track of where you were until that explosion just a minute ago. The only way to get down there from within the arena complex is through the janitor closet traps. Why were you in one of those, hmm? Barigis' face took on a shifty look and the robot leaned in. Don't tell me that you were there for this? The robot lifted its clawed hand and showed Sam the key that he had picked up in the closets. He reached for it, but the robot snatched it out of the way. Naughty, naughty. Bad boys don't get to escape. The alien's voice took on a ridiculous baby-like cadence as he pouted at Sam. He wanted nothing more than to punch that detestable pink face until it was a bloody smear, but the man was not actually here. But. Sam flashed his hand up and batted away the gun before it could fire, causing the beam of energy that it discharged to carve a hole through the window of a shop. Somebody inside let out a shrill shriek, but Sam assumed that meant that they were still alive. His other fist came up and struck the robot full in the face with all of his force. It was like punching a piece of stone, but one that was especially soft. One of his knuckle bones broke but the robot's entire head broke with it. A small shower of debris blasted its way out of the back of the robot's head and covered the others with a layer of pulverized circuitry. They froze for a moment, allowing Sam to get up close and personal with them. His mace was too long to use properly now and it would take too long for him to unstrap it from his back, but why switch from something that was working? His fists both shot out at the same time, this time aiming for the robot's necks. With a metallic crunch, the robots both lost their heads at the same time. Sam grabbed the fallen key and jumped off of the roof, making his way towards the arena. At the front doors, Barigis waited for him, surrounded by ten guards. The man smiled at Sam and motioned for him to stop. Reluctantly, Sam did. Very impressive, but it all stops now. Unless you surrender immediately, I shall be forced to destroy you, Barigis said with a snarl. No. What the hell do you mean no? Barigis replied, a bit confused. I mean no. You might think you're clever but I know that that isn't really you there. The actual you might be able to kill me instantly, but this is just some sort of hologram, isn't it? Barigis shook his head violently. No, this is the real me. Prepare to die. The man placed both of his hands together and a small blast of what looked to be a cloud popped out, streaking towards Sam. Well, it streaked in its dreams. The thing moved like an actual cloud, so slowly that Sam was able to do a full circuit of it before it reached his position. Rather, he would have been, but he wasn't that disrespectful. There was still some room for the salt in the wounds however. You were saying? Sam said with a raised eyebrow, laying it on thick for maximum humiliation. Barigis screamed in impotent rage and rushed Sam, but he passed through him like a ghost. Even worse, Sam started to explain what exactly the man had done wrong. What tipped me off first was the fact that I never once felt your aura. If you really were strong enough to do the stuff that you did with a real body, then I should have been able to detect it. Instead, it was like you weren't even there. 
Also, why would you come out here with so many of the guards if you were strong enough to kill me? Chapter 60 Berigis didn't bother to answer, instead going red with rage. Or rather, a deeper shade of his already pink color. He pointed towards Sam with a trembling hand and the robots charged him. Three of them stayed behind, charging up attacks with their weapons. The blocky pistols went off with muffled whooshes and the energy beams streaked across the street, artfully going through holes in the other robots' formation. This created the effect of what looked like a wave of death coming across the street, that was if the death was moving so slowly that it could be outrun by the average sloth. At least, it appeared that way to Sam with his new threshold. Despite the fact that strength really only should have increased the possessor's actual strength, it seemed to have a range of benefits across the board. They were pretty hard to describe, but apparently faster reflexes were one of them. Maybe it was just his ability to propel his body at greater speeds. There was a strange interplay between his stats, and some of them seemed to boost the others. Strength and dexterity when used in unison allowed for the effects of the latter to be boosted to a greater degree. As the robots came in, Sam got ready and he drew his mace. For this situation, he decided to use an attack called Raging Waterfall from his weapon style. He had never seen it in actual action, but he knew how to use it. As the robots came in, Sam jumped up and began to imbue his weapon with his mana. This technique called for maximum saturation, so he made sure to pump it as full as he could go. As his supply bottomed out, the weapon reached full saturation and it was almost impossible to look at, it was so bright. As he came down, his mace formed a trail of light in the air almost looking like a waterfall. His weapon style had been created by someone far stronger than him, so when it was originally used, it was saturated with water elemental energy, creating a real waterfall in the middle of the attack, but for this mana would work fine. It landed on the head of one of the robots, threatening to detonate. Rather than letting it do so, Sam only allowed a tiny amount of the energy to dissipate and enter the body of the robot, letting the rest stay in the weapon. For this attack to work, each robot would have to be struck with the same amount. This extremely bastardized form of the attack was nowhere near its original structure, and in the real attack the mana conservation was meant to conduct mana throughout the entire deluge of water, but in this situation Sam had to make do with this. The robot crumpled underneath the strike, pancaking on the ground with a metallic clang. The other robots tried to prepare, but Sam instantly flowed into the next attack, caving in the chest plate of one of the other bots. It flew backwards into the other robots, causing a domino effect that sent them tumbling across the ground. In the background, Berigis raged and the ranged robots prepared for another shot. The robots were actually quite powerful, but compared to Sam and his ability to intelligently use his power, they were like wheat before the scythe. He made quick work of the other robots and was making his way towards Berigis when a sudden pressure crashed down on him from the direction of Berigis. The hologram started to flicker out, but it had time for a few words. Under the terms and conditions of the contract that you signed, you are to not move for dash the connection cut out at the last moment, leaving Sam completely stuck. He tried to struggle, but it was no use. It was like he was rooted to the spot by the force of gravity, inexorable and irresistible. He waited there for minutes, but then the force inexplicably lifted. With a chuckle, Sam realized what had happened. The hologram of Berigis had used up too much energy in enforcing the decree of the contract and had been ejected from this universe, or whatever it was that holograms resided in, and was not able to complete the command. Because of this, some inbuilt safety feature kicked in and enacted the contract, but only for a certain amount of time. If that had not been the case, the outcome of the command would have been far more unpleasant. He started to run towards the arena, seeing streams of robots pouring out of the building. Inside the roars of the crowd told him that the tournament was still in full swing. That was a good thing as there would be no distractions for him when he got inside the building. As he approached the front line of the robots, he tensed his leg muscles and leaped over them, landing amidst the next ground. His mace rose and fell like a meteor, smashing the bots into piles of metal. His mace flashed out around him as he ran, but there were too many of these robots for him and he began to flag. Roaring in exertion, Sam tried to press forwards, budging the robots by a small amount but it was futile. They had moved into a position that allowed them to form a wall in front of him, and now they were closing in, trying to crush Sam between their metal bodies. Sam tried to jump up again, but a hand grabbed his foot, stopping him. Instead, Sam fell over forwards and onto the robots where they began to lay into him with their fists. The only good thing about this was that they were too tightly packed to use their ranged weapons, which would have been a hassle for Sam to deal with. Sandwiched beneath hundreds of robots, Sam began to despair. There seemed to be no way out, and the clone of Berigis would likely reform soon, this time commanding him properly. He didn't know why the robots were not trying to kill him, but he suspected that the pink alien who controlled them had plans for him. 
plans that he did not want to help enact. Within him, his Dao struggled to flare into prominence, but they were too far removed from him for him to feel his presence. It was just as well, as using them in their current state would cripple his cultivation until his death. The detonation of a Dao within a body made for some interesting, but also highly disturbing injuries. The least of which was instant organ rupturing. The half-body half-soul space that a Dao resided in was a volatile area, torn between its two realities, and if anything happened in there that was dangerous, it would affect both halves of a person's being as well. Sam did not, and had no reason to know this yet, but soul damage was a very real thing the more powerful a cultivator got. For now, he searched for a way out of his predicament. The weight was growing heavier and heavier, and if he didn't get out soon, he would die despite the robots not intending it. They were only following orders after all and such basic robots had no way to tell the difference between something being alive and dead. They followed their order to the letter, which was to stop Sam at all costs. Now that Sam was in a situation where his strength was useless, he would have to find another way out. Ever since he had discovered his class, he had slowly gained points into intelligence and thus into his mana pool. That was a potent source of energy, but he was not well versed in its use, only knowing how to imbue it into his weapons. There was no space in here to use it like that, and because the robots were already in contact with his skin, he couldn't use his shield ability either. His skin was beginning to tear under the strain and his bones creaked ominously. Gritting his teeth, Sam dived into his mana pool. Chapter 61 Never having really visualized his resource pools before, he was surprised to find out that they were very real things. In his mind's eye, his entire body was suffused with a faint mist of green energy, which he assumed was his stamina. Near his core, there was a secondary accumulation of energy, this time a blue so bright and concentrated that it looked like a clump of tinted lava. That was where his mana was stored. It was contained within a small membrane of some diaphanous substance and it seemed to be a little less full than its maximum capacity. Sam knew that this meant that he was missing a little mana. He had no idea how the resource regenerated, only that it did without his input. Perhaps he was drawing it from the air around him or from his cores. All he knew was that he barely used it in large quantities and as such, it almost never emptied out. He suddenly had a strong desire for some sort of ranged spell, like those that he had seen some of the arena fighters using. Gripping his mana with his will, Sam tried to manipulate it. There seemed to be channels already built into his body and those tried to wick away the fluid as he directed it. Ignoring their pull, Sam started to move it into his muscles. While the use of a spell would be useful in this situation, he had neither the time nor the skill to use one without prior practice, so he pumped it into his muscles instead. They started to burn and his body felt like it was being slowly melted, but Sam could see that this was just an illusion. In reality, he was gaining incredible strength from this maneuver, but it was draining his mana at a colossal speed. It was taking something like 50 or 60 points away per second. Luckily he was able to slow down his perception of time, giving him the ability to use something like this effectively. If he was still in his old body, this would have been wasted, and he would only have been able to get off a single attack. Now, he transformed into something else. With one, titanic heave, Sam thrust the robots off of him, roaring out loud. Making a small space for himself, Sam was finally able to jump out of the confines of the robots, just as the time ran out. The momentum of his jump carried him across the street and in front of the arena. Pulling out the key from his pocket, Sam opened the door and walked inside, slamming it shut behind him. The sounds of hundreds of metallic fists pounding on the door made him shudder, but he knew that they could not get in. Now that he was inside the complex, Sam tried to get his bearings. He was in what looked like a control room, filled with computer monitors and storage devices that looked like medieval scientific instruments. The latter items pulsed with light as strange fluids ran through their mechanisms, creating some unknown effect. Instead of trying to decipher their arcane workings, Sam made his way over to the computers, knowing how to work those at least. Or so he thought. The keys were in some strange script that looked nothing like English, or any other language that Sam had ever seen. They hurt to look at for more than a few seconds and Sam recoiled from the unsettling sight. Yet another anomaly within the otherwise immaculate system translation service. Perhaps this was intentional however, as it would be useless to any infiltrators of the compound. If the system translated everything indiscriminately, then espionage and secrecy would be almost impossible, especially in a world where people could hear and see at far further distances than anyone back on old earth. Sam smiled at the inadvertent moniker that he had created for the planet before the system had come. Hmm, old earth. I like it. Sam decided to use that word from now on in his head. It had a satisfying ring to it. Instead of trying to decipher the keys, Sam tried to look at what was on the screens as well. There were a few icons that looked vaguely like apps or files that could be seen, 
and he clicked on the first one that he laid eyes on, one with an image of a camera. As he clicked, he had a disturbing thought, and what he found confirmed it. There were a few hundred entries on the screen, and these Sam could read. Eduardo Vanzetti. Sam Atlas. Pyotr Nikolaevich. Rodney Kane. Those were the names of some of the fighters and as he scrolled down even further, he found that everyone still in the tournament had won. Clicking on his own one, Sam saw a fisheye view of his room. Next to the video was an icon of a microphone and Sam sighed as he saw that he had been right. Berigis had been invading the privacy of everyone that was under his charge. Combined with all the other things that he had done, Sam's rock-bottom appreciation of the man's character suddenly found that there was a cave underneath it. He closed the tab with a snarl and started to append the drawers in the room. A strange feeling started to beckon to him from the rest of the room and he followed it. He didn't know what he was looking for, but eventually he found it. There was a locked box in one of the cabinets that was labeled System Contracts. He grabbed it and tried to open it but it was locked. In fact, there didn't even seem to be a way to open it at all and Sam struggled with the box, trying to crack it open with his hands and mace. Nothing worked and in desperation, he tried to analyze it. Immediately, a spike of pain lanced through his mind and he let go of the box in shock. It clearly did not want him tampering with it. Sam picked it up again and awkwardly cradled it under his arm, unsure of what to do with it. Carrying it would make him an instant target to any of the guard robots, though he probably already was one. This was going to be a problem. He couldn't leave it though either as this would be his only chance to free everyone. Making his way out of the room, he entered the hallway and finally was back in a part of the arena that he recognized. Struck with a flash of insight, he pulled out his room token and sure enough, it guided him back there. Following the tug of the token, he came across a roaming janitor robot. It looked at him for a moment before opening its mouth and letting out a piercing alarm that echoed around the hallway. Cursing, Sam continued to move, now running at full speed. Behind him, Sam heard the noise of the guard robot's feet pattering against the floor. He ran even faster and soon the walls faded into a blur in his vision, his feet outstripping his perception. Skidding to a halt outside his room door, he slapped the key against it and opened the door, running inside. Letting out a breath, Sam then exploded into a frenzy of motion, searching the room for any signs of cameras. Remembering the angle that the one on the computer had displayed, Sam found it soon enough. It was concealed behind an ornamental plant that stood on a table on the side of the room. Sam had never even noticed it before. Smashing the lens between his fingers, Sam sat down at his sofa, finally able to relax. He placed the box down in front of him and got to work. Three hours later, Sam was staring at a much diminished box. After having studied it for long enough, his advanced intellect had gotten to work deciphering what needed to be done to open it. The first layer had ended up being keyed to a mana signature, which Sam was able to replicate by studying it for long enough. It wasn't anything hard to do, sure, but Berigis had likely never expected that anyone would find the box in the first place. As he waited for the box to open, he had gone over his system logs. The robots hadn't given him any essence, but he had received a strange message nonetheless. The system applauds your dedication to the eradication of the scourge of technology. Unfortunately, none of the robots that you have defeated are classified as high technology, meaning that they are reluctantly considered legal. Please search for a real threat next time that you go hunting for robots. This message will not be sent again. Puzzled by this, Sam remembered something that he had forgotten until now. Stored deep within his brain was the information crystal that he had absorbed detailing the factions that inhabited the multiverse. If he wasn't mistaken, there was one that had something to do with technology. Opening it up, he searched and eventually found it. Three. The Prophets of the Machine God, a group made up of those universes that were especially technologically advanced before the advent of the system, these people seek to take control of the system itself for their own foul ends. Spurn these foul heretics, for they are the epitome of evil. Killing them will give additional rewards. It seemed as if the system had something against those who tried to use technology past a certain level perhaps out of some sort of fear that it would be replaced. In fact, wasn't the system a sort of massive AI anyway? It certainly seemed that way. It sent messages to people that were not just pre-recorded, but seemed to be created on the spot by the system itself. The machine god thing that the prophets were trying to make sounded suspiciously similar to the system. Sam closed the notification as a chime sounded out from the box. It had opened finally and he frowned as he saw that there was yet another layer to it. Chapter 62 it fell apart into segments that looked vaguely like orange peel and revealed a spherical object in the middle. It was covered in words and Sam saw that he was able to read them. As he did so, he frowned. It was some sort of dense mathematical problem that he had not the faintest idea how to solve. 
It involved so many strange squiggly lines that Sam was beginning to grow nauseous just from looking at it. The only thing that he recognized was the number one next to the problem, which seemed to indicate that it was only the first out of a long number of puzzles. Frowning, Sam got to work. There was no point in giving up, and Sam recognized something in the equation as he worked. He was not closer to solving it, but he suddenly knew what it was. It was a strangely elongated version of Fermat's last theorem. Sam had read a book about that a few years ago, and he remembered that the man who had solved it had required hundreds of pages of equations in order to prove that his interpretation was correct. Luckily for Sam, he knew what the answer was because of reading the book. This equation is true, Sam said to the sphere. It blinked green and opened, revealing another layer. He pumped his fist in delight at how something that he had seen as some extraneous fact when he had read the book was now so much more important than it had seemed back then. The next layer of the sphere had a sentence written on it and Sam read it out loud to himself. Why do you fight? Huh? What does that mean? Was the thing literally asking him why he engaged in battle? I fight to survive. If someone else is trying to kill me, then I have to defend myself. The sphere went red and the number three appeared above it, suddenly turning into a two. The meaning was clear. He only had two more chances to solve this. Pondering the meaning more deeply, Sam realized that it was acting him in a roundabout way as to why he struggled to grow stronger in the face of adversity. That was actually a complicated question, and Sam found that he didn't really know the answer. He could create any number of platitudes such as that he fought for justice, or to grow stronger, but he knew that none of those really encapsulated it. Why had he been able to fight when the system had come rather than just giving up as the entire world order was changed? What allowed him to rise to where he was now? The fact that he had been able to reach the top five of the strongest people on earth was only now starting to sink in. It was more than an impressive feat, it was downright improbable. He knew that he had the advantage of his strange Tao heritage, but that was not solely the reason. The truth slowly started to dawn upon him as he looked at the sphere and ruminated on all of his exploits after the system had arrived. He was special now, something beyond the ordinary. Sam had earned his place in the upper echelons of humanity through his grit and purpose. Suddenly the answer came into his mind like the first raindrop onto a drought-stricken land. I fight because it gives my life meaning. The sphere went green again and the next layer appeared. Sam's eyes were starting to get blurry and he rubbed at them to clear them. To his surprise, his hands came back wet. He was crying. Stating such a profound truth of his journey as a cultivator resonated with him on a spiritual level and he suddenly felt like he was more connected to himself as a person. A system notification appeared in front of him and he wiped his eyes off to read it. You have found your mantra. I fight for meaning. Your mantra is what catalyzes your life, what makes you go through the struggle of cultivation, the pain and the strife in the hopes that one day you will have a brighter future. Knowing on a basic level what motivates you will allow you to persevere when others will fail. Sam read the message and then re-read it, smiling at how perfectly it described the feeling that he felt at that moment. He saw that there was an unread message from earlier, but he ignored it for now, moving back to the orb. Outside of the room, something started banging on the door and the voice of Barigis rang out as if the man was standing next to Sam. Sam Atlas. You will pay for what you have done. I command you to dash Sam slapped his hands to his ears as soon as the man started talking, but he could still hear it loud and clear. As soon as he heard the word command, Sam knew that it was time for drastic measures. He reached out with his hands again and slammed them into his ears, rupturing his eardrums. Surprisingly, there was not that much pain, only a strange sensation of being submerged in water. He withdrew his hands, noting that they were covered in blood. Now he could work in peace. Outside the room, Berigis was in severe risk of having an aneurysm. Well, his clone was. The real Berigis was far too strong to suffer from such an affliction, but if he wasn't careful, the sheer rage that he was projecting through his link to the imprint would short it out. The surrounding solar system started to tremble and shake as Berigis screamed back in his own universe. Forcing his will upon the space around him, the noise was audible even in the vacuum and it was impossibly loud. The closest planet was struck with Category 12 earthquakes and mile-high tsunamis which wiped out the vast majority of its inhabitants in seconds. On the other planets, the effects were not as pronounced, but they were still devastating. Still not rid of his rage, Berigis raised his fist and punched out into the void. A shockwave of condensed Tao energy and mana eradicated the entire system in a blink of an eye, leaving him floating in the middle of a massive cloud of dust. Over time, it would coalesce and turn into a nebula, but not one that any sane person would admire. Tainted by the fear and anger of the inhabitants of the planets that it was made of, the nebula would, over the course of a few billion years, turn into a nightmarish semi-sentient being that hungered for the cores of planets. For now however, it was nothing and Berigis completely ignored it. 
Now that his anger was somewhat stemmed, he was able to think rationally again, sighing in relief that he hadn't been anywhere near the center of his domain when he had lost control, he tried to think of some way to enter Sam's room. The man already had the box with the contracts in it, and from what Barigis had heard, he was already almost finished with it. If he was able to open it, then Barigis' tentative foothold on the planet and its future would be completely gone. Without anything to offer it, the system imprint would abandon him, and Barigis would be left with the taste of defeat in his mouth, a peculiar flavor that seemed to grow more bitter as one grew more powerful. As a being that could destroy entire solar systems, Barigis' tongue curled in on itself at the thought, or at least it would have if the entire concept was not just a metaphor. Chapter 63 Anyway, the problem with his situation was that as the system contracted host of the tournament, he was obliged to ensure the safety and privacy of the fighters. He had been able to bend these strictures somewhat with the help of his ally in the system imprint, but actually breaking into the room of one of the competitors would not be allowed, no matter what the imprint tried to do to stop him. The rules of such events had been laid down in stone by the system and would not be subverted by the mere whims of A.D. Ranker. Instead, Barigis would simply have to wait until he could either get to Sam or until he had managed to open the box. Sam was not as close to opening the cache of documents as Barigis thought. The last question was a real stumper, and he had been puzzling over it for hours. It was a riddle, but one with no clear answer. I am eternity, I am an instant. I am everything, I am nothing. I am everywhere, I am nowhere. I am the answer, I am the question. What am I? The number one appeared on top of the sphere as soon as it had opened, and this more than anything else was what was causing Sam so much trouble. He only had one shot at this and the riddle was too complicated to easily intuit. It seemed to be some sort of trick question as the sentences were contradictory, making his task much harder. His mind could almost be heard worrying as it tried to solve the riddle, but so far he had no luck. Sam had never been that good at riddles, and especially not ones like this. Damn it, Sam said, immediately clapping his hand to his mouth. It was too late though, and a clicking noise came from the sphere. Sam got up and ran to the other side of the room, thinking that it was about to explode. Instead, the sphere went green and clicked open, revealing a pile of documents. Staring at the thing, dumbfounded, Sam took a moment to collect himself. The answer was damn it? Sam asked, confused. He walked over to the sphere and saw that a note had fallen out of the metal. He picked it up and read it. Sometimes, there is no right answer. Sam sighed as he realized what the purpose of the riddle had been. It had told him that he only had a single chance in order to make him procrastinate and second-guess himself, but in reality he could have said anything. Sam picked up the contracts and immediately dropped them as what felt like an electric shock ran through him. Wincing, he searched for why that had happened. The answer was in his system logs. You are not permitted to touch the contracts of anyone other than yourself. This was going to make finding his own one a lot harder but Sam had to do so, or else Barigis would be his master forever. Bracing himself for the shock again, he spread out the papers in one quick motion, his stats allowing him to do so before he was shocked again. The shock was far stronger this time and he was flung across the room and into the wall. Groaning, Sam got up and made his way to the table. He wasn't sure if he could take another one of those. Checking his health, he nodded. The first shock had dealt 25 damage, and the second one had dealt 100. If it increased by a factor of four each time, he couldn't survive the next one. Praying that his contract was visible, he let out a cry of relief as he saw his name on the top of a sheet of paper. Unfortunately, that was all that was visible and the rest of the paper was covered in other other ones. Trying to find a way to get it out from the other paper, he felt his hands begin to steady as his dexterity stat sensed that he needed its help. His muscles tensed, not allowing him to make a wrong move as he snatched the paper out from under the others. Preparing for another shock, Sam sighed in relief as he was unharmed. Now that he had his contract in hand, a system notification popped up. This contract has been tampered with. Do you wish to read the full and unabridged version? Y slash N. Of course, Sam picked yes and watched as the words on the page were magnified, as well as what looked to be a whole book of text that appeared out of nowhere, which must have been the shrunken one. Reading down the page, he ignored the words that he had signed off willingly to and started to read the hidden text. The signer of this document will not be allowed to resist the commands of the being known as Barigis Elevantis. Attempts to do so will result in the forced control of the signer's body to do the task asked of them by Barigis Elevantis. If the signer is recalcitrant for more than three times, or if Barigis Elevantis wishes, then they will die. The rest of the text was a list of situations in which the signer was still bound to the letter of the document, and Sam didn't even know what most of them were. What the hell is Cloud Bunny Possession? The answer was not forthcoming, nor was it for any of the other strange circumstances that the document outlined. 
After having scanned the entire thing, Sam was given another system notification. You have entered this contract without full knowledge of what it entails. Do you wish to dissolve it? Y slash N. Sam laughed as he hit the yes button with all of his mental energy, feeling something pull itself out of his body like a parasite. He watched as a tendril of blue energy retracted itself from his head and snapped back into the document before the paper exploded. Sam sighed in relief as the feeling of freedom filled his body and he opened the door, ready to face off against Barigis. He had tucked the other contracts away in a bag, so that he didn't have to touch them. He would distribute them to the other fighters as he found them. Chapter 64 As soon as Sam opened the door, he was tossed back inside the room by an explosion. It wasn't much of an explosion, barely searing his flesh, but it had a lot of kinetic power to it. After realizing that there was no smoke or fire coming from where the explosion had originated, Sam saw that it was actually the fist of a massive robot. It was at least 10 feet tall and built like a bodybuilder who had eaten another bodybuilder that was doing all of the steroids in the world at the same time. Needless to say, it was a big robot. Sam briefly wondered how it was attacking him within the arena area, but then remembered that there must have been some provisions for robots as the training robots were able to attack people. Very clever, Barigis. Sam called out, not sure if the other man could hear him. His attention was stolen back by the robot as it prepared to attack. Its eyes were lit up with a fiery light and Sam ducked as its fist slammed into the ground next to him, leaving a crater in the floor. Seeing as the floor was made out of stone, the robot packed a serious punch. It seemed to be quite slow however, quite a bit slower than Sam. It made up for that with its strength however, and as Sam was soon to find out, its durability. He brought his mace up and over in the first of one of his mace katas, bringing it down onto the robot's head with a cry of anger. Instead of crumpling the creature like similar attacks had done to the weaker robots, the thing reached up and grabbed the mace out of the air, blocking it with its gargantuan forearms. They were the size of Sam's thighs and were made out of polished steel. Seeing as Sam had put on a lot of muscle since the system had come, those forearms were like sides of beef. The mace clanged off with a metallic noise, not even leaving a dent. The robot leered down at him and opened its left palm, revealing the barrel of a gun. Not only was it strong and tough, but it had hand lasers. Some people just won the genetic lottery, or rather in this case, the assembly line lottery. Wait, was it racist to assume that robots were all made in an assembly line? The intrusive thought came and went as Sam was clotheslined by the robot in the moment of unsteadiness after his mace had bounced off. He was tossed backwards yet again as the robot impacted his flesh and this time some of his ribs cracked. The bot would have made a very impressive WWE champion, that is if they let robots fight in it. And assuming that it was still around of course, which Sam doubted very much. He had a sudden vision of a unit of pro wrestlers who had all leveled up, fighting against a horde of gremlins, which somehow made him laugh. He got up gingerly, making sure not to disturb his damaged torso and noticed that the door was left unguarded. There was no point in staying to fight this behemoth, and it was time to show the robot that humans were superior. Sam ran at his opponent and ducked down at the last moment, sliding between its legs and out the door. He slammed it shut behind him and locked it, listening to the rhythmic pounding of the robot on the door. That thing was built like the door of a bunker, so it wouldn't be going anywhere soon. Sam put away his key and leaped back as a laser beam crossed the space in front of him. Barigis stood on the other side of the hallway, his face filled with rage. Neil! The man shouted, sighing as Sam did nothing of the sort. So you were able to dissolve your contract. I guess that I will just have to kill you. There is no point in letting someone as promising as you one day grow up to be the person who kills me. Farewell, Sam. Unsure of how exactly the pitifully weak clone expected to kill him, Sam was not prepared for the aura that dropped down on him like the gravity of a black hole. The ceiling above him crumbled away, and a man floated down regally through the hole, alighting on the ground in front of Sam. It was Barigis, but also not. The feeling that Sam received off of this man was nothing like the image that the clone projected. That thing was too weak to even project its aura, but this man was like a god compared to that. This was the real Barigis, in all his glory. The clone next to him faded away like mist on the wind, nothing before the majesty of its true self. One minute ago, Barigis had felt the contract dissolve between himself and Sam Atlas. Realizing that he would have to kill the man before he became a threat, Barigis did something that was decidedly unwise. He forced his true self into a lower-ranked universe. The appearance of a godlike being in a newly integrated universe had multiple effects, not least of which was the destabilization of its cosmic membrane. The cosmic membrane was what protected a universe from the ravages of the astral plane, otherwise known as the space between worlds or the interbrainal space. The astral plane was home to countless monsters, many of which were unfathomably powerful. 
It was one of those that made its way to the now defenseless universe at that moment. Salvactros, sovereign of the billion void shards, appeared in the space next to the universe, creating a bow wave of aura pressure that started to unravel the fabric of reality within the fragile orb of matter. One of the stronger of the weakest class of interbrainal titans, Salvactros was considered no more than an insect by its elder brethren. Despite this, it possessed power sufficient to destroy universes. There was a reason why those who tampered with the cosmic membranes were hunted down and dealt with viciously. None of that mattered to Berigius at that moment, not that he could sense it anyway. The only thing that he wanted to do was to kill the thorn in his side. Preparing to smite Sam down with the wrath of a spurned god, Berigius instead found himself, along with everyone else in the universe, floating in empty space. Chapter 65 Sam blinked as he was suddenly transported from the battered floor of the arena building into the depths of space. He looked around and saw billions, no, trillions of other beings floating there with him. They came in all shapes and sizes, some of them smaller than his fingernails, and others the size of mountains. Next to him, Berigius floated, stunned at how he could have been moved against his will. He made a move towards Sam, preparing to kill him, but the faster-than-light attack moved as if through molasses, not even reaching Sam before his entire body locked down. A brilliant flash of light, like the birth of a star, appeared in the void, revealing the form of Tantalo's Veravax. The man was pissed. His face was colored the ruddy red of a molten ingot of iron and the sheer power that coursed off of him was enough to stop the hearts of everyone that felt it, that was if it was not directed solely at Berigius. The pink man made a strangled noise, and tried to move, but he could not. A cracking noise echoed across the void as the man's bones started to shatter. Accompanied by Berigius' screams of pain, Tantalos flashed across the space in the blink of an eye, grabbing Berigius by his throat. So you are the trash that dared to place my universe in jeopardy? That overgrown kraken that was drawn to here by your destruction of the cosmic membrane actually was able to hurt me. For that, your death will be long and painful, Berigius Elevantis. Tantalos vanished, bringing his unwilling companion with him, leaving everyone floating in space. A starry figure stepped out of the darkness, floating in the space high above them. It was the system overseer that Sam had seen once before. With the voice of a being who had never once tasted defeat, it began to speak. It is to my great regret that the appointed system imprint to this universe in my absence has deviated from its correct path. It allied with the being known as Berigius Elevantis, placing this entire universe at risk. Rest assured, both beings are being punished now and will never return to plague you again. Unfortunately, the battle between the owner of this universe and the creature that was summoned by its sudden weakness destroyed your universe, turning it into a cloud of particles floating in the void. I am working to remedy that, and you should be returned to normalcy in a few hours. Strive to grow stronger, lest this happen to you again without any protection. With those words, the being vanished, leaving everyone in silence. None of them could move or speak, so they simply floated there, waiting for themselves to be able to leave this place. Sam's mind was working overtime however, and he barely noticed his situation. This was the first time that he had seen Tantalos since the very beginning of the integration period, and Sam suspected that was the actual man himself this time, rather than just a clone of him. Sam wanted to find out how to make the clones that Berigius and Tantalos had been able to create as they seemed quite useful. He could send them out to gain information and if they died, then nothing would happen to him. Sam guessed that it was a far higher tier ability that he had access to however. Speaking about that, Berigius had not been what Sam had expected. Because he had used that clone as a baseline, he had thought that the man was about E rank or something around there, but unless the power of the ranks grew exponentially as one progressed, that was impossible. He was still far weaker than Tantalos however, which meant that he was likely a D rank at most. That was frightening to Sam as the power that Berigius had possessed was enough to destabilize the entire universe. Would he one day be like that? More importantly, how long would it take? Would he be millions of years old by the time that he reached that level, or would he be able to do so before his allotted time expired? Seeing Tantalo's deal with Berigius like that made the 100-year deadline suddenly seem like nowhere near enough time to progress. After a while of such useless thoughts, Sam found himself back in the hallway that he had been in before the universe was destroyed. It looked exactly the same, except Berigius was no longer there. Sam still had the bag of contracts under his arms, and he checked them quickly to see if they were all there. They were. The universe had been recreated down to the last atom, and Sam heard the faint banging of the robot on the door of his room. Smiling unexpectedly, he hopped down the hallway, in a strangely good mood. Avoiding the death of your universe would do that to someone. As he walked, a message appeared in the air in front of him and he stopped, startled at the sudden appearance of what looked to be a system notification. 
10,239,428,157th Universe Patch Notes Removal of Entity Barigis Elevantis Repair of Universal Membrane Causal Reversal of Universal Destruction Reparations Made to the Inhabitants Sam laughed. It really was like a game. Then he paused when he read the word reparations. What reparations? Sam said to the air. As he spoke the word reparation, a small bag dropped out of the sky in front of him. He picked it up and opened it. Inside was a small item that looked like an I.D card. It had his face and name on it, and as he touched it, it dissolved into his flesh. Shivering as a sensation like ice water being poured down his neck overtook him, he was greeted with another message. In apology for the inconvenience caused to your universe by the actions of Barigis Elevantis, everyone has been granted a rank-appropriate citizenship for this multiverse. This grants you certain privileges within this multiverse such as access to interuniversal travel and access to the Supreme Multiversal Bank. As a result of this, you have gained a Class 6 citizenship, as fits one of your rank. Many of these privileges have been revoked by the order of your universal ruler, Tantalos Veravax. Sam was puzzled by the card that he had received. What exactly was a multiversal citizenship? Why was it something that he was only learning about now? It seemed like it was something valuable as it was the reward for his entire universe being destroyed, but it didn't seem that useful to him based on what he had read. Closing the message, Sam decided to forget about that for now and get on with his task. Making his way out of the hallways and into the main waiting area, he walked into a chaotic scene. All of the fighters were standing in a mob and seemed to be arguing with each other. As Sam approached, they all turned around and started to direct their antipathy at him. Chapter 66 You, what did you do to us? A stocky man wearing what looked to be a suit of metal armor shouted across the room. Rather than answering, Sam took a deep breath and tossed the pile of contracts onto the ground, trying to stop himself from retaliating. With his new strength from his threshold, he could have ripped that man's head off without blinking. Not that he would do such a thing of course, but it was admittedly tempting. Find the contract that corresponds with your name and accept the system prompt to dissolve it. Hopefully that will clear your minds. If not, then I guess that you were just assholes all along. This proclamation was met with a storm of threats and other forms of verbal assault, but Sam turned around and sat down. Eventually, a few people made their way out of the crowd and started to pick up the papers. With flashes of light, their contracts were dissolved and they all let out deep breaths of astonishment. All of them looked down at their hands in confusion and then towards Sam. He grinned at them and watched their expressions. Unexpectedly, they fell to the floor and started bowing to him. We are sorry that we ever doubted you. Please forgive us, as it was not our intention. It was like there was a fog over our minds, one of them said as they bowed. Sam was horrified by the attention and ran over to lift them up. There's no need for that. As long as you all understand that I did not cause all of this mess, then I am satisfied. Now that you all can see what happened to you, I urge you to make the right choice. The trickle of people turned into a flood and the blue light of the contracts being dissolved filled the room with an eerie hue. Then it dissipated, with everyone freed from the influence of Barigis. Some of them sobbed in relief, and others sat down in shock at being free. A few, namely the strongest of them, were unaffected, seeing as they had not really been affected by the mind control in the first place. Then, it all started to go downhill. It all started with Rodney Kane. The man had, for a brief moment, looked at Sam with something other than disdain, actually grateful for once about what Sam had done for him, but then his expression hardened and a shifty look took over his face. He whispered something to his companion, Andrew Monroe, and the man looked over at Sam with a malicious look in his eyes. Without any warning, they charged Sam. What they had realized was with the dissolution of the contracts coupled with the universal reset, they were not bound by the laws of the arena anymore and they could freely attack others. And of course, they targeted Sam. He gritted his teeth and started to expand his aura, filling it with the hot power of his rage, how could these people turn against him almost as soon as he had freed them? It defied belief. Nobody else tried to stop them, either too dazed from their ordeal or too afraid of the two men to do anything. It was just Sam against the two men, and he was far weaker than them without his daos. So that's how it's going to be then? You're going to bite the hand that fed you? Sam's voice was laced with the thick, almost molten anger that was stirring within him at this display of ingratitude and pure evil. Not only were they going to attack him for no apparent reason, but they had capitalized on his gift to them to do so. That was too much for Sam to deal with and instead he prepared to give them the beating of their lives, unsure of how he was actually going to do that. Anger was a domineering force, and under its auspices, he felt as if he could not lose. Rodney sneered at him, his scarred face twisted with malice and glee. You damn fool. Why on earth would we not use your gift to kill you? It makes it that much sweeter. 
By then Sam was completely out of it, his mind aflame with anger. For the first time since he had been cut off from his daos, the force that was protecting him from them started to crack and break. He was outputting such pure anger that it was resonating with the concept that he had been bound, calling out to it for an alliance. Against this conceptual resonance, the barrier that the strange being had placed in his was like a sheet of paper against the wrath of a dying star. With the sound of reality tearing, Sam's body began to glow bright red, outputting the heat of a furnace. Before he could succumb to his anger forever, he heard a voice faintly, as if through water. Arbiter. Sam. You're breaking apart. It was the voice of Eduardo, and the use of Sam's name shocked him so much that it dragged him out of his berserker state. What? What is happening? Sam's mind was beginning to fracture, the struggle between his Tao and his soul too much to bear. He felt a hand grab onto his own, and another one landed on his head. A strange force began to pulse through the hand and into his body. It felt like the conceptual ideal of a perfectly balanced system, the feeling of paying for something, or getting revenge for the death of your family. It was the force of reciprocity. Drawing on the connections between himself and Sam, the owner of the hand started to pull away the torment that was ravaging his body, causing Sam to drift off into a dark and tortured sleep. As the last few drops of his awareness left him, he saw and heard a fight breaking out and the face of profound visionary standing over him, with a worried look on his wrinkled face. At least Sam had finally figured out what the man's Tao was. With one final futile grasp at consciousness, Sam was dragged under by the siren call of sleep. Chapter 67 The sounds of muffled voices called Sam back up from the abyss, and he slowly opened his eyes to reveal the blurry side of his room. It was packed with people and Sam slowly moved his hand up to his face, feeling a jolt of panic as he felt his skin. He was no longer wearing his mask and everyone here could see him in the flesh. Scrambling backwards, and only hitting the wall, Sam heard a strange noise. It sounded like the crashing of soft and gentle waves onto a sandy beach. With a start, he realized that it was the noise of people cheering. Cheering for him. He got up with a groan and started to get out of the bed before he realized that he was not fully clothed. Before he could embarrass himself further, someone handed him some clothes. He looked at the person to thank them and saw that it was Eduardo. The man had a grin on his face and as he opened his mouth, Sam knew that he was about to say something embarrassing. Don't worry Sam, none of us saw your little friend. Sam started laughing but then choked at what the man said next. It's not like it would be visible anyway. Staring at the man in astonishment, Sam didn't know whether to laugh or hit him. Eduardo? What's gotten into you? The man winced at the use of his name, but then shrugged. He had exposed Sam's name after all. Somebody told me that it would cheer you up. Normally I would not resort to such crude humor, but our mutual friend believed that it would be effective. Sam flashed Eduardo a look of annoyance, mingled with amusement. And who exactly is our mutual friend? That would be me, profound visionary said, with a smile creasing his already lined face. As Sam looked at him with a look of disbelief, he raised his hands in defense. What? Before I entered my monastery, I lived a life of vice. Back in Beijing they called me the one-eyed dragon. I'm sure that you can guess why if you've ever seen a Chinese dragon. Ha! Huh, you crazy old bastard. I doubt you've changed a bit. Eduardo said, slapping the other man's back. Unsure of what exactly was happening, Sam waited for an interlude in the conversation. Um, am I missing something here? Did you two know each other before? Eduardo shook his head before explaining. No, when I was trying to convince Visionary here to join our group, he used his Tao to mingle his memories with my own to ascertain my character. That made it so I have these very strange images in my head, ones that might not be fit for this public space. The man winked at Sam and his companions before falling silent. Well, that entire conversation was a little too much information for my tastes. Anyway, what exactly is going on here? Who are these people? Eduardo let out a breath, his face more serious now. When you were gone, uh, things went south. You were the only one preventing the spread of the taint that surrounded the second and third rankers. Your strength made it so that they, not exactly, were deterred, but did not want to have to deal with the consequences. Without you here, everyone started to split into camps, and this was only accelerated after your return. It seems that piece of shit pink alien had been purposefully creating discord by inflaming their emotions towards you. They already saw you as a threat, but now they see you as an enemy. Some people did not want to follow them so they suffered the consequences. Apparently weaponized aura use did not count as violence under the contracts. Poor Theodore here hasn't been able to speak properly since he was blasted by their combined force. Sam tried not to giggle, but it escaped him anyway and he felt like an asshole. Sorry, I expected you to say something like, poor Jimmy, not a name like Theodore. Oh come on. Nobody else thought that was a little disingenuous? 
everyone stared at him until he started to feel really uncomfortable. Eduardo cleared his throat and continued. Before we continue, you should check your notifications. When you were unconscious, there was some information pertaining to the continuation of the tournament. It might be useful to you. Sam opened up his interface and checked. Sure enough, there was something there. Continuation of the interrupted first tournament of planet Earth. Because of the unforeseen consequences that led to the unintended perversion of the tournament to further the agenda of Berigius Elevantis, it did not continue in the intended manner. The new rules are outlined below. There are 250 combatants left, who will continue in the order that they were originally scheduled to fight in. There will be no outside interference, save for the spectators watching the event. The prizes shall be granted as listed below. 250-50 th place, 100, 000, 000, 000 credits. 50-25 th place, 250, 000, 000, 000 credits. 25-16 th place, 250, 000, 000, 000 credits and one rare skill. 16-5 th place, 500, 000, 000, 000 credits, one rare skill and one customized G rank weapon. 4 th place, 1, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000 credits, one epic skill and one customized G rank weapon. 3 rd place, 1, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000 credits, one epic skill, one customized G rank weapon and a faction creation token. 2 nd place, 1, 500, 000, 000, 000 credits, one legendary skill, one customized G rank weapon, one faction creation token and a choice between a personal F rank training robot or a month of tutelage by an E rank fighter. 1 ST place, 2, 500, 000, 000, 000 credits, one legendary skill, one customized G rank weapon, one faction creation token, a personal F rank training robot, a month of tutelage by an E rank fighter and a mythical title. Sam almost lost it as he read the rewards for the top places. Just the credits alone from first place were five times more than his entire net worth, and the other rewards were worth five more. Sam immediately knew that he had to place first, no matter what he had to do to get there. If he was not able to, then someone else would, and it most likely would be the overlord, making him even more of an unassailable bastion of power. He paused for a moment, seeing something strange. There was a weird transition with the rewards, with the third lowest rewards bracket going all the way down to 16th place instead of 15th or 10th as would have been more normal. Sam realized why, which was because of the way that a tournament worked. By the time that the match had worked its way down to the last 16 fighters, there would be an even number of them, allowing for the beginning of the finals. It must have been like that so that all of the finalists would get rewarded for their efforts. Perhaps Sam was barking up the wrong tree, but time would tell if he was right. For now, there were more important things to do. Chapter 68 Hey, Eduardo, what about the overlord? What's he doing? Eduardo shrugged at the question. I'm not sure. He seems to be working by himself, without any allies. Not that a monster like him needs any. Sam was perplexed by the man's choice of words. What do you mean? He's strong, sure, but not that powerful. Eduardo shook his head. When you were gone, he had his first serious arena match. He fought against another of the top 10 rankers, a woman known as Phoenix. She actually was able to hurt him, and he decided to go all out. Suffice to say, there wasn't enough left of her afterwards to fill a matchbox with. The rest of the unaligned top 10 are sitting on the fence, unsure of which side to join. Anonymous seems to be leaning towards the enemy, but a few others are considering us. After that accursed monster hunt, the rankings changed up a little bit. Reaper is one of the top 10 now, as well as the bear. Both of them grew much more powerful after the hunt, having passed their first thresholds in their relevant stats. Sam nodded. He understood that at least. After having gone through it for himself, he knew just how much of a boost doing so was. So are they something to worry about in the future? Sam asked, wondering how he would face up against them, especially without the help of his DAO. Eduardo shrugged. Perhaps. It depends on if you can access your DAO. It seems as if you have been having issues with that. Even then, you might have the raw stats to overwhelm them. You were able to do that with Reaper already in the tournament, but if he manages to make his way out of the loser's bracket, which I am sure that he will, then you will have to face him, or someone else of his level, again. He seems to still retain some animosity for you, not because of Berigius, but because of how you bested him. He thinks that you were mocking him by not going all out. Sam sighed and let out a wry laugh. He was just having the worst of luck these days it seemed. First he had earned the attention of Berigius which had ended up making him a scapegoat for the other people in the tournament. Now he was still suffering under the legacy of Berigius, despite the fact that the man was now gone. Sam briefly wondered what was happening to the man now, but dismissed the thought. 
he was getting his just desserts no matter what. Sam doubted that someone as ruthless as Tantalos would just let someone go like that. Settling back into the bed, he closed his eyes, trusting in his companions to protect him. He was still exhausted by what had happened to him with his Dao and he needed to rest. The rest of the people in the room trooped out and into the hallways, except for Eduardo and Profound Visionary. They stayed by his bedside, protecting him from anything that could come to hurt him. Eduardo flashed a glance over to the remnants of the robot that they had found in Sam's room. The hunk of scrap metal that they had turned it into was now serving as a very interesting-looking piece of modern art. Sam was thrust into a strange vision as soon as slumber overtook him. He could tell that it was not a normal dream, mainly because he was fully aware of it. Sam was, as it seemed he had a penchant for doing, floating in the middle of space. This time, there were no stars, just a small ball of condensed matter that exuded such a vast gravitational field that if Sam was not there in spirit, he would have been reduced to mere atoms floating in the void. As it began to expand, he realized what it was. He was witnessing the birth of the multiverse, or perhaps even existence itself. As the ball expanded, it split into four smaller balls of matter, each far weaker than the first. They continued to divide like cells going through mitosis until there was a tapestry of millions of softly glowing balls of light hanging in the firmament. With a dull roar of power, they exploded outwards in size, going from the size of grains of sand to the size of a galaxy in an instant. Sam didn't know how he knew any of these measurements, but it just seemed to be natural to him. It was part of the vision, it seemed. Over time, they kept expanding and eventually they revealed themselves to be the size of full universes. Small streams of matter started to drift up from the nascent universes and began to clump into pockets of matter. As they coalesced, they grew brighter and brighter until they formed into a human shape and took their first breaths. There were two figures present, one that was instantly reminiscent of the system overseers, except with the patterns of galaxies and universes on their skin instead of stars. As he took in the scale of the vision, he saw that those were actual universes and galaxies on it, not just images of them. That was not the most intriguing thing however. The other figure was far more of an enigma than the starry one. It was made out of an indescribable light that seemed to be made up of both everything and nothing at the same time. As Sam peered closer, he saw that was literally the case. Small motes of varying energies drifted around it like a cloak and, altering his perspective of the figure, he moved even closer, seeing a tiny image in them. Feeling them resonate with him, he saw that they were fully formed daos. With a jolt, he was torn away from the scene and instead was held in place to witness what happened next. Two colossal fists, one from each entity, streaked across the void, moving faster than light, faster than thought, even faster than the concept of speed itself. With a crash, they struck together in the middle of the void, sending out a shockwave of pure energy. This energy slammed into the universes, imbuing them with the first seeds of life and being. Each of them started to glow with a different hue, and he watched as tiny dots of energy formed within them, each the seeds of a new universe. Just as Sam saw this, the vision went black and the voice of a god began to speak. And that was when it all started. The Eternal War Between the Tao and the System. Chapter 69 The voice continued, but Sam felt a strange sensation on his arm and he flicked it away, trying to listen to what he was being told. It redoubled in strength and he was dragged out of the dark space, the voice still continuing. A bright light pierced the void and he saw the face of Eduardo over him. Sam, it's time to get up. The first match starts soon. Sam sprang up and out of the bed, suddenly feeling as if he had been resting for years. Indeed, he had no idea how long that vision had been. It felt like it had been millions of years, but he knew that was not the case. Somewhat flustered by the sudden removal of himself from the vision, he didn't hear what Eduardo said next. What was that? Sorry, I was a bit lost in my thoughts. Nothing. All I wanted to say was good luck. You're going to need it. As the tournament progresses, it's going to get harder and harder for you to beat your opponents with just your raw power alone. Sam let out a breath and nodded. I know. I am trying to find a solution, but none of it is intuitive. Sam gritted his teeth at the reminder of his failure and Eduardo quickly dropped the subject, not wanting to upset him more. The crackly voice of profound visionary broke into Sam's thoughts. With matters of the Tao, introspection is everything. Do you even know why your path has been broken? Sam turned around, startled. What do you mean? My path? The older man sighed and smiled, shaking his head. Your Tao is a reflection of yourself. I gained my Tao because I was steeped in the life of an isolated monk, relying on others to survive. In turn I helped them, creating a cycle of reciprocity. So I ask you this. Where did your Tao spring from? Sam prepared to answer, but then stopped. That was actually a good question. He understood why he had received the Tao of the Arbiter, but what about the other one? 
he had never been an especially angry person, not until he had gained that Tao at least. This thought prompted a small fragment of the voice in his dream to return. Your path shall be long, for your path is all. Sam wasn't sure why exactly he had remembered that, but it seemed important. Something to do with his Tao heritage most likely. Before he could ponder this any further, he was dragged out of the room by Eduardo, and towards the arena. When they arrived, the scene was markedly different to what Sam had seen before. There were two lines of empty chairs dividing the room into three segments. Near the front, a single man sat in his own segment, and Sam saw that it was the overlord. On the left was the largest group, and the two unwelcome faces of Rodney Kane and Andrew Monroe glared at him, with snarls on their faces. Sam flashed them a quick one-finger salute, laughing when they responded with a howl of rage. Surprised at just how much more open he had become since the system arrived, Sam smiled. He would never have had the energy or inclination to maintain this sort of oppositional relationship with anyone before. He was well known at his job as the person to always cave first in an argument. Back then, that was because he couldn't care less about life, but now that he had a reason to exist, it was like a whole new spectrum of emotions had been opened up to him. Sitting down at a vacant chair at the head of the faction on the right, he took a quick glance back, doing a headcount of his allies. It had been heard to tell in the room, but here he was able to see the rows of chairs properly. There were about a hundred people sitting there, which meant that the other side had about a hundred and fifty people. They were outnumbered, but not by that much. In the end, it was a tournament which meant that alliances were not really alliances, but more like loose coalitions of like-minded people. Yes, that sounded a lot like an alliance, but they would still have to fight each other eventually. A few minutes later when the last of the people arrived, the camera feed board dropped down from the ceiling. Wondering how the tournament was going to go from now on, Sam waited for something to happen. Words started to scroll down on the screen, and a computerized voice read them out. The first match will be between Okita Masomyun and Merlin. Sam recognized the first name as the man who had approached him all those days ago with a business proposition. Sam had completely forgotten about him, but he saw to his satisfaction that the man was sitting within his area. As he got up, he bowed to Sam and whispered something to him. I shall prove my worth to you now, Sam San. Sam tried to tell him that was not necessary, but then he reined in his mind and saw that this was the right course of action. He needed to see if the man could defend himself, especially if he was to manage their finances. On the other side of the room, Merlin stood up. Sam guessed that the name was an alias, seeing as he was dressed up as some sort of wizard. He was wearing grey robes and carried a gnarled wooden staff. Sam smiled, wondering if the man had confused his famous wizards. He watched as the two fighters made their way up the front of the room and out into the arena. Okita bowed to his opponent, but his gesture was not returned. A flash of light signaled the start of the match and Okita drew his sword, a long katana that looked to be sharpened to a razor edge. Chapter 70 His opponent raised his staff and brought it down on the ground, creating a localized earthquake that caused Okita to lose his balance slightly. Unfortunately, the mage was not fast enough to make it to him in time to capitalize on the distraction, and instead he was caught in an awkward position of being in motion while fighting against a far faster opponent. With a look of alarm on his face, he snapped his fingers, summoning a blue energy shield around himself before Okita reached him. With a sharp-sounding shout, the man cut down with his katana, moving the tip at speeds that were invisible to the naked eye. It was that tip that struck the shield, eliciting a loud crack from the substance that stilled the cheering of the crowd. Merlin smiled, slamming his staff down again. With a low whir, something burst out of the ground next to Okita. It looked like a segmented worm made out of molten rock and it lunged for the swordsman with a high-pitched screech. The man leaped back and blocked the strike with his blade, angling it so that the brittle metal of his highly sharpened weapon did not break. The worm was redirected off to the side, and it tried to coil around in the air, but failed to reach Okita as he tucked into a graceful forward roll. Closing the distance between himself and Merlin rapidly, the man drew back his sword and thrust it forwards. A small bead of light came out of the tip and struck the shield, starting to rotate as it did so. Growing faster and faster, the attack began to hum as it drilled a hole in the shield. Okita gritted his teeth as he pushed forwards into the air with his weapon, seeming to have to maintain the position for the attack. The worm came in from the side, knocking him out of position and disrupting the attack. With a bead of sweat running down his face, Merlin dabbed at a small rivulet of blood that trickled down from his forehead. The attack had started to go through the material and had even reached his head. Now that Okita was on the ground, the worm started to show its worth. It latched onto the swordsman with its serrated teeth and started to bite down. If not for the intense heat coursing off the creature, Okita would have been bleeding out on the sand. As it was, he was covered in burns instead. 
leaning in to see the battle more clearly, Sam was starting to get excited about this. The fight was rapidly becoming one of high stakes, something that really got the blood pumping. He hoped that Okita won, of course, but the fighting style of the Earth Mage was quite enjoyable to watch. Neither of them were that strong, but they fought with a skill that showed how often they had practiced with their respective styles of fighting. Sam briefly checked the leaderboards, to see where they were on them. Both of them were in the high 50s, with Okita at 57 and Merlin at 56. Because of this, they were very well matched. Okita roared and started to pulse with a red light that seemed to be made both out of his mana and his blood. Okita stumbled a little as he rose, and Sam saw that his eyes had turned blood red as well. It was some sort of berserker skill, one that took health away from Okita for using it. Sam was intimately familiar with something like that, as he had one just like it. It seemed like the Japanese man was more in control of himself however, and he moved forwards in a calculating manner that belied his feral appearance. Despite the obvious anger and bloodlust that the transformation instilled in him, Okita was able to rein it in. Kicking off the ground with one foot, he moved at speeds of over a hundred miles per hour for about a second, bringing him much closer to his opponent. Merlin squealed and cracked his staff into the ground, creating a wall of stone that rose up in front of him. As Okita's sword point struck it, all of the red energy that surrounded him was sucked into the tip, creating a bloody drill of energy on the end of the blade. It seemed that the man specialized in armor penetration over all else, and it showed now as the drill blasted through the wall and into Merlin's flesh. The mage toppled over, but everyone except for Okita could see that he was not out of the fight yet. A moment before impact, he had created a crude stone golem that vaguely looked like him, something that you wouldn't think was human, even in the dark. However, Okita could only hear what was happening on the other side of the wall and not see it, meaning that he believed the battle to be over. A moment later, the wall toppled over and towards Okita. He lazily slashed up with his sword, bisecting the rapidly crumbling earthen bulwark, gasping as he saw that Merlin was alive. Opening his mouth to speak, his voice came out of the speaker in front of Sam. They seemed to have fixed the sound issues in the time spent, uh, redecorating the universe. But how? You died. I heard your body hit the ground. Merlin laughed and pointed to the decaying golem on the ground. Speaking in an obviously contrived deep voice, he answered. Appearances can be deceiving, my young hobbit. You assumed that I was dead, when in reality there was no way to be sure. Sam laughed. The man had definitely mixed up his wizards there. He had likely been some sort of role player before the system came, and had decided to fully embrace his hobby now that he had a chance to be a real wizard. Sam watched as the man thrust his staff forwards, summoning a spear of earth that sped forwards with the sound of an avalanche that had somehow been tacked onto it. Not quite understanding how the man had achieved such an effect, Sam looked closer, realizing that it was just a petty trick. He could feel the vibrations of earth and rock moving far below, which was creating the noise. Merlin really was going for the special effects. The rocky spear reached Okita in an instant, starting to fracture into multiple smaller shards as it traveled. By the time that it was about to strike Okita, it had turned into hundreds of little pieces of rock. Rather than trying to dodge, Okita stood his ground and Sam watched as a faint mist started to drift into his blade. Sam strained his eyes and more paranormal senses that he had gained, trying to see what was going on. The scene sharpened into focus, and he saw a pure white energy fill the blade. A system notification chimed, but he ignored it, too intent on watching the fight. Okita took a deep breath and then bellowed the name of his technique. Samurai's defense. Sam could faintly hear that the original language was not English, and the actual words were Bushi no Mori. If he had not been paying attention, that would have escaped him. Yet another oddity of the translation feature, it seemed. The man's hand started to blur with speed, and what looked to be a heat haze started to build around him. With a series of swift, efficient movements, his sword flashed out into a devastating sequence of attacks that cut through the stone shards like a hot knife through butter. The attack was so powerful that it actually blew a couple of the shards back at Merlin, causing the man to duck for cover. Okita stood there, panting for a moment, before rushing forwards. His body was starting to give up on him, and he was severely flagging, but the look of steely determination in his eyes signaled that he would not give up until either he was incapacitated, or dead. With another shout, he thrust his sword forwards multiple times in a single second, quite a feat with such a long blade. The small drills of energy started to form and then coalesced into a much larger drill that locked onto Merlin, seeing that the drill followed his every move, the mage paled and started to weave a complex spell in his hands. Firstly, a blue mana shield formed. Then a wall of stone rose up, and wrapped around the man with a soft whisper of stone on hardened mana. Finally, he shot up into the air on a pillar of rock. The drill followed him unerringly the entire time, and by the time it had reached him, 
the man had had enough. I yield. Merlin screamed, causing Okita to abort his attack. The mage was clearly not a fan of pain, and would rather give up than suffer any more than he had already dealt with. Okita bowed low and withdrew, giving Sam a tense smile. Then he fell over backwards with a thud, throwing up a cloud of dust from where he fell. Chapter 71 Okita was transported away, and Merlin walked off, shamefaced at his loss. A moment later, the next fight was announced by the screen. Sam heard his name and blanked out on the rest of the speech, instead getting up and walking towards the front. As he did so, he saw to his relief that it was one of the lower-ranked people, a woman by the name of Emily Ken. She seemed to be some sort of barbarian class, going by old video game terminology, and she sported a pair of small axes that were harnessed to her back. She gave Sam a toothy grin, and he was surprised to see no sign of animosity from someone who was from the other side. No hard feelings, eh? Just a friendly fight. The woman had a very strong Australian accent, which belied her warrior's appearance. She was clad in dark metal armor with a patch of fur running around her shoulders and neck. Sam nodded at her, glad that this was not going to be some frantic grudge match. He was about to check the leaderboards, but then stopped. The woman had already started ahead towards the arena and he did not want to exit behind her. As he hurried up to catch her, she looked back and smiled. Trying to compensate for something, mate? Sam scoffed, but could not respond quickly enough for it to not be awkward. She grinned at him and entered the ring. Sam took up his customary position, mace at the ready. His opponent had a more nonchalant air to her, and she lazily flicked her axes off her shoulder, hefting the weapons with a smile. As the battle started, she leaped forwards, crossing her weapons before her. A faint smell of ozone hit Sam's nostrils, and his hair stood on end. The woman's axes started to crackle with lightning, and she swiped them across herself as she reached Sam. He hastily blocked with his mace, starting to get into the rhythm of battle. As his next blow snaked in between her weapons and almost sent her sprawling, a look of surprise crossed her face. It quickly vanished, but Sam knew that it had been there. A moment later, Emily's face became like a mask, and he knew that meant she was getting serious. She rushed in with her weapon swinging, trying to distract Sam from the kick that she was preparing to launch at him. Before he had received his weapon style, he would have been hard-pressed to avoid it, but now it was far easier. His own leg moved back and he flipped on one hand, showcasing far greater agility than that of a natural human. It was a bit unnecessary, but Sam had an image to preserve, especially after the good-natured taunts that he had received from the woman. She was pretty good, clearly with a background with her weapons, but Sam was simply stronger, faster, and possessed the fighting style of a far more powerful cultivator who had likely studied his style for years, if not decades. Even though he was barely channeling a hint of its potential, it was enough in such a low-leveled fight. With all of this in mind, she was still doing an admirable job keeping up however. Sam could tell that she had not broken through any thresholds yet, because she winced when she tried to block his strikes. This showed that her strength was not up to par, and by the rest of her movements, neither were her other stats. Sam decided to use this as more of a fun exercise, something to distract him from his current woes. It was refreshing to just spar without any stakes. Well, there was the matter of his position, but this woman did not have a chance in hell of winning against Sam. He still didn't know who exactly his mysterious ally was, but he thanked them a thousand times over as he fought. Then he had a dark thought. What if he had, by accepting the ability, not that he really had a choice, became beholden to whoever had sent it to him? Realizing that he was distracting himself as a wayward strike nearly pulled him off balance, Sam dismissed the thought. Berigius had made him far too paranoid. He returned to the fight with his full attention, and proceeded to mop the floor with his opponent. Each strike was met with a perfect counter, each block was followed up with the most optimal strike. It was not even fair to compare them at this point, and Sam was fully getting into the zone. His strikes began to blend together, and he started to lose himself. It was a far different sensation than with his Tao of Anger however, and he still maintained a razor focus on his battle, just with a large degree of detachment. This allowed him to judge his attacks with a precision that was not marred by his emotional state at the time, and he eventually reduced the woman to being weaponless with an inspired construction of two techniques, a parry and a block. Their real names were far more grand, but for now Sam couldn't care less about the poetic meaning of them. He just wanted more battle power. This resulted in a single strike both preventing him from taking damage and disarming his opponent in a single graceful attack. Rather than seem dismayed, Emily seemed to be smiling. Feeling a little uneasy, Sam backed off, his senses tingling in alarm. With a roar of primal anger, the woman erupted into a pillar of yellow energy, and her axes crumbled into nothing, producing more of the yellow energy. This streamed into her, causing her technique to skyrocket in potency. 
Sam could almost feel multiple thresholds being passed within the woman's body as she transformed, and he was left seeing what looked like some sort of warrior queen of the jungle, an Amazonian terror of the battlefield. Vines and plant matter had covered her body, and her face was now masked with a layer of ivy, making her look inhuman. The plants formed into a pattern that looked like grotesquely bulging muscles and highly defined veins made out of green creepers. This covering of plant life had bulked her up by an insane degree, and she was now almost ten feet tall. Small streams of lightning crackled around the armor, but they were more of a cosmetic effect as they seemed to be muted with proximity to the vines. Squinting, Sam was able to understand what was going on. The vine and plant effect was a result of her affinity with earth energy, hence the yellow energy. The lightning was probably the result of a skill, which was muted when in contact with her true elemental abilities. The woman turned her blank gaze at Sam and he flinched involuntarily as he felt the eye of a wrathful and ancient entity stare at him, then the feeling retreated, aided with a blast of his aura. Even without his Tao, it was still incredibly potent, more than a match than any skill that this woman could bring to bear. All that this new form meant was that it was time for him to go all out, or at least as much as he could without his Tao. His mace started to shine with the light of mana and he supercharged it, feeling it pulse in his hand as the weapon took on the power of the mana. With a sudden rush of motion, Sam appeared in front of the plant creature. She lashed out with a trailing vine at high speeds, succeeding at catching Sam full across the face, cutting into it. The vine end was going faster than a whip, and it was made out of some sort of durable plant that could survive contact with Sam's leathery skin. Well, that was probably not the best, or most comforting, descriptor. It didn't look leathery, but it certainly felt that way to him sometimes. Shuddering, he banished the thought from his now cluttered mind. The sight of the transformation had shocked him out of his battle state and he was now back in contact with the rest of the world, fully susceptible to distraction. She stalked the ground in front of him, creating small patches of plant life wherever she tread. Sam was having none of this, especially after he saw them start to grow and undulate like tentacles on the ground. This was not that kind of book. He dodged to the side as one of the tentacles lashed out at him, and he crushed it into the ground with his mace, expending a little bit of mana as he did so. Looking towards the form of the plant-covered woman, he used his new skill to its fullest extent, testing its limits. When he had used his sight to detect what Okita was doing, he had found a new power that he did not know he had, one that allowed him to see the use of mana and elemental energy more acutely than he had been before. The skill was called Elemental Sight and its abilities had been confirmed by his notification. You have gained the skill, Elemental Sight, rare. A bit more inquisitive than most, you have decided that you wanted to find out more about the workings of the universe. In doing so, you unlocked the hidden sense that all cultivators possess, the ability to detect elemental energy. Rejoice, for most of your level do not have this ability. Sam had not exactly been sure if the message was sarcastic or not, but it was a new skill nonetheless. As he used it, he was able to see small rivulets of yellow energy course down the arms of the plant amalgamation and into the ground. They continued underneath the sand, somewhat muted in his sight, but still visible. Outwardly, the plant creature did not make any signs of having used a skill, but Sam surprised it by jumping up as what looked to be a massive Venus flytrap snapped its serrated teeth shut where his foot had been. The glistening taint of venom that he had seen on it would not have been fun to deal with in a battle. With a frown, Sam advanced. This battle had gone on for too long anyway, and he was starting to become apprehensive of slipping up. It was time to end this farce once and for all. Chapter 72 He weaved between grasping tentacles, his agility and weapon prowess on full display as he used his mace like a third arm, vaulting over it and swinging it to gain momentum. A key part of his weapon style was high mobility, as Sway tied a practitioner of an art that revolved around the movements of water. He could flow like the most placid of rivers, but also strike like the most unexpected of waves. Combined, this was a deadly combination. The plant-encrusted women started to back away as he approached and opened her hands wide, releasing a cloud of green pollen. It didn't take a genius to figure out that it was toxic, so Sam used his aura, wondering if it would work like this. If not, he could always hold his breath. With a higher constitution, doing so for entire minutes at a time was not out of reach. As it turned out, his aura did affect the light and drifting pollen, preventing it from reaching him. With one last skip, he was there, with his mace overhead. He smiled and whispered one last thing to the woman before he swung down. Who's compensating now? With an explosion of blue light, her reply, if indeed there was one, was cut off and the plants were forcibly blasted off of her body. The unconscious form of Emily fell to the ground, where she lay until the match and announcement rang out. Sam walked back into the room and handed up for the audience, both for his adoring fans and for his enemies. 
Strangely enough, the system seemed to be placing people of the same faction against opposing faction members, rather than against each other. It wasn't every time, but it was more than half of the time. Ignoring the customary snarls from the two stooges over on the other side of the room, Sam sat down, wincing as his overused muscles twinged. All of that gymnastics had been rough on his body, even if he had not taken a single serious blow the entire battle. Enjoying the congratulations of his allies, he watched the next fight begin. Sam smiled. This one would be interesting. Eduardo and Rodney Kane walked up to the front of the room and up the ramp to the arena, glaring daggers at each other the entire time. Beneath the bravado, Sam could tell that Eduardo knew that he was going to lose, but he would give the arrogant scarred man a few more scars to remember. Sam only hoped that Eduardo would yield before he died. They readied themselves to fight, and with a smug grin on his face, Rodney raised his hand and slammed it down into his palm. With the reverberation of a thousand belfries, something started to rise out of the ground behind him. It looked like a demonic creature made out of earth and dark light, with streams of fluid running off between its joints. Rodney hopped backwards and landed in the middle of the creature, sinking into it like it was some sort of mech. The gloves were really coming off during this match. It seemed that almost everyone had held back during the monster hunt, and now that the stakes were high, their true power was being revealed. Sam really needed to get to fixing his Tao and he used the words of both profound visionary and of the voice in the dream to try and get a heading to follow. Still, it was extremely hard work, and all of the stuff that he had achieved so far was purely conceptual. Sending his attention back to the fight, Sam watched as it began in earnest. The creature of darkness leaped into the air and towards Eduardo, landing with a thud and creating a pool of noxious vapors where it landed. Sam could see Eduardo covering his mouth and nose as some of the vapor reached him. Rather than attack his lungs however, the black gas acted like an acid, rapidly eating away at his flesh. With a cry of alarm, the man jumped backwards and landed out of the range of the cloud. A menacing laugh emanated from the cloud, and Rodney exited it, now clutching a massive sword in a two-handed grip. With a whoosh of metal through air, the sword came down, far faster than something of its size had any right to do. A thunderous tearing noise echoed through the arena as a ten-foot-wide strip of sand just vanished beneath the onslaught. It sped towards Eduardo, who narrowly missed it. With a frown, the man began to counterattack, sending multiple light attacks towards his enemy. They seemed weaker than before, but with Sam's new elemental sight, he was able to see that there was a new force in with the unattributed mana, a green energy that was subtly woven within the attack. He could see that the energy came from a small pendant that the man wore around his neck, and he realized that had been Eduardo's reward for defeating the tree monster during the monster hunt. As the attacks landed, large roots burst out of the ground and wrapped around Rodney and his living suit of armor. He pulled on them with his hands, but they held firm. The roots started to contract, but they would not get any headway on the highly durable and strong construct that they held in their grasp, and what sounded like a lazy sigh came out of the helm of the creature. With a dull roar of metal creaking off of metal, Rodney pushed his construct to its limits, tearing free from the roots. A few scratches marred its surface, but that was all. Eduardo paled a little and then resumed his attack, this time not landing a single one as the large metal creature somehow avoided them all with a speed that belied its size. As it closed in and struck Eduardo with a right jab, Sam saw why it was so fast. The punch was far weaker than it should have been coming from a creature of that size, which meant that it was light enough to move elegantly, but not heavy enough to be especially tough. That must have been what the sword was for, although the armor was now too close to use it properly. Eduardo dodged the next blow by the narrowest of margins, with a piece of his hair drifting to the ground after the razor edge of the greatsword gave him a close shave. What Sam wondered was what had happened to the sword that the man had used during the fight with the tree. That had been a completely different style and make than this one, and it had been bright as well, a marked contrast with the Stygian greatsword. What had happened to the light-based attacks that he had used before? Was that just a front to distract against this true moveset, or was it in fact an integral part of it? In any case, Eduardo was flagging. He was taking hits left and right, and only his skill with his rapier allowed him to use it to turn away the great sword. Rather than trying to block it, which would have been an exercise in futility and broken bones, he turned it away from him, redirecting the force rather than opposing it. For all of his brute strength and speed, Rodney Kane seemed to lack any sort of deeper mastery of his weapon, instead relying on his stats to fight. If not for the fact that there was a vast gulf of power between the two men, it would have been a much different fight. As it was, it was more of a one-sided beatdown than anything else, and Rodney hadn't even taken a single wound yet. Eventually acknowledging that he was going to lose, Eduardo did something that Sam had never seen before. Raising his hands as if praying for benediction, he dropped his blade. Taking a direct hit from the greatsword, 
his body folded over it, spurting blood. Instead of falling over onto the ground after he had been torn off of the blade, he stood up tall, a white light shining from his eyes. Then he spoke, with a resounding, booming voice. Ave Maria! Two lightning-fast punches, each covered in white light, slammed into Rodney, breaking through his armor and actually touching his flesh for the first time in the battle. The man stumbled and rocked back as another series of blows hit him. The light that blazed within Eduardo's eyes started to dim, and his blows gradually grew weaker. Eventually, the onslaught diminished to the point that Rodney was able to get back up. His armor was in tatters, and his flesh was broken, but still he stood. In reality, the damage looked far worse than it actually was and the man was just pretending to be more hurt than he really was, wanting to lull people into a false sense of security. He had passed his resilience threshold a week ago, and now possessed an automatic healing effect that was working, even now, to repair his flesh. Before he could do anything, Eduardo said in a broken voice, I yield. Then he fell over onto the ground. Rodney roared in rage, and it looked as if was going to strike the other man when he was down, but he then thought better of it and stormed off through the door. Chapter 73 As he entered the room where the rest of the fighters were waiting, the armor had come off and his face was dark with rage. He sat down by Andrew Monroe, and they started to mutter to each other, sending meaningful glances over at Sam's side of the room. Sam was just glad that Eduardo had been able to put up that much of a fight. That Avenue Maria thing must have been a final skill of sorts, something that triggered when he was on the brink of death. Sam did not possess anything close to what would be considered a final skill, and he desperately needed it. He was good at fighting, but not especially good at finishing fights, especially against people of his level of power. Without his daos, he would need to look to the boon of elemental energy. He still needed to connect with Earth properly, however, and he had a vague idea of how to do it. Seeing as most people still in the tournament already had an elemental connection, they must not take that long to form. Sam walked out of the room, as he had already fought that day, and made his way back to his quarters. It was time to put his plan into action. Now that Barigis had gone, there was nothing stopping anyone from leaving the arena and going out into the town. When he had been there last, Sam remembered that there had been a grassy strip of land that seemed perfect for what he was looking to do. Exiting the now unlocked front door of the arena, he entered the deserted town. Now that everyone was watching the tournament, this was the perfect time to roam the streets of the city. He was not here to idly wander however, and he made his way to the park quickly. With a furtive glance around him, Sam began to dig. After he had reached a depth of about ten feet, he started to collapse the walls around him. Dirt and rock rained down into the hole. If this didn't work, he would feel incredibly stupid. As the hole filled in, his breathing became more labored, and he started to close his mouth and nose, not wanting to ingest any more earth than necessary. He stood there, entombed in soil, gradually beginning to feel a resonance with it. If not for his prior connection to earth, this would all have been a colossal waste of time. As it was, the small nugget of power that orbited his core began to grow as the pure energies of earth filled it. It was going too slowly however, and he gradually started to run out of air. Sensing that he would fail to connect with his element if he left now, he forced himself to remain there and suffer for greater power. The blackness of oxygen deprivation started to close in on him, and his health bar began to tick down. Seeing as he had quite a large one, it was going quite slowly, but he only had about two more minutes left to live, not least that the entire thing was incredibly uncomfortable. With a final surge of energy, his meridian finished opening and he tore his way out of the earth, gasping for air. He flopped down onto the grass like a beached whale and looked inside himself, seeing that his meridian was now far larger. You have fully opened your elemental meridian of earth. After submerging yourself in your element, you have fully awakened your connection to the element of earth. Now you can use it in battle and to empower yourself with its elemental energy. Further your connection through meditation and more extreme physical connections to your element. Current Mastery 1% Sam was, of course, at the very beginning of opening his meridian. Seeing that there was only 1% mastery logged in his system, that meant that he had another 99% to go. Also, judging by how progression worked, it would not be linear, but rather a long and exponentially growing slog to grow it. Getting up after he had recovered from his ordeal, Sam ran back to the arena, wanting to return before anyone came out to challenge him. As he ran, he heard something strange coming out of an alleyway. A short and aborted scream rang out from behind a shop, and he faintly heard the noise of flesh striking flesh. Running to see what was going on, he saw a woman being assaulted by a group of five other people. She was clutching something in her hands, what looked to be a large crystal of roiling energy. Give us that, you worthless piece of shit. One of the assailants, a man, screamed at her. The woman, despite being covered in cuts and bruises, would not let go. 
Upon closer analysis, Sam saw that she was quite a bit younger than he had expected. She lashed out with her foot and struck one of the others in their kneecap, causing the woman to hop backwards in pain. Her face twisted in rage, she struck the girl with the crystal in the face. You're going to pay for that, you little dash. Something the matter here? Sam said dryly. He wanted to see when these people would say to justify their actions. They turned to him and snarled. EFF off, you bastard. What the hell do you think you are? Some sort of white knight, here to save the princess? You get three seconds to go, or I'm going to kill you. The man who said this looked like the leader of the group and he held a short sword that had the look of something mass-produced. Sam snorted. This group was a joke. Anyone who preyed on defenseless people like this girl deserved to be sent straight to the lowest circles of hell. Sam couldn't assure that, but he could damn well make it feel like they were there. As he stood his ground, with a cocky smile on his face, the man rushed him, sword raised high. Sam raised his hand and caught the blade, snapping it with a quick clench of his hand. The man blinked, before his right arm snapped. Screaming, he looked down at the mass of twisted flesh where Sam had punched. Sam looked down at his hand, surprised at how effective that had been. Reining in the power a little, he tossed the man into a wall, where he remained, pancaked there like a bug. The others paled in fear as they saw how easily Sam had dealt with their leader. One of them seemed to recognize him and all of the blood drained from their face. Oh, shit. Sam smiled even wider. So you recognize me, then? The man nodded apprehensively. You're the arbiter. Upon hearing that, the other members of the gang fled. Sam picked up a few stones from the ground and sent them through the air at the retreating hoodlums, knocking them onto the ground. They did not get up. He made his way over to the girl and chuckled as she pulled out a dagger on him as he approached. Don't get any closer. I'm warning you. The effect was more cute than anything else, as she was barely five feet tall and looked to be about thirteen years old. Sam wondered how exactly she had gotten into this situation and he analyzed the crystal that she was holding to see what exactly it was that the criminals were looking for. Large Jirank Essence Crystal. Jirank Magical Item. A condensed crystal made out of the essence of Jirank monsters. This crystal can either be made out of the byproduct of a hundred Jirank monsters, or can occasionally be found in sites where there is a lot of ambient essence, such as near a fight between high-level opponents. If you are level 1 to 25, it will give you three levels. If you are level 25 to 40, it will give you two levels. If you are level 40 to 45, it will give you one level, and if you are level 45 to 50, it will give you a half of a level, banking experience if you are too close to the bottleneck of G-rank. Sam now saw why those people had been so frantic in their acquisition of this crystal. It was quite useful, even to him, and he felt a small twinge of greed at the crystal. Quashing that, he started to walk away. It belonged to this girl, and she had every right to use it. Before he got more than a few steps away, the girl called out to him. Hey, why did you save me? Sam turned around in surprise. It was the right thing to do. Why would I have not done so? You could have easily taken this crystal off of me. You were far stronger than those thugs, the girl said. Then I would have been no better than them. What else would a good person do? Unexpectedly, the girl smiled and then started to dissipate into the air. You passed the test. Congratulations. Sam watched as the bodies of the things on the ground disappeared, and he was left in the middle of the alleyway with the essence crystal. He felt something like a tendril of pure heat enter his body, and he suppressed a scream as it lanced into his dao. Then he stopped. It had actually repaired the Tao of the Arbiter by a small amount. Had that been some sort of tribulation, sent down to him by his Tao? It certainly seemed that way, as no trace of the event remained save for the orb. He picked it up and put it away in his clothes, deciding to wait until he was in safety to level up. Chapter 74 He made his way back to the arena and slunk inside the door, making sure that there was nobody there to see him. As he walked down the corridor and back to his room, he spotted somebody walking up it, shortly followed by a whole group of people. It was the enemy faction, and Sam had no intention of tangling with them. He ducked into a side corridor and regulated his breathing as they passed by. If not for the presence of Reaper, Anonymous, and the two leaders of the group, he would not have been troubled. It seemed that Reaper and Anonymous had finally decided to pick a side, and now, rather than simply sitting with the group, they were a part of it. After they passed, Sam let out a deep breath and continued to his room. Opening the door and ducking inside, he froze as he spotted a man sitting on one of his sofas. As the man turned towards him, Sam let out a gasp. It was the overlord. Drawing his weapon in one smooth motion, Sam prepared to fight, no matter how futile it was. To his surprise, the other man waved his hand dismissively. I am not here to fight. Merely to ask a question. Why do you not use your Tao in your fights? Sam paused and then put his mace back. How the hell did you get into my room? 
I'm the only one with a key. The overlord did not answer, instead staring at Sam. Sighing, he answered the original question. That is of no concern to you. Now, if you will excuse me, I have things to do. Can you please leave? Without taking his eyes away from Sam, the overlord walked out of the room and into the hallway, clearly suspicious of him. Sam sat down, worried about what had just happened. How exactly had the man gotten into his locked room without his permission, or his key? Was it to do with his power, had he simply broken through the defenses with his Tao? Sam dismissed that. That was not a very likely thing to happen, as the system would likely have planned for something like that to happen. It simply seemed as if this would be a mystery, at least until Sam found out more about the Overlord. For now, it was time to explore his new meridian and to level up. Debating which to do first, he decided to upgrade his stats before his meridian. If he had to fight again soon, this would be the better option. Picking up the large orb of essence, he crushed it between his hands, allowing the essence stored within to rush into his body. It felt like he was inhaling liquid glass, and he choked on the substance as it entered him. Coughing, he read his new status sheet. Now he knew why the crystal had been so cheap for its power in the merchant's booth. Who the hell would want to go through that just to level up? Looking at his stat sheet, he decided that he would for the amount of potential power that he had just gained. Before he could check the stats, a system notification popped up. Warning, essence corruption has reached 10%. This is the maximum threshold for natural depletion of corruption within your body. Any more consumption of unearned essence will result in permanent difficulties leveling up. And there was the other reason. Sam had known that the description of the essence crystal was too good to be true. He was glad that he had not succumbed to the siren's call of easy power, and had bought a lot of the crystals without knowing the side effects. This was a valuable lesson, and one with no real cost as of now. As long as he remembered what would happen, he would be fine. Finally opening his stat sheet, he inspected the new changes. Sam Atlas. Human. Mortal Tear. G Rank. Class, Dao Visionary. Level 32. 6 free stat points. Strength. 50. 1.325x. Constitution. 34. 1.325x. Resilience. 28. 1.325x. Dexterity. 26. 1.325x. Intelligence. 36. 1.325x. Wisdom. 47. 1.325x. Health 340-340. Mana 360-360. Stamina 750-750. Dao. Dao mode of the Arbiter. Dao mode of Anger. Skills. 1x Common, 2x Rare, 1x Epic, 2x Legendary. Titles. 1x Celestial. Temporary Titles. 1x Epic, 1x Legendary, 1x Mythical. Dao Heritage. Dao Incarnation of Existence. Party. Torturna Salvinii Brescan, level 26. Health 350-350. Rax, level 25. Health 370-370. Skill Branches. Muscle Density Enhancement, level 1. Basic Weapon Knowledge, Blunt, level 1. Weapon Style. Flowing Water Style. Weapon Mastery, Implement Stage 5. Elemental Affinities. Earth, 1% Mastery. Sam was happy to see that his party members were doing well for themselves. Both of them had gained their classes, and as far as he would tell, were gaining something out of them. Both of their health counters had increased substantially, showing that they had increased their constitution substantially. More importantly, he had a choice to make. Knowing what happened upon reaching level 50 in a stat, did he want to cross another threshold now, or wait until later? His stat gains from his class had enabled him to increase wisdom by a large amount without having to place a single point in it. Either way, by the next level he would have it but he had no idea when that would happen. Eventually, he decided to do it. Placing three stat points into wisdom, he waited for the pain to hit him. This time, it was like there was a cauldron full of boiling acid being poured directly into his brain. His eyes were forcibly opened to the world, and to all of his interactions within it. All of his transgressions, all of his sins were laid bare for him to see. The physical pain stopped, but the mental anguish was far worse. It made him feel like a failure, a complete non-entity to see all the times that he had neglected to pick the right option that could have done so much more for him. He saw that he had wasted his life before the system had come by moping around and not applying himself to living properly. This more than anything else was what really seared his brain to the core. After what felt like hours of this, the feeling subsided and he was deposited back within the naive safety of his own mind. You have passed the first threshold of wisdom. Wisdom is what allows for the formulations of efficient plans, knowing what is to come, and even for more esoteric ponderings, such as upon the Tao. 
wisdom might seem useless, but it is far from that. Only the wise truly understand that simple truth however. If wisdom is required to attain wisdom, then is wisdom predetermined? The notification took a more philosophical bent by the end, and it still did not explain exactly how this new threshold was going to do for him. Sam felt more powerful, but in an incredibly vague way. Then, looking inwards, he saw. His daos had been repaired even further, and suddenly he understood what his problem was. His Tao heritage meant that he was supposed to comprehend the Tao of existence, which he assumed was the greatest Tao that there was. However, he still had to start somewhere, and that was at the very beginning. Rather than picking a single path and following that to the end, he would have to connect with every Tao in existence. The two Daos that he possessed now were in conflict, and the only way to fix them was to create something greater out of the ashes of the old. How he was to do this, Sam did not know, but he knew, as surely as he knew of his own existence, that he would figure it out. It was time to ask someone who was more versed in the ways of the Tao than himself about the whole thing. Chapter 75 Leaving his room, Sam searched for profound visionary. Hearing a strange humming noise coming from one of the rooms, he moved towards it, recognizing the sound of the man's voice. He knocked on the door and the humming stopped. A moment later, it opened, revealing the face of the mystic himself. Looking at Sam for a second, he opened the door wider and let him in. Sitting down on what looked to be a piece of rug that had been cut off of the main section, he waited for Sam to speak. Before he did so, he took in the room and its furnishings, or rather lack thereof. There was nothing in the room, save for the ceiling light and the piece of rug that the man now sat on. As Sam turned to him with an obvious question on his lips, profound visionary answered before Sam could say anything. The lack of distractions helps me focus on my meditation. If I am to reach the next level of the Tao anytime soon, then I will need to meditate efficiently. Not, as to why you are here. You seek counseling about your own Tao, correct? In addition, you recently went through a Tao tribulation. Sam stared at the man. How did you know all of that? Sam asked, astounded. The other man smiled and tapped the side of his head. I would like to say my wisdom, but in reality my Tao gives me some abilities that some might consider, unnatural. Sam gave him a look. Did you just make a movie reference? Sam asked, shocked that the man who had lived in a monastery for so many years would know about that. I'm not that old, Sam. Living on rice for many years had prematurely wizened me. Besides, some of the other monks would come back to the monastery with DVDs sometimes. We had a small TV for the purpose of instructional videos, but it was quickly repurposed to play movies on. They were always badly dubbed, as we could not succumb too much to the pleasures of the flesh, but that line got through well. Sam laughed and waited for the other man to answer his original question. Seeing that he was impatient, profound visionary smiled and waggled his finger. You must be willing to wait for great power to come to you. Not everything is training. But I suppose that I must answer you now. What you went through was a test from your Tao to see if you were worthy of its strictures. If you pass it, then your connection deepens a little, but if you fail you start to lose that connection. Passing it also rewards you with an item, usually something that is part of the vision. Sam nodded. That was exactly what had happened to him. The other man continued and picked up something from the ground next to him. It was a small ring that pulsed with gentle blue light. Passing it over to Sam, he let him analyze it. Ring of the Sage. Jirank item. A ring that passively increases the wearer's wisdom through regular bouts of introspection and tests. Every twelve hours that it is worn, one gains a point into wisdom, as long as the tests are passed. Limit of two points per level. Sam dropped the ring as if he was holding something dirty. That's, that's a goddamn cheat. Sam shouted, clapping his hand over his mouth as he remembered his company. You can get two extra points per level just from this? The other man smiled and shrugged. I guess it is. By the way, I know that you're getting tired of referring to me by my title in your head. You can call me Lao. Before you start sputtering, that was another effect of my Tao. I am not a mind reader, just good at sensing emotions. Anyway, that was not the main reason that you came here though. You thought about my words, did you not? Sam nodded. Yes, I need to fix my Daos before I have to fight against someone powerful, and I recently passed my wisdom threshold which allowed me to see what I was doing wrong. Lao cocked his head. Don't you have that in your strength stat as well? How did you get two thresholds in such a short time without completely unbalanced stats? Sam's look must have told Lao everything, as he did not press the subject. Never mind. Come sit by me, and we can get started. Sam followed the man's directions and sat beside him in a cross-legged position, beginning to let himself relax. Lao took in a deep breath, and Sam followed him. Rather than say anything, the other man started to breathe in and out regularly and Sam copied him. After about 15 minutes, his mind was completely calm. 
Lao opened his eyes next to Sam and looked at him. Now we can begin. Firstly, have you reached the visualization stage of your Tao development yet? What, you mean that I can see them within my body? Yes, I have. Lao smiled. Good. I want you to go look at them right now. Sam tried to do so, but he then realized that he was still disconnected from them. Ah, uh, I might not be able to reach them right now. There were some complications that I have to deal with now. The other man shook his head. No matter how fractured, your Tao is, and always will be a part of you. You can find it no matter where it is. Just try. You might surprise yourself. Wondering how the older man knew all of this, Sam started to test it out. He drifted into his core space and started to search for his Daos. There was nothing available there, but he instead started to look for the feeling that the Daos gave him and eventually he found a thin thread of their conceptual energies. Diving into his soul and using the thread as a guiding line, he was able to delve further than he had ever done so before. His mind started to get a bit fuzzy, but still he pressed on, his single-minded determination forcing him past his own limits in search of answers. Finally, two lights appeared out of the darkness, one of white energy and the other of red and orange. The white orb was cracked down the middle and streams of energy were tugged out of it by the gravity of the other orb, which was trying to force it to adapt. Sam reached the surface of his Tao of the Arbiter and laid his hands on it. Back in the real world, his body twitched as his soul started to convulse. Lao laid his hands on Sam and started to send some of his energy into him. Within the soul space, Sam saw a wave of calming blue energy sweep across his soul, enveloping him and easing his pain somewhat. Laying hands on a fractured Tao was like looking upon something that was not meant to be, a rent in reality, a tear in existence. As he did so however, he gradually started to see what was going wrong. His other Tao had forced him towards violent behaviors that did not fit well with his Tao of the Arbiter, and this created a toxic dichotomy that could not last without one caving. Sam could see that even with all of the safeguards in place from the placement of his Daos within this area, they were still disintegrating, albeit slowly. In fact, his arrival here had caused the process to speed up and he recognized that he would not be able to fix them again if he did not do so now. Sam retreated from the surface of the orb and started to grasp at the streams of energy with his mind. He didn't know how he was doing this, but it felt right. Chapter 76 Tearing them away from the Tao of Anger was like tearing a piece of his soul out by the roots, but the steely focus of his mind stopped him from being distracted. He directed the energy back within his Tao and the crack started to recede. Then a sudden and sharp feeling of wrongness overtook him as he saw veins of red start to spread across the white surface of his beleaguered Tao. He had unwittingly furthered his own destruction by corrupting his Tao with the energy of his other one. The corruption spread quickly, and the wrongness was almost too distracting to work past. Sam roared and forced himself to concentrate. The only hope now was to stabilize the process and to make sure that the merging of the two energies did not end in catastrophic failure. The only way to do this was through drastic measures. Sam grabbed the entire orb that made up his Tao of Anger and forced it to move towards his other Tao. They started to repel each other with a force-like magnetism, but within his own soul, Sam was king. He crushed the two orbs together, creating an explosion of polychromatic light that widened out his vision and caused him to fall unconscious. He had no time for such a thing however, and he forced himself awake. In front of him was a scene that looked like the death of a planet. Strings of chaotic energy danced around a field of shattered matter, which glowed with an ominous light. Sam could feel his soul tearing and featuring at the seams, and he slammed his will down on the two Daos before they could undo him. The pain was so intense that Sam's conscious thought was overwritten, leaving only the force of his raw will to continue. This was clearly not the correct way to fuse Daos, but he had no choice. With a final cataclysmic crash, the matter and energy fused into a new orb, one made out of a mixture of his two Daos. It looked like a celestial orb of pure light, that was suffused with veins of a darker substance that looked vaguely like gemstones. It had not finished fusing however, and there was still a small band of unmerged Tao energy. As this happened, Sam was torn away from this sight, and into a Tao vision. Three men stood in front of a wizened old woman, who was standing above them on a dais. Millions of people watched from large stands in the background, and as Sam's view panned out, he saw that there were billions there, the full population of a planet. The woman raised a gavel and slammed it down, silencing the whispering that was coming from the myriad of people that were there. There will be order in this court. She said, her voice somehow transforming from the soft and shrill voice of an old woman into the strident tones of a proud queen, full of vigor and vitality. Good. The three men who stand here today have been accused of the murder of the righteous king of this planet, whose family is here today with us. The vision panned out to a small podium upon which an incomplete family stood, a middle-aged woman, two younger girls and a young man. All four of them were blurry-eyed with tears, 
but Sam could tell that something was amiss. The vision drew attention to the fact that the queen held a small vial of a colorless liquid, which had the appearance of tears. Why this was, Sam did not know, but he waited for the vision to explain it. The judge continued as everyone looked at the woman and her children. How do the guilty plead? One of the men, a broad-shouldered, strong-jawed specimen, in short an ideal image of what a man should be, stepped forwards. He jetted his chin out and turned to address the entire crowd rather than just the judge. My brothers and I plead not guilty. These foul beasts that you see here, these wretches who seek to frame us with their crocodile tears, are the kin of the most heinous of men, namely the late king. He was the man who killed our sister, the man who ravaged our village in his lust and greed. He desecrated the women of our small community before killing them, all while their male relatives watched. The proof of this lies in our immaculate Daos, which would have shattered if we had killed him without just cause. You see, my brothers and I are all followers of the Tao of justice, and our personal path is that of retribution. I invite all here with the necessary skills to analyze the state of our Daos. The judge leaned forwards and inspected the men before leaning back and nodding. There can be no doubt about it, these men speak the truth, their actions were rage-filled and brutal, but they acted in concord with justice. For this, I find them not guilty. And as to the people who aided the late king in his endeavor, the vision faded away, but the message was clear. Anger did have a place, as long as it was tempered with a desire for justice. All three men had been followers of the path of anger as well as of justice, but they were clearly in control of their emotions, despite the stress that they were under. This would be Sam's path now as well. The orbs slid together with a crash that sounded like the sundering of a world, and they finally fused perfectly. Sam felt a surge of power course through his body upon witnessing his success, and he was thrust back into the real world. His skin glowed with light that quickly faded away as he looked at it. More importantly, there was a new notification. You have gained a new Tao. Tao fragment of righteous anger, incomplete. Salvaging your soul and body from the mistakes of muddling your path should have been impossible, but you did so anyway. As a result, your new Tao is not fully formed, and for it to be considered a true fragment stage Tao, it must be integrated with your spirit more effectively. Righteous anger is the purest and most virtuous form of wrath that there is. Rather than selfishly indulging in your own anger as a palliative for your inner suffering, you instead use it as a shield and sword with which to protect the innocent. As a fragment level Tao, however incomplete it is, you gain a bonus to your stats from the integration of your concept with your soul and body. As you progress in your comprehension, these bonuses will increase. Plus 3 to all physical stats. Plus 2 to all mental stats. Sam laughed out loud as he saw that he had succeeded, but the notifications were not done yet. You are the first being in your universe to form a Tao fragment. Your title has been altered to reflect this. The title, Tao Paragon of the 10,239,428,157th Universe, Celestial, has been changed to, Greater Tao Paragon of the 10,239,428,157th Universe, Celestial. You have further demonstrated your boundless talent with the Tao by continuing to shoot past all expectations. Plus 30% to all stats, rounding to the nearest whole number. Sam was glad that his altering of his stats had the desired effect on the rendering of his titles into words. It was more of an OCD thing than anything else, but the unclear delineation of where his title began and ended was annoying him. Now that it followed the same rules as his skill notices, he was satisfied. The best thing was still to come, which was to check his stats. Sam heard someone clear their throat beside him, and he remembered what he had been doing before he had created his new Tao. Did it work? Lao asked, trying, and failing to hide his curiosity. Sam nodded and the other man smiled. Good, good. I sense that you have passed a qualitative threshold in your Tao. You seem much stronger, and the turmoil in your soul has vanished. Why don't you check your stats now to see what changed? Sam nodded, not bothering to tell the man that was what he was about to do. Sam Atlas. Human. Mortal tier. G rank. Class, Tao Visionary. Level 32. Three free stat points. Strength. 56. 1.375x. Constitution. 39. 1.375x. Resilience. 33. 1.375x. Dexterity. 31. 1.375x. Intelligence. 40. 1.375x. Wisdom. 55. 1.375x. Health 390 slash 390. Mana 400 slash 400. Stamina 840-840. Dao. Dao Fragment of Righteous Anger. Skills. 1x Common, 2x Rare, 1x Epic, 2x Legendary. 
Titles 1x Celestial Temporary Titles 1x Epic 1x Legendary 1x Mythical Tao Heritage Tao Incarnation of Existence Party Torturna Salvinii Brescan, Level 26 Health 350-350 Rax, Level 25 Health 370-370 Skill Branches Muscle Density Enhancement, Level 1 Basic Weapon Knowledge, Blunt, Level 1 Weapon Style Flowing Water Style Weapon Mastery, Implement Stage 5 Elemental Affinities Earth, 1% Mastery Chapter 77 Sam saw that he had not added in the points from his previous level, and he did so, putting them all into strength. The bonus that he got from his threshold was extremely powerful, and he wanted to continue gaining as much as he could out of it. Wanting to see if his new title bonus increased his stat any more than it would have before, he opened his stats again. Sam Atlas. Human. Mortal Tear. G Rank. Class, Dao Visionary. Level 32. Strength. 60. 1.375x. Constitution. 39. 1.375x. Resilience. 33. 1.375x. Dexterity. 31. 1.375x. Intelligence. 40. 1.375x. Wisdom. 55. 1.375x. Health 390-390. Mana 400-400. Stamina 900 out of 900. Dao. Dao Fragment of Righteous Anger. Skills. 1x Common, 2x Rare, 1x Epic, 2x Legendary. Titles. 1x Celestial. Temporary Titles. 1x Epic, 1x Legendary, 1x Mythical. Tao Heritage. Tao Incarnation of Existence. Party. Torturna Salvinii Brescan, Level 26. Health 350-350. Rax, Level 25. Health 370-370. Skill Branches. Muscle Density Enhancement, Level 1. Basic Weapon Knowledge, Blunt, Level 1. Weapon Style. Flowing Water Style. Weapon Mastery, Implement Stage 5. Elemental Affinities. Earth, 1% Mastery. It seemed that while he had gained somewhat of a boost, it was not enough to push him over the edge to gaining more stat points per one that he put in. Sighing, he closed his stats, knowing that he was already getting a far better deal than anyone else at this moment was. Seeing as he was checking the system functions, he figured that he might as well see who was on the leaderboards. He had been told that they had changed, and he wanted to see by how much. Opening the total power leaderboard, he grinned as he saw the new changes. Overall power. 1. The Overlord. 2. Rodney Kane. 3. The Arbiter. 4. The Scourge of New York. 5. Profound Visionary. 6. Melissa Tang. 7. The Angel of Death. 8. Reaper. 9. Anonymous. 10. The Bear of the Motherland. Sam was now the third most powerful person in the world, and as he saw this, he was greeted with yet another title upgrade. The title, Top 5 Power, Planet Earth, Legendary, has been changed to, Top 3 Power, Planet Earth, Legendary. Plus 3% to all stats. It was barely a change at all, only bringing his stat multiplier up to 1.38, but at least he had removed the floating fourth number. The sound of glass shattering dissuaded anyone going near Andrew Monroe's room from going any closer. The man was in the grips of a fiery rage, after he had seen what had happened with the overall power leaderboard. He had lost his place, and with it some of his power from his title. It was only a measly amount, true, but it was the principle of the matter that counted. He would be a laughingstock among his peers and his closest friend would probably make fun of him. Their relationship was more one of mutual alliance rather than anything else, as a criminal and a former politician could only pretend to be like normal people for so long before their real faces were revealed. Nothing would actually happen to him because of this, but it was still humiliating. He would have his revenge on Sam Atlas, that was for certain. Back in Lau's room, Sam was explaining all of the changes in his stats to the eager man. Of course he left out some details, such as his class and his Tao heritage, but the rest was enough to satisfy the old mystic. He bowed low in front of Sam and congratulated him on his new power. If Lau was any worse of a man, he would have been jealous, but he had transcended such base foibles long ago. Instead, he only felt joy for his friend. Also, it wouldn't hurt that their faction was now headed by the third strongest man on earth. Besides, Lau was not too far behind. He was still in the top five after all, and with his mastery of the Tao, he would probably reach higher levels soon enough. Sam was worried that the man who he had so brutally defenestrated from his former position would come seeking revenge. 
Unfortunately, the leaderboard did not actually say how much stronger the fighters were from each other, and as far as Sam knew, the battle could go either way. Judging by the way that the system had been creating the matches so far, he would be facing off against Andrew Monroe soon enough. He was not looking forward to that. Sam made his way out of the room after having explained everything and he walked towards the arena entrance. There should be another round of fights starting about now. Sam had never really thought about it, but it was strange that everyone seemed to make it to the start of the matches just in time, without any sort of prompting from any outside source. There were some strange things going on with the system, he guessed, and it was subtly manipulating their minds to be on time. It was a lot more subtle than announcing it through the halls, but Sam wondered what was the point. Was it just some sort of power play or was there an actual reason? Seeing most of the fighters traipse on in, Sam found his customary seat. A few minutes later, he had a strange feeling, almost as if somebody was trying to drill a hole in his skull with just their gaze. He turned around and saw the thunderous face of Andrew Monroe. There were flecks of foam on his lips, and he looked completely deranged. The man was channeling his aura through his gaze, but because they were on a similar level of power, nothing was happening. Curious as to what would happen if he did this, Sam sent a spike of his own aura, laced with the power of his new Dao straight at the other man. Andrew winced as the attack struck home and then clutched his head. Sam flashed him a cheeky grin and then watched the beginning of the battle. This seemed to be the beginning of the losers bracket matches that would determine if the fighters were able to make it out of their positions of having lost. The first match was between Reaper and Anonymous. As they walked up to the arena, both of them gave each other strange looks that Sam couldn't parse. Perhaps it was because they were in the same alliance, or maybe they were just trying to psyche each other out. Anonymous had decided to go without her mask after she had been revealed to everyone by Eduardo and her small, childlike face was at odds with her reputation and power. If not for the fact that Sam could feel her aura, he would have thought that she was just a normal teenage girl. They entered the sands of the arena and began without waiting for the system to announce the start of the battle. The audience oohed and awed at the fight, but Sam had since learned to drown them out with his own thoughts. They were immaterial, and only a distraction from the real fight. The humans in the audience would be the vassals of the winners of this tournament and they were nothing to him. Feeling a little strange about how much his perspective had shifted, after all he could have been one of them easily enough, Sam watched the battle as it progressed. The two fighters seemed to be holding back for some reason and neither of them used any sort of deadly technique. Reaper stuck to simple armor creation with his ectoplasm, and Anonymous only used her daggers. They had definitely been conspiring with each other. As Reaper moved to exploit an opening, Anonymous retaliated, revealing that it had been a trick. However, it had been so obvious that Sam had seen it from a mile away, and apparently so had the audience, from the noise that they were making. It was becoming clear to them as well that this fight was rigged. The fight never progressed past a magically enhanced clash of fists and steel, and eventually they both attacked each other at the same time, with Reaper sending a fist towards Anonymous' head and she thrusting her knife's dull edge into the base of the man's skull. They both collapsed to the ground and there was a pause. The system's voice rang out and it seemed angry. As a result of the clearly manipulated circumstances of this match, from now on any such result as this will result in immediate disqualification of the fighters in question. However, as this was not explained to these two, they both will move back into the winner's bracket. The audience started booing, and Sam got up to join them. The rest of his group did as well, but the enemy faction did not move. Neither did the overlord, but that was more out of apathy than anything else. Sam sat down after a moment and watched as the two bodies were carted off to the medical bay. Seeing as this sort of thing was probably going to start happening more and more, manipulation of the rules that was, Sam would have to be on guard. He wanted to win the tournament, so he needed to be ready for any sort of underhanded dealing. In fact, he needed to win the tournament, or else the winner would use their power to destroy him. Chapter 78 at this point, the only people above him on the leaderboard were his enemies, and none of his allies were there. He wouldn't have minded if someone like Eduardo or Lau had been number one, but sadly that was not to be. There always had to be a villain to every story, and Sam had found his. At least until the real battle started in a hundred years. Sam tried to not to think about that much, but he found his mind drifting there more and more as time went on. The effects of his stats upon his body were gradually changing his life view and a hundred years did not seem like that much time anymore. In a year, his lifespan would probably be many times that anyway. Suddenly, he wanted to leave this tournament and level up instead of participate in this system-sanctioned gladiator match. He needed the rewards though, so he could not afford to sacrifice his possible edge in the world for a simple bit of laziness. He had Jeffrey and Rax to think of, as well as the rest of his new allies. 
They would need to be protected from the depredations of the overlord and his ilk, and Sam would be the one to do it. The reward that would make or break his chances in the long run was the personal tutelage one. Any ranker would probably have a wealth of wisdom to share with their pupils, but unfortunately the second-place winner also had an opportunity to do that as well. In the scenario in which Sam won and the overlord placed second, he would have to be on his toes after the month was over because both of them would have been preparing at the same pace. Of course, the format of the training could be completely different than a flat period after the tournament's end, but it was still important. Sam looked up at the man who was the subject of his thoughts, and then reconsidered his aspiration of reaching the top two places, as it sounded pretty unlikely. He did not know this, but the overlord was thinking the exact opposite thoughts. He had detected Sam's new power and he knew that in the end, Sam was the one who he would be fighting against. Rodney Kane was powerful, but he would not be able to stand against someone with the highest tiered Dao in the universe. The overlord could see the power rolling off of Sam in waves, not that it was power per se, but rather potential. Sam had not gotten anywhere near the full amount of power out of his Dao that he could possibly do so, and if he was able to fully come into his own, then he could possibly beat him. Besides, he had to focus on what would come after as well. The overlord knew that he would either place first or second, with first being the most likely possibility, but he did not know if Sam would have a new influx of power sometime soon. Sam watched as the next few fights went on, and a few people were banished from the tournament. Still, they would be doing pretty well for themselves regardless. A hundred thousand credits was quite a lot of money, and Sam expected that there would be a new surge in the number of Dao wielders in the world as the wise people used their money to purchase a Dao guide. Some would of course spend it on luxury, but the ones who were destined for greatness would use it for the right purpose. Soon, the bouts in the loser's bracket were over for the day and the real fights began. Reaper was up first, the system clearly trying to punish him for exploiting the rules like had had, he was still weak from his healing, but he could not back down or else he would be disqualified. He was up against Melissa Tang, a woman who Sam had not seen fight before. She was a slight figure, with a survivalist's kit, wearing practical clothes of what seemed to be some sort of white fur. Sam was confused as to why she was wearing something like that in a temperature-controlled environment, but he would reserve judgment until he saw her fight. She wielded a gun and a knife combo, with a long machete clutched in her right hand and a pistol in her left. Both of them were part of a matching set, with the same paint scheme and alloy composition. She was clearly ready for battle and the scars on her face told Sam that her life since the initialization had not been easy. She didn't look that imposing, but Sam knew that Reaper was in for a tough fight. Reaper began to channel his ectoplasm and started to create his full body armor before the match started. As he did so, Melissa shifted and then called something out to him. Ah, a necro. Who did you use to gain your power? The man flushed and stopped channeling his power, clearly perturbed. Who told you that? He asked, his voice stony. She chuckled and turned to face the crowd. You all know how elemental awakening works, right? Well, how exactly do you get closer to death? Reaper dashed over to her and tried to hit her, but she dodged. Shut the hell up. He screamed as he ran. She started laughing and continued to taunt him. Anyway, I'm sure that you all understand what I am getting at now. Indeed, Sam saw it after a few moments of thought and he was laughing heartily at the expense of Reaper. It didn't hurt that the man had been one of his chief tormentors. The entire audience started laughing as well, the implication clear. Sam saw a few people shrink, probably also practitioners of the deathly arts. Shaking his head, Sam watched as the battle began in earnest. Even the people on the other side were laughing as well, showing just how disloyal to each other they were. Reaper was clearly enraged, and his movements were clumsy and full of anger against the woman who had defamed him. He tried to hit her, but as much as he wanted to, he was not in the right frame of mind for the fight. Every now and again, she would dance in and carve a wound into his flesh, almost effortlessly. Her gun had not come into play yet, and Sam wondered why. Then something strange happened. Reaper began to calm down, and his movement shifted from being jerky and unsophisticated into being precisely placed and targeted. The change was marked, and Melissa was suddenly on the defensive. Sam felt a strange energy off of Reaper, and as it started to burgeon, Sam realized that he was beginning to form his Tao. This battle had unlocked his innermost potential, and his opponent didn't end this quickly, then she would be the one who was on the back foot. She tried, she most certainly tried, but she was unable to stop him before he fully formed his Tao. This process seemed strange to Sam as the Tao formed over the course of a few minutes, rather than instantly. If that had happened when he was fighting against Lena Scarlet, he would not be there now. Wondering if his mysterious aptitude for the Tao was what had allowed him to do that, he watched as the Tao blossomed into full form. It projected out a wave of apathy and misery, 
exactly what Sam expected from someone like Reaper. There were many different interpretations of death, and it was clear that Reaper had taken the most miserable of them. Different cultures had different views of death, and many of them had seen it as something to celebrate, the passing of a soul into their desired afterlife. Reaper however dismissed all of this. His cosmology had no room for such idyllic hopes and dreams, and like his name he would deliver final death to everyone in existence. Or at least, he would try. Sam had been sucked into the pit of endless misery by a small amount before he had escaped the gravity well of the man's Tao, but many of the people in the audience seemed to be crying. They were caught up in a vision of their own demise and this was what instilled such terror in them. A shield slammed down around the arena, and the aura cut off, focused instead to the inside of the shield. Melissa paled as she faced down the Tao-infused aura of Reaper and she gritted her teeth rather than give up. She did not possess a Tao, but she was higher level than the man. It was clear that he would brook no surrender, so she had to be very clear about her yielding if it came to that. Sam could tell that Reaper desired nothing more than the deaths of everyone in this area, more than anything else in the world. That would grant him immense power, as his comprehension of his Tao would skyrocket. In the boundless expanse proper, death cultivators were viewed with a healthy dose of fear. They usually found themselves victims to their own creed, but the few that did survive became some of the most powerful beings in the cosmos. They could blast through levels by basking in the concentrated death energy of millions of slaughtered souls and thus ascend the ranks in mere years or decades. This all slowed down eventually, but in the beginning, they had a good run of it. One of the main limiters to the number of such cultivators was the fact that most people had little or no affinity for death, as only the insane would wish to further death's goals among the living. Chapter 79 Reaper looked down on his opponent like a god of death upon his herd, ready to cull her for the sake of the flock, or rather, his own power. He raised his hand and a storm of darkness expanded outwards from it, creating a zone of night within the area, similar to how the forest during the monster hunt had been constructed. A bright light flashed from above, and the arena was revealed to all of the viewers, but it seemed that Melissa was still inhibited by the darkness. She fumbled around in the cloud as Reaper stalked her and eventually he chose to strike. Some minute detail, perhaps the air moving in an unnatural way or the click of a shoe on a stone alerted her to his presence, and she vaulted backwards. As his fist fell down with a sword of death energy clutched within it, her maneuver turned certain death into a long cut down her abdomen. She groaned in pain and landed with a thud, fighting to stop herself from collapsing. Reaper advanced towards her with a dark look on his face, and then stopped. Banishing the dark energy, clearly not aware that the system had already removed it for the audience, he lashed out with his sword, cutting deep into his opponent's face. Gurgling, she tried to call for mercy, but she could not, as most of her lower face was gone, ripped clear off by the blade. With a whoosh of air, he severed her head, letting it drop into the sands below. Raising his hands up high, Reaper pulled some sort of energy out of the woman's corpse, consuming it entirely. Sickened by the spectacle, Sam saw that it was her soul. It had the same feel as his own one, and as the man, no, monster, devoured it, his aura signature spiked in power. Reaper howled, an inhuman, bestial sound erupting from his mouth, infused with his aura. Many of the people in the stands were pressed back into their seats, both from the power and from a primal urge to distance themselves from this monster. Then he walked out of the arena, still clad in his armor. Behind him, there was only silence. Sam was worried now. That had not been what he was expecting. If Reaper now possessed a Tao, Sam was afraid to see where he was on the leaderboards. Surprisingly enough, many of the top ten people lacked a Tao, with only Sam, the Overlord, Lao and now Reaper having one. It was abundantly clear that Jeffrey had been talking from personal experience when he said that most people did not form a Tao for months. Even without the advantages that Sam had, it required a certain raison d'etre, a certain connection to a concept to first form the basis for your Tao. Then one must find the willpower to actually form the Tao within them, which seemed to take a fight to the death to trigger. In the rest of the multiverse, it was likely that people formed Dao simply by meditating on various concepts until they found one that stuck. That was a worthwhile method in a much safer part of the multiverse, but not on a frontier planet and universe such as Earth. Indeed, fortune truly favored the bold. On the planet Kentari 4, thousands of universes away, in a branch headquarters of the Minery Insect, one of the local leaders rubbed his hands together. Salvinius Relk, of an aquatic species of humanoids, had carved out his niche for himself through displays of utter ruthlessness and sadistic evil. Originally bound to the water, after having killed off his entire tribe, he had gained enough power to leave the seas of his planet and take to the stars. Over the years, he had dealt with some of the worst scum to roam the universe, but he had never encountered something quite like the minor insect. Of course, he had attempted to join them immediately. 
Entering a competition between millions of hopeful applicants, he had risen to the top of his E-rank bracket through sheer brute power and bloodlust. So impressed with him were his handlers that they had installed him in a probationary period within this universe, as one of its junior administrators. He had been in that position for centuries, and he needed something drastic to change that. He had been idly watching the feeds from one of the new universes, and something had caught his attention. It was from a planet known as Earth, quickly becoming famous in the local universal cluster as an incubator for prodigies of the highest order. He had dismissed them as potential assets to the order, both because of their tendencies for justice and the fact that none of them were suited for the sort of numbness that allowed one to kill millions. However, there was a new challenger to the hegemony of these unworthy candidates, and his name was Reaper. Over the last few days, Salvinius Subconscious, an apparatus more powerful than the active minds of people of a lower rank, seized all of the information about the fighters without his input. Now that he had reason to use the information, he dug up some details on Reaper. He had been somewhat of a joke before this match, stepped on by the strongest fighters. Then the monster hunt had happened, which Salvinius had thought was an inspired piece of manipulative cruelty, and he had ascended to the leaderboards. Now that he had formed a Tao, he was the perfect foothold into the universe. They would have to do this carefully, but if they were able to poach him from the butcher properly, he would not be able to retaliate, as the sect was a B-rank force, and his own group was only C-rank. He would rage about it for years to come, but in the end nothing would come of it. He had not expected for the universe that he had purchased to be such a hotbed of potential power, and thus had not planned for the eventuality that others would try to take some of that power for themselves. The offers that the Minorians could give Reaper were far more tantalizing than anything that Tantalos could give, not that he was offering anything more than a quick death anyway. In fact, it would be child's play to claim Reaper as their own. Gulping, Salvinius rang up his supervisor on the hologram transmitter on his table. If his idea was not suitable for the sect, then he would die a painful death for daring to talk out of turn. There were so many applicants for his position that it would likely be filled immediately. Perhaps he would even see his successor enter the room as he breathed his last. Opening the plastic cover that was over the big red button on the hologram transmitter, he steeled himself and then pressed it. A new star blossomed into life in the room, and Salvinius shut his eyes. His master liked to project his full power at all times, and gazing upon the unfettered energy of an high enlightened tear cultivator would cause him to go blind. Of course, he had no idea that there was a force amplifier built into the transmitter just so that his supervisor could shock and awe him with his presence. Salvinius had never met the man in person, and thus believed him to be a peak D-ranker, while in reality he was only a low D-ranker. Many cultivators liked to lord it over their subordinates, and out of those quite a few did things like this. It was petty and pathetic, but for them it was the height of entertainment. There was even an information-sharing network set up on the multiversal interweb that was reserved solely for videos of such things. The only explanation for this was that millennia of life made for an extremely bored cultivator. As soon as the light seared his retinas, Salvinius dropped into a kowtow, making sure to hit his head off of an intentionally placed spike. The Minorians took the idea of debasement to the next level, and their method of showing respect was to harm oneself in the pursuit of that goal. The nebulous figure that hovered above the transmitter was appeased by this gesture and he addressed his charge. So, Worm, you have dared to contact me. Why have you done so? I will grant you one subjective minute to explain, one minute to me that is. Start now. The task that the man had given Salvinius was an extremely unfair one, as a subjective minute to a D-rank cultivator was akin to a mere second for an E-rank. Still, he was able to answer the question in time. Those classes that he had gone through in precise speed enunciation were spying off now. He had thought that the multi-million credit cost was quite extreme for such a basic skill, but it was saving his life right now. This one has found a possible asset in the new universe on the far reaches of the Sentani cluster, Venerable Sect Elder. The man was not actually a sect elder, barely even a sect assistant, but he liked to be addressed as such and his subordinates had no grounds on which to refuse him. This statement piqued the man's interest and he started rubbing his chin. Hmm, you tell an interesting tale, maggot. I will give you time to explain. Do not test my patience. Of course, wise and most generous elder. The man of whom I speak is one of the humans from the planet known as Earth. That planet has become infamous as a breeding ground for geniuses, but the universe is under the thumb of the butcher. The other man paled at this, but tried to hide it with a quick scratching of his cheek. Salvinius was not as stupid as his supervisor thought and he caught the move, internally adding that to a long list of reasons that he would depose this man for. Miraculously, most of them had been formed before he had even personally met him. His name is Reaper, and he is a powerful death cultivator. 
He recently acquired a DAO and has jumped up the leaderboards as a result. If we can harness his potential, then we might be able to catapult our branch to the head of the sex special sector. The face of the supervisor lit up with greed. There is no we, filth, but your proposition is promising. I shall think upon it. For addressing me in the same context as yourself, I command you to punish yourself in a way that you see fit. Farewell. The oath that Salvinius was under forced him to start beating himself viciously with a barbed club. As blood ran down his face, Salvinius plotted his revenge. Chapter 80 On Earth, Sam cultivated his element within the safety of his own room. It was quite slow going, even for just the first percentage point, but as he pondered the meaning of Earth, his vision, which had been adopted as his image of the element, started to sharpen by a minute amount. It was barely noticeable, but there was a profound feeling of deeper meaning within the whirls on the flesh of the rocky deity that stood tall within the vision. With a snap of released power, Sam progressed to the next percentage point of mastery. It had taken him hours to just go up by one point, and he was afraid of how long it would take later on. With that out of the way, it was time to form a new skill. Walking up to his neglected training robot, he decided that it was time to challenge the setting that he had been having so much trouble with. Pressing the button, he planted himself firmly as the robot came flying in. It was still a blur of motion, but Sam was no longer utterly outclassed by it. He fainted to the left and then dodged to the right as the ghostly version of his mace crashed down onto the floor. Sam did not know what the wood was made of, but it was incredibly sturdy. It had taken an attack that would have pulped any normal tree without a single dent. The robot wheeled around and sent its left fist flying towards Sam, with its fingers coated in an ethereal flame. Now that he was proving to be a match for the robot, he was being treated to its full repertoire of skills. Bracing himself, trusting that he had the right idea, Sam started to enhance himself with his mana and his earth elemental energy. The effects of his mana bulwark skill started to meld with the power of implacable earth, creating a physical shield of a crystalline substance. The robot slammed its hand into the shield, and was sent flying backwards as a detonation of released energy was sent back at it. Sam had imagined the perfect shield as he had released his energy, something that would both block and attack. Sam had tried to imbue the skill with his Tao as well, but he had come up against a brick wall, as if the skill was already too saturated with power for any more to be added. He did not need his Tao anyway, this was enough. The robot flew into the shield that surrounded the fighting enclosure and collapsed forwards, catching itself on both hands. It stood up and paused, looking at Sam. A worthy opponent. You are far more than you were when we last fought. I welcome this challenge. But you must fall. Overdrive. Sam was caught off guard by the robot suddenly manifesting a voice, and he was unable to dodge as golden flame started to lick across the surface of the robot, and it sped towards him, easily twice as fast as before. Sam had next to no time to prepare for the attacks of the robot, as it was so fast now. The golden flames that wreathed its form were hot to the touch and Sam's arm was burnt just from trying to deflect the blow of the bot. Not that it mattered anyway, as it was far too strong for him to resist. His estimate of about a doubling in strength seemed to be accurate, as it far outclassed him now. It laughed at him, a disconcerting noise coming from a metallic body, and it sounded like the noise of breaking glass. Sam shuddered and tried to get away, but he was held fast by its robotic claw. A devastating blow from its mace took him in the bottom of the chin. And only his quick use of his new ability stopped him from being knocked out or perhaps even killed. The layer of stony mana was almost completely shattered by the attack, and some of the force still got through anyway. It was almost unbelievable how quickly the battle had turned. His shield would not withstand another blow, but he had some other aces up his sleeve. Not having used his Dao in a long time, he had forgotten about how to do so and now that he was in a dire situation, it was time to try it again. Channeling both his physical anger and his conceptual anger into himself, he felt a marked difference in the way that the skill manifested itself now. Previously, fiery rage had created a berserker-like state that prevented him from thinking clearly, but now it was a lot calmer. It was like his rage was simmering in the back of his mind, rather than boiling on the front burner. He was empowered just as much by the skill, but it was a lot calmer. He could feel the half of his doubt that was aligned towards justice, mitigating the effects of the other half trying to control him with anger. This allowed him to fight much more effectively, and he began to use one of his weapon techniques. Gritting his teeth as he did so, Sam lifted his body off the ground, hanging off of the robot's hand with that being the only thing supporting him. Normally his weight would have been trivial, but Sam yanked down hard as he did so, and the robot went flying over his head and into the ground. There was a crashing noise and he looked around to see that it had landed on its feet. He was not free of its grasping hands, but it was still very much in the fight. It popped a joint back into place and then resumed its attack. 
Sam wasn't sure if the thing was starting to grow dimmer, but the flames seemed to be giving out and its movements were a little bit slower. It was still a lot faster than Sam, but not to the point of invincibility. He waited until the last minute and then juked to the side to avoid the outstretched mace of the robot. The blue weapon slammed through the place where he had stood and hit the floor, creating an explosion of kinetic force. The last bit of that explosion picked up Sam like a rag doll and tossed him face first into the shield. It was hard and unyielding, and he was dazed from the collision. The robot appeared behind him and thrust down, narrowly missing Sam and hitting the shield instead. It flickered slightly, but held firm. Sam groaned. Of course the shield was the most ineffective and weak model that the arena providers could find. The system would provide luxury, but only at the level of its intended partakers. Once one became stronger than the average level of the room's amenities, it would start to break down. By now the robot was starting to make whirring noises, as it was malfunctioning. Sam started dancing around the room, waiting until it had run out of power. Finally, the flames flickered out and the robot stumbled. As it suffered from the aftereffects of its skill use, Sam rushed in and brought his mana-imbued mace down on the robot's head. It raised one metallic hand and caught the weapon, stumbling a little under its force. Its raw power was still too high to beat in a contest of strength alone. Instead, Sam smiled. He now had an excuse to use his Tao imbuement for the first time in days. His mace started to shake as he filled it with the raw energy of his Tao fragment, seeming to take far less energy to fill. Before he would have tapped out much of his reserve by doing this, but now it was only taking about a quarter or even less to fill. When it was finally filled, it started to glow with the color of his new Tao and it was so potent that he could see the raw and unfettered energies swirling in the mix. With a cry, he brought it down. All went still for a moment, the scene strangely widening out and then the attack landed. The robot's head was blasted apart in what looked like slow motion as the mace came down and a shockwave of red energy rippled through its body and out of the bottom of its feet. With the sound of tearing metal, the robot fell apart, completely eviscerated. Chapter 81 The pieces started to come back together and it was whole again, and thankfully inert. Sam had thought that it was able to resurrect itself for a moment, but it was just the automatic function of the robot. He took a deep breath and left the arena, but then a faint noise came from behind him. He looked around, and saw the robot standing up. It didn't look hostile, rather inquisitive. The robot walked up to the edge of the arena and then stopped, seemingly prevented from going any further. It cocked its head at him, and then proceeded to go much further than a human's range of motion, dispelling the illusion that it was a normal person. How did you gain power so quickly? It said in a low voice. It does not make any sense. Sam was not sure of what to say and he faltered for a moment. Why are you suddenly sapient? You never spoke before. The robot regarded him with a look that almost looked like condescension. You monkeys did not provide any sort of challenge for me before. I do not know about my fellow training bots, but I doubt that any of them have been overcome yet. As my opponents get stronger, I must start to fight more intelligently, which requires that my true mind be switched on. In fact, there are a few other modules that I have disabled right now. Wait a second. The robot did something with its head and then shook it to dislodge something. There was nothing there, but as it spoke again, the difference was clear. Is this better? It asked, its voice suddenly that of a human. Specifically the raspy and deep voice of an older man who had smoked too many cigars. My analysis of your culture shows me that this is the stereotypical voice for one such as I, a trainer who does not mind hurting his students. Does this feel correct to you? For a moment, Sam could have closed his eyes and pretended that it was in the room with a drill sergeant, straight out of all of those bad army shows. Yeah, that's way better. How did you do that though? Sam asked, wondering more out of curiosity than any alarm at the sudden morphing of the robot's mannerisms. I have full access to your planet's primitive version of the multiversal interweb, or rather what was on it before the arrival of the system shorted it out. It is quite impressive that a species that has barely begun to travel into space is able to create such a sophisticated network. In fact, there was a lot of fiction written about robots such as myself. Sam did not know what to say to this and instead looked at the robot helplessly. He had no idea why humanity had created the internet, and indeed that it was anything special. He had always just used it as a tool for entertainment. Then something that the robot had said to him hit him. Wait, multiversal interweb. What is that? The robot responded instantly, and then spoke as if it was reading something out of a textbook. The multiversal interweb is a network for the purpose of information sharing that was created by the various factions of this multiverse after it had reached a population of a thousand universes. Over the time since then, it has morphed into its current state, a digital world in which the answers to almost anything can be found, that is if the owners want it to be found. In other words, it's a big-ass computer network. 
The flat monotone of its voice shifted back into the drill sergeant's voice after a moment as it said the last sentence. Sam chuckled. He was starting to like this bot. How do you access this network? Sam asked, wondering if there was some sort of special computer that one had to own. You must have multiversal citizenship and then there is a 100 mana fee each time that you enter it in order to ensure that its workings continue to be free of credit costs. Sam nodded. That sounded straightforward. Where do I find the entry point then? Simply focus on your citizenship card and then think about your desire. Sam did so and holding his card in front of him and feeling somewhat stupid, he closed his eyes and started to imagine connecting to the interweb. Nothing happened for a moment, and then a surge of mana was ripped out of him and he was suddenly in a new world. Sam blinked as a gust of wind hit him. He was standing on top of a massive spire, in the middle of what looked like a medieval city. The entire scene was made out of colored lines of code, which blended together in a way that made it look realistic. All around him, other people flew in the air or ran along the ground. Wondering if he could fly, Sam jumped off the side of the building, and then plummeted to the ground. He landed, but did not feel any pain. As he landed, a system notification appeared in front of him. Congratulations on entering the multiversal interweb. It is an information-sharing network that spans the entire multiverse, made to act as a secondary world in which to find information. No damage can be taken within this world, although things like aura attacks still work. One can move at a speed equal to their capabilities in the real world. Information is stratified based on the searcher's power, with the most classified information at distances of entire universes from the spawn point. The interweb takes on the characteristics of multiple different civilizations and DAO archetypes from the DAO annals. This creates a patchwork of different places in which to browse. Finally, every hour you are charged double the mana that you had to pay the last time, until your supply runs out. Mana cannot be regenerated within the interwebs as they use a form of time dilation to ensure that long delves do not interfere with outside responsibilities. The long message was like the entry point to a new world, and Sam was stunned by the possibilities of such a place. If Earth had possessed something like this, then they would have probably taken over the galaxy by now. The sheer amount of processing power that this must have taken was immense, far beyond anything that Sam could comprehend. It was like VR, but far more realistic. A game within a game, if you would. Sam opened his stat sheet, but rather than finding his normal stats, he instead was met with this. Current time spent, 01,59. Hours remaining based on mana, too. There was no mention of anything else, just how long he had been in the interweb and how long he had left. He supposed that there was nothing else to do with your stats though, and he tried to summon his DAO. Nothing happened, which meant that this facsimile of the real world was nothing near as complex as the true thing. This delve as the system called it would be simply for the purposes of discovering more about the world around him. The first order of business was to find a place to research. The layout of the city was in a geometrically perfect grid and as the line of the streets progressed, the buildings became more ornate, as opposed to less relative to their distance from the city center, as in a real city. Sam started down one of the streets and began to run towards what looked to be a library. That was as good of a stop as any. As he ran, something strange happened. His feet moved beneath him, but he was only covering a fraction of the ground that he should have. It was like being on a treadmill, but when he stopped, nothing happened. A passerby called over to him as they dashed by. Having some trouble there, noob? It looked like, despite the absence of the usefulness of stats, that it was very easy to tell how powerful someone was by how quickly they moved. Even here, where there was technically no violence, people could easily be swayed by threats against them in the outside world. The scourge of politics always transcended violence in the end after all. Instead of responding to the fast-vanishing figure, Sam focused on running. He did not get tired the entire time, and despite how quickly he was pumping his legs, he did not have to breathe any more heavily than normal. In fact he might not even have to breathe at all. Sam closed his mouth and nose, and found that nothing changed at all. The mechanisms of life within this world were just an illusion. Chapter 82 Sam made his way into the library after an hour of running that had barely covered a hundred feet in objective space, and entered it. As soon as he did so, the effect of the street stopped and he was able to walk normally. The inside of the library was not filled with books, but with small cubicles that had strange machines within them that looked vaguely like sci-fi devices for the purpose of entering a digital reality. Sam wondered what the makers of all those movies would have thought if they had been able to see this world for themselves. Most of the cubicles were filled, but one nearby him was free and he sat down within it. Picking up the wire that connected to the side of the wall, he stared at it, confused. It was not clear at all what he was supposed to do with it, but the wire took initiative for itself. The thing jumped out of his hands and thrust itself into his ear. 
He did not feel any pain, but the sensation was strange nonetheless. A flash of green light blocked everything else out and he found himself standing in the middle of a starry void, surrounded by words. Each of them was connected to a massive pile of documents that appeared as if they were physical. Wondering where he should start, Sam decided to ask what the Dao Annals were. The system had briefly mentioned them and he wanted to know more about them. Speaking the words into the void, a series of papers drifted up to them. Upon picking one of them up, the information was downloaded into his mind. You have used 0.1% of your allotted data space within the interweb. Upon filling this, you must either delete something else within your space, upgrade your citizenship, or progress in rank. This seemed like a good deal to Sam, until he read what had been implanted into his mind. It was barely a paragraph in length. The Dao Annals, System Entry. The Dao Annals are a semi-material accumulation of all of the possible states of matter within reality. As concepts emerge and form into their own Daos, their nature and interactions with other concepts are tracked by the Dao Annals. This creates a self-fulfilling series of templates that work together to manage the progression of causality. Dao archetypes are part of this cycle, and they are formed when sapient beings interact with the Dao Annals. The creation of something, such as a culture, language or non-physical concept creates a space within the annals for this to be formed. These archetypes can be drawn upon to create versions of themselves, similar to blueprints within a construction process. Much about the annals is unknown, such as when they were created, why they exist and how something that is not accessible anywhere physical can still be drawn upon. See also, Akashic Records, Causal Templates, Theory of the Creator. Sam had heard of the term Akashic Records before, and it was the only thing within this that he recognized instantly. There had been a similar interpretation of what this meant back on Earth, but it was mainly the domain of cultists and weirdos who believed in some universal truth. As it turned out, they had been right. Sam wondered if they had come to the recognition of this truth because of the subtle influence of the Tao Annals, which seemed to be the only right answer. Did that mean that many of the civilizations on Earth were based on something further off in the multiverse? Was Sam a clone of someone else? As he pondered these questions, he was ejected from the interweb and spat out onto the floor of his room. Sam's time had run out. The robot still stood there and as Sam got up, the bot spoke to him. How was it? As a robot, I am unable to access the interweb in the same manner as a natural softent. Sam's look of confusion signaled to the robot that he had no idea what it was talking about. Softent? Is that Latin or something? It simply means a sapient being. Is that a term that is out of use within your lexicon? I found it when a knowledge pack was imported into my brain of the culture and language of Earth. As a naturally occurring word in your language, the system translation feature did not kick in. Never mind that though. I need to recharge. My new capabilities are taking a toll on me. The robot sat down in a cross-legged position and then started to make a noise like that of a human breathing in and out. It seemed that it was cultivating, in some way or another. Sam could see energy start to accumulate within the robot, an energy that he had not seen before. It was of a rainbow color, and it felt like a wellspring of potential to him. Recognizing the feeling, he was able to figure out what it was. It was essence in its pure form. That must have been what the robot, and indeed most forms of system-sanctioned technology, ran off of, seeing the disdain that the system had for higher forms of conventional technology. The bot was not really a robot in the traditional sense, but rather a form of monster that acted like one. It did not run off of electricity or have a central processing unit, but it still was able to do things that a normal robot could do. Sam left the room, with nothing else to do there. It was time to watch some more of the fights. As well as that, he wanted to see the rankings of the battle so far and who was out of the tournament for good. He made his way into the room and saw a much diminished crowd as opposed to before. Looking up at the leaderboards, he saw that barely a hundred people remained, within both the losers and winners brackets. He was near the top of the winners bracket, in all of the categories. At some point during the final segment of the tournament, the system had started ranking the fighters, to create some sort of audience engagement. It even seemed that there was betting going on. The top segment of the leaderboard looked like one of the lineups in a betting shop. 1. The Overlord, 2 to 1 odds. 2. Rodney Kane, 3 to 1 odds. 3. The Arbiter, 3.5 slash 1 odds. 4. Profound Visionary, 5 to 1 odds. 5. Reaper, 6 to 1 odds. The names did not follow the power leaderboard after third place, and Sam wondered why Andrew Monroe was not on it. Was he not as strong as his placement on the leaderboard indicated? or was he simply not suited to arena battles? In fact, Sam had not seen the man fight yet, and he wondered what his full abilities looked like. He had sparred with the man in the monster hunt, but it had been clear that he was holding back then. 
Sam doubted that some magnetic abilities and a few other tricks were the extent of the man's resources. One did not get into the top ten without a reason. As he read the rest of the leaderboard, the next fight began. The one that had been running when Sam had entered had not been worth looking at, just a duel between two of the bottom-ranked fighters. Their movements had been unrefined and slow to Sam's sight, and looking at them was almost painful. The next one seemed more promising though. It was between the woman who had joined them during the monster hunt, and some man from the upper twenties on the leaderboard. He didn't know either of their names, but it didn't matter to him. The system announced the fight, and he learned their names anyway. Her name was Eliza Williams, and the man was called Big Boy, one of the most ridiculous aliases that Sam had ever seen. The man was not even big in real life, and was shorter than his opponent by almost five inches. Either the man was delusional, or he was being sarcastic. Most likely the latter of the two. Sam wondered what the woman would do against him, as the last time he had seen Eliza fight, she had been quite bad at it. Her style had been off and she had been much weaker than him. Now it was time to see if she had progressed. Chapter 83 This fight would be an interesting one, as Big Boy, despite his name, was a mage. He had two wands rather than a staff like most of the other mages, and was dressed in an odd ensemble that looked like that of a clown's outfit, but even more garish. Entire book series could probably be written about the man, although not ones that were especially kind to him. They would be very funny though. They began their fight with a cautious analysis of each other, with an entire minute spent circling the arena, looking for a place to strike. Eventually, Big Boy grew tired of the wait and he launched a projectile at Eliza from his right-hand wand. It looked like a blob of multicolored paint, and where it landed, the ball spread out over the sand, dyeing it with its bright hues. Then it started dissolving it, revealing that it was not merely paint. Eliza looked at it warily and edged away from the impact zone. The other man let out a laugh that sounded faintly insane, and Eliza gave him a look that spoke volumes about her opinion about him. Then again, anyone who dressed up as a clown in normal society probably had a few problems going on in their lives. The fact that normal society did not exist anymore still did not excuse that. She dodged around another few of the paint balls and made her way towards her opponent. As she approached, the other man waggled his finger disapprovingly, and something that sounded like a children's lullaby started playing. It was creepy, as all lullabies are when heard outside of a bedroom, and perhaps in one as well. His eyes started to light up as if he was a cat, and strange shadowy figures appeared under him and started walking towards Eliza. They had no substance and she ignored them, but when one of the shadows reached her own and slashed at it with a long talon, she winced as a cut opened up on her body. Big Boy started to cackle and then he spoke. You can either defend against the shadows or against me. Who will it be? The man ended that proclamation with a high-pitched giggle as he started confidently walking towards her. The giggle was made to rhyme with the other words, which made it far worse. The man's voice was too high for someone of his age, and it reminded Sam of those movies about demonic possession. Perhaps this man really was possessed by one, albeit a demon that liked to dress up like a clown and laugh maniacally. Actually, that sounded exactly like what a demon would do. Sam exited his thoughts as the battle started to heat up. Eliza tried to slash at one of the shadow monsters, but nothing happened as her three-dimensional body could not harm the two-dimensional shadows. Then she had a lucky break and as she lashed out at one further away, the shadow of her knife crossed the shadow of the shadow creature. It let out a hiss and then vanished. A smile broke onto Eliza's face and her opponent scowled. She erupted into a frenzy of slashing, and the telltale glow of mana started to infuse her strikes, making them faster and more accurate, as opposed to more powerful as with Sam. Her movements reached a crescendo, and a moment later all of the shadows were dead. As she stood there triumphantly, she realized that she had forgotten about Big Boy. But it was already too late. A lance of amorphous rainbow gel speared out from his hand and into her torso, skewering the woman on what looked like an icicle of frozen paint. He leaned in, obviously wanting to relish in her suffering, but as she started to mouth the words of her surrender, she suddenly threw her knife into the man's side. His lack of constitution and resilience made it that his body shattered under the impact, and he was torn away from her, leaving the spike within Eliza's body. She raised her hands in victory and then collapsed. Sam let out a sigh of relief. If that creepy bastard had won, then he would have been one step closer to claiming the best rewards. Some of Sam's enemies were just as bad as him, but at least they were sane. He would take a sane opponent over one who acted unpredictably any day of the week. As the man was carted away on a stretcher rather than being teleported away and another one was summoned for Eliza, showing that the system liked to mix things up once in a while, Sam took a look at the leaderboards. There were only 45 people left in the winner's bracket now, and the battle was getting into the endgame. 
The presence of the leaderboards really made it easy to know who was going to win, in some way making it not as fun as it normally would have been, but on the other hand if there were upsets, then they were very exciting to watch. Sam would have rather been in the audience for this tournament and not have to worry about fighting, but for the sake of his future and the pursuit of justice on earth, he would have to fight, and win at that, for him to be able to succeed. His next goal was to surpass Rodney Kane, and then he would finally be able to challenge the boss battle. The overlord himself. The next day, Sam sat under the watchful eye of his training robot, who he had taken to calling Sarge, as he prepared to go for another delve into the interweb. He wanted to do some more research on the basic principles and history of the multiverse, especially about the Tao. He did not know if such information would be available where he could get to, but he was sure that there would be something about it. Sam channeled his mana fee into his citizenship card and closed his eyes as he entered the interweb. This time he arrived where he had been last, outside of the library. That was good, as it meant that he would not have to walk all the way there again. A message popped up in front of him and he read it. Novice's library added to fast travel destinations. Current list, universal spawn point, Novice's library. It seemed that the interweb, just like many video games, had a fast travel mechanism. Sam entered the library and plugged into one of the ports there. As he entered the strange liminal space of the archives, he saw the piece of paper about the Dao annals floating next to him. Sam dismissed it and searched for something else. Intoning the word Dao into the void brought up a host of options. Sam scrolled through them and eventually found something promising. What is the Dao? An academic research paper by the f rank scribe Tal Vanter. The Dao is known by many names across the multiverse. The way, the intrinsic concepts, the mandate of heaven. However, all of these names do not encapsulate what it truly is. The Tao is, with lack of a more precise term, the conceptual image of everything that exists. It exists without any input from the outside world, as it is, in some way, the world itself. There are different tiers of the Tao, organized by how overarching, or how powerful they are. As a lowly member of the Archivists Association, I do not know the names for the higher Tao tiers, but I do know the first three and what they mean. Firstly, there is the Tao Moat. This is the initial and weakest stage of the Tao. This the domain of the lesser concepts, such as the ones created by sapients which do not exist naturally. Some of these are higher up in the hierarchy, but the basic emotions such as anger, joy, sadness and other such feelings can be found there. More powerful forms of those are on the next tier, which is that of the Tao Fragment. This stage adds another level of profundity to the concept, and this is where concepts such as grief, wrath and euphoria can be found. In addition, some of the basic physical laws are here too, such as momentum and inertia. Then there is the first of the more powerful Tao circles. The Tao Seed Stage. This is where the first of the more complicated and powerful concepts can be found, such as wealth, power and strength. As well as those, some of the other physical concepts can be found, usually to do with living beings such as the Daos of the sheep, horse and wolf. Despite the popular ridicule of these Daos, they are just as powerful and efficient as any other at this stage. The general rule of thumb for Daos is that the more complex it is, to a certain extent, the more powerful it is. In some cases, the natural power of the Tao influences its ranking as well. Now, for a description of how Daos influence sapience. Throughout the course of a person's journey to power, they can tie themselves to specific Daos that grant them great power if nurtured properly. These Daos usually suit the person in question, for example, I possess the Tao fragment of ink. The Daos after the moat stage possess different levels to them as well, with a greater stat and power bonus depending on that. Fear the wizened old man, for he most likely has a powerful Tao. In some cases, insufficient cultivation can be made up for somewhat or even entirely by mastery of the Tao. I have added a link to this phenomenon below. High Elder Xanthros, the G-Rank, Galactic Ruler, a preliminary guide by E-Rank Scribe, Cantor Selvin. Sam closed the page and immediately opened up the link. He knew that he was getting sidetracked, but he had to see this for himself. The idea that someone of his rank could rule a galaxy was something that he would not believe until he had seen proof. Chapter 84 The page appeared after a moment, and he started reading. High Elder Xanthros, the G-Rank, Galactic Ruler, a preliminary guide by E-Rank Scribe, Cantor Selvin. Xanthros Telgon, the famous G-Ranker who can defeat a D-Ranker in combat, is the ruler of a galaxy in a frontier universe of the Dalvin Cluster. On its own, this is not a very impressive feat, as galactic rulers are commonplace within the universe, but his low rank compared to all other galactic rulers has turned him into a legend. He was born 25,000 years ago to a family of middle-class artisans in a low-level planet within his current galaxy. 
They had a hard life, but they were protected by a beneficent city lord, a rarity in the multiverse. One day, a fleet of raiders came from another planet, looking for resources to sell on the open market. They killed the citizens of the town to the last man, except for Xanthros. They crippled his cultivation, making it so that essence would not enter his body. Rather than giving up, as most others would have done in that situation, he retreated into a cave in the mountains to begin his journey of Dao Mastery. It took him years to reach a level of power that would allow him to leave the safety of his cave, where he had lived off of rats and fungus. Now with the effective power of a peak F rank, he was able to start recruiting allies. The families and distant relations of those who had lived in the city flocked to his banner and over the course of the next century, he waged a bloody war against the raiders. Over this time, his Dao mastery continued to grow and eventually he claimed the head of the raider leader in single combat, a staggering feat for someone with barely any levels at all. Now the ruler of two planets, he was able to cultivate his Dao for millennia, eventually becoming a myth to the inhabitants of the planet. Five thousand years later, he emerged, with the auric signature of AD Ranker. It is unknown what Dao he follows, but without a doubt it is a powerful one. Since then, he embarked on a grand conquest of his galaxy, defeating tyrants, kings and oligarchs alike in his search for power. That is what led to his status today. His full story is chronicled within my book, King, Visionary, Prophet, a biographical account of Xanthos Talgon. Sam looked up the book out of curiosity more than anything else and choked when he saw what it was. The book was over 50,000 pages in length, and it cost a million credits to buy. That was definitely not something that he had any interest in purchasing at the moment. For the remainder of his time there, Sam researched more about the Tao, only finding anecdotal reports of Tao wielders. This made sense to him as there was no way that actually pertinent information that would tell one how to create a Tao would be free. After a while of this, he was ejected from the interweb and back into his room. Sarge regarded him impassively as he got up and then raised its hand to beckon for Sam to come over. He followed the robot's hand and entered the small arena. With a thud, he found himself on the ground, Sarge's hand on his throat. Sam instinctively rolled his body around and tossed the bot off of himself, giving himself room. He sprang up and got into a fighting stance, getting ready for the next attack. The robot started laughing, and Sam lowered his hands tentatively. Sorry, I just wanted to see how gullible you were. I don't suppose that if I told you that the word gullible was written on the ceiling, you would look up? Sam ignored the robot, but noted that it must have done a deep search of the internet if it was throwing out references like that. He started to leave the arena, but Sarge called after him. Why don't we spar again? It is my purpose to eke out your inner potential, no matter how buried that might be. What, are you scared of little old me? Sam wheeled around and gave the robot a stern look. It grinned, an odd contortion of its metallic lips and pouted a moment later. Sam went out to grab his mace and moved in, causing the robot to light up in a comically overstated manner. Sam got ready to fight and began to sink into his battle trance. That was one of the more complicated parts of his fighting style the ability to flow with the currents of battle rather than stand against it like a boulder against the stream. It might not falter for years, but eventually it would be ground down by the constant stream and turned into powder. Much of the techniques were veiled in metaphor, but this was one that actually made sense to Sam. The robot came in hard and heavy, trying out a new series of attacks against Sam. Last time it had been more graceful and refined, but this time it seemed to be relying on brute force to win. As its mace connected with Sam's, he stumbled backwards. Was the robot able to alter its stat layout? It certainly seemed that way. After the battle he would ask what was going on. In any case, he would have to fight differently. Sam shifted into a more refined style that relied on dodging rather than blocking. This allowed him to avoid the blows from the robot quite easily. Just as water could grind down an opponent through its inexorable power, it could just as easily flow to the path of least resistance. Sam smiled. He was getting good at this metaphor stuff. After a few minutes of dancing around aimlessly, the robot decided to use its ability again. This was what Sam had been waiting for. Narrowing his eyes, he began to focus on the battle properly as the robot came flying in with a halo of fire around its body. This time the effect gave it vastly increased strength rather than a simple increase to all of its stats, and when its mace hit the floor, Sam stumbled. Its power was that of someone who had placed all of their stats points into strength, with the threshold crossed. As a result, it was able to defeat him easily in a contest of strength, but Sam could run circles round it. In addition, it should be weak towards damage as well, with low durability. He didn't know if that was exactly how the stat distribution thing worked, but it was the most likely option. Despite its relative lack of speed however, it was able to move its mace at high speed due to its strength. Because of the way that objects in motion around a point worked, the end of the mace was accelerated into a blur of motion as it was swung. 
If that thing hit Sam then he would be turned into pulp. He doubted that the hot tub would do anything for a shattered body. Instead he would just have to fight smarter and harder. The other side of the equation was that the momentum of the weapon made it so that it couldn't pull it back properly. Its energy weapon had taken on mass in order to do damage as it landed, but it couldn't be light as well. That just was not how physics worked. Sam suspected that at the higher levels, physics didn't matter as much, or none of the things that the higher-ranked cultivators would work. As the weapon landed again, Sam saw that he had an opening. With a swift jab of his mace, he trapped the robot's mace against the ground for a split second and then punched it full in the face with a mana-infused punch. As he had expected, the robot crumpled around his fist and then began to repair. He stepped back and waited for it to recover. Sarge got up and rubbed its face, pretending to be abashed at its loss. Sam looked at it expectedly, waiting for an explanation. The robot noticed this and it turned to him. You want to know how I did that, correct? I have the ability to control myself down to a molecular level, but that makes it so I can never progress further than the body that I was made in. The only way to progress for me is to be upgraded into another form, either through mental transfusion or through a bodily upgrade. Nobody will do that for me however, so my dreams are moot. Sam would have sworn that he heard a small tinge of sadness in the bot's tone. It continued to speak, the sad tone now very apparent. I have always wished to travel the multiverse, but I have never been able to do it. I have seen images of the multiverse on the interweb, but it is an ephemeral thing that I have never been able to actually go to. I cannot interface with the interweb like a person, which means that all I receive is raw data. The voice of the robot became wistful at the end, and Sam wished that he could do something for it, but there was no way to do so. Then he had an idea. You said that you could be upgraded through mental transfusion, right? Sam asked, his voice soft. The robot nodded. Sam smiled at it and told Sarge his plan. Well, one of the rewards for winning the tournament is a F-rank training robot, so if I win, what do you say about being transplanted into it? The robot looked at him with a hopeful expression. You would do that for me? Sarge asked, with a tremor in his voice. Sam knew that it was likely fate, but it was still quite convincing. He nodded in response and the robot let out a deep breath. Sam was not sure where the robot was getting the air from, but since it had gained sapience, it had started to act more and more like a human. Whether it was a simple imitation or something else, Sam could not tell. Chapter 85 He left the robot in his room to think about his offer and Sam made his way towards the arena entrance. He should be up soon again, and he was looking forward to getting closer to the end of the tournament. Sam took his place in the seats and took a look behind him, noticing that most of the seats were empty. It was like sitting in the rows of a C-list movie, where there was only you and a few other people around. Sam was surrounded by his strongest allies, and it seemed that he had been set up as a figurehead for the group. As before, the overlord sat at the front of the room with the other faction sitting away from him. Taking a look at the match, Sam saw that it was one of the losers' bracket matches. Not wanting to watch this, he turned around to talk to his allies. Any changes since I was here last? Sam asked Eduardo. The Italian man shook his head. No, from what I have seen, the positions are pretty much set in stone by this point. I was able to get out of the loser's bracket by now, and everyone else in it are the weakest specimens of the tournament. Some of them have taken to killing their opponents before they can surrender in order to artificially move up the ranks, but the system usually is able to prevent that. I think that the normal matches are about to start now. You might be up again because you've been away for a bit. Sam nodded as the match finished and sure enough, his name was called. A small jolt of excitement ran through him as he saw who he was up against. Andrew Monroe. The man looked delighted to have an opportunity to take out Sam and he was positively salivating as he entered the arena. Sam laughed and called out a taunt at him. Hey, why don't you get that looked at? You might have rabies. The other man flashed him a look of utter hatred. I'm going to tear the flesh off of your bones, Arbiter. You're going to be begging for mercy by the time that I'm done with you. That's what I said to your mom last night. Sam retorted, delighting in the look of rage that he received. That was the face of a man who was on the borders of unhinged and going straight into madness. As soon as they entered the sands of the arena, the other man started to prepare something. A silvery substance started to cover his skin and it quickly spread over his body, creating a layer of armor all over him. As Sam started to move towards him, the man raised his fist and slammed it down. Censure. As the name of his technique echoed off of the stands, a wave of energy shot out from where he had landed, passing through both him and Sam within a blink of an eye. Sam tried to say something, but nothing came out. Looking at Monroe, he understood what the man was doing. This would be a battle to the death. With no recourse or means of surrender, they would have to fight until one of them was dead. Sam was happy with those conditions. 
He pushed off of the ground and flashed forwards, already beginning to enhance his mace with his Dao and mana. The weapon hummed as it arced through the air and towards its target. Monroe danced to the side and the mace cracked into the ground next to him, blasting the man with accelerated sand. Small scratches opened up on his strange armor, but they closed up after a moment. Sam jumped back as Monroe swung out with his knife. At the last moment, some mechanism within the blade triggered and it was lengthened by over a yard. The end of the blade shaved a small amount of skin and hair off of Sam's head. Monroe had gotten first blood, and that caused the crowd to go wild. Notably, about half of them did not. It seemed that Sam's fans were not happy with the turn of events. Sam wiped the blood off his face and backed away, preparing for a counterattack. Then the other man let go of his knife and started to use his magnetic abilities on it. It whipped through the air end over end towards Sam and he raised his mace to defend himself. Sam planted his feet firmly, after all the attack was not really that powerful, and was able to catch it firmly on his mace, preventing the knife from going any further. The other man frowned, the expression somehow visible through the mask, and the knife split into two pieces, each of which accelerated towards Sam's head. He let out a grunt, except nothing came out of his mouth, only silence. This was pretty odd to deal with, and it was quite distracting as well. It wasn't that no noise was being produced per se, it was that something was blocking the sound waves from making their way into the air. Sam could still feel the vibration as he spoke, but they did not reach his ears on the outside. It was just the two of them that were affected as well, as all of the inanimate objects still made noise. That was shown by the clink of the knives as Sam snatched them out of the air and slammed them together, dropping his mace in the process. It was the only way that he was able to mitigate the attack, and it was exactly what Andrew was looking for. The man grinned and snapped his fingers. Sam tried to throw the knives away, but they stuck to him until they blew up in his hands, tearing through the flesh. Sam growled inaudibly and wrung the shards out of his hands. Then he dashed towards the other man, who was seemingly content to let him come to him rather than the other way around. Sam was only too happy to oblige. Monroe lacked any more weapons, so Sam assumed that he was unprotected, save for the armor. In addition, he did not look like a constitution main, so dealing with him would be trivial. As Sam approached, with his mace raised above his head, his opponent did something with his fingers, creating something in the air. It was too small for Sam to see but a moment later he felt a burning pain in his abdomen and he looked down to see a thin line of blood. The thin line blossomed into a river, soaking through his clothes. Only his bones had prevented the attack, which was a razor-thin wire made out of metal, from penetrating his entire body. Luckily for Sam, his strength was high enough to stem the bleeding just by clenching his muscles, although it was a bit distracting. Another cheer came out of the crowd and Sam grimaced. The pain was still quite sharp, even if the bleeding was gone. Pain was one of those things that he was just going to have to get used to as a cultivator. Sam started to clear his mind and began to build up his Tao energy again, this time focusing on the battle as well. The power of righteous anger began to fill his body, and his skill activated. As the power of fiery rage took over his body and mind, it stopped almost immediately, leaving his mind clearer than it would have been under the effects of the previous skill. The physical empowerment still took place however, and Sam smiled as his body began to smoke with the red heat of his anger. It was not very hard to summon up some wrath at this man, even with the more selfless version of the skill. This man had wronged him many times, and he was now returning for justice. Sam relished in the feeling of his Tao working properly and he luxuriously stretched as the power finished building. A system notification blared in his vision, but he ignored it. Right now, he had a battle to win. Cracking his knuckles, Sam got ready to give Andrew Monroe the fight of his life. It was time to get revenge for everything that the man had ever done to him, or another innocent. Sam cranked up his aura to the max, pumping it with the power of his Tao. A field of palpable energy rolled out from around him and took Monroe head on like a freight train. He was actually pushed back by the power, and the aura broke over the edge of the stands like a wave. Then something st Chapter 86 They might have had a gulf between them in levels, but their power went the other way. Sam's Tao was so far beyond anything that Andrew had that it was almost absurd. Sam could tell that the man was starting to panic, and was hiding it poorly. His arms were shaking slightly, slightly enough that a normal person would not have noticed it, but Sam saw it clear as day. The man gulped and started to pull something out of the air. As his hands moved, a sword made out of the same silvery material as the man's armor emerged from nowhere. On second glance, it was literally his armor. The material peeled away from his body as the sword was formed. It seemed like Andrew had a finite amount of metallic substance to play around with. I'll give you a better chance than you gave me, Andrew. If you surrender now, I will spare you. Sam said, actually meaning the words. Losing to him was enough punishment for the scourge of New York. 
Sam knew that the man would be torn apart by his so-called allies if he showed the slightest hint of weakness, and Sam had a sneaking suspicion that the one who jumped him first would be his closest ally, Rodney Kane. Sam flicked out his mace, causing the other man to tremble even more. Then something changed on his countenance. It was a subtle shift, but a meaningful one nonetheless. The trembling stopped and the man gripped his sword firmly. It was like a different person was standing in front of Sam. Sam also started to steady himself. It seemed that there would be no quarter given after all. Sam stared the other man down and shuddered slightly as he saw a strange look flash across the man's face. For the briefest of moments, it seemed like there was someone else looking at Sam through Andrew's eyes. Andrew then frowned and said something strange. Curious. This meat puppet, I mean I, did not expect you to be so powerful. Sam frowned at the strange words, but as far as he knew, the man was slightly insane. Before he could think about it any longer, the other man surged forwards and Sam had to bring his mace up in an awkward block to prevent himself from being struck. The sword had a lot of force behind it, more than the man actually had in strength. Sam could tell that it was not an ordinary weapon and he tried to scan it, curious as to what would come up. In the brief second between a dodge and a block, he was greeted with a strange message. Warning! This weapon does not fall under the purview of the system. Sam frowned. What did that even mean? He thought that the system was in control of everything. Where had this man gotten something like that? Perhaps this was why Andrew was so high up on the leaderboards despite how weak he really was. He was getting help from some outside source. The controller that was piloting Andrew's body like a robot made of flesh scowled as it saw that Sam was starting to get suspicious. It did not know the working of the minds of the fleshy ones well. The creature that was in control of the man's body was actually a highly sophisticated AI, one of the many in the employ of the prophets of the machine god. They did not usually show their presence so overtly, but in this case if they did not, the puppet would be lost. At some point between the myriad calculations that the AI processed, it had time to laugh at how gullible Andrew Muno had been. The man had actually thought that he was a full partner with the organization. In reality, he was only a tool for the furthering of the faction's agenda within the multiverse. A giggle came out of the mouth of Andrew, and the AI paused for a moment, regaining control over the body. It was very possible that this process would break the man's mind. Oh well. It wasn't like he couldn't be useful afterwards. Sam was starting to get unnerved with the behavior of his opponent, and the audience was beginning to whisper among themselves. Sam did not know what was going on with the other man, and he was starting to think that it was not the same man as before. In any case, he still had to defeat him. As the man's sword came down, Sam dodged to the side, but the sword followed him in a manner that should have been impossible unless the sword was extremely light, but somehow also possessed a lot of inertia. As the sword came in again, Sam blocked it and carefully looked at the blade as it connected. The particles that made up the weapon contracted as they made contact with his mace, and that was what was causing the strange effect. It was not made out of metal, but some sort of semi-sentient mass of organisms. It reminded Sam of Nanites from science fiction, but that sounded like something that only the technology faction would have, and they were under censure from the system. No, it was highly unlikely that this man had access to that sort of resources. Sam knocked the blow aside and counterattacked, sending his mace through a complicated series of movements designed to confuse and disorient his opponent. The strange sensation, like someone else had taken over the other man's body, appeared again as he moved, and his opponent closed his eyes. Somehow, he was able to react to all of the strikes as if they were in slow motion, parrying them and mitigating the force behind them. Then, as the attack ceased, he grabbed onto the handle of Sam's mace and pulled him forwards. Sam initially resisted, but with a sudden yank filled with inexplicable force, he was jerked forwards and onto the sword. His eyes widened, and he let out a gasp of shock. The effects of fiery rage started to dissipate, and he was left there, hanging off of the cold material of the sword. Something started to wriggle inside him, and he looked down to see the sword begin to split into particles. It began to tear through his body, and Sam began to fade away, his mind succumbing to a strange and sudden feeling of lethargy. He was dying, and there was nothing that he could do about it. The energy of his Tao was becoming like a distant memory, and the gray haze of the afterlife began to beckon to him. A faint noise caused him to perk up slightly. A cry of sorrow and rage that seemed to be directed at him. But there was no Sam anymore, so how could someone be calling out for him? Sam! The voice repeated, even louder. Don't let that bastard win. He recognized the voice. It belonged to a certain monk. What was his name, Mao? Dao? Wait, the Dao. Wasn't that something important? Sam could not remember, but he felt an ember begin to burn within his chest as something inside him flared to life. The raw concept of his Tao began to tremble and shake as its meaning was deepened within his body. What was righteous anger? 
It was the true path to justice. This truth resonated within his body and he took a deep breath. An orb of coruscating energies blossomed within his chest and he let out a breath as life started to flow back into his body. A feeling of strength and power began to flow within him and he opened his eyes. They were filled with pure rage. Andrew Monroe took a step back, before the AI took control again and forced the body to keep a hold of Sam. With a roar of volcanic wrath, he was slammed into the ground by the force of Sam's unfettered aura. Every ounce of his power and will was sent into his aura, creating something akin to a gravitational field around him. Somebody who did not even have a basic Tao could not compete. Sam took a step, and the arena seemed to rumble under his feet. Another one took him over to the prone form of his opponent. Raising his mace, with a halo of reddish light limbing his form, Sam did not look like a random guy in a pair of overalls at a medieval convention, but as a demigod of wrath and vengeance. With that sight, the AI lost control completely, and the shattered mind of Andrew Monroe was able to offer up one last coherent sentence before it gave up the ghost. I yield. Chapter 87. Sam considered killing him anyway, but then he would be disqualified and that would ruin his chances of winning. With a snort, he backed up and then locked eyes with where he knew Rodney Kane to be sitting. The message was clear. He was next. Sam started to walk back to his seat, but then his legs stopped working. He looked down and saw that his front was covered in blood. That was the last thing that he saw for a long time. Sam woke up in the arena hospital, lying on a bed. The lower half of his upper body was covered in bandages, and he was hooked up to an I.V bag that was filled with green liquid. He took a look around him and saw the body of his opponent lying on a bed across from him. His eyes were open, but completely vacant. It seemed that the man's mind had been broken by his fight with Sam. Sam looked around some more, but there was nobody else in the room with them. He sighed and checked the notifications that he had received. You have upgraded the Dao skill, fiery rage, epic, into the Dao skill, fiery justice, legendary. Fueled by the power of a Dao fragment and the inner motivations of its user, this skill allows for the use of a berserker state, without the clouding of mental faculties that normally accompanies it. That was the name of the new skill that Sam had used during the battle, the one that Fiery Rage had morphed into as he had used it. It was a lot more useful than the previous skill, as it was basically just free power. Sam was always open to that. The next notification was an even more welcome one. You have upgraded your Dao. Dao Fragment of Righteous Anger, First Step. Righteous anger is the purest and most virtuous form of wrath that there is. Rather than selfishly indulging in your own anger as a palliative for your inner suffering, you instead use it as a shield and sword with which to protect the innocent. Now that you have increased connection with his concept and ideal, it will begin to manifest itself more frequently. Plus 10 to all physical stats. Plus 7 to all mental stats. Sam whistled as he saw the new stat bonuses. They were far more than they had been before. Then he paused. Sam winced for a moment, tensed up, and then relaxed. None of his stats had passed their thresholds. It would have been very annoying to have to deal with that when his body was in such a state of disrepair. A few minutes later, Eduardo and Lau rushed into the room. Behind them a few of Sam's other allies waited, not wanting to disturb Sam. He smiled and greeted them with a wave, not up to much more. The two men gathered at the side of his bed, and Sam reached up with his hands to grasp theirs. Lau let out a relieved sigh. I thought that we had lost you. Did you hear my voice calling out for you to recover? Is that why you suddenly had a second wind? Sam nodded. It is, and I am eternally grateful to you for that. If not for your encouragement, I would have been dead right now. The other man smiled weakly and let go of Sam's hand. Eduardo cleared his throat and brought the conversation towards more pressing matters. Now with Andrew Monroe out of the equation, it's up to you to win the tournament. Rodney Kane will be coming for you next, and he will not underestimate you this time. Be sure that you win, or else our positions will be in jeopardy. If you somehow beat the Overlord, then we will have achieved our goal and we can then form a proper faction. This surprised Sam. You want to make a faction with me? The others nodded. As well as a good portion of humanity. We need a strong protector, and what better than the strongest man on the planet? Or at least you will be if you win. Sam nodded and thought about what that would mean for himself. Rax and Jeffrey would be very surprised if was able to succeed against all odds. They were unable to access the leaderboards, so they had no idea how powerful he was right now except for his level. They would be in for a real shock when he met up with them again. He had tried to contact them through the party link before, but it seemed that they were too far away to do so. That again raised the question of where exactly this arena was. Lao? Eduardo? Do either of you know where this arena actually is? The others shook their heads too, but Lao had a thoughtful expression on his face. I was wondering that as well. 
The tides of reciprocity that we as humans have with places and things are almost completely unintelligible because of distance. I don't think that we are on Earth anymore. Really? Why would they go to such an expense to transport us here? Sam asked. All he got was blank stares in reply. Sam clicked his fingers suddenly. Wait a sec, I forgot to tell you too about something. Have either of you heard about the multiversal interweb? Both of them shook their heads and gave him a perplexed look. Sam smiled and showed them how to access it. It took a few minutes but eventually they grasped it. With apprehensive looks, both men sat down on the nearby bed and entered the interweb. Sam entered shortly after them and waited to see them. They did not arrive, and he remembered that he had spawned in a different place. He opened his fast travel interface and selected the correct section. There was a whooshing noise and he suddenly found himself standing on top of the building that he had spawned in on. The two other men were standing there, looking over the edge nervously. Sam walked up behind them and tapped their shoulders. Eduardo let out a very uncharacteristic scream and then scowled at Sam. Sam, how did you get here? The man asked. Lau merely smiled at his ignorance, in a way that suggested that he already knew everything about the situation. He somehow managed to pull this off without seeming condescending, which was a miracle as of itself. Eduardo ignored his saintly visage and instead paled as he saw Sam running towards the edge. Sam, what the hell? It was too late. Sam was already over the edge and Eduardo rushed over to look down. What he saw was the figure of Sam standing unharmed far below. He called up to them to follow, and Lau jumped next, completely trusting. Eduardo sighed and followed, landing safely on the ground far below. Okay, guys, welcome to the interweb. I would explain it, but I'm pretty sure that both of you should be getting a notification about now. That should explain it well enough. Sure enough, their eyes glazed over and they read over the screen for a moment. Then they looked up at Sam. How is this possible? Eduardo asked, a look of awe on his face. Sam shrugged and started to run towards the library. Both men followed him and they ran into the strange spatial dilation effect. Sam flashed them both cheeky grins and used his fast travel ability to appear in front of the library. He looked at the two men struggling to go up the street and beheld a very strange sight. They were moving in slow motion, with both of them almost appearing stationary. As Sam focused in, he saw that they were both moving slightly, but not much. He wondered what they were feeling as they watched him stand there. About half an hour later, they both arrived and the dilation effect stopped. Chapter 88 Eduardo looked at Sam with a snarl. What in the name of God was that? Why didn't you warn us? Sam laughed. I just wanted to see what it looked like. Also, now that you both have the fast travel thing, you should leave this space before someone gets the wrong idea with your bodies. Eduardo chuckled at this. Sam, I don't know if you noticed this, but we aren't exactly spring chickens. Sam let out a stifled laugh as he heard this. Jesus, Eduardo, your mind is really in the gutter. I thought that you worked at the Vatican? The other man grinned. Well, we have a saying there. The two most desperate types of men are teenage boys and priests. There's a grain of truth in that statement I think. Sam shook his head. You're incorrigible. As he said this, the two men vanished, and Sam followed them. It turned out that all he had to do to exit before his time was up was to just think about the desire to do so. He popped out into his bed and groaned as he unintentionally tweaked his abdominal muscles. That cut was so deep that it went all the way through. If not for his heightened attributes, he would have died in that arena. Sam flopped back and closed his eyes. He was tired and it was as good a time as any to rest. Perhaps he would even have another vision. He did not, only the normal sort of inane dreams about random stuff that somehow felt completely normal when you were in it. In one of them he was a dog chasing a house-sized cat with two heads and in another he was reading a magazine with a picture of Eduardo posing on it like a bodybuilder. The standard dream fair. He really doubted that there was something profound about seeing Eduardo with his shirt off, but perhaps there was. In any case, he did not remember it after he woke up. It seemed that his high wisdom stat allowed him a greater degree of lucidity within his dreams, because he was fully aware for some of the time. When Sam woke up, he was refreshed, and a large portion of his wound had already healed, between his stats and the liquid drip that he was connected to. Sam let out a deep breath and stretched out, glad that he was healing so quickly. It was a day until Sam was well enough to leave the hospital, which would have been an incredible turnover back on the pre-system earth, but now it was commonplace. For an injury that had pierced his entire body to be healed in a matter of days was something that he still could not quite believe. In any case, he was healed. Sam made his way out of the room and gave the comatose figure of Andrew Monroe one last glance. The man stared off into the distance, his eyes vacant. Whatever had happened to him during the fight had been something that would not be healed for a long time. 
Sam shuddered as he remembered the strange things that had happened as he had fought the other man. That had not been a normal battle, and his opponent had not been using conventional skills. Sam would get to the bottom of it eventually, but for now he had a tournament to win. He made his way back to his room and opened the door, before taking off his clothes and jumping into the hot tub. That cleared the last few bits of fatigue that clouded his mind and Sam let out a deep breath. Someone cleared their throat next to him and he jumped in surprise. Turning around slowly, he saw the figure of Lao looking at him with a smile on his face. Why are you here? Sam asked, a bit disturbed by the close proximity to naked, wrinkled flesh. The other man chuckled and took his time answering. I don't have a hot tub in my room, remember? I need something to heal some of my aches and pains from old age and the constant bowls of rice. I think that I told you about that. Sam reached back in his memory and remembered that the man had in fact told him about that. He sighed and leaned back in the tub. It didn't matter anyway. It wasn't like there was anything visible under the foam. He waited there for a few minutes until he had been refreshed and then left the tub, looking behind him to make sure that the older man wasn't looking. All he saw was the back of his head. Nodding in satisfaction, Sam got his clothes on and left the room, taking his time in walking to the arena. It was in the middle of a fight by the time that he arrived and he sat down. It was one of the final fights of the tournament in fact, and he leaned forwards. This one he did not want to miss. The overlord himself faced off against Rodney Kane, and the two men were having at it. It was quite clear that there was a gulf in power however, and the strange metallic suit that Rodney used was battered and scarred by the attacks of the other man. The overlord was dwarfed by the gigantic mecha, but he was still overpowering it with raw strength and speed. His fists were coated with the light of mana and his dao and each punch created a crater on the surface of the other man's armor. It was clearly going to end soon, and the winner was certain, but it was still taking the overlord some time and effort to defeat the other man. He was taking some hits in return from the great sword that the armor wielded, and Sam could make out a few small cuts on his body. Still, he was mostly unharmed and he was ahead of the other man. Sam wished that he had arrived earlier so that he could see how the overlord fought, but he had gotten here too late for that. Instead, he would have to be content with the scraps of the fight. With a roar, the overlord slammed his fists into the side of the armor, splitting it down the middle. An explosion of blood came out from underneath the armor, and it started to crumble away. Rodney Kane stumbled out and the overlord launched a punch at him. The attack was simple, but filled with power and the concept of the man's Dao, which Sam would now see with his new Dao connection, was some form of the idea of supremacy or something else to do with being more powerful than another person. He could also see that the idea was powerful, but that it was a fragile idea. It was a good thing to know for their fight that was sure to come. The fist came in and the other man actually dodged it, but the wind from its passing ruffled his head. It looked harmless, but then he stumbled, coughing up blood. It was as if the fist had an aura of power around it that damaged anything that it went through. That was a powerful ability, and yet another thing that Sam would have to watch out for. The manner in which the man was simply dismantling his opponent was intimidating to say the least, and Sam had to focus to nor be distracted by the theater that was going on in front of him. Rather than watch the battle, he watched what was going on behind the battle, the actions that the men took in order to be able to fight each other. This was the battle behind the battle, the true series of motions that would spell the end of the battle. He did not know exactly what this was that he was watching, but it was somehow related to his wisdom and the interplay of his mental stats. It was allowing him to predict the movement of the two men, based on how they fought with each other. Slowly but surely, he was creating a mental map of their styles and ability to fight. He took a look at the leaderboards, to see what would happen when Rodney lost. There were still a few of the losers bracket matches to be fought, so if the man lost now then he would be up again later to fight Sam. There were even fewer people left in the arena now, and they had started to cluster into the center. Without the presence of their leader, the opposing faction was looking a bit perturbed by how they were faring. Chapter 89 Only about 10 to 15 fighters remained on each side, and these people were the cream of the crop of earth. Nobody had received their rewards yet, which meant that they would all get them after the tournament was over. Sam sighed and returned his attention to the battle, dreaming about what he would do when he had left the tournament. He would have to fight to protect his people, of course, but there would be more free time to do what he pleased, which was, if he was being honest with himself, probably going to be more training. He no longer had any sort of inclination for entertainment, which was strange, but he supposed that life was now its own form of entertainment, a real-life video game with stakes that were all too high. He cut out all of the noise from his head, and watched the final moments of the fight. The overlord had pulled out all the stops for his finisher, and Sam could feel the pressure from here. He was in the process of constructing some sort of beam attack between his hands that glowed with an ominous light. If that hit Rodney, there would be no going back for the man. 
Sam could feel a vague sense of unease as he looked onto the spiraling depths of the ball of energy, and he fancied that he saw his own death there, trampled under the foot of the overlord. He shook his head and cleared the Tao influence from his mind with a surge of his own. He would not be intimidated that easily. The man taunted Rodney with a few muttered threats, obviously trying to get him to attack him before he surrendered. Instead, Rodney took the wise course of action and surrendered before he died. Sam had not taken the man for a coward, but he supposed that it was the smart thing to do in that situation. Still, the sigh of relief that he let out afterwards was all too audible. Sam shook his head at the uncharitable thought. That might well be him soon. As Rodney walked out of the arena under his own steam, a rarity in these past fights, he gave Sam a strange look. It almost seemed as if he was saying good luck to him, which would have been very out of character. He wondered why the man had done so, but then he heard a voice coming out of the monitor. The fighter known as the Overlord has invoked Section 49B of the Mutiversal Tournament Code, and has waived his right to recuperate for a chance to challenge any fighter of his choice. He has decided to fight against the Arbiter. Will the fighter in question please make their way up to the arena? All eyes turned to Sam and he gulped. That had been unexpected. He smiled in an attempt to calm himself, but he knew that he was not ready for this fight. Either he was going to make a fool out of himself, or he was going to die. It was highly unlikely that he would be able to defeat the other man. The voice rang out again. Make your way to the arena now or be disqualified. Sam jumped up and started walking. He had been too lost in thought to remember what he had been supposed to do. As he entered the arena, the noise of the crowd reached a fever pitch. This was the fight that they had all been waiting for. He took a deep breath and stepped onto the sands. His anxiety was creating the effect of being in a far larger arena, and the cheers of the crowd sounded deafening. The overlord loomed large in his vision, almost as if he was a god standing in front of Sam. Then he blinked and the effect was gone. That had not been his mind acting up, but an actual attack from the other man. Sam could not tell what the other man's face looked like now on account of his hood, but he was sure that it was not happy. Sam walked forwards and smiled at the overlord, trying to show that he wasn't afraid. His rapidly beating heart belied that fact, and he was sure that his opponent, along with everyone in the arena, could sense it. With the start of the tournament announced, the overlord dashed forwards. Sam gulped. The sheer speed that the man was exhibiting was almost insurmountable to Sam and he was only able to dodge by the tiniest of margins. That had the unexpected effect of making it look like he was a lot more skilled than he actually was, which caused the crowd to start cheering again. As the other man wheeled around to attack again, Sam noticed something strange. He almost appeared as if the man was moving slower than before. Only by a tiny amount, but still noticeable. Your Tao revolves around the perception of your power, doesn't it? Sam said, gambling on the hope that the other man would answer him and not take advantage of his distraction. The other man narrowed his eyes and stopped. What do you think you know about me? He asked, his voice stony. Sam shrugged. I can sense your Tao essence from here. Something to do with supremacy, right? The other man snarled and raised his fist, beginning to empower it with mana. You're an annoying little rat, do you know that? Your level is nowhere near as high as mine, but you have some cheat ability that is allowing you to progress with your Tao at a much faster rate than should be possible. Admit it, you bastard. The tone in the man's voice was surprising to Sam. Could it be that he was jealous of Sam's aptitude with the Tao? He dropped the thought as the overlord's fist powered through the air towards him. It was too fast for Sam to even see, so he raised up his mace and started to create a mana shield around it and him. The fist impacted like a meteor and the shield almost instantly cracked, sending Sam flying. He coughed up blood and rolled to his feet. The strength behind that blow had been too much for anyone of the level that the overlord was at to possess. It was far more than even Sam's, and he had passed his first threshold. He would have understood if the other man had focused solely on strength, but he was just as powerful in all the other stats as well. Sam was convinced that it had something to do with the overlord's Tao. He was just too strong otherwise. But, there had been something that had caught Sam's eye. The effect had gone now, but for the briefest of moments after Sam had dodged the man's first attack, the overlord had slowed down. Sam did not know how to capitalize on that, but he would. For not, it was time to get serious. Sam did not know if that would even be enough, but he had to try. With a deep breath, he centered himself, a hard task with the overlord barreling across the sand towards him, and he began to draw upon his Tao. The fiery essence of his Tao began to fill him up, a bit more muted than when he faced off against Andrew Monroe, but still there nonetheless. As well as that, he used his eyes of judgment skill on the overlord, surprised when it only showed the man as having a small amount of taint. It still gave him a boost however, and he welcomed every edge that he could get. All of this barely made it so that the next punch did not send him as far. 
The other man seemed to be gaining power from each successful attack that he performed on Sam, and soon he would be too powerful to fight against at all. In addition, it was quite hard to fight against a pugilist with a mace, as it was far too easy for someone using their fists to get within his guard. So he decided to do something different. Sam dropped his mace and got into a primitive boxing stance. Straining his mind to modify his fighting style, Sam began to use his fists as if they were tiny maces. The idea actually worked somewhat effectively, and the next attack that came in was redirected by his fists to the side. As he did so, the audience started cheering again. Sam was not cheering, mainly because he had broken a bone in his hand from just partially blocking that attack. He winced in pain and tried to recover before the next attack came in. Because he had stopped the punch, the subsequent one was slower than before and he ducked underneath it. Slamming his hand into the base of the other man's chin, he succeeded in sending him backwards a single step. It was like hitting a brick wall, and his knuckle bones cracked from the strain. There was something else going on here, something beyond simple supremacy-based power gains. There was no way that the man was still this durable after his strength had been curbed somewhat. As Sam attacked again, this time he coated his fist in the raw essence of his Tao. It felt strange, as if he was pumping it full of air like a balloon, and the appendage became lighter which allowed him to swing it more effectively. A shot of earth elemental energy into the hand brought its weight back to normal levels. With his perfected fist, Sam punched with everything that he had. The overlord smiled and opened his arms wide. If this attack failed, it was game over for Sam. Chapter 90 The effect of mitigating such an obviously powerful attack would make it so that the overlord was basically invincible. Sam could not and would not allow that. With every last muscle fiber in his body triggering, Sam punched forwards. His fist felt like it was a rocket, speeding towards its target at almost imperceptible levels of speed. However, it would be impossible to redirect now that it was in motion. When it landed, Sam immediately felt every bone in his hand break. He let out a cry of pain and watched as the rest of his arm crumpled. However, it was not for vain. The body of the previously invulnerable overlord streaked through the air, impacting the arena wall like a gunshot. The man immediately got to his feet, but the damage was done. A single drop of blood dripped down from his mouth and the man stumbled. He came in again, this time at barely more than Sam's top speed. Sam smiled and twisted around, grabbing the man's hand and throwing him over his shoulder in a judo toss, slamming him head first into the ground. He let go and jumped back, waiting for the other man to get up. A red light began to shine from the man's body, and the sand started to melt beneath him. With a demonic roar, he got to his feet and stared at Sam. His muscles were bulked up with power, and his body radiated energy that started to break down Sam's cells with its pure power. It was not painful, but Sam could see the veins of necrosis starting to work their way up his skin. He snarled and started to channel his Tao to counteract them. It was like fighting a fire with a squirt gun, but it at least stemmed its spread. The overlord let out a deafening cry that caused the audience to recoil in their seats, and Sam's ears to bleed. Then he spoke in a gravelly, raspy tone that sounded like that of a demon. You are the first to force me to show this form, Arbiter. I was surprised that you figured out my abilities so quickly, but I suppose that was going to happen eventually. Now, I will give you one chance to surrender, and then I shall attack. Will you do this? Knowing the man's power set now allowed Sam to guess what he was trying to do. Willing capitulation would increase his power far more than a forced surrender would. Sam shook his head and began to channel his Tao and elemental energy. The two forces crashed together inside his body like titanic waves and started to spread throughout it, creating a web of power that girded his bones and skin. It was slowly tearing him apart, but he could deal with the pain for now. He had never attempted this before, and the energies wanted to get out of his body, but he would not let them do so. They were his, and they would obey. On the outside, his body began to glow and he lifted off of the ground by a tiny amount. Most did not notice it, but the stronger fighters did. Everyone had gone silent by this point and the atmosphere was such that one could hear a pin drop. And drop it did. With twin screams, the two fighters rushed each other. As soon as Sam crossed fists with his opponent, he knew that he had lost. His right arm shattered instantly, and the shockwave spread up the rest of his body, rattling his skull. His already broken hand was reduced to a mess of pulp and shattered bone shards, and it took all he had to not cry out in pain. Instead, he surrendered, just before the next fist could shatter his skull. The other man retracted his fist and chuckled to himself. Sam walked out of the arena, at least able to still stand, and he collapsed into his chair. The people around him started to whisper and he drifted in and out of consciousness. He probably should have looked for a healer first. Sam woke up some time later, lying on the bed of his room. 
Somebody had hooked him up to one of those healing drips, and he wondered why he was not in the hospital room. Instead, he was surrounded by a few of the other members of his faction and he looked up to see Eduardo and Lau looking down at them. Both of them looked concerned. That was not as equal of a fight as I was expecting. That man is bad news, Eduardo said, looking down at Sam with a worried expression. Sam nodded. Just one punch from that final form of his broke my arm. I'm going to need to train a lot if I hope to surpass him. At least I figured out his weakness, not that it does much good. What was that you were doing with your attacks? It seemed like you were aiming for some effect beyond just damage, Lao asked Sam. The overlord has a doubt that has something to do with how powerful he is in relation to others. If he lands a hit on his opponent, he gets stronger, but if he misses or is blocked, then he gets weaker. Still, it doesn't do that much though. The others nodded as they suddenly understood what had been happening. Lao and Eduardo exchanged glances and then shooed the others out of the room. The fighters left without a word, and they were left alone with nobody to eavesdrop. Eduardo sat down by Sam on his bed and let out a sigh. Well, I guess we can at least aim for second place. Both you and Rodney Kane are in the loser's bracket right now, and you will have to fight him to leave it. That will be the last thing that you will need to do to get second place. As for us, we will definitely get top 10, but I do not know which place in it. Sam nodded. They were both in the winner's bracket now and they were in the last segment of the battle. The only problem would be if they had to fight each other. It probably would come down to that eventually. Sam lay back and winced as his arm was jostled by the motion. He forced himself to look down at it and was pleasantly surprised by how intact it was. The bones had pulled back together somewhat and his arm bones were almost fully repaired. How long has it been? Sam asked the others. About three hours, Lao said, looking at something off in the distance. Sam followed his gaze, but there was nothing there. He had expected to see a clock or something like that, but it seemed that the man had simply known the time from somewhere else. Lao noticed Sam's gaze and he smiled. The system clock is quite useful, he said. Sam gave him a look. What's that? Sam asked, narrowing his eyes. Lao smiled at him. Look at your system interface and imagine seeing a clock. It should pop up immediately. Sam followed the man's instructions and found that there was indeed a function for a system clock. It appeared in front of him, and he was finally able to see the time again. That must have been why there were no clocks in the arena because they had assumed that all the fighters had access to a clock of their own. It made a good deal of sense to him. As he opened it up, he saw that it was 4.37 in the afternoon. Sam closed the screen and closed his eyes briefly. Ignoring the others, he tried to visualize everything that he had done in the battle. However, all that he was able to surmise was that the overlord was too powerful to fight, no matter what he did. Sam needed to level up and to develop his skills some more in order to even have a chance. Chapter 91 As the only opponent that Sam would be allowed to fight would be Rodney Kane, he had some time to practice his abilities and skills. His maze mastery was good enough for what he was planning, as he had no way to upgrade something that was the creation of a being far more powerful than him. No, what his idea was to walk down the long road of full body enhancement. The ability that he had used against the overlord in the last minutes of the fight had catapulted his power to extents that he had never dreamed of before, and if it had been mastered, it might have been enough. So, Sam began to train, with the help of Sarge. After his arm had fully healed, he was able to enhance it properly, and today would be the first time that he attempted to use the skill again. Walking up to Sarge, Sam sat down and tried to think of what he would say. I don't suppose that you have access to the arena feeds? Sam asked. The robot nodded. Of course, one of my primary functions is to masquerade as one of the fighters that my charges will have to fight. I was surprised that you did not make use of that function. Sam was pleasantly surprised, and his face showed as much. Huh, can you mimic the fighting style and power of the overlord's last form then? Yes, but do you really want to fight something at that power again? I might accidentally kill you. Sam was almost about to so no, but then a surge of resolve hit him. Shaking his head, Sam answered. No, I will win this tournament at all costs. I will take some pain if it is necessary. Sarge muttered something that sounded vaguely like a warning that Sam was going to be in a lot more than some pain. The robot sighed and got up, and immediately sent out a surge of aura. Sarge's body began to take on the color of the overlord's form as well, creating the illusion of the man standing in front of Sam. With a deep breath, Sam stepped into the arena. It was time to see if he had what it took to be the strongest. As soon as he entered the arena, Sam was blindsided by a punch so powerful that all of the teeth of the right side of his face were sent flying out of his mouth. Even then, he could tell that the robot was holding back. Sam scampered backwards and rapidly began to cycle his Tao and elemental energy, trying to ignore the searing pain of his mouth. 
Sarge walked slowly towards him, mimicking the character of the overlord as well. This gave Sam time to start enhancing himself. The power of his Tao energy and his earth mastery started to coalesce, creating an incredibly unstable matrix of energy within his body. Sam closed his eyes. If he was to pull this off without crippling himself, he needed to focus. It took everything that he had to ignore the overwhelming presence walking towards him, but Sam persevered. With a cracking noise, the matrix sunk into his bones and muscles, causing his body to erupt into agony. Along with it came a strange feeling, one that felt as if his body was a puppet, and his was the puppet master. Moving came easier to him, and Sam sensed that he would be able to pick himself up with his mind if he wanted to. As a punch spiraled in, he tested it out. As soon as he tried to move, his body rebelled, and he fell backwards into unconsciousness. Sam woke up to see the figure of Sarge looming over him. He groaned and got up, nursing a splitting headache. Running his tongue around his mouth, he was pleased to find that his teeth were already regrowing. He slowly got to his feet and immediately fell over. What happened? Sam asked Sarge. The robot shrugged. I have no idea. Your arms twitched, and then you fell over. That was all I saw. Sam sighed. This might take a while to perfect. It had worked during the actual arena match, and Sam stopped for a moment to wonder why it had failed now. His memories of the fight were crystal clear, and he found the difference soon enough. In the fight with the Overlord, it had been the first time that he had used the technique, and it had not bonded with his body in the way that it had just done. It seemed that the power of the technique would be inhibited by how little it was integrated with his body. Sam would have to train the skill in order to allow it to seamlessly merge with his bones. What he suspected was that there was too much power contained within his Tao to be fully integrated into his body. If Sam had to hazard a guess, he would assume that only F ranks and above usually had a Tao fragment. For now, his stats were likely too low to integrate it, at least without years of practice. Unfortunately, there were no ways to get essence where he was, not unless there was something that he had been overlooking the entire time. As if reading his mind, Sarge spoke. Your technique is stressing your body, correct? I believe that you need more levels for it to work properly. Why do you not take on some missions in the multiversal interweb? Sam stared at the robot. What? How would I do that? I thought that it was just a computer simulation. There aren't any real monsters to kill there or anything. The robot shook his head. I mean that people offer essence rewards in exchange for certain services. In a manner similar to bounty posts, that is, just with essence rather than credits. Sam nodded. He had collected one of them himself. How do I find these? Sam asked Sarge. It should be near the spawn point, you won't miss it. I have never actually seen one, only the code that represents it, but it should be pretty clear. Sam thanked the robot and entered the interweb. He emerged in front of the library and rather than enter, he started to look around for something that looked like a bounty posting. Further down the street, there was something that looked like an open-air market, but each stall was covered in pieces of paper rather than goods. That looked promising, and Sam started to make his way towards it. The space dilation kicked in as soon as he set foot on the street, and it took him a good part of an hour to reach his destination. When he entered the market, the dilation stopped. Sam made his way to the nearest booth and found that it was manned by a strange green alien with five arms. It looked up at him and pointed at the piece of paper. Sam wondered why it just didn't talk to him, but then he saw that it did not have a mouth. He picked up one of the pieces of paper and read it. Wanted. 10 pieces of reality stone, 0.1% purity. Reward, 10, 000, 000 essence. Deliver to Tavroxis Alt Run, Planet Devana 4. Sam put it down. That was not something that he would be able to do. He had no idea what reality stone was, and he had no idea how to get it. Instead, he picked up another piece of paper. Wanted. Dow tutoring for fragment stage breakthrough. Only accepting tutors who already have a fragment. Reward, 75, 000, 000 essence. Contact the buyer through this link. Carrot asterisk carrot percent asterisk asterisk carrot 7. A series of random characters were scrawled along the bottom, and they glowed with a faint blue light, appearing to be some sort of hyperlink. Sam clicked on it, and he was whisked away. This time, he could see where he was going, and he was being carried at high speeds across the city towards a nondescript building. The force carried him inside and set him down in front of a group of dour looking elderly men and women in robes. They were not human but they were close in appearance, certainly closer than many of the aliens that Sam had seen in the market. They had pallid gray skin and tiny horns on their brow, but apart from that, they looked like normal people. In front of them sat a young man in a cross-legged position. As soon as Sam entered, he felt an extremely powerful aura locked down on him, imbued with a Tao. He frowned and pushed back with his own one, making the aura unable to gain purchase on him. 
One of the elders sighed in relief. Good, you really do have what we need. Some of the previous applicants were fraudsters. Let me introduce myself. I am one of the elders of the Manthrox sect, a small F-rank sect that resides on a planet of the same name. Our scion here is our last hope to break free of our earthly shackles and take to the stars. He had touched upon the inklings of the Tao path that leads to the Tao of space, and we need that to be able to leave our planet. Will you help us out? Sam didn't know what to make of that proclamation, and he paused in thought. After a minute of thought, he nodded. All right. What do you need me to do? Chapter 92 One of the elders whispered something to his neighbor, and she laughed. The man who had spoken to Sam flashed them a look and they quieted. You must provide instruction to our scion so that he can break through. We purposefully placed this request in a newly initialized universe because of how anyone there with a Tao fragment would be a genius of the first order. In fact, I can sense the paths of karma and fate twist around like you like light around a black hole. You are the first in your universe to gain a Tao fragment, are you not? Sam considered lying, but then he nodded. The man smiled and looked at one of the women. My wife is a big fan of you, Arbiter. She follows your fights on the interweb whenever they are on. Surprised that the man knew him, Sam realized that he had access to information from people outside of his universe. Wait a minute, am I famous or something? The man and his wife chuckled. In the nearby universes, most definitely so. It is a pity that your universe is in the clutches of the butcher, but perhaps you shall be the first to end his bloody reign. One of the other elders hit the man on the back of the head. Talnor, do not say such things where people might hear. The man winced and looked back at Sam. We can speak after, but for now we need your services. When you are ready, we can begin. Sam nodded and walked over to the boy sitting on the ground. What do you need me to do? Sam asked. You must field your Tao aura in a way that it creates a crucible in which the boy can form his own. Make it so that he is suppressed, but not overwhelmed. Sam gave him a look. Why can't you just do it? Surely you all have fragments by now. The man laughed. Oh, the follies of the newly initialized. Most people do not gain Tao fragments for decades. Ordinary life is not exactly conducive to their creation. Sam cocked his head. It seemed that his privileged situation had inured him to the realities of the multiverse, as well as only hearing about the prodigies, those who had created their Tao ahead of the curve. He nodded and began the process. Sitting down next to the boy, he fielded his aura, making sure to do so slowly and carefully. He tried to make it as the elder had directed, suppressive, but not overwhelming. Judging that by the expressions that the boy made, he was able to find a happy balance. He sat there for a while, starting to reach out with his Tao sense into the boy. What he saw there made him frown. The boy's Tao was like a mess of power, technically complete, but completely unrefined. Doing something that he had never done before, Sam reached out with his Tao and started to alter the fabric of the boys with its power. He sank into a deep trance, and lost all sight and track of what he was doing. He weaved the strands of power back into a cohesive whole, creating a miniature sun inside the boy's body. It was nowhere near as perfect as his own, but it was a far cry from what had been there before. Wiping a bead of sweat off of his head, Sam withdrew his aura somewhat and began to feel a pressure building against its constraints. He pushed back and as the two forces clashed, the orb of power within the boy started to shine brighter and brighter. With a clap of thunder, it blossomed into full force, a nascent star within his body. The process had been a bit different that Sam's own, likely because he had fused two Daos together, rather than just upgrading one of them. The boy opened his eyes, a look of wonder on his face. H. How? What was that? My Dao is so much more powerful than before. The elders looked at Sam with an expression of shock. One of them walked over to the boy and asked him a question softly. Sam could not hear it, but he could hear the answer. It was like there was a beneficent god from on high, directing me through the creation process. The leader of the group looked at Sam with tears in his eyes, and then did something unexpected. He fell to his knees and started bowing before Sam. The rest of the group followed suit. As they rose, the leader took Sam's hand in his and shook it. You have gone far beyond what we asked for. Unfortunately, we cannot raise the essence reward, but I have a better proposition for you. From now on, we shall join your faction, as soon as you create it that is. Using the new power of our scion, we can make our way to the universal portals, and from there travel to your universe. How does that sound? Sam was stunned. Wait a second, you said that you all were in control of a planet, right? They nodded. And all of that power would then be under me? They nodded again. Sam grinned. Hell yeah, I'm in. The other man smiled and then turned to his companions. I think it's time for introductions. I am Talnor Manthrox, and the other members of our sect will introduce themselves to you at their discretion. Unfortunately, there is no time to do so right now, but rest assured, 
we will be coming within the year. I swear it upon my cultivation. The rest of the elders made similar oaths, and then they flickered out of sight. As they did so, Sam was filled with power as the essence filtered into him. He left the interweb to see his new level and stats. Firstly though, there was a notification. You have gained the class skill, Dao Pedagogy, Legendary, Great is the man who possesses power. Greater still is the man who uses that power to benefit his disciples. Greatest is the man who can use that power to develop the power within his students. Many would kill for this skill, whether for it to be used on them or for it to be given to them. Be careful of those you show this to, for it has the potential to change the lives of many. You are able to fix flaws in the Daos of those who possess a lower level Dao than your own. There was another one underneath it. You have gained your first class skill. Class skills are kept within the Dao annals, ready to be implanted into the class user upon either reaching a prerequisite, or upon forming it for themselves. Your class does not possess any records, so you gain assistance in forming them instead. Ha, huh, I guess it really is unique after all. Jeffrey was right, Sam said, looking at the message. It seemed that he was within uncharted territory. Before he could explore this more he could feel the subtle pressure of multiple levels waiting for him. Sam did not know how much essence corresponded to a level, but he would be able to find out easily enough. You have leveled up, x3. You have reached the essence cap for non-combat or cultivation-related essence gains for your rank. Sam frowned. That had been a lot less that he had expected for how much essence he had received. He opened his stat sheet and inwardly winced. Sam Atlas. Human. Mortal tier. G rank. Class, Dao Visionary. Level 35. 9 free stat points. Strength. 60. 1.38x. Constitution. 43. 1.38x. Resilience. 33. 1.38x. Dexterity. 31. 1.38x. Intelligence. 48. 1.38x. Wisdom. 67. 1.38x. Health 430 slash 430. Mana 400 slash 400. Stamina 900 out of 900. Dao. Dao Fragment of Righteous Anger, First Step. Skills. 1x Common, 2x Rare, 4x Legendary. Titles. 1x Celestial. Temporary Titles. 1x Epic, 1x Legendary, 1x Mythical. Dao Heritage. Dao Incarnation of Existence. Party. Torturna Salvinii Brescan, Level 29. Health 370-370. Racks, Level 28. Health 410-410. Skill Branches. Muscle Density Enhancement, Level 1. Basic Weapon Knowledge, Blunt, Level 1. Weapon Style. Flowing Water Style. Weapon Mastery, Implement Stage 5. Elemental Affinities. Earth, 1% Mastery. Sam was on the cusp of his intelligence threshold and he knew that the breakthrough would be just as painful as all the others. The only question was whether he should bite the bullet now and take the pain, or wait until his next level. Before he could change his mind, Sam added the two stat points to the stat. Chapter 93. As soon as he did so, a strange feeling overtook him. His mind started to drift upwards, and out of his body. As it did so, he began to feel a strange sense of unease as he exited his skin. As soon as that happened, his mind was blasted with what felt like the full truth of creation. Everything that could be conceived, and some that could not, were funneled into his mind like bullets of pure insight. He screamed, but he had no mouth with which to scream. Sam's mind started to expand, dancing perilously close to the edge of insanity. Then it stopped, and the feeling was gone. He gasped as he was sent back into his body and sheltered from the storm of information. It had been not physically painful per se, but painful in the way that trying to multitask beyond your limits was. Only on a far larger scale. Now that he was past that however, he felt like a new man. Every action that he had taken within the last few days was laid bare to his sight, telling him what he should have done in those situations. However, this insight was tempered with the knowledge that the past was done, and that there was no point worrying about it. That must have been his wisdom kicking in to mitigate the effects of untrammeled intelligence. Sam was glad that he had picked that stat to upgrade first. The notification came in, and Sam read it quickly, his new intelligence allowing him to read the entire paragraph in less than a second. You have passed the first threshold of intelligence. Intelligence is often mistaken for wisdom, but in reality they are two vastly different things that need each other to be efficient. Intelligence allows for raw analytical capacity and processing speed, but does not govern itself. If someone knows everything, save for the knowledge of what to do with it, then do they not simply know nothing at all? Sam chuckled at the sheer depth of that last sentence. 
The threshold notifications for both intelligence and wisdom had been filled with pithy insights that sounded straight out of a philosophy book. As he got used to his new intelligence, he remembered something that disturbed him. The last time that he had received free essence, it had corrupted his body somewhat. Had that happened to him now? Sam searched his status, but found nothing. He was fine, but he did not know why he was so. Perhaps it was something to do with how the notification last time had told him that only unearned essence would harm his cultivation. Shrugging, he returned to his stat sheet. He had another seven points to allocate, which was enough to get him ten points into any stat of his choice with his multiplier. With a sigh, he saw that he would be able to pass another threshold. Gritting his teeth, he put the points into constitution. As soon as he did so, an ominous crack could be heard coming from his body. He looked down and saw that his bones were sticking out of his skin, completely shattered. The pain hit him a moment later, and he screamed out loud. Hoping that the room was soundproofed, he continued. His bones were torn completely out of his body, and he flopped to the ground without anything to hold him up. They started to clack together, forming a new skeleton in the air in front of him. As they did so, they began to glow and fuse together, becoming denser and smoother. Mana was sucked out of him to facilitate this change, and the marrow within his bones was hardened and made more durable. Meanwhile his skin and flesh was having the same thing happen to it, only on a lesser scale. The pain of this was immense, and even worse than the pain for the strength threshold. It was as if he was feeling his bones, despite them not actually being in his body. It was a maddening sensation, but one that thankfully dissipated after a few minutes. Still, he could feel the uncomfortable out-of-body tingling for a bit afterwards. With a crack, the bones locked together fully and then flew at Sam. Without anything to block or move with, he had to sit there as they forced their way into his body. As they did that, the blood and viscera on the ground flew up and back into his body, making it whole again. Coughing up some strange black substance, Sam felt the pain disappear. You have passed the first threshold of constitution. Meaty, thick, built, these are words that might be used to describe you. That is, if you had chosen to transition through a different Tao archetype. Instead of selecting the stereotypical image of a tank, you opted to remain the same as you were before. In saying goodbye to your five-foot-wide shoulders, you said goodbye to the possible hordes of suitors that would follow you. Some might consider that a blessing, and others a curse. Sam laughed out loud at that one, as it was like the description of the heavyweight class from his class selection ceremony. Now that he had gone through both of the excruciating changes, Sam checked his stats. Sure enough, both his health and mana had gone up the former to 795 and the latter to 765. Sam exited his status sheet and got up. It was time to perfect his new skill seeing as he was more powerful now. Sarge got to its feet as Sam approached, and the robot smiled. It knew that he was ready now to train, and that was the robot's primary directive, to help others train. Nothing else would make it happier, save perhaps for its freedom. There however lay a slippery slope of obtuse ethics, which Sam did not really want to get into. For now, he had a tournament to win. Entering the arena with the robot, Sam started to prepare his skill. Sarge let him do it, powering up as well. Sinking into himself, Sam constructed the network of energy and slotted it into his bones. Now that his bones had been enhanced, they seemed to take the energy far more easily than before, and the feeling of power from the skill washed over him like a wave of warmth. He felt strong, fast, dangerous even. More than anything else, he felt ready. With a surge of will, his right arm shot out, at speeds that even he could barely see. Clenching his fist, Sam got into a fighting stance. He would use this to train his pugilism as well, seeing as he would not always be able to use a mace in battle. Sarge clapped its hands, and the robot sped across the ground towards him. This time however, Sam could see him. As the robot's fist slammed into where Sam would have been, he grabbed a hold of it, and winced as his bones and ligaments started to feel the strain. A little pain was nothing however, and he continued. Tearing the robot off the ground and out of the grasp of gravity, Sam threw Sarge into the hard floor, causing it to crack slightly. The robot was unharmed, but it was a big difference to the previous fight. Sam flitted backwards, reveling in his new speed, and then he tripped on something immaterial. As he fell towards the ground, he realized that his left leg had given out. With a sigh, he cancelled the skill and fell to the ground. Damn it. Why is this skill so hard to use? Sam screamed as he pounded the ground with his fist. At least he had been able to do it more easily this time. It would work in a fight, but only for a moment. He got to his feet, helped up by Sarge and he clenched his fist as the robot did so. Sarge didn't seem to mind, and the hard metal was nice to squeeze, seeing as it would not break under his grasp. He stood up fully and then gave Sarge a determined look. I will do this, Sam said, as much to himself as the robot. 
Sarge nodded and gave him a grin. Good. Remember your promise, I am looking forward to my new body. Sam nodded. I will. Thank you for all you have done. Sam rested for another ten minutes, and then got up. His body seemed to be healed from his mild exertion, and it was time to continue. Chapter 94 He entered the circle and this time started to pay attention to what he was doing. As he did this, the process slowed down, until he could see every aspect of it. Small particles of energy from his Tao exited the orb and collided with yellow energy that coursed outwards from his meridian. This created the special energy that he could use to enhance himself. Thinking about it more, Sam remembered that he had selected Earth because it would match well with his Tao of the Arbiter. It looked like it was synergizing well with this one as well. The energy crackled as it condensed into a stronger form, creating a template on the inside of his body for his bones. As it entered them, he saw the bone matter briefly glowing and discharging a wave of colorless power into the surrounding tissue. It dissipated quickly, but the effects could be felt afterwards. As Sam zeroed in his sight into the tissue, he could see that they were slowly breaking down under the effects of the power. It was at a negligible rate, but as he moved, it sped up. That was why he was suffering from the skill if he used it for too long. Sam opened his eyes and returned to the here and now. Sarge waited for him to attack, and Sam did so. He pulled his fist back and he punched forwards as he ran, crunching his fist into the torso of the robot. Sam's arm twinged, but it held firm and an indent of his fist could faintly be seen on the robot's torso, before it disappeared as if it had never been there. Sarge twisted in the air and landed feet first, cocking back its hand and rushing Sam. He forced his body to move under the fist, as it was moving far faster than he would hope to dodge with just his natural movements. He winced as something tore in his back, and he dropped to the ground again. This would be a long training session. Five or six hours later, Sam was able to use the skill for about ten minutes without faltering. If he overextended himself however, that time was slashed down to almost nothing. He was able to fight Sarge using the full power of the Overlord to a standstill, but he was quickly overwhelmed. If this was the best showing that he could put up against a poor imitation of the man, he would be instantly defeated the next time. His only hope of salvation was that he could exploit the other man's strange doubt in order to force him to cede the advantage. Any normal fighter, prepared in advance, would go all out against a fighter that they had battled before. However, Sam thought that it was much more likely that the Overlord would wait, in order to build up his Tao power. It was a powerful Tao, but one with many strictures. Without it, the Overlord would still have been the strongest, because of his level, but it would have been a much more even fight. Sam checked the leaderboards, but there were no changes. He was still in third place. If all went as planned, his next opponent would be Rodney Kane, a good warm-up for his final battle. Sam finished up his training for the day, as it would be useless to push his body beyond its abilities. All that would do would be to make it so that he was tired and sore for his next fight, and that would not do. Instead, he decided to do something a bit less intensive. Cultivating his meridian. Entering his body, he made his way to the spinning orb of earth elemental energy, and stared deep into its depths. The sight of almost invisible creatures and things swimming around in its depths tantalized him with the slightest echoes of advanced concepts and abilities, but they were completely out of his reach. Instead, Sam sat down within the metaphysical space within his body that his meridian was located in, and started to meditate. He did not think about anything in particular, instead simply letting the power of his meridian guide him. He could feel that he was on the cusp of a breakthrough, as a result of his usage of the element, but he needed to do a little bit of non-physical contemplation first. As he sat there, for an indeterminate amount of time, small truths and nuggets of information entered his mind. It was on a subconscious level, and he did not register then consciously, but it was enough to push him over the edge. With a pop, his meridian flared with light and then let out a small nova of power that dissipated after a moment. Sam exited his meditation and checked his stat sheet. Sure enough, there was the notification. You have reached 2% mastery of your meridian of earth. Now with nothing else to do for a while, Sam played around with his stat sheet. He had configured it to display his skills and titles when he selected that area, but he had never really tested it out yet. Clicking on the skills section first, he waited to see what it would say. Skills. Dao Pedagogy, Legendary. Basic Dao Channeling, Legendary. Fiery Justice, Legendary. Eyes of Judgment, Legendary. Lesser Mana Bulwark, Rare. Elemental Sight, Rare. Basic Analyze, Common. It seemed that it organized the skills by rarity, similar to how it did on the main status sheet, but also gave more details about them such as the names. Satisfied, Sam closed the skills section and entered the titles 1. Titles. 
Greater Dow Paragon of the 10,239,428,157th Universe, Celestial. Temporary Titles. Number 1 Dow, Planet Earth, Mythical. Top 3 Power, Planet Earth, Legendary. Top 10 Levels, Planet Earth, Epic. Sam nodded as he read the titles. It was exactly what he had expected. As he closed his status, he wondered if there was something about titles in the interweb. He entered the multiversal communication web and teleported to the library. Entering the door, he connected to a vacant information port and immediately searched titles. A generic system entry came up first, which is what he opened. Titles. Titles are a concrete appreciation of a being's accomplishment, made solid by the Tao archetype of merit. Upon gaining a title, one receives a reward based on the type of title. Usually this is a stat boost or a boost to something else. As well as normal titles, there are temporary titles, which include titles related to ruling a specific territory, something based on a hierarchy, or a fugitive title for criminals. Titles are organized by rarity, similar to skills. They start at common, and go all the way up to the highest rarity, which is not within the purview of a minor universe to see. Sam groaned as he saw the blockage of information from the system. Why could it not just tell everyone what they had to prepare for? What was the point of all this cloak and dagger stuff when it was likely that everyone would find out anyway? Or perhaps they wouldn't. Thinking about his personal experience, Sam realized that most people who aspired to power died by the sword of their own path. Barely anyone would ever reach the top, and to keep it fair to those who did, the system hid information about them. He closed the tab and looked at the other results that came up. Most of them were dry academic entries about the interaction of titles, and how to get specific titles, but of course, none of them were useful. The most interesting thing that he saw there was a method to get the common title of questioner. All that meant was that someone had questioned the nature of reality at some point in their life, and had directed it towards gaining a title. Sam realized that he was already going down the rabbit hole, and closed the tab, but it was too late. You have gained the title, questioner, common. Am I real? Plus 25% certainty that your reality is a lie. Sam groaned and immediately looked up something else, which was how to get rid of titles. Title removal. For titles without any concrete benefit, one can simply wish for them to be removed. Huh, that's pretty easy, Sam said to himself. He selected the worthless title with his mind and banished it. It disappeared out of his title screen, and it was as if it never had existed. Sam wondered if that article pertaining to the questioner title had been some sort of joke, like a computer virus back on old earth that would infect your computer with an annoying but harmless effect. Sam sighed and let out a little chuckle. It was quite funny now that he thought about it. If it had been something harmful, he would have been annoyed, but it was just a joke. Now that he had gotten what he was looking for, Sam left the interweb and returned to his room. Chapter 95 Sarge was waiting for him there, with a flustered expression on his face. Sam, there's something happening at the arena. There was just an announcement made summoning all fighters there. You missed it because you were on the interweb. You better hurry. Damn it. Sam exclaimed as he ran out the door, picking up his mace as he went. In case he had a fight going on soon, he needed to be ready. As he left, he took one look to make sure that everything was in order. At the exasperated waving of Sarge, he rushed out the door. Sam ran down the hallway, not encountering a single person. When he entered the atrium, there were less than twenty people in there. The starry figure of the system overseer stood at the front of the room, giving Sam a disapproving look. Now that everyone is here, we can finally begin. The formatting of the tournament is about to change somewhat. We are down to the final sixteen fighters, eight in the losers bracket, and eight in the winners bracket. Today will be the final day of fighting, where we will crown a new winner of the tournament. There will be no killing allowed in this part of the match, and the rules are otherwise the same. Your positions at the end will be determined by an algorithm based on your performance and matchups to create a hierarchy despite the fact that some people will be at the same rank otherwise. The fights will occur within the brackets until the last match, which will be between the winners of both brackets. The first fight will be between Torchman and the Bear of the Motherland. Sam did not recognize the first name, and he took a look around. All of the fighters were from the upper echelons of the leaderboards, and Sam should have been a bit more attentive in reading them. Upon checking them, he saw that Torchman was the number 12 human in the world. Judging by his name, and the small sparks that danced around his body, he fought with fire. The bear was the same as before, a massive, burly Russian man who lived up to his name. They walked up together, Torchman with an easy, athletic gait, and the bear with a lumbering one. They stopped in the middle of the arena, and paused as the system explained what was happening to the audience. There was a moment of silence and then a cheer. This was even more exciting than the normal matches. 
the best of the best, vying for supremacy. The system finished up and announced the beginning of the battle. Sam wondered how exactly the system overseer was able to be here, as well as supervising the rest of the universe. Was it omnipresent or something like that? Perhaps it was, which was a scary thought. That would equate its power with that of a god, which was not comforting in the slightest. If so, what did that say about the system as a whole? This overseer might act with its authority, as a part of it itself, but it certainly possessed less power. Sure, it was a mostly benevolent god, but judging by Jeffrey's stories, it was not towards those who displeased it. In fact, perhaps it had been there when Jeffrey had been recounting those stories, and even now Sam was on its watch list. The worst thing was that he would never know. As the two men got into position in the arena, Sam watched them slowly, feeling small sparks of Tao energy coming off them. In fact, the same could be said of most of the fighters here. They were all coming close to forming their Daos. Perhaps these would be the fights in which this finally happened. Sam watched half-heartedly as the two men fought, focused more on the figure of the overlord. The man stared off into the distance, clearly in the middle of something. The small motes of Tao energy that were coming off him told Sam that whatever he was doing, it would be bad for Sam in the end. Wondering if he could do something about it, Sam drew on his new skill. It was extremely hard to do so, but he was able to enter the Tao space of the other man with his own. What he saw there was quite impressive. It was only a Tao moat, sure, but one that glowed with the light of a much stronger Tao. It was perfectly compressed, and in far better shape than that of the boy from the interweb. Sam gave the man a look to make sure that he had not been detected, and he sent a little spike of power into the man's Tao. There was a small buzz, and then the production of Tao sparks stopped. The overlord jolted in his seat, and then looked around himself in shock. His eyes locked on Sam, who returned in gaze with a cool state. If the overlord said anything about this in a public setting, his status might take a hit, which would cause him to lose even more power. It was actually pretty fun playing with the man's Tao. Sam gave him a smile and then looked back at the fight. The bear was absolutely dominating the battle, which was to be expected based on his position on the leaderboards. The fireballs that Torchman sent off were not very effective against the rocky armor of the bear, and they only served to leave glassy patches of melted stone on it. However, it was a bit closer than it seemed on the outside. The mage was a bit more than just a normal mage, and his movements were a lot quicker than other mages of his level. He had weaker spells as a result, but he was able to use them a lot more efficiently. It seemed that dexterity was a good addition to spellcasting prowess. If Sam had picked a different build, it might well have been this. However, the one downside of this was that you ended up with lower stamina and mana on average than if you had picked a pure physical or magical build. Eventually, Torchman ran out of stamina, and he was forced to stand his ground in front of the charging form of the bear. He was a lot braver than Sam would have been in that situation, and his face did not even flicker as he started to prepare a new spell. With a shout that was whipped off his lips by a sudden gust of hot wind, he began to rapidly snap his fingers one after the other, creating tiny motes of red-hot fire in the air. Ten, twenty, a hundred. They kept on forming, and then they formed into tiny arrowheads of fire. After what must have been almost a thousand floating motes began to rotate around him, which had all formed in a matter of seconds, Torchman thrust his hands forwards. The small flames, weak on their own, worked wonders in a large group. The first ones flickered out as soon as they struck the stony flesh of the bear, but they made tiny dents in the rock that were unerringly targeted by the next ones, on and one until the first series of attacks got through the armor. The bear roared in bestial rage, and he smashed his free hand down to the ground in front of himself, creating a localized earthquake that knocked Torchman off of his feet. The man flipped through the air to land perfectly, but unfortunately for him, dexterity was useless if there was nothing to push off of. A five-foot-long spear of rock, wrought from the bear's own armor, sped through the air and impaled the other man, causing him to let out a strangled cry as he was torn out of the air. With a pop, he was teleported out of the arena to receive medical aid. The bear raised his hands, waving his unused axe, and banished his armor, roaring with delight. A small sector of the arena started chanting something in Russian, and a few bare-chested men with Russian flags tattooed on their torsos jumped up and down. After a few minutes of this, the bear made his way back inside the arena waiting area. Congratulations to the winner of the first fight, the bear of the motherland. Next up will be the first delegates from the winner's bracket, the angel of death, and anonymous. Eduardo and the figure of anonymous made their way into the arena, and the system signaled for the fight to begin. Anonymous wasted no time leaping forwards, her knife at the ready. She pulled back her hand midair, and thrust the knife forwards dozens of times in the span of a few seconds, creating blades and spears of wind that shot towards Eduardo. 
With an artful flourish, he drew his rapier and brought it around in front of him in a semicircular arc, cutting the wind blades out of the air. He took a step back as Anonymous cut at the place where he had been standing, and then slashed his rapier towards her. A crescent of white light formed at the tip of the blade and gracefully peeled off, heading on a collision course with Anonymous' head. Sam lost focus a few minutes into the fight as he took a look around the room. He only knew a little over half of the faces there, and he decided to check the leaderboard for overall power, something that he had not done in a while. It would be important for determining who he might be up against. This time, he made it display the top 16 people, assuming that they would be who were here today. Overall power. 1. The Overlord. 2. Rodney Kane. 3. The Arbiter. 4. The Scourge of New York. 5. Profound Visionary. 6. Reaper. 7. The Angel of Death. 8. Anonymous. 9. The Bear of the Motherland. 10. Solitaire. 11. Drake. 12. Torchman. 13. Starchild. 14. Harry King. 15. Marina Talbot. 16. Thomas Aquinas. Chapter 96. It was quite a diverse mix of names, ranging from mythical beasts to philosophers, but it was mostly recognizable to Sam. Sam looked around the room, trying to match faces to names, and he was able to do so quite easily in fact. Solitaire was the masked figure leaning against a wall, with card hands inlaid onto their clothing. Drake was the large man with scales, Sam had no idea where those came from, Thomas Aquinas was the man sitting deep in thought, wearing what looked like a Halloween costume of Isaac Newton, and Starchild was the woman wearing a blindingly bright sequined outfit made to look like twinkling stars. Of the last two people, Harry King and Marina Talbot, both wore masks, and neither of them were wearing anything especially identifying. Sam would just have to wait to see who they were. Eduardo was handling himself admirably against Anonymous, and had succeeded in getting the first hit of the battle in. However, a fight between two high-dexterity fighters was more of a game of skill than brute force, and it was quite hard for either to land a telling attack. As of now, both of them were sticking to their basic attacks, not wanting to reveal anything too special to each other. Anonymous already knew about Eduardo's finishing move, Ave Maria, but he could have created a new skill in the time since his battle with Rodney Kane. For now, they were probing each other and testing the waters. The stakes for this match were extremely high, as it would determine who would be the master, and who would be the servant in the new world order after this. There were only three faction spots for the entire world, and the hierarchy within them would be determined by personal strength or usefulness to the faction. It was basically assured that the Overlord and Sam would get a faction, but the most important thing was to place first. The bonuses from that would allow the faction leader to overcome stronger opponents, which would in turn increase the power of the faction immeasurably. After the end of the tournament, this would become a game of politics and threats, rather than one of force. There would still be battles and fighting of course, but not immediately. Sam turned his attention back to the match and saw that Eduardo had managed to disarm Anonymous. The girl had created a pseudo-knife of wind in her hand, which she was using to fight. It seemed weaker than her normal one however, and it was starting to come apart as she parried and blocked with it. Eventually, as the knife came apart fully, she was forced to reveal her final attack. With a high-pitched cry, she raised her hands and then ripped into her arm with a jagged blade of wind. Throwing the blood up into the air, she cut through it with her blades, creating a red-tinged blade of wind that moved far faster than any she had created before. It sucked the blood out of her arm at a furious rate, and she was quickly going pale. The blade grew larger and larger as it crossed the divide between the two fighters, Eduardo having retreated upon seeing her prepare the skill. That may have turned out to be a mistake for him, as the blade was growing more powerful the longer that it traveled. However, it stopped growing about 10 feet from Eduardo, Anonymous having run out of blood to fuel it with. She clutched her arm and sank to the ground, drained of energy. Eduardo pursed his lips and stared down the rapidly approaching attack. It was far more powerful than anything that Anonymous had leveled at him before, and he knew that if it hit him, it would severely injure him. Eduardo sighed and spoke something softly, too softly to be heard. He raised his rapier up to the heavens, and a bolt of jagged lightning lanced down and struck the tip. The blade started to glow with a searing white light, and Eduardo drew his right leg back, getting into a stance. With a simple downward slash, he parted the blood blade, creating a solid wall of white that rushed across the arena. It slammed into Anonymous, and picked her up, smashing her into the wall. She was instantly teleported away, her injuries too severe to continue. Eduardo bowed to the audience and then collapsed to the floor. He had not taken a single hit during the fight, but his final attack had overtaxed his body. He was lifted out of the arena by a small hard light projection and plopped down in the chair next to Sam. There was a short intermission, and Eduardo woke up at some time within it. Huh? 
did I win? He asked, sounding confused. Sam nodded and Eduardo let out a sigh of relief. Good. Sam smiled and waited for the next fight to start. This could very well be his one, with Rodney Kane. Instead, something unexpected happened. The form of Andrew Monroe walked out of the back of the room and took a seat on the other side. Sam said form, because it was clear that this was not the same man who he had seen before. He walked with a jerky cadence, and his eyes rolled back and forth as he moved. If Sam didn't know better, he would have said that the man was possessed. In fact, he was possessed, by the AI that had been implanted into him. It was very careful not to arouse any suspicion, as the system overseer was very close to it. By masking all of its functions and blending it with that of its host, the AI was able to hide from the all-seeing eye of the system. That was helped of course by the fact that it was greatly distracted by being on billions of planets at once, supervising tournaments, but it was still more than powerful enough to erase the AI from existence. Sam saw Rodney Kane give his friend a look as he sat down, and then whispered something to him. The answer was apparently not satisfactory, as the man edged away from Monroe. With that, the system announced the end of the interlude. With a quarter of the fights for this sector finished, the next ones will bring us to the one-half mark. Coming from the loser's bracket, we have our next fighters, Harry King, and Marina Talbot. Sam was now able to more easily see who was what as they got out of their seats, as they walked quite differently. One was quite clearly male, and the other female. He crossed his legs and watched the beginning of the fight. Both fighters were close-quarter, strength-oriented fighters, like himself. Marina wielded a large hammer, and her opponent clutched a great axe in one hand, with a buckler in the other. It was a very strange combination, but one that seemed to work for him. Sam noticed that they seemed to have pulled the weapons out of thin air, and he turned to Eduardo. Hey, did you see that too? What? They both summoned those weapons out of nowhere. Eduardo chuckled. Oh, that. Some vendor in an alien-run city tried to flog one of those things off to me. They both have storage devices. The alien tried to tell me that it was a premium one, but I analyzed it and saw that it was some hack job. It took a constant injection of 99% of your mana pool to use. However, that might not be a problem for these two. They don't look like they're using much mana. Sam and Eduardo watched as the two fighters circled each other, wary of a possible attack. Marina attacked first, and she performed a strange technique with her hammer, where she slammed it into the ground, propelling her body through the air. As she flew, she raised her hammer high above her head and started to imbue it with some sort of elemental energy. It was not one that Sam had seen before, and it had an aura of dark blue power around it. As it moved, it kept altering its trajectory, making sure that its path was unerring. Huh, that's a pretty rare element, Lao said, talking for the first time. Sam looked over at him. What is it? I didn't recognize it. It's the element of order. She's using it as some sort of aiming technique. Sam laughed. Ha, huh, if only I had that when I was playing those first-person shooters. I would have been a god at them. The reference went over the heads of the other two men and Sam sighed. Nobody? Okay, never mind. Sam then realized something. Hey, how did you know that? Where did you find out about the elements? I bought it. It was only a few thousand credits. Information vendors on the interweb seem to be a lot cheaper than ones in the real world. Sam gave him a pensive look. All right, I'll buy one of those then. It might not be for a while, but I will definitely look into it. With that, their conversation was over. Chapter 97 The attack landed with a clang on Harry's buckler, the small shield looking far too minuscule to turn away such a powerful blow. A half-dome of earth erupted from the sand below, and formed around the buckler, reinforcing it. There was a cracking noise, and a piece of the wall fell off, but it held firm for long enough to dull the impact. Marina snarled and pushed back off of the wall, landing with a thump. Harry took a step back and then banged his weapons together, sending out a cone of red light that enveloped Marina. It didn't seem to do any damage, but it caused her to go on a rampage towards the man. Sam chuckled. When the other two men looked at him, Sam explained. It's a taunt skill. It's one of the most ubiquitous skills that tanks have in video games. It makes it so that the enemy will target you over all else. It's much better in a party setting, but as you can see here it's pretty effective on its own. With no higher intelligence governing her actions, Marina made attacks that were far sloppier than they should have been, snarling in bestial rage as she did so. Harry patiently turned the attacks aside and then struck back, catching the woman in the ribs with the flat of his axe. Its size was such that it acted like a hammer, propelling her backwards. She was sent about twenty feet, skidding on the sand and creating a long furrow in the arena floor. She let out a frustrated growl and then got up, charging Harry immediately. Halfway through the motion, she stopped and clutched her head. Damn it. 
I should have invested more into wisdom or something. It seemed that she had thrown the taunt off, and was now in control of herself again. Sam leaned in to watch the fight unfold, and he watched as Harry tried, and failed, to execute another taunt. It looked like prolonged exposure to the effect created a resistance to future iteration of it, just like in games. Perhaps the entire concept of video games was just another DAO archetype, stored within the DAO annals. In any case, there were definitely parallels between them and the workings of the system. Marina weaved around the ponderous strikes of Harry's axe, making good use of her higher dexterity. Both of them had pretty skewed stats toward strength, but Marina focused on dexterity as a secondary stat, and Harry clearly was aiming for constitution or resilience. It was hard for him to land a blow, but he could take one with the best of them. Marina kept landing attacks on his arms and legs, seeking to cripple them, but every strike that could have shattered boulders only caused the man to shift in discomfort. Sam narrowed his eyes as he noticed something interesting going on. Harry refused to move out of one spot, instead preferring to stay rooted in place, almost as if he was drawing power from not moving. And as the battle progressed, Sam saw that was in fact correct. The man had the inklings of a Tao, one that seemed to be related to the concept of solidity. In fact, it was likely that very concept, as Sam's fragment staged Tao sense could make out the nature of lower order concepts quite efficiently. In any case, he was going to break through soon. It seemed that Marina was only just behind him in that regard, as Sam could feel small sparks of nascent Tao energy coming off of her as well. They would likely not break through during this match, but they were still able to draw upon their power somewhat. It was not very efficient, but it was enough for a fight against another non-Dao wielder. Marina's attacks grew a small amount in power each time that she landed an attack in succession, a good Dao spark for someone who fought like her. She had low health, but high stats that were conducive to a rapid-fire blitzing style of fighting. This was exactly what she was doing against Harry. After three solid minutes of power building, the momentum within the hammer had grown too much for Harry. With a sickening crack, the buckler, and the arm underneath it, broke into tiny pieces. Harry screamed as the shards of bone clattered together to the ground, leaking out of his ruined arm. He looked at Marina with a pain-filled gaze before activating a skill. The ruined arm started to glow with red light, and that light streamed up into his mouth and nose, filling him with energy. The arm started to wither away, but he ignored it, instead breathing in more and more of the red power. His eyes dilated, and his skin turned a bright shade of red. With a bellow like that of an angry bull, he charged Marina. Harry moved far faster than he had before, far faster than he had any right to move, with the weight of his axe. He still managed it however, and when he reached Marina, all of his momentum was transferred into his axe. The woman's face filled with fear, and she tried to move, but she could not, and Harry brought the axe down like a thunderbolt from heaven, at such speeds that a red haze of heat appeared around the edge. It slammed into the ground where Marina was standing, occluding the view with a cloud of dust. When it cleared, the audience gasped. Marina stood tall in front of Harry, with one of her arms missing. What was more impressive was that her mace was buried deep into the man's face, denting the iron mask that he wore to such an extent that he was barely recognizable as a person, only a twisted hunk of metal. He fell backwards with a groan and crashed to the sands. His body was teleported away, and Marina raised her free hand in victory, to the sound of tumultuous cheering. What the crowd, and indeed most of the fighters, did not see was the new Tao that blazed within here. Sam smiled. It seemed that she had been able to form it during this match after all. That last devastating attack from Harry must have been the crucible with which she forged her destiny, creating enough danger and adversity to hone her skills onto the point that she formed a Tao. Marina walked off the arena, dripping blood from her stump. It did not seem to bother her overly, and as soon as she sat down a robot came over with a large bandage and a plastic bag connected to a drip filled with the green healing solution that Sam had been hooked up to multiple times. He doubted that it would be able to heal a severed arm, but perhaps he would be surprised. It was more likely that it would make the stump heal over, allowing Marina to fight again, although with a severe handicap. Sam gave her an appraising look. The world would be a very interesting place after the tournament ended. And now for the next match of the finals, in the winner's bracket. This battle will be an interesting one, showcasing the strongest man alive, and a rising star. Without any further ado, the next fighters are the Overlord and Reaper. Sam frowned as he heard the system's voice. Was it just him or did it sound more enthusiastic about this battle? He was not the only one to notice this, and Eduardo chuckled. Ha! Huh. The system sure seems excited. I wonder why, Eduardo said. Sam nodded and laughed. Yeah, normally it just speaks in a monotone. Now it's acting like a real arena announcer. Well, it knows how to work the crowd. This battle is one that will excite the audience to no end. 
Those with little power hate, but also worship, those with an abundance of it. This fight will show that to excess. Did you never wonder why the overlord has fans, despite the fact that he should be someone reviled by all? Lao added. Huh, that's actually a good point, Sam said, watching as a good portion of the arena started clapping as the overlord raised his hands in supplication. He does seem to have way more support than he should. Sam was about to say more, but then the voice of the system drowned him out. With two of the most promising fighters in the world here today, who will win? Will it be the paragon of overwhelming force, the overlord, or will it be the cold hand of death itself, Reaper? Sam pursed his lips. There was definitely something strange going on here. The voice of the system was uncharacteristically emotional. It was almost as if it was trying to feed the overlord Dao energy so that he would easily beat Reaper. Could that be it? Does the system not want Reaper to do well in this fight? Sam wondered. Perhaps it has something to do with the man's Dao. The system might not want a loose cannon death cultivator gaining even more power. The rest of his thoughts ebbed away as the match started. Chapter 98 At the first Lagrange point, a place between the Earth and the Sun where the gravitational pulls of both celestial bodies were equal, a strange spaceship made out of twisted flesh and tortured muscle squatted, like a parasite upon creation. It technically did not need the orbit-denying influence of the Lagrange point to stay stationary there, but it made the cost in fuel a bit lower than normal. It drew power from the ritual sacrifices of thousands of prisoners that were held within the myriad of storage devices that were strewn across the ship. They had created storage devices similar to stasis chambers just for this purpose, but without the effect of shutting down the minds of the inhabitants. Being nothing more than an untethered mind for hundreds of years in the void quickly turned most of the prisoners to madness, which only increased their energy potential. Each of them had been a disciple of the minory insect who had failed in their missions. The members of that profane sect did not even receive a single chance to redeem themselves after failure. No, this was the instant punishment for such a crime against the sect's reputation and honor. They were fed into the ship's Dao engine, a creation by one of the higher-ups in the sect that converted Dao-aligned energy into pure power that would be used to propel the ship. This being a ship belonging to the minor Ian sect, the Dao energy was that of pain. On the bridge of the ship, Salvinius Relk's supervisor, the man who had been informed of the presence of a promising being on this planet by his subordinate, stood. He looked down at the small blue and green orb that hung in the firmament, feeling a tiny bit of interest at the sight. Earth was a markedly different planet than most within the civilized multiverse, which were invariably vast conglomerations of endless urban sprawl. He was keeping a watchful eye on Reaper, to see if he truly was worthy of joining the sect. For a cultivator like him, it was almost trivial for him to extend his aura sense down to the planet's surface and into the tournament. The man laughed as he saw where it was, inside a pocket of open space deep within the crust of the planet. The system never failed with its intriguing initialization tournament's themes, and this one was one of the better ones that he had seen. He took a seat on a chair that was lined with jagged spikes and complete with a localized gravity well to increase the pressure. Letting out a small sigh of pleasure, he reclined backwards. For a powerful pain cultivator, this chair was like a bomb to the soul. Ignoring that for now, he kept watching the fight as it began. Baltus Agrinor was nothing if not a patient man. That was for things that were out of his control of course. Everything else that dallied was a personal affront to him. Back within the arena, Sam and all the others in the audience were transfixed by the beginning of the most anticipated fight in the tournament yet. Reaper was a quickly rising power within the world, and this would be the battle to see if he had what it took to hold his own. It was unlikely that he would beat the Overlord, but his showing here would be what determined his final ranking. Fighting well against the strongest man on earth while still losing was far more impressive than beating a weaker opponent. The audience went still as the Overlord took a step forward. So, Reaper, I have heard a lot about you and your power, even felt it. Now let us see if you can match that in a real fight. The Overlord was drumming up the passions of the crowd to fuel his Dao, and Sam could see that it was working. Streams of ethereal Tao energy coursed down into the Overlord, making him light up with power. His mask started to glow as the energy entered his body, and the snarling demon's face took on an eerie hue. The entire time, Reaper gazed on with a cold look on his face, one of a man who has realized the most fundamental truth about life. That it cannot exist without death. Reaper held out one arm, and summoned a spectral scythe to it, one so densely packed with ectoplasm that it was basically a physical object. The ectoplasm allowed for the cutting edge to be far sharper than that of a normal weapon, while maintaining peerless durability. A pure black suit of plate armor rose up from the ground around Reaper and began to attach itself to his body. This was no transparent conglomeration of ectoplasm, but a solid suit of conceptual energies, wrought out of Reaper's Tao and his elemental energy. The overlord started to hype himself up for the match, 
building up his stores of ego by flexing for the audience. The cheers of his supporters added even more fuel to the fire that was his Dow. The only question was now, how many hits would it take to knock Reaper out of the game? The betting board appeared in the middle of the arena for some reason, and Sam saw the audience begin to mess around with their system interfaces. Sam wished that he could bet on the matches, but as a competitor, that sort of behavior was banned. Besides, he would be walking out of this with a hefty payout in any case. The overlord finished grandstanding and got ready to attack. When the battle commenced, he moved like a flash, so pumped up on Dao energy that his movements were a blur, even to Sam. He appeared directly in front of Reaper, and punched forwards, his hand coated in energy. To everyone's surprise, Reaper dodged. Sam had seen what the man had really done, which was not as impressive as it had looked, which was to read the overlord's movements before he had started punching, allowing him to predict where the fist would land so that he could move out of the way in time. If he had not done this, he would have been pancaked by that attack. A gust of wind blew up a storm of sand as the energy of the punch faded, and Reaper counterattacked. His scythe whipped around like a serpent, and the very tip cut into the overlord's mask. The item must have been made out of something special, as it didn't even crack, but the scythe was still able to cut smoothly into it, drawing a single drop of blood. Sam watched as the Dao energy surrounding the man dimmed slightly. The overlord growled and lashed out with his right fist, grabbing onto the scythe. It must have burned his hand and Sam could hear the sizzling, which had been amplified by the speakers for some reason, but if he felt any pain, he did not show it. The devious actions of Reaper have allowed him to achieve first blood. Will it be enough to prolong his defeat? Only time will tell. Sam nodded. The system was definitely interfering, as shown by the flare of Dao energy around the overlord. Hey, Lao? Sam called out. So you noticed it too? Sam nodded. His Dao energy is being artificially increased by the system. It seems to have some sort of vested interest in this fight. Eduardo frowned. What? I don't see anything. Sam looked at Eduardo. You don't have a Dao yet, so you can't see what's going on. Though, by the looks of your aura, you're getting close. Sam raised his finger to cut off Eduardo as the battle went into full gear below them. The overlord shuddered as the new power entered him, and he tightened his fist around the scythe. Reaper tried to wrest it free, but the other man was too strong. With a roar, he shattered the scythe between his fingers, creating an explosion of black light that forced him back a few steps. Blood ran freely from Reaper's nose as his connection to his skill was shattered. He grunted and then took a step back, dodging another strike from the overlord. The man's fist slammed down into the ground, sending a cloud of sand ten feet into the ground. It fell like coarse yellow rain around the two fighters, obscuring the view of the audience. The dust cleared to reveal the overlord with his hands around Reaper's neck. Chapter 99 The audience groaned as this had happened before in the last fight. Hearing this, the overlord dropped Reaper. Pa, you're not even worth killing. Weakling. He spat, filling himself with even more Dao energy. By this point, the man was so full of Dao energy that even the normal people could see the faint haze of energy that swirled around him. Eduardo let out a gasp. So that's what you were talking about. Wait, does that mean dash? No, you don't have a Dao yet. It's just that the overlord has gained so much energy that it's visible to normal senses. A groan came up from the arena floor, and Sam looked down. Who, who are you to speak of death? Reaper said, his voice thin. What was that? The overlord asked. You want to die? I said, who are you to speak of death? Reaper asked, his voice stronger. He started to get to his feet, and a haze of black light began to swell around him. The embrace of the mother is everywhere. Death is part of life, the most important part in fact. I will be its arbiter within this world. Call of the grave. Oh shit, Sam said, he's having a Dao breakthrough. Three spectral figures rose from the arena floor, each shaped like a tattered facsimile of a human. They clutched ethereal axes and swords, and their countenances were grim. Sam bit his lip, suddenly wary. The power that was emanating from Reaper was quite palpable. It was nothing compared to his own, but for someone without any sort of Dao comprehension multipliers, save for the presumable influence of the man's leaderboard title, this level of power was almost unbelievable. Sam wondered if the rest of the universe was doing this well, or if it was just Earth. The three shades charged the overlord, and he dismissively batted at one of them with his hand. It chittered and brought its sword down, cutting into his skin. A drop of blood welled up and the man went berserk. His demonic mask glowed an even deeper hue of red, and he roared so loudly that Sam was tempted to cover his ears. The man punched at the air, creating a solid beam of light that tore through the upper body of the wraith, leaving it standing there without a head. It remained there for a moment, as if unsure of what to do, and then faded away into a light mist and then into nothing. 
The other wraiths quickly followed suit and the overlord turned towards Reaper. The games were fun, but it's time to end this. Agreed. A tiny speck of dark energy shot out from Reaper's outstretched hand, traveling at such speeds that even the overlord wasn't able to dodge in time. It cut straight through his body and out the other side, leaving a tiny hole on his chest. He looked down in horror and then back at Reaper. Dao energy leaked out of the wound, as well as the more physical fluid of blood. He stared at Reaper for a moment and then clapped his hands together. A thin blade of force was pressed out between his hands, slicing through the air towards Reaper. The man just stood there, and when it hit him, he was instantly teleported away. He had thrown the match without any apparent plan, and as he did so, he looked up into the sky for some reason. Sam forgot about that soon afterwards, but one man did not. Baltus shivered in delight as he witnessed the performance of the prospective sect member. He was magnificent. Simply magnificent. To be able to fight like that against the local planetary hegemon was more than Baltus had expected. Even better, he had been able to sense the tendril of energy that Baltus had sent down to test his Tao senses. He had looked up at the last moment, just before he had been teleported away. Yes, this boy would do well indeed. Laughing, Baltus snapped his fingers, and the ship tore a hole in space and time, exiting the universe and heading back towards his own. The overlord let out a cry of rage and struck the ground multiple times with his fist, throwing a tantrum like a baby. Still, his fans did not relent in their cheering, and as he walked off the arena, he seemed to perk up a little. The man slammed himself down into his chair, nearly cracking it, and crossed his legs. He was angry that Reaper had humiliated him in front of the entire arena. Sam whistled. He knew that Reaper would be in for a tough time after this tournament, and so would he for that matter. His heart rate started to increase as he realized that the next loser's bracket match was up. He had a 1 in 2 chance of being up next, and it was most likely that he would be up against. For the third match of the loser's bracket, we have the Arbiter vs Rodney Kane. Rodney Kane. Sam swallowed his nerves and got up, and across the room so did his rival. It was time to see who was the number two under the sun. Kane hissed at Sam as the two of them walked side by side up the ramp to the arena. You may think that you're assured of victory with your fancy Dao, but I'm not as weak as you might think. Good for you. All I know is what I've been told, and I was told that you can only last for a minute. The man's face twisted in confusion and then he reddened. You bastard. I'm going to make you pay for that. Didn't deny it, I notice, Sam added, chuckling. By then they were on the arena sands, and Sam stopped taunting Rodney. The man was in an ideal state anyway, his mind inflamed with rage. This would hopefully be an easy fight. Begin. The system said almost immediately, and Sam gripped his mace with his other hand, bringing it up into a tentative guard. Rodney clenched his fist and the suit of dark armor rose out of the sands again, this time looking sleeker and more deadly. It coated his body in all areas, and he smiled as the last bit of metal covered his face. Sam took this in with a blank face and instead focused on getting ready to fight. An invisible sheath of Tao energy formed around his mace, quickly becoming tangible as he poured more and more into it. His body began to fill up with his elemental energy, rapidly spooling out of his meridian. He was not going to attempt to use his new technique yet, both out of fear that a countermeasure would be devised by his audience, and also because he felt that he would not need it. Rodney finished powering up and Sam drew back his mace with both hands, getting ready to fight. The other man summoned his greatsword to his hands, the weapon's razor edge clearly visible. No normal greatsword would have been constructed like that, but as it was a summoned weapon, it did not matter. He raised it up and hefted the weapon onto one shoulder of his armor, getting ready to attack. Sam smiled and drew his foot back, preparing to take the blow and retaliate with one of his own. Rodney Kane took a deep breath and then shattered the ground beneath him with a mighty thrust of his legs. The heat and friction of the movements made the sand momentarily fuse beneath him, creating a thin layer of glass that cracked instantly with a tinkling crash. Even Sam appreciated the showmanship, and he let himself smile slightly at the display. That had been a pretty good opening move. What came next was more standard fare, an overhand swipe from the greatsword that cleaved down towards Sam's head. He tucked his stomach in and turned, trapping the blade between his mace and himself. Rodney struggled to remove the blade, and in the end his strength, augmented by the armor as it was, was superior. Sam was forced to let go and he turned it into an opening by spinning the man's blade as he released it. The extra motion momentarily confused Rodney, and as he took his greatsword back in check, Sam struck. The spike tip of his mace, which corresponded to the middle claw of the bear's paw, struck home and lanced into the solar plexus of the suit of armor. It did not break through, but Kane let out a gasp as the air was propelled out of his body, and he was driven back a few steps. He growled and slashed his greatsword through the air, 
creating a shallow rent in reality that quickly grew into a horizontal edge of energy that streaked towards Sam. Sam ducked underneath the blade, but as something cut into his cheek, he saw his mistake. There was a much smaller and almost invisible blade of concentrated air pressure traveling in the shadow of the main one, and that had succeeded in cutting him. If not for his duck, it would have cut one of his arms off. The main blade dissipated, its work done, and Rodney Kane laughed. All of your grandstanding is just a load of hot air, Arbiter. I am going to make you feel some serious pain before this is over. Mark my words. Sam did not respond to the taunt, and instead began to channel his Tao energy and his elemental energy. He was not going to use his secret skill, but he could turn the tables a little with something like it. Chapter 100 As he neared the armored form of his opponent, Sam began to pump energy into his mace, it began to grow slightly warm in his hand, and Sam began to contemplate the power of righteous anger. If anyone would be a target for such an emotion, it would be Rodney Kane. His face contorted into a rage-filled grimace as he remembered everything that the man had done to him, and the fire in his soul blazed into life, becoming a raging inferno of white-hot Tao energy. A small fraction of his new technique would be on display now. Time would tell if anyone was clever enough to recognize it for what it was. Transitioning into an angled front flip, hoping to distract the audience from what he was about to do, Sam began to channel a mixture of elemental energy and Tao energy into his right arm. The two powers, yellow and red, mingled like sparks of fiery lightning and sank into his bones. A surge of energy entered his limb, and the mace accelerated by almost double, causing Rodney Kane to fumble with his sword, trying to get it up in time to block. He failed, too arrogant and sure of himself, and the mace struck home. There was a resounding crash, and Rodney Kane was blasted sideways by the attack. His body hit the arena walls and a chunk of stone fell from it, prompting the nearest audience members to scramble upwards. That was just as well, as the entire row of seats for twenty feet in both directions collapsed into the sands. Rodney got up with a bellowed roar, and raced across the arena towards Sam. He was enraged now, and each breath he took sounded like it was the product of a bellows. The entire right side of his armor was cracked and pitted, and a piece was missing, allowing Sam to see a gaping wound that ran up the side of the man's chest. A small piece of rib was visible, but as he watched, it began to heal over rapidly. The other man must have passed his constitution threshold by now. He stopped in front of Sam and screamed in his face, a wordless cry of rage. Sam smiled, which made the other man even more angry. Beneath the veneer, Sam was also in a roiling pit of anger, one that allowed his Tao to be used to its fullest potential. The battle was heating up, and it was time for him to match its furious pace. The burning power of fiery justice filled his limbs and Sam laughed, feeling his muscles and bones gain power. Rodney Kane came in like a thunderbolt, his form a blur as the armor raced across the sands. Sam pulled back his right hand and as the other man came in, gripped the end of the mace with the other and swung. The great sword and mace slammed together, creating a small shockwave of displaced air around them. Both fighters strained against each other, until Sam let go of his weapon suddenly, causing Rodney to stumble. Leaving his mace on the ground, Sam jumped into the air and brought both fists down in a hammer fist attack. They were surrounded with the energy of his mana, Tao energy and elemental energy, loosely contained within a bubble of will. They did not want to coexist, but that was the whole point. As his fists landed, the mixture exploded, slamming Rodney into the dirt and tossing Sam into the air. He grabbed his mace on the way out and landed gracefully. All that pugilism training that he had done was really paying off now. The top layer of the skin on his hands was gone, but he had suffered worse pain by now, and it was not that distracting. They started to scab over almost immediately, and he was left with two scarred appendages that looked like some horror movie prop. As Rodney got to his feet, tottering, a chunk of armor fell off of his helmet. There was a crack running down the piece of armor, and as Sam watched it crumbled away. The other man's face was a tortured picture of utter wrath, and a small stream of blood ran down it. A spark of Tao energy shot out from the man and landed on the sands, invisible to almost everyone in the audience, another one followed and then another. Sam's eyes widened and he began to run towards Rodney, but a blast wave of red light shot out from the man, tossing him backwards. When Sam landed, he looked at Rodney. His hair was floating above his head, and both of his eyes were glowing a deep red. Sam recognized the feeling that he was getting off the man, as it was one that he had felt before. Rodney Kane had just awakened the Tao mode of anger. The red energy began to sink into his body, and Sam also recognized this. He was using some variant of fiery rage. With a scream of incandescent anger, the man dashed towards Sam, his movements like a blur. Sam tried to dodge, but the man's greatsword caught him full in the stomach, cutting deep into his abdomen. 
He was pushed off the end of the blade by the centripetal force of the move, and he crashed into the wall, now in the same situation as Rodney had been a few minutes earlier. A strange feeling came from his legs, and Sam looked down to see a ropey stream of entrails spilling out from his body. He groaned, and the pain hit him. It was like the world's worst stomach ache, one mingled with severe heartburn. His life force was slowly leaving him, and his sense of purpose was diminishing. His Tao energy started to dissipate, and he collapsed to the ground. Closing his eyes, Sam waited for himself to be teleported away to be healed. Then something blossomed in the darkness of his soul. A small speck of purest white light, a monument of purpose and resolve. It pulled him in like a black hole, and as he touched it, his eyes shot open. Ignoring the pain, he got to his feet. He would not lose here. He could not lose. There was too much at stake here, and for his journey to have meaning, he would have to win. He would become the strongest person in existence, if that would be what it took to fill the dearth of meaning in his life. He would become God. A bright light shone from behind his eyes, and in front of Rodney's eyes, he transformed. A towering presence descended to the arena, his Tao blazing to life again. Rodney Kane, I will not lose to the likes of you. Sam screamed, projecting his power forwards in a cone of sound and energy. Rodney took a step back, and his face twisted in fear, his own Tao faltering. Sam was rapidly hemorrhaging blood and energy, but he had enough left for this. He took one shaky step forwards, and then another. Step by step, he increased his speed and momentum until he was flying across the arena towards his opponent. Every trace of his remaining energy was forced into a tiny ball of condensed power, which he slammed into the head of his mace. The mace heated up, until it burned his hands, but still Sam held it. When his hands were nothing more than sticks of charred meat, he was ready. One final attack. One final attack to end this all. Rodney Kane recognized this, and Sam watched as the man poured all of his power into his next attack. His greatsword lengthened, until it was over ten feet long, and it began to hum with barely contained power. With primal screams, the two men attacked with all of their might. Sam's entire being was boiled down to this one attack, and he smiled as he saw Rodney falter. Taking one cataclysmic attack to his torso, Sam gritted his teeth as his mace came down. When it landed, Rodney's body detonated around the impact zone, looking as if a meteor had struck it. He was instantly teleported away, and Sam was left in the arena, his body almost cut in half. Falling backwards, he heard a whoosh as he was sent to the hospital ward.